Introduction to Edison, His Life and Inventions. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Edison, His Life and Inventions by Frank Lewis Dyer, General Counsel for the Edison Laboratory and Allied Interests, and Thomas Comerford Martin, ex-president of the American Institute of Electrical Engineers. Introduction Prior to this, no complete, authentic, and authorized record of the work of Mr. Edison during an active life has been given to the world. That life, if there is anything in heredity, is very far from finished, and while it continues, there will be new achievement. An insistently expressed desire on the part of the public for a definitive biography of Edison was the reason for the following pages. The present authors deem themselves happy in the confidence reposed in them, and in the constant assistance they have enjoyed from Mr. Edison while preparing these pages, a great many of which are altogether his own. This cooperation in no sense relieves the authors of responsibility as to any of the views or statements of their own that the book contains. They have realized the extreme reluctance of Mr. Edison to be made the subject of any biography at all, while he has felt that, if it must be written, it were best done by the hands of friends and associates of long standing, whose judgment and discretion he could trust, and whose intimate knowledge of the facts would save him from misrepresentation. The authors of the book are profoundly conscious of the fact that the extraordinary period of electrical development embraced in it has been prolific of great men. They have named some of them, but there has been no idea of setting forth various achievements or of ascribing distinctive merits. This treatment is devoted to one man whom his fellow citizens have chosen to regard as in many ways representative of the American at his finest, flowering in the field of invention during the nineteenth century. It is designed in these pages to bring the reader face to face with Edison, to glance at an interesting childhood and a youthful period marked by a capacity for doing things and by an insatiable thirst for knowledge, then to accompany him into the great creative stretch of forty years during which he has done so much. This book shows him plunged deeply into work for which he has always had an incredible capacity, reveals the exercise of his unsurpassed inventive ability, his keen reasoning powers, his tenacious memory, his fertility of resource, follows him through a series of innumerable experiments conducted methodically, reaching out like rays of searchlight into all the regions of science and nature, and finally exhibits him emerging triumphantly from countless difficulties, bearing with him in new arts the fruits of victorious struggle. These volumes aim to be a biography rather than a history of electricity, but they have had to cover so much general ground in defining the relations and contributions of Edison to the electrical arts that they serve to present a picture of the whole development effected in the last fifty years, the most fruitful that electricity has known. The effort has been made to avoid technique and abstruse phrases, but some degree of explanation has been absolutely necessary in regard to each group of inventions. The task of the authors has consisted largely in summarizing fairly the methods and processes employed by Edison, and some idea of the difficulties encountered by them in so doing may be realized from the fact that one brief chapter, for example, that on ore milling, covers nine years of most intense application and activity on the part of the inventor. It is something like exhibiting the geological eras of the earth in an outline lantern slide to reduce an elaborate series of strenuous experiments and a vast variety of ingenious apparatus to the space of a few hundred words. A great deal of this narrative is given in Mr. Edison's own language, from oral or written statements made in reply to questions addressed to him with the object of securing accuracy. A further large part is based upon the personal contributions of many loyal associates, and it is desired here to make grateful acknowledgment to such collaborators as Messrs. Samuel Insull, E. H. Johnson, F. R. Upton, R. N. Dyer, 
S. B. Eaton, Francis Jail, W. S. Andrews, W. J. Jenks, W. J. Hammer, F. J. Sprague, W. S. Mallory, and C. L. Clark, and others, without whose aid the issuance of this book would indeed have been impossible. In particular, it is desired to acknowledge indebtedness to Mr. W. H. Meadowcroft, not only for substantial aid in the literary part of the work, but for indefatigable effort to group, classify, and summarize the boundless material embodied in Edison's notebooks and memorabilia of all kinds now kept at the Orange Laboratory. Acknowledgement must also be made of the courtesy and assistance of Mrs. Edison, and especially of the loan of many interesting and rare photographs from her private collection. End of introduction. Chapter One of Edison, His Life and Inventions. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Edison, His Life and Inventions, by Frank Lewis Dyer and Thomas Comerford Martin. Chapter One, The Age of Electricity. The year 1847 marked a period of great territorial acquisition by the American people, with incalculable additions to their actual and potential wealth. By the rational compromise with England in the dispute over the Oregon region, President Polk had secured during 1846, for undisturbed settlement, 300,000 square miles of forest, fertile land, and fisheries, including the whole fair Columbia Valley. Our active policy of the Pacific dated from that hour. With swift and clinching succession came the melodramatic Mexican War, and February 1848 saw another vast territory, south of Oregon and west of the Rocky Mountains, added by treaty to the United States. Thus, in about 18 months, there had been pieced into the national domain for quick development and exploitation, a region as large as the entire Union of 13 states, at the close of the War of Independence. Moreover, within its boundaries was embraced all the great American gold field, just on the eve of discovery, for Marshall had detected the shining particles in the mill race at the foot of the Sierra Nevada, nine days before Mexico signed away her rights in California, and in all the vague, remote hinterland facing Cathayward. Equally momentous were the times in Europe, where the attempt to secure opportunities of expansion, as well as larger liberty for the individual, took quite different form. The old absolutist system of government was fast breaking up, and ancient thrones were tottering. The red lava of deep revolutionary fires oozed up through many glowing cracks in the political crust, and all the social strata were shaken. That the wild outbursts of insurrection midway in the fifth decade failed and died away was not surprising, for the superincumbent deposits of tradition and convention were thick. But the retrospect indicates that many reforms and political changes were accomplished. Although the process involved the exile of not a few ardent spirits to America to become leading statesmen, inventors, journalists, and financiers. In 1847, too, Russia began her tremendous march eastward into Central Asia, just as France was solidifying her first gains on the littoral of Northern Africa. In England, the fierce fervor of the Chartist movement, with its violent rhetoric as to the rights of man, was sobering down and passing pervasively into numerous practical schemes for social and political amelioration, constituting in their entirety a most profound change throughout every part of the national life. Into such times Thomas Alva Edison was born, and his relations to them and to the events of the past sixty years are the subject of this narrative. Aside from the personal interest that attaches to the picturesque career, so typically American, there is a broader aspect in which the work of the Franklin of the nineteenth century touches the welfare and progress of the race. It is difficult at any time to determine the effect of any single invention, 
and the investigation becomes more difficult where inventions of the first class have been crowded upon each other in rapid and bewildering succession. But it will be admitted that in Edison one deals with a central figure of the great age that saw the invention and introduction in practical form of the telegraph, the submarine cable, the telephone, the electric light, the electric railway, the electric trolley car, the storage battery, the electric motor, the phonograph, the wireless telegraph, and that the influence of these on the world's affairs has not been excelled at any time by that of any other corresponding advances in the arts and sciences. These pages deal with Edison's share in the great work of the last half century in abridging distance, communicating intelligence, lessening toil, improving illumination, recording forever the human voice, and on behalf of inventive genius it may be urged that its beneficent results and gifts to mankind compare with any to be credited as statesman, warrior, or creative writer of the same period. Viewed from the standpoint of inventive progress, the first half of the 19th century had passed very profitably when Edison appeared, every year marked by some notable achievement in the arts and sciences with promise of its early and abundant fruition in commerce and industry. There had been exactly four decades of steam navigation on American waters, railways were growing at the rate of nearly 1,000 miles annually, gas had become familiar as a means of illumination in large cities, looms and tools and printing presses were everywhere being liberated from the slow toil of manpower. The first photographs had been taken. Chloroform, nitrous oxide gas, and ether had been placed at the service of the physician in saving life, and the revolver, gun cotton, and nitroglycerin added to the agencies for slaughter. New metals, chemicals, and elements had become available in large numbers. Gases had been liquefied and solidified, and the range of useful heat and cold indefinitely extended. The safety lamp had been given to the miner, the kison to the bridge builder, the anti-friction metal to the mechanic for bearings. It was already known how to vulcanize rubber and how to galvanize iron. The application of machinery in the harvest field had begun with the embryonic reaper, while both the bicycle and the automobile were heralded in primitive prototypes. The gigantic expansion of the iron and steel industry was foreshadowed in the change from wood to coal in the smelting furnaces. The sewing machine had brought with it, like the friction match, one of the most profound influences in modifying domestic life and making it different from that of all preceding time. Even in 1847, few of these things had lost their novelty. Most of them were in the earlier stages of development. But it is when we turn to electricity that the rich virgin condition of an illimitable new kingdom of discovery is seen. Perhaps the word utilization or application is better than discovery, for then as now an endless wealth of phenomena noted by experimenters from Gilbert to Franklin and Faraday awaited the invention that could alone render them useful to mankind. The 18th century keenly curious and ceaselessly active in this fascinating field of investigation, had not, after all, left much of a legacy in either principles or appliances. The lodestone and the compass, the frictional machine, the laden jar, the nature of conductors and insulators, the identity of electricity and the thunderstorm flash, the use of lightning rods, the physiological effects of an electrical shock, these constituted the bulk of the bequest to which philosophers were the only heirs. Pregnant with possibilities were many of the observations that had been recorded, but these few appliances made up the meager kit of tools with which the 19th century entered upon its task of acquiring the arts and conveniences, now such an intimate part of human nature's daily food, that the average American today pays more for his electrical service than he does for bread. With the first year of the new century came Volta's invention of the chemical battery as a means of producing electricity. A well-known Italian picture represents Volta exhibiting his apparatus before the young conqueror Napoleon, 
then ravishing from the peninsula its treasure of ancient art and founding an ephemeral empire. At such a moment, this gift of despoiled Italy to the world was a noble revenge, setting in motion incalculable beneficent forces and agencies. For the first time, man had command of a steady supply of electricity without toil or effort. The useful results obtainable previously from the current of a frictional machine were not much greater than those to be derived from the flight of a rocket. While the frictional appliance is still employed in medicine, it ranks with a flint axe and the tinder box in industrial obsolescence. No art or trade could be founded on it. No diminution of daily work or increase of daily comfort could be secured with it. But the little battery with its metal plates in a weak solution proved a perennial reservoir of electrical energy, safe and controllable, from which supplies could be drawn at will. That which was wild had become domesticated. Regular crops took the place of haphazard gleanings from break or prairie. The possibility of electrical starvation was forever left behind. Immediately, new processes of inestimable value revealed themselves. New methods were suggested. Almost all the electrical arts now employed made their beginnings in the next twenty-five years. And while the more extensive of them depend today on the dynamo for electrical energy, some of the most important still remain in loyal allegiance to the older source. The battery itself soon underwent modifications, and new types were evolved, the storage, the double fluid, and the dry. Various analogies next pointed to the use of heat, and the thermoelectric cell emerged, embodying the application of flame to the junction of two different metals. Davy, of the safety lamp, threw a volume of current across the gap between two sticks of charcoal, and the voltaic arc, forerunner of electrical lighting, shed its bright beams upon a dazzled world. The decomposition of water by electrolytic action was recognized and made the basis of communicating at a distance, even before the days of the electromagnet. The ties that bind electricity and magnetism in twinship of relation and interaction were detected, and Faraday's work in induction gave the world at once the dynamo and the motor. Hitch your wagon to a star, said Emerson. To all the coal fields and all the waterfalls, Faraday had directly hitched the wheels of industry. Not only was it now possible to convert mechanical energy into electricity cheaply and in illimitable quantities, but electricity at once showed its ubiquitous availability as a motive power. Boats were propelled by it, cars were hauled, and even papers printed. Electroplating became an art, and telegraphy sprang into active being on both sides of the Atlantic. At the time Edison was born, in 1847, telegraphy, upon which he was to leave so indelible an imprint, had barely struggled into acceptance by the public. In England, Wheatstone and Cook had introduced a ponderous magnetic needle telegraph. In America, in 1840, Morse had taken out his first patent on an electromagnetic telegraph, the principle of which is dominating in the art to this day. Four years later, the memorable message, What Hath God Wrought, was sent by young Miss Ellsworth over his circuits and incredulous Washington was advised by a wire of the action of the Democratic Convention in Baltimore in nominating Polk. By 1847, circuits had been strung between Washington and New York under private enterprise, the government having declined to buy the Moore system for $100,000. Everything was crude and primitive. The poles were 200 feet apart and could barely hold up a wash line. The slim, bare copper wire snapped on the least provocation, and the circuit was down for 36 days in the first six months. The little glass knob insulators made seductive targets for ignorant sportsmen. Attempts to insulate the line wire were limited to coating it with tar or smearing it with wax for the benefit of all the bees in the neighborhood. The farthest western reach of the telegraph lines in 1847 was Pittsburgh, with three-ply iron wire mounted on square glass insulators with a little wooden pent roof for protection. 
In that office, where Andrew Carnegie was a messenger boy, the magnets in use to receive the signals sent with the aid of powerful nitric acid batteries weighed as much as 75 pounds apiece. But the business was fortunately small at the outset, until the new device, patronized chiefly by lottery men, had proved its utility. Then came the great outburst of activity. Within a score of years, telegraph wires covered the whole occupied country with a network, and the first great electrical industry was a pronounced success, yielding to its pioneers the first great harvest of electrical fortunes. It had been a sharp struggle for bare existence, during which such a man as the Chapter 2 of Edison, His Life and Inventions This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Edison, His Life and Inventions By Frank Lewis Dyer and Thomas Comerford Martin Chapter 2 Edison's Pedigree Thomas Alva Edison was born at Milan, Ohio, February 11, 1847. The state that rivals Virginia as a mother of presidents has evidently other titles to distinction of the same nature. For picturesque detail, it would not be easy to find any story excelling that of the Edison family before it reached the Western Reserve. The story epitomizes American idealism, restlessness, freedom of individual opinion, and ready adjustment to the surrounding conditions of pioneer life. The ancestral Edisons who came over from Holland, as nearly as can be determined in 1730, were descendants of extensive millers on the Zoider Zee, and took up patents of land along the Passaic River, New Jersey, close to the home that Mr. Edison established in the Orange Mountains a hundred and sixty years later. They landed at Elizabethport, New Jersey, and first settled near Caldwell in that state, where some graves of the family may still be found. President Cleveland was born in that quiet hamlet. It is a curious fact that in the Edison family, the pronunciation of the name has always been with a long E sound, as it would naturally be in the Dutch language. The family prospered and must have enjoyed public confidence, for we find the name of Thomas Edison as a bank official on Manhattan Island signed to Continental Currency in 1778. According to the family records, this Edison, great-grandfather of Thomas Alva, reached the extreme old age of 104 years. But all was not well, and, as has happened so often before, the politics of father and son were violently different. The loyalist movement that took to Nova Scotia so many Americans after the War of Independence carried with it John, the son of this stalwart continental. Thus it came about that Samuel Edison, son of John, was born at Digby, Nova Scotia in 1804. Seven years later, John Edison, who, as a Loyalist or United Empire emigrant, had become entitled under the laws of Canada to a grant of 600 acres of land, moved westward to take possession of this property. He made his way through the state of New York in wagons drawn by oxen to the remote and primitive township of Bayfield in Upper Canada on Lake Huron. Although the journey occurred in balmy June, it was necessarily attended with difficulty and privation. But the new home was situated in good farming country, and once again this interesting nomadic family settled down. John Edison moved from Bayfield to Vienna, Ontario, on the northern bank of Lake Erie. Mr. Edison supplies an interesting reminiscence of the old man and his environment in those early Canadian days. Quote, when I was five years old, I was taken by my father and mother on a visit to Vienna. We were driven by carriage from Milan, Ohio, to a railroad, then to a port on Lake Erie, thence by a canal boat in tow of several to Port Burwell in Canada across the lake, and from there we drove to Vienna a short distance away. I remember my grandfather perfectly as he appeared at 102 years of age when he died. In the middle of the day, he sat under a large tree in front of the house, facing a well-traveled road. 
His head was covered completely with a large quantity of very white hair, and he chewed tobacco incessantly, nodding to friends as they passed by. He used a very large cane and walked from the chair to the house, resenting any assistance. I viewed him from a distance and could never get very close to him. I remember some large pipes and especially a molasses jug, a trunk, and several other things that came from Holland. Close quote. John Edison was long-lived, like his father, and reached the ripe old age of 102, leaving his son Samuel charged with the care of the family destinies, but with no great burden of wealth. Little is known of the early manhood of this father of T. A. Edison until we find him keeping a hotel in Vienna, marrying a schoolteacher there, Miss Nancy Elliot, in 1828, and taking a lively share in the troublous politics of the time. He was six feet in height. Of great bodily vigor, and of such personal dominance of character that he became a captain of the insurgent forces rallying under the banners of Papineau and Mackenzie. The opening years of Queen Victoria's reign witnessed a belated effort in Canada to emphasize the principle that there should not be taxation without representation, and this descendant of those who had left the United States from disapproval of such a doctrine flung himself headlong into its support. It has been said of Earl Durham, who pacified Canada at this time and established the present system of government, that he made a country and marred a career. But the immediate measures of repression enforced before a liberal policy was adopted were sharp and severe, and Samuel Edison also found his own career marred on Canadian soil as one result of the Durham administration. Exile to Bermuda with other insurgents was not so attractive as the perils of a flight to the United States. A very hurried departure was effected in secret from the scene of trouble, and there are romantic traditions of this thrilling journey of 182 miles toward safety, made almost entirely without food or sleep through a wild country infested with Indians and unfriendly disposition. Thus was the Edison family repatriated by a picturesque political episode, and the great inventor given a birthplace on American soil, just as was Benjamin Franklin when his father came from England to Boston. Samuel Edison left behind him, however, in Canada, several brothers, all of whom lived to the age of ninety or more, and from whom there are descendants in the region. After some desultory wanderings for a year or two along the shores of Lake Erie, among the prosperous towns then springing up, the family, with its Canadian home forfeited, and in quest of another resting place, came to Milan, Ohio, in 1842. That pretty little village offered at the moment many attractions as a possible Chicago. The railroad system of Ohio was still in the future. But the Western Reserve had already become a vast wheat field, and huge quantities of grain from the central and northern counties sought shipment to eastern ports. The Huron River, emptying into Lake Erie, was navigable within a few miles of the village, and provided an admirable outlet. Large granaries were established, and proved so successful that local capital was tempted into the project of making a towpath canal from Lockwood Landing. All the way to Milan itself, the quaint old Moravian mission and Quondam Indian settlement of 100 inhabitants found itself of a sudden one of the great grain ports of the world, and bidding fair to rival Russian Odessa. A number of grain warehouses or primitive elevators were built along the bank of the canal, and the produce of the region poured in immediately, arriving in wagons drawn by four or six horses with loads of a hundred bushels. No fewer than six hundred wagons came clattering in, and as many as twenty sail vessels were loaded with thirty-five thousand bushels of grain during a single day. The canal was capable of being navigated by craft of from two hundred to two hundred and fifty tons burden, and the demand for such vessels soon led to the development of a brisk shipbuilding industry, for which the abundant forests of the region supply the necessary lumber. An evidence of the activity in this direction is furnished by the fact that six revenue cutters were launched at this port in these brisk days of its prime. Samuel Edison, versatile, buoyant of temper, and ever optimistic, would thus appear to have pitched his tent with shrewd judgment. There was plenty of occupation ready to his hand, and more than one enterprise received his attention. 
but he devoted his energies chiefly to the making of shingles, for which there was a large demand locally and along the lake. Canadian lumber was used principally in this industry. The wood was imported in bolts, or pieces three feet long. A bolt made two shingles. It was sawn asunder by hand, then split and shaved. None but first-class timber was used, and such shingles outlasted far those made by machinery with their cross-grain cut. A house in Milan, of which some of those shingles were put in 1844, was still in excellent condition 42 years later. Samuel Edison did well at this occupation, and employed several men, but there were other outlets from time to time for his business activity and speculative disposition. Edison's mother was an attractive and highly educated woman, whose influence upon his disposition and intellect has been profound and lasting. She was born in Shenango County, New York, in 1810, and was the daughter of the Reverend John Elliott, a Baptist minister and descendant of an old revolutionary soldier, Captain Ebenezer Elliott, of Scotch descent. The old captain was a fine and picturesque type. He fought all through the long War of Independence, seven years, and then appears to have settled down at Stonington, Connecticut. There, at any rate, he found his wife, Grandmother Elliot, who was Mercy Peckham, daughter of a Scotch Quaker. Then came the residence in New York State, with final removal to Vienna, for the old soldier, while drawing his pension at Buffalo, lived in the little Canadian town and there died, over one hundred years old. The family was evidently one of considerable culture and deep religious feeling, for two of Mrs. Edison's uncles and two brothers were also in the same Baptist ministry. As a young woman, she became a teacher in the public high school at Vienna, and thus met her husband who was residing there. The family never consisted of more than three children, two boys and a girl. A trace of the Canadian environment is seen in the fact that Edison's elder brother was named William Pitt, after the great English statesman. Both his brother and the sister exhibited considerable ability. William Pitt Edison, as a youth, was so clever with his pencil that it was proposed to send him to Paris as an art student. In later life, he was manager of the local street railway lines at Port Huron, Michigan, in which he was heavily interested. He also owned a good farm near that town, and during the ill health at the close of his life, when compelled to spend much of the time indoors, he devoted himself almost entirely to sketching. It has been noted by intimate observers of Thomas A. Edison that in discussing any project or new idea, his first impulse is to take up any piece of paper available and make drawings of it. His voluminous notebooks are a mass of sketches. Mrs. Tanny Edison Bailey, the sister, had, on the other hand, a great deal of literary ability and spent much of her time in writing. The great inventor, whose iron endurance and stern will have enabled him to wear down all his associates by work sustained through arduous days and sleepless nights, was not at all strong as a child, and was of fragile appearance. He had an abnormally large but well-shaped head, and it is said that the local doctors feared he might have brain trouble. In fact, on account of his assumed delicacy, he was not allowed to go to school for some years, and even when he did attend for a short time, the results were not encouraging, his mother being hotly indignant upon hearing that the teacher had spoken of him to an inspector as addled. The youth was, indeed, fortunate far beyond the ordinary in having a mother at once loving, well-informed, and ambitious, capable herself, from her experience as a teacher, of undertaking and giving him an education better than could be secured in the local schools of the day. Certain it is that under this simple regime, studious habits were formed and a taste for literature developed that have lasted to this day. If ever there was a man who tore the heart out of books, it is Edison, and what has once been read by him is never forgotten, if useful or worthy of submission to the test of experiment. But even thus early, the stronger love of mechanical processes and of probing natural forces manifested itself. Edison has said that he never saw a statement in any book as to such things that he did not involuntarily challenge and wish to demonstrate as either right or wrong. As a mere child, the busy scenes of the canal and the grain warehouses were of consuming interest, but the work in the shipbuilding yards 
had an irresistible fascination. His questions were so ceaseless and innumerable that the penetrating curiosity of an unusually strong mind was regarded as deficiency in powers of comprehension, and the father himself, a man of no mean ingenuity and ability, reports that the child, although capable of reducing him to exhaustion by endless inquiries, was often spoken of as rather wanting in ordinary acumen. This apparent dullness is, however, a quite common incident to youthful genius. The constructive tendencies of this child, of whom his father said once that he had never had any boyhood days in the ordinary sense, were early noted in his fondness for building little plank roads out of the debris of the yards and mills. His extraordinary retentive memory was shown in his easy acquisition of all the songs of the lumber gangs and canal men before he was five years old. One incident tells how he was found one day in the village square, copying laboriously the signs of the stores. A highly characteristic event at the age of six is described by his sister. He had noted a goose sitting on her eggs, and the result. One day soon after, he was missing. By and by, after an anxious search, his father found him sitting in a nest he had made in the barn, filled with goose eggs and hen's eggs he had collected, trying to hatch them out. One of Mr. Edison's most vivid recollections goes back to 1850, when as a child three or four years old, he saw camped in front of his home six covered wagons, prairie schooners, and witnessed their departure for California. The great excitement over the gold discoveries was thus felt in Milan, and these wagons, laden with all the worldly possessions of their owners, were watched out of sight on their long journey by this fascinated urchin, whose own discoveries in later years were to tempt many other argonauts into the auriferous realms of electricity. Another vivid memory of this period concerns his first realization of the grim mystery of death. He went off one day with the son of the wealthiest man in the town to bathe in the creek. Soon after they entered the water, the other boy disappeared. Young Edison waited around the spot for half an hour or more, and then, as it was growing dark, went home puzzled and lonely, but silent as to the occurrence. About two hours afterward, when the missing boy was being searched for, a man came to the Edison home to make anxious inquiry of the companion with whom he had last been seen. Edison told all the circumstances with a painful sense of being in some way implicated. The creek was at once dragged, and then the body was recovered. Edison had himself more than one narrow escape. Of course, he fell in the canal and was nearly drowned. Few boys in Milan worth their salt omitted that performance. On another occasion, he encountered a more novel peril by falling into a pile of wheat in a grain elevator and being almost smothered. Holding the end of a skate strap for another lad to shorten with an axe, he lost the tip of a finger. Fire also had its perils. He built a fire in a barn, but the flames spread so rapidly that, although he escaped himself, the barn was wholly destroyed, and he was publicly whipped in the village square as a warning to other youths. Equally well remembered is a dangerous encounter with a ram that attacked him while he was busily engaged digging out a bumblebee's nest near an orchard fence. The animal knocked him against the fence and was about to butt him again when he managed to drop over on the safe side and escape. He was badly hurt and bruised, and no small quantity of arnica was needed for his wounds. Meantime, little Milan had reached the zenith of its prosperity, and all of a sudden had been deprived of its flourishing grain trade by the new Columbus, Sandusky, and Hawking Railroad. In fact, the short canal was one of the last efforts of its kind in this country to compete with the new means of transportation. The bell of the locomotive was everywhere ringing the death knell of effective water haulage, with such dire results that in 1880, of the 4,468 miles of American freight canal that had cost $214 million, no fewer than 1,893 miles had been abandoned, and of the remaining 2,575 miles, quite a large proportion was not paying expenses. The short Milan Canal suffered with the rest, and today lies well-nigh obliterated, hidden in part by vegetable gardens, a mere grass-grown depression at the foot of the winding shallow valley. 
Other railroads also prevented any further competition by the canal, for a branch of the Wheeling and Lake Erie now passes through the village, while the lake shore in Michigan Southern runs a few miles to the south. The owners of the canal soon had occasion to regret that they had disdained the overtures of enterprising railroad promoters desirous of reaching the village, and the consequences of commercial isolation rapidly made themselves felt. It soon became evident to Samuel Edison and his wife that the cozy brick home on the bluff must be given up, and the struggle with fortune resumed elsewhere. They were well to do, however, and removing in 1854 to Port Huron, Michigan. Occupied a large colonial house standing in the middle of an old government fort reservation of ten acres, overlooking the wide expanse of the St. Clair River just after it leaves Lake Huron. It was in many ways an ideal homestead toward which the family has always felt the strongest attachment, but the association with Milan has never wholly ceased. The old house in which Edison was born is still occupied in 1910 by Mr. S. O. Edison. A half brother of Edison's father, and a man of marked inventive ability, he was once prominent in the iron furnace industry of Ohio, and was for a time associated in the iron trade with the father of the late President McKinley. Among his inventions may be mentioned a machine for making fuel from wheat straw and a smoke-consuming device. This birthplace of Edison remains the plain, substantial little brick house it was originally. One storied, with rooms finished on the attic floor, being built on the hillside, its basement opens into the rear yard. It was at first heated by means of open coal grates, which may not have been altogether adequate in severe winters, owing to the altitude and the northeastern exposure. But a large furnace is one of the more modern changes. Milan itself is not materially unlike the smaller Ohio towns of its own time or those of later creation. But the venerable appearance of the big elm trees that fringe the trim lawns tells of its age. It is indeed an extremely neat, snug little place with well-kept homes, mostly of frame construction, and flagged streets crossing each other at right angles. There are no poor; at least everybody is apparently well-to-do. While the leisurely atmosphere pervades the town, few idlers are seen. Some of the residents are engaged in local business. Some are occupied in farming and grape culture; others are employed in the ironworks nearby at Norwalk. The stores and places of public resort are gathered about the square, where there is plenty of room for hitching when the Saturday trading is done at that point. At which periods the fitful bustle recalls the old wheat days when young Edison ran with curiosity among the six and eight horse teams that had brought in grain. This square is still covered with fine primeval forest trees, and has at its center a handsome soldier's monument of the Civil War, to which four paved walks converge. It is an altogether pleasant and unpretentious town, which cherishes with no small amount of pride its association with the name of Thomas Alva Edison. In view of Edison's Dutch descent, it is rather singular to find him with the name of Alva. For the Spanish Duke of Alva was notoriously the worst tyrant ever known to the Low Countries, and his evil deeds occupy many stirring pages in Motley's famous history. As a matter of fact, Edison was named after Captain Alva Bradley, an old friend of his father and a celebrated shipowner on the lakes. Captain Bradley died a few years ago in wealth, while his old associate, with equal ability for making money, was never able long to keep it. Differing again from the revolutionary New York banker, from whom his son's other name, Thomas, was taken. End of chapter two. Chapter three of Edison. His life and inventions. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Alana Jordan. Edison: His Life and Inventions by Frank Lewis Dyer and Thomas Comerford Martin. Chapter Three: Boyhood at Port Huron, Michigan. 
The new home found by the Edison family at Port Huron, where Alva spent his brief boyhood before he became a telegraph operator and roamed the whole Middle West of that period, was unfortunately destroyed by fire just after the close of the Civil War. A smaller, but perhaps more comfortable home, was then built by Edison's father on some property he had bought by the nearby village of Gratiot, and there his mother spent the remainder of her life in confirmed invalidism, dying in 1871. Hence the pictures and postal cards, sold largely to souvenir hunters, as the poor Huron home, do not actually show that in or around which the events now referred to took place. It has been a romance of popular biographers, based upon the fact that Edison began his career as a newsboy, to assume that these earlier years were spent in poverty and privation, as indeed they usually are by the newsies, who swarm and shout their papers in our large cities. While it seems a pity to destroy this erroneous idea, suggestive of a heroic climb from the depths to the heights, nothing could be further from the truth. Socially, the Edison family stood high in Port Huron at a time when there was relatively more wealth and general activity than today. The town in its pristine prime was a great lumber center, and hummed with the industry of numerous sawmills. An incredible quantity of lumber was made there yearly until the forests nearby vanished and the industry with them. The wealth of the community invested largely in this business and in allied transportation companies was accumulated rapidly and is freely spent during those days of prosperity in St. Clair County bringing with it a high standard of domestic comfort. In all this, the Edison shared on equal terms. Thus, contrary to the stories that have been so widely published, the Edisons, while not rich by any means, were in comfortable circumstances, with a well-stocked farm and large orchard to draw upon, also for sustenance. Samuel Edison, on moving to Port Huron, became a dealer in grain and feed, and gave attention to that business for many years. But he was also active in the lumber industry, in the Saginaw district, and several other things. It was difficult for a man of such mercurial, restless temperament to stay constant to any one occupation. In fact, had he been less visionary, he would have been more prosperous but might not have had a son so gifted with insight and imagination. One instance of the optimistic vagaries, which led him incessantly to spend time and money on projects that would not have appealed to a man less sanguine, was the construction on his property of a wooden observation tower over a hundred feet high, the top of which was reached toilsomely by winding stairs after the payment of 25 cents. It is true that the tower commanded a pretty view by land and water, but Colonel Sellers himself might have projected this enterprise as a possible source of steady income. At first, few visitors panted up the long flights of steps to the breezy platform. During the first two months, Edison's father took in three dollars and felt extremely blue over the prospect and to young Edison and his relatives were left the lonely pleasures of the lookout and the enjoyment of the telescope with which it was equipped. But one fine day there came an excursion from an island town to see the lake. They picnicked in the grove, and six hundred of them went up to the tower. After that, the railroad company began to advertise these excursions, and the receipts each year paid for the observatory. It might be thought that, immersed in business and preoccupied with schemes of this character, Mr. Edison was to blame for the neglect of his son's education. But that was not the case. The conditions were peculiar. 
It was at the Port Huron Public School that Edison received all the regular scholastic instruction he ever enjoyed, just three months. He might have spent the full term there, but, as already noted, his teacher had found him addled. He was always, according to his own recollection, at the foot of the class, and had come almost to regard himself as a dunce, while his father entertained vague anxieties as to his stupidity. The truth of the matter seems to be that Mrs. Edison, a teacher of uncommon ability and force, held no very high opinion of the average public school methods and results, and was both eager to undertake the instruction of her son, and ambitious for the future of a boy, whom she knew, from a pedagogic experience, to be receptive and thoughtful to a very unusual degree. With her he found study easy and pleasant, the quality of culture in that simple but refined home, as well as the intellectual character of his youth without schooling, may be inferred from the fact that before he had reached the age of twelve, he had read, with his mother's help, Gibbon's Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Hume's History of England, Sears' History of the World, Burton's Anatomy of Melancholy, and the Dictionary of Sciences, and had even attempted to struggle through Newton's Principia, whose mathematics were decidedly beyond both teacher and student. Besides, Edison, like Faraday, was never a mathematician, and has had little personal use for arithmetic beyond that which is called mental. He said once to a friend, I can always hire some mathematicians, but they can't hire me. His father, by the way, always encouraged these literary tastes, and paid him a small sum for each new book mastered. It will be noted that fiction makes no showing in the list, but it was not altogether excluded from the home library, and Edison has all his life enjoyed it, particularly the works of such writers as Victor Hugo, after whom, because of his enthusiastic admiration, possibly also because of his imagination, he was nicknamed by his fellow operators Victor Hugo Edison. Electricity at that moment could have no allure for a youthful mind. Crude telegraphy represented what was known of it practically. And about that the books read by young Edison were not redundantly informational. Even had that not been so, the inclinations of the boy barely ten years old were toward chemistry, and fifty years later there is seen no change of predilection. It sounds like heresy to say that Edison became an electrician by chance, but it is the sober fact that to this preeminent and brilliant leader in electrical achievement, escape into the chemical domain still has the aspect of a delightful truant holiday. One of the earliest stories about his boyhood relates to the incident when he induced a lad employed in the family to swallow a large quantity of Sedlitz powders in the belief that the gases generated would enable him to fly. The agonies of the victim attracted attention, and Edison's mother marked her displeasure by an application of the switch kept behind the old Seth Thomas grandfather clock. The disastrous result of this experiment did not discourage Edison at all, and he attributed failure to the lad rather than to the motive power. In the cellar of the Edison homestead, young Alva soon accumulated a chemical outfit, constituting the first in a long series of laboratories. The word laboratory had always been associated with alchemists in the past, but as with filament... This untutored stripling applied an iconoclastic practicability to it long before he realized the significance of the new departure. Goethe, in his Legend of Faust, shows the traditional or conventional philosopher in his laboratory, an aged, tottering, gray-bearded investigator, who only becomes youthful upon diabolical intervention, and would stay senile without it. In the Edison laboratory, no such weird transformation has been necessary, for the philosopher had youth, fiery energy, and a grimly practical determination that would submit to no denial of the goal 
of something of real benefit to mankind. Edison and Faust are indeed the extremes of philosophic thought and accomplishment. The home at Port Huron thus saw the first Edison laboratory. The boy began experimenting when he was about ten or eleven years of age. He got a copy of Parker's School Philosophy, an elementary book on physics, and about every experiment in it he tried. Young Alva, or Al as he was called, thus early displayed his great passion for chemistry, and in the cellar of the house he collected no fewer than two hundred bottles gleaned in baskets from all parts of the town. These were arranged carefully on shelves and all labeled poison so that no one else would handle or disturb them. They contained the chemicals with which he was constantly experimenting. To others this diversion was both mysterious and meaningless, but he had soon become familiar with all the chemicals obtainable at the local drug stores, and had tested to his satisfaction many of the statements encountered in his scientific reading. Edison has said that sometimes he has wondered how it was he did not become an analytical chemist instead of concentrating on electricity, for which he had at first no great inclination. Deprived of the use of a large part of her cellar, tiring of the mess always to be found there, and somewhat fearful of results, his mother once told the boy to clear everything out and restore order. The thought of losing all his possessions was the cause of so much ardent distress that his mother relented, but insisted that he must get a lock and key and keep the embryonic laboratory closed up all the time except when he was there. This was done. From such work came an early familiarity with the nature of electrical batteries and the production of current from them. Apparently the greater part of his spare time was spent in the cellar, for he did not share to any extent in the sports of the boys of the neighborhood, his chum and chief companion, Michael Oates, being a lad of Dutch origin many years older, who did chores around the house, and who could be recruited as a general utility Friday for the experiments of this young explorer, such as that with the Sedlitz powders. Such pursuits as these consumed the scant pocket money of the boy very rapidly. He was not in regular attendance at school, and had read all the books within reach. It was thus he turned newsboy, overcoming the reluctance of his parents, particularly that of his mother, by pointing out that he could by this means earn all he wanted for his experiments and get fresh reading in the shape of papers and magazines free of charge. Besides, his leisure hours in Detroit he would be able to spend at the public library. He applied in 1859 for the privilege of selling newspapers on the trains of the Grand Trunk Railroad between Port Huron and Detroit, and obtained the concession after a short delay during which he made an essay in his task of selling newspapers. Edison had, as a fact, already had some commercial experience from the age of eleven. The ten acres of the reservation offered an excellent opportunity for truck farming, and the versatile head of the family could not avoid trying his luck in this branch of work. A large market garden was laid out, in which Edison worked pretty steadily with the help of the Dutch boy Michael Oates, he of the flying experiment. These boys had a horse and small wagon entrusted to them, and every morning in the season they would load up with onions, lettuce, peas, etc., and go through the town. As much as six hundred dollars was turned over to Mrs. Edison in one year from this source. The boy was indefatigable, but not altogether charmed with agriculture. After a while I tired of this work, as hoeing corn in a hot sun is unattractive, and I did not wonder that it had built up cities. Soon the Grand Trunk Railroad was extended from Toronto to Port Huron, at the foot of Lake Huron, and thence to Detroit, at about the same time the War of the Rebellion broke out. By a great amount of persistence 
I got permission from my mother to go on the local train as a newsboy. The local train from Port Huron to Detroit, a distance of 63 miles, left at 7 a.m. and arrived again at 9.30 p.m. After being on the train for several months, I started two stores in Port Huron, one for periodicals and the other for vegetables, butter, and berries in the season. These were attended by two boys who shared in the profits. The periodical store I soon closed, as the boy in charge could not be trusted. The vegetable store I kept up for nearly a year. After the railroad had been opened a short time, they put on an express which left Detroit in the morning and returned in the evening. I received permission to put a newsboy on this train. Connected with this train was a car, one part for baggage and the other part for U.S. mail, but for a long time it was not used. Every morning I had two large baskets of vegetables from the Detroit market loaded in the mail car and sent to Port Huron, where the boy would take them to the store. They were much better than those grown locally and sold readily. I never was asked to pay freight, and to this day cannot explain why, except that I was so small and industrious, and the nerve to appropriate a U.S. mail cart to do a free freight business was so monumental. However, I kept this up for a long time, and in addition bought butter from the farmers along the line, and an immense amount of blackberries in the season. I bought wholesale, and at a low price, and permitted the wives of the engineers and trainmen to have the benefit of the discount. After a while, there was a daily immigrant train put on. This train generally had from seven to ten coaches filled always with Norwegians, all bound for Iowa and Minnesota. On these trains, I employed a boy who sold bread, tobacco, and stick candy. As the war progressed, the daily newspaper sales became very profitable and I gave up the vegetable store. The hours of this occupation were long, but the work was not particularly heavy, and Edison soon found opportunity for his favorite avocation, chemical experimentation. His train left Port Huron at 7 a.m. and made its southward trip to Detroit in about three hours. This gave a stay in that city from 10 a.m., until the late afternoon when the train left, arriving at Port Huron about 9.30 p.m. The train was made up of three coaches, baggage, smoking, and ordinary passenger, or ladies. The baggage car was divided into three compartments, one for trunks and packages, one for mail, and one for smoking. In those days, no use was made of the smoking compartment as there was no ventilation, and it was turned over to young Edison, who not only kept papers there and his stock of goods as a candy butcher, but soon had it equipped with an extraordinary variety of apparatus. There was plenty of leisure on the two daily runs, even for an industrious boy, and thus he found time to transfer his laboratory from the cellar and re-establish it on the train. His earnings were also excellent, so good, in fact, that eight or ten dollars a day were often taken in, and one dollar went every day to his mother. Thus supporting himself, he felt entitled to spend any other profit left over on chemicals and apparatus. And spent it was, for with access to Detroit and its large stores, where he bought his supplies, and to the public library, where he could quench his thirst for technical information, Edison gave up all his spare time and money to chemistry. Surely the country could have presented at that moment no more striking example of the passionate pursuit of knowledge under difficulties than this newsboy, barely fourteen years of age, with his jars and test tubes installed on a railway baggage car. Nor did this amazing equipment stop at batteries and bottles. The same little space, a few feet square, was soon converted by this precocious youth into a newspaper office. The outbreak of the Civil War gave a great stimulus to the demand for all newspapers, 
noticing which he became ambitious to publish a local journal of his own, devoted to the news of that section of the Grand Trunk Road. A small printing press that had been used for hotel bills of fare was picked up in Detroit, and type was also bought, some of it being placed on the train so that composition could go on in spells of leisure. To one so mechanical in his taste as Edison, it was quite easy to learn the rudiments of the printing art, and thus the weekly herald came into existence, of which he was compositor, pressman, editor, publisher, and news dealer. Only one or two copies of this journal are now discoverable, but its appearance can be judged from the reduced facsimile here shown. The thing was indeed well done as the work of a youth shown by the date to be less than fifteen years old. The literary style is good, there are only a few trivial slips in spelling, and the appreciation is keen of what would be interesting news and gossip. The price was three cents a copy, or eight cents a month for regular subscribers, and the circulation ran up to over four hundred copies an issue. This was by no means the result of mere public curiosity, but attested the value of the sheet as a genuine newspaper, to which many persons in the railroad service along the line were willing contributors. Indeed, with the aid of the railway telegraph, Edison was often able to print late news of importance, of local origin, that the distant regular papers, like those of Detroit, which he handled as a newsboy, could not get. It is no wonder that this clever little sheet received the approval and patronage of the English engineer Stevenson when inspecting the Grand Trunk system, and was noted by no less distinguished a contemporary than the London Times as the first newspaper in the world to be printed on a train in motion. The youthful proprietor sometimes cleared as much as twenty to thirty dollars a month from this unique journalistic enterprise. But all this extra work required attention, and Edison solved the difficulty of attending also to the newsboy business by the employment of a young friend whom he trained and treated liberally as an understudy. There was often plenty of work for both in the early days of the war, when the news of battle caused intense excitement and large sales of papers. Edison, with native shrewdness already so strikingly displayed, would telegraph the station agents and get them to bulletin the event of the day at the front, so that when each station was reached there were eager purchasers waiting. He recalls in particular the sensation caused by the great battle of Shiloh, or Pittsburgh Landing, in April 1862, in which both Grant and Sherman were engaged, in which Johnston died, and in which there was a ghastly total of 25,000 killed and wounded. In describing his enterprising action that day, Edison says that when he reached Detroit, the bulletin boards of the newspaper offices were surrounded with dense crowds, which read awe-stricken the news that there were 60,000 killed and wounded, and that the result was uncertain. I knew that if the same excitement was attained at the small towns turned along the road, and especially at Port Huron, the sale of papers would be great. I then conceived the idea of telegraphing the news ahead, went to the operator in the depot, and by giving him Harper's Weekly and some other papers for three months, he agreed to telegraph to all the stations the matter on the bulletin board. I hurriedly copied it, and he sent it, requesting the agents to display it on the blackboards used for stating the arrival and departure of trains. I decided that instead of the usual one hundred papers, I could sell one thousand, but not having sufficient money to purchase that number, I determined in my desperation to see the editor himself and get credit. The great paper at that time was the Detroit Free Press. I walked into the office marked editorial and told a young man that I wanted to see the editor on important business, important to me anyway. I was taken into an office where there were two men, and I stated what I had done about telegraphing. 
and that I needed a thousand papers, but only had money for three hundred, and I wanted credit. One of the men refused it, but the other told the first spokesman to let me have them. This man, I afterward learned, was Wilbur F. Story, who subsequently founded the Chicago Times and became celebrated in the newspaper world. By the aid of another boy, I lugged the papers to the train and started folding them. The first station, called Utica, was a small one where I generally sold two papers. I saw a crowd ahead on the platform, and I thought it some excursion. But the moment I landed, there was a rush for me, and I realized that the telegraph was a great invention. I sold thirty-five papers there. The next station was Mount Clemens, now a watering place, but then a town of about one thousand. I usually sold six to eight papers there. I decided that if I found a corresponding crowd there, the only thing to do to correct my lack of judgment and not getting more papers was to raise the price from five cents to ten. The crowd was there, and I raised the price. At the various towns there were corresponding crowds. It had been my practice at Port Huron to jump from the train at a point about one-fourth of a mile from the station, where the train generally slackens speed. I had drawn several loads of sand to this point to jump on, and had become quite expert. The little Dutch boy with the horse met me at this point. When the wagon approached the outskirts of the town, I was met by a large crowd. I then yelled, Twenty-five cents apiece, gentlemen. I haven't enough to go around. I sold all out and made what to me was then an immense sum of money. Such episodes as this added materially to his income, but did not necessarily increase his savings, for he was then, as now, an utter spendthrift, so long as some new apparatus or supplies for experiment could be had. In fact, the laboratory on wheels soon became crowded with such equipment most costly chemicals were bought on the installment plan, and Fresenius's qualitative analysis served as a basis for ceaseless testing and study. George Pullman, who then had a small shop at Detroit and was working on his sleeping car, made Edison a lot of wooden apparatus for his chemicals, to the boy's delight. Unfortunately, a sudden change came, fraught with disaster. The train, running one day at thirty miles an hour over a piece of poorly laid track, was thrown suddenly out of the perpendicular with a violent lurch, and before Edison could catch it, a stick of phosphorus was jarred from its shelf, fell to the floor, and burst into flame. The car took fire, and the boy, in dismay, was still trying to quench the blaze when a conductor, a quick-tempered Scotchman, who acted also as a baggage master, hastened to the scene with water and saved his car. On the arrival at Mount Clemens Station, its next stop, Edison and his entire outfit, laboratory, printing plant, and all, were promptly ejected by the enraged conductor, and the train then moved off, leaving him on the platform, tearful and indignant in the midst of his beloved but ruined possessions. It was lynch law of a kind, but in view of the responsibility, this action of the conductor lay well within his rights and duties. It was through this incident that Edison acquired the deafness that has persisted all through his life. A severe box on the ears from the scorched and angry conductor being the direct cause of the infirmity. Although this deafness would be regarded as a great affliction by most people, and has brought in its train other serious bubbles, Mr. Edison has always regarded it philosophically, and said about it recently, This deafness has been a great advantage to me in various ways. When in a telegraph office, I could only hear the instrument directly on the table at which I sat and unlike the other operators, I was not bothered by the other instruments. Again, in experimenting on the telephone, I had to improve the transmitter so I could hear it. This made the telephone commercial, as the magnetotelephone receiver of Bell was too weak to be used as a transmitter commercially. It was the same with the phonograph. 
the great defect of that instrument was the rendering of the overtones in music and the hissing consonants in speech. I worked over one year, twenty hours a day, Sundays and all, to get the word specie perfectly recorded and reproduced on the phonograph. When this was done, I knew that everything else could be done, which was a fact. Again, my nerves have been preserved intact. Broadway is as quiet to me as a country village is to a person with normal hearing. Saddened but not wholly discouraged, Edison soon reconstituted his laboratory and printing office at home. Although on the part of the family there was some fear and objection after this episode on the score of fire, but Edison promised not to bring in anything of a dangerous nature. He did not cease the publication of the Weekly Herald. On the contrary, he prospered in both his enterprises until persuaded by the printer's devil in the office of the Port Huron Commercial to change the character of his journal, enlarge it, and issue it under the name of Paul Pry, a happy designation for this or kindred ventures in the domain of society journalism. No copies of Paul Pry can now be found, but it is known that its style was distinctly personal, that gossip was its specialty, and that no small offense was given to the people whose peculiarities or peccadilloes were discussed in a frank and breezy style by the two boys. In one instant, the resentment of the victim of such onslaught publicity was so intense he laid hands on Edison and pitched the startled young editor into the St. Clair River. The name of this violator of the freedom of the press was thereafter excluded studiously from the columns of Paul Pry, and the incident may have been one of those which soon caused the abandonment of the paper. Edison had great zest in this work, and but for the strong influences in other directions would probably have continued in the newspaper field, in which he was, beyond question, the youngest publisher and editor of the day. Before leaving this period of his career, it is to be noted that it gave Edison many favorable opportunities. In Detroit, he could spend frequent hours in the public library, and it is matter of record that he began his liberal acquaintance with its contents by grappling bravely with a certain section and trying to read it through consecutively, shelf by shelf, regardless of subject. In a way, this is curiously suggestive of the earnest, energetic method of frontal attack with which the inventor has since addressed himself to so many problems in the arts and sciences. The Grand Trunk Railroad machine shops at Port Huron were a great attraction to the boy, who appears to have spent a good deal of his time there. He, who was to have much to do with the evolution of the modern electric locomotive, was fascinated by the mechanism of the steam locomotive, and whenever he could get the chance, Edison rode in the cab with the engineer of his train. He became thoroughly familiar with the intricacies of firebox, boiler, valves, levers, and gears, and liked nothing better than to handle the locomotive himself during the run. On one trip, when the engineer lay asleep while his eager substitute piloted the train, the boiler primed, and a deluge overwhelmed the young driver, who stuck to his post till the run and the ordeal were ended. Possibly this helped to spoil a locomotive engineer, but went to make a great master of the new motive power. Steam is half an Englishman, said Emerson. The temptation is strong to say that workaday electricity is half an American. Edison's own account of the incident is very laughable. The engine was one of a number leased to the Grand Trunk by the Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy. It had bright brass bands all over, the woodwork beautifully painted, and everything highly polished, which was the custom up to the time old Commodore Vanderbilt stopped it on his roads. After running about fifteen miles, the fireman couldn't keep his eyes open. This event followed an all-night dance of the trainman's fraternal organization, and he agreed to permit me to run the engine. I took charge, reducing the speed to about twelve miles an hour, and brought the train of seven cars to her destination 
at the Grand Trunk Junction safely. But something occurred which was very much out of the ordinary. I was very much worried about the water, and I knew that if it got low the boiler was likely to explode. I hadn't gone twenty miles before the black damp mud blew out of the stack and covered every part of the engine, including myself. I was about to awaken the fireman to find out the cause of this when it stopped. Then I approached a station, where the fireman always went out to the cow-catcher, opened up the oil cup on the steam chest, and poured oil in. I started to carry out the procedure when, upon opening the oil cup, the steam rushed out with a tremendous noise, nearly knocking me off the engine. I succeeded in closing the oil cup, and got back in the cab, and made up my mind that she would pull through without oil. I learned afterward that the engineer always shut off steam when the fireman went out to oil. This point I failed to notice. My powers of observation were very much improved after this occurrence. Just before I reached the junction, another outpour of black mud occurred, and the whole engine was a sight, so much that when I pulled into the yard, everybody turned to see it, laughing immoderately. I found the reason of the mud was that I carried so much water it passed over into the stack, and this washed out all the accumulated soot. One afternoon, about a week before Christmas, Edison's train jumped the track near Utica, a station on the line. Four old Michigan Central cars with rotten sills collapsed in the ditch and went all to pieces, distributing figs, raisins, dates, and candies all over the track and the vicinity. Hating to see so much waste, Edison tried to save all he could by eating it on the spot, but as a result... Our family doctor had the time of his life with me in this connection. An absurd incident described by Edison throws a vivid light on the free and easy condition of early railroad travel and on the southern extravagance of the time. In 1860, just before the war broke out, there came to the train one afternoon in Detroit two fine-looking young men accompanied by a colored servant. They bought tickets for Port Huron, the terminal point for the train. After leaving the junction just outside of Detroit, I brought in the evening papers. When I came opposite to the young man, one of them said, Boy, what have you got? I said, Papers. All right. He took them and threw them out the window, and turning to the colored man said, Nicodemus, pay this boy. I told Nicodemus the amount, and he opened a satchel and paid me. The passengers didn't know what to make of the transaction. I returned with the illustrated papers and magazines. These were seized and thrown out of the window, and I was told to get my money of Nicodemus. I then returned with all the old magazines and novels I had not been able to sell, thinking perhaps this would be too much for them. I was small and thin, and the layer reached above my head, and was all I could possibly carry. I had prepared a list, and knew the amount in case they bit again. When I opened the door, all the passengers roared with laughter. I walked right up to the young men. One asked me what I had. I said, magazines and novels. He promptly threw them out of the window, and Nicodemus settled. Then I came in with cracked hickory nuts, then popcorn balls, and finally molasses candy. All went out of the window. I felt like Alexander the Great. I had no more chance. I had sold all I had. Finally, I put a rope to my trunk, which is about the size of a carpenter's chest, and started to pull this from the baggage car to the passenger car. It was almost too much for my strength, but at last I got in front of those men. I pulled off my coat, shoes, and hat, and laid them on the chest. Then he asked, What have you got, boy? I said, Everything, sir, that I can spare that is for sale. The passengers fairly jumped with laughter. Nicodemus paid me $27 for this last sale and threw the hole out of the door in the rear of the car. These men were from the South, and I have always retained a soft spot in my heart for a Southern gentleman. While Edison was a newsboy on the train, a request came to him one day to go to the office of E.B. Ward and Company, at that time the largest owners of steamboats on the Great Lakes. 
The captain of their largest boat had died suddenly, and they wanted a message taken to another captain who lived about fourteen miles from Ridgeway Station on the railroad. This captain had retired, taken up some lumber land, and had cleared part of it. Edison was offered fifteen dollars by Mr. Ward to go and fetch him, but it was a wild country and would be dark. Edison stood out for twenty-five, so that he could get the companionship of another lad. The terms were agreed to. Edison arrived at Ridgeway at 8.30 p.m., when it was raining and as dark as ink. Getting another boy with difficulty to volunteer, he launched out on his errand in the pitch-black night. The two boys carried lanterns, but the road was a rough path through dense forest. The country was wild, and it was a usual occurrence to see deer, bear, and coon skins nailed up on the sides of houses to dry. Edison had read about bears, but couldn't remember whether they were day or night prowlers. The farther they went, the more apprehensive they became, and every stump in the ravished forage looked like a bear. The other lad proposed seeking safety up a tree, but Edison demurred on the plea that bears could climb, and that the message must be delivered that night to enable the captain to catch the morning train. First one lantern went out, then the other. We leaned up against a tree and cried. I thought if I ever got out of that scrape alive, I would know more about the habits of animals and everything else, and be prepared for all kinds of mischance when I undertook an enterprise. However, the intense darkness dilated the pupils of our eyes so as to make them very sensitive, and we could just see at times the outlines of the road. Finally, just as a faint gleam of daylight arrived, we entered the captain's yard and delivered the message. In my whole life, I never spent such a night of horror as this, but I got a good lesson. An amusing incident of this period is told by Edison. When I was a boy, he says, the Prince of Wales, the late King Edward, came to Canada, 1860. Great preparations were made at Sarnia, the Canadian town opposite Port Huron. About every boy, including myself, went over to see the affair. The town was draped in flags most profusely, and carpets were laid on the crosswalks for the prince to walk on. There were arches, etc. A stand was built raised above the general level where the prince was to be received by the mayor. Seeing all these preparations, my idea of a prince was very high. But when he did arrive, I mistook the Duke of Newcastle for him, the Duke being a fine-looking man. I soon saw that I was mistaken, that the prince was a young stripling, and did not meet expectations. Several of us expressed our belief that a prince wasn't much, after all, and said that we were thoroughly disappointed. For this one boy was whipped. Soon the Canuck boys attacked the Yankee boys, and we were all badly licked. I myself got a black eye. That has always prejudiced me against that kind of ceremonial and folly. It is certainly interesting to note that in later years the prince for whom Edison endured the ignominy of a black eye made generous compensation in a graceful letter accompanying the Gold Albert Medal awarded by the Royal Society of Arts. Another incident of the period is as follows. After selling papers in Port Huron, which was often not reached until about 9.30 at night, I seldom got home before 11 or 11.30. About halfway home from the station in the town, and within 25 feet of the road in a dense wood, was a soldier's graveyard, where 300 soldiers were buried due to a cholera epidemic which took place at Fort Gratiot nearby many years previously. At first we used to shut our eyes and run the horse past this graveyard, and if the horse stepped on a twig, my heart would give a violent movement, and it is a wonder that I haven't some valvular disease of that organ. But soon this running of the horse became monotonous, and after a while all fears of graveyards absolutely disappeared from my system. I was in the condition of Sam Houston, the pioneer and founder of Texas, who, it was said, knew no fear. Houston lived some distance from the town and generally went home late at night, 
having to pass through a dark cypress swamp over a corduroy road. One night, to test his alleged fearlessness, a man stationed himself behind a tree and enveloped himself in a sheet. He confronted Houston suddenly, and Sam stopped and said, If you are a man, you can't hurt me. If you are a ghost, you don't want to hurt me. And if you are the devil, come home with me. I married your sister. It is not to be inferred, however, from some of the preceding statements, that the boy was of an exclusively studious bent of mind. He had then, as now, the keen enjoyment of a joke, and no particular aversion to the practical form. An incident of the time is in point. After breaking out of the war, there was a regiment of volunteer soldiers quartered at Fort Gratiot, the reservation extending to the boundary line of our house. Nearly every night we would hear a call, such as, Corporal of the Guard Number 1. This would be repeated from sentry to sentry until it reached the barracks, when Corporal of the Guard Number 1 would come and see what was wanted. I and the little Dutch boy, after returning from the town after selling our papers, thought we would take a hand at military affairs. So one night, when it was very dark, I shouted for Corporal of the Guard Number 1. The second sentry, thinking it was the terminal sentry who shouted, repeated it to the third, and so on. This brought the corporal along the half-mile, only to find that he was fooled. We tried him three nights, but on the third night they were watching, and caught the little Dutch boy, took him to the lock-up at the fort, and shut him up. They chased me to the house. I rushed for the cellar. In one small apartment there were two barrels of potatoes, and a third one nearly empty. I poured these remnants into the other barrels, sat down, and pulled the barrel over my head, bottom up. The soldiers had awakened my father, and they were searching for me with candles and lanterns. The corporal was absolutely certain I came into the cellar, and couldn't see how I could have gotten out, and wanted to know from my father if there was no secret hiding place. On the assurance of my father, who said that there was not, he said it was most extraordinary. I was glad when they left, as I was cramped, and the potatoes were rotten that had been in the barrel, and violently offensive. The next morning I was found in bed, and received a good switching on the legs from my father, the first and only one I ever received from him, although my mother kept a switch behind the old Seth Thomas clock that had the bark worn off. My mother's ideas and mine differed at times, especially when I got experimenting and mussed up things. The Dutch boy was released next morning. End of chapter 3 Recording by Ele Chapter 4 of Edison, His Life and Inventions This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jude Cater Edison, His Life and Inventions By Frank Lewis Dyer and Thomas Comerford Martin Chapter 4 The Young Telegraph Operator While a newsboy on the railroad, says Edison, I got very much interested in electricity, probably from visiting telegraph offices with a chum who had tastes similar to mine. It will also have been noted that he used the telegraph to get items for his little journal and to bulletin his special news of the Civil War along the line. The next step was natural, and having with his knowledge of chemistry no trouble about setting up his batteries, the difficulties of securing apparatus were chiefly those connected with the circuits and the instruments. American youths today are given, if of a mechanical turn of mind, to amateur telegraphy or telephony, 
but seldom, if ever, have to make any part of the system constructed. In Edison's boyish days it was quite different, and telegraphic supplies were hard to obtain. But he and his chum had a line between their homes built of common stovepipe wire. The insulators were bottles set on nails driven into trees and short poles. The magnet wire was wound with rags for insulation, and pieces of spring brass were used for keys. With an idea of securing current cheaply, Edison applied the little that he knew about static electricity, and actually experimented with cats, which he treated vigorously as frictional machines until the animals fled in dismay. And Edison had learned his first great lesson in the relative value of sources of electrical energy. The line was made to work, however, and additional to the messages that the boys interchanged, Edison secured practice in an ingenious manner. His father insisted on 11.30 as proper bedtime, which left but a short interval after the long day on the train. But each evening, when the boy went home with a bundle of papers that had not been sold in the town, his father would sit up reading the returnables. Edison, therefore, on some excuse, left the papers with his friend, but suggested that he could get the news from him by telegraph, bit by bit. The scheme interested his father and was put into effect, the messages being written down and handed over for perusal. This yielded good practice nightly, lasting until twelve and one o'clock, and was maintained for some time until Mr. Edison became willing that his son should stay up for a reasonable time. The papers were then brought home again, and the boys amused themselves to their heart's content until the line was pulled down by a stray cow wandering through the orchard. Meantime, better instruments had been secured, and the rudiments of telegraphy had been fairly mastered. The mixed train on which Edison was employed as newsboy did the way freight work in shunting at the Mount Clemens station, about half an hour being usually spent in the work. One August morning in 1862, while the shunting was in progress and a laden boxcar had been pushed out of a siding, Edison, who was loitering about the platform, saw the little son of the station agent, Mr. J. U. McKenzie, playing with the gravel on the main track along which the car without a brakeman was rapidly approaching. Edison dropped his papers in his glazed cap and made a dash for the child, whom he picked up and lifted to safety without a second to spare, as the wheel of the car struck his heel, and both were cut about the face and hands by the gravel ballast on which they fell. The two boys were picked up by the train hands and carried to the platform, and the grateful father at once offered to teach the rescuer, whom he knew and liked, the art of train telegraphy, and to make an operator of him. It is needless to say that the proposal was eagerly accepted. Edison found time for his new studies by letting one of his friends look after the newsboy work on the train for part of the trip, reserving to himself the run between Port Huron and Mount Clemens. That he was already well qualified as a beginner is evident from the fact that he had mastered the Morse code of the telegraphic alphabet and was able to take to the station a neat little set of instruments he had just finished with his own hands at a gun shop in Detroit. This was probably a unique achievement in itself among railway operators of that day or of later times. The drill of the student involved chiefly the acquisition of the special signals employed in railway work, including the numerals and abbreviations applied to save time. Some of these have passed into the slang of the day, 73 being well known as the telegrapher's expression of compliments or good wishes, while 23 is an accident or death message, and has been given broader popular significance as a general synonym for hoodoo. All of this came easily to Edison, who had, moreover, as his herald showed, an unusual familiarity with train movement along that portion of the Grand Trunk Road. Three or four months were spent pleasantly and profitably by the youth in this course of study, and Edison took to it enthusiastically, giving it no less than eighteen hours a day. He then put up a little telegraph line from the station to the village, 
a distance of about a mile, and opened an office in a drug store. But the business was naturally very small. The telegraph operator at Port Huron, knowing of his proficiency in wanting to get into the United States Military Telegraph Corps, where the pay in those days of the Civil War was high, succeeded in convincing his brother-in-law, Mr. M. Walker, that young Edison could fill the position. Edison was, of course, well acquainted with the operators along the road and at the southern terminal, and took up his new duties very easily. The office was located in a jewelry store, where newspapers and periodicals were also sold. Edison was to be found at the office both day and night, sleeping there. I became quite valuable to Mr. Walker. After working all day, I worked at the office nights as well, for the reason that press report came over one of the wires until 3 a.m., and I would cut in and copy it as well as I could to become more rapidly proficient. The goal of the rural telegraph operator was to be able to take press. Mr. Walker tried to get my father to apprentice me at $20 per month, but they could not agree. I then applied for a job on the Grand Trunk Railroad as railway operator, and was given a place, nights, at Stratford Junction, Canada. Apparently his friend Mackenzie helped him in the matter. The position carried a salary of $25 per month. No serious objections were raised by his family, for the distance from Port Huron was not great, and Stratford was near Bayfield, the old home from which the Edisons had come, so that there were doubtless friends or even relatives in the vicinity. This was in 1863. Mr. Walker was an observant man who has since that time installed a number of waterwork systems and obtained several patents of his own. He describes the boy of sixteen as engrossed intensely in his experiments and scientific reading, and somewhat indifferent for this reason, to his duties as operator. This office was not particularly busy, taking from fifty to seventy-five dollars a month, but even the messages taken in would remain unsent on the hook while Edison was in the cellar below, trying to solve some chemical problem. The manager would see him studying sometimes an article in such a paper as The Scientific American, and then disappearing to buy a few sundries for experiments. Returning from the drugstore with his chemicals, he would not be seen again until required by his duties or until he had found out for himself, if possible, in this offhand manner, whether what he had read was correct or not. When he had completed his experiment, all interest in it was lost, and the jars and wires would be left to any fate that might befall them. In like manner, Edison would make free use of the watchmaker's tools that lay on the little table in the front window, and would take the wire players there without much thought as to their value, as distinguished from a lineman's tools. The one idea was to do quickly what he wanted to do. In the same swift, almost headlong trial of anything that comes to hand, while the fervor of a new experiment is felt, has been noted at all stages of the inventor's career. One is reminded of Palissy's recklessness, when, in his efforts to make the enamel melt on his pottery, he used the very furniture of his home for firewood. Mr. Edison remarks the fact that there was very little difference between the telegraph of that time and of today, except the general use of the old Morse register with the dots and dashes recorded by indenting paper strips that could be read and checked later at leisure if necessary. He says... The telegraph men couldn't explain how it worked, and I was always trying to get them to do so. I think they couldn't. I remember the best explanation I got was from an old Scotch line repairer employed by the Montreal Telegraph Company, which operated the railroad wires. He said that if you had a dog like a dachshund, long enough to reach from Edinburgh to London, if you pulled his tail in Edinburgh, he would bark in London. I could understand that, but I never could get it through me what went through the dog or over the wire. 
Today, Mr. Edison is just as unable to solve the inner mystery of electrical transmission. Nor is he alone. At the banquet given to celebrate his jubilee in 1896 as professor at Glasgow University, Lord Kelvin, the greatest physicist of our time, admitted with tears in his eyes and the note of tragedy in his voice that when it came to explaining the nature of electricity, he knew just as little as when he had begun as a student, and felt almost as though his life had been wasted when he tried to grapple with the great mystery of physics. Another episode of this period is curious in its revelation of the tenacity with which Edison has always held to some of his oldest possessions with a sense of personal attachment. While working at Stratford Junction, he says, I was told by one of the freight conductors that in the freight house at Goodrich there were several boxes of old broken-up batteries. I went there and found over eighty cells of the well-known Grove nitric acid battery. The operator there, who was also agent, when asked by me if I could have the electrodes of each cell, made of sheet platinum, gave his permission readily, thinking they were of tin. I removed them all, amounting to several ounces. Platinum, even in those days, was very expensive, costing several dollars an ounce, and I owned only three small strips. I was overjoyed at this acquisition, and those very strips and the reworked scrap are used to this day in my laboratory over forty years later. It was at Stratford that Edison's inventiveness was first displayed. The hours of work of a night operator are usually from 7 p.m. to 7 a.m., and to ensure attention while on duty, it is often provided that the operator every hour from 9 p.m. until relieved by the day operator shall send in the signal 6 to the train dispatcher's office. Edison reveled in the opportunity for study and experiment given him by his long hours of freedom in the daytime, but needed sleep just as any healthy youth does. Confronted by the necessity of sending in this watchman's signal as evidence that he was awake and on duty, he constructed a small wheel with notches on the rim and attached to it the clock in such a manner that the night watchman could start it when the line was quiet, and at each hour the wheel revolved and sent in accurately the dots required for the sixing. The invention was a success, the device being, indeed, similar to that of the modern district messenger box, but it was soon noticed that, in spite of the regularity of the report, SF could not be raised even if a train message were sent immediately after. Detection and a reprimand came in due course, but were not taken very seriously. A serious occurrence that might have resulted in accident drove him soon after from Canada, although the youth could hardly be held to blame for it. Edison says, This night job just suited me, as I could have the whole day to myself. I had the faculty of sleeping in a chair any time for a few minutes at a time. I taught the night yardman my call, so I could get a half hour's sleep now and then between trains, and in case the station was called, the watchman would awaken me. One night, I got an order to hold a freight train, and I replied that I would. I rushed out to find the signalman, but before I could find him and get the signal set, the train ran past. I ran to the telegraph office and reported that I could not hold her. The reply was, Hell! The train dispatcher, on the strength of my message that I would hold the train, had permitted another to leave the last station in the opposite direction. There was a lower station near the junction where the day operator slept. I started for it on foot. The night was dark, and I fell into a culvert and was knocked senseless. Owing to the vigilance of the two engineers on the locomotives who saw each other approaching on the straight single track, Nothing more dreadful happened than a summons to the thoughtless operator to appear before the general manager at Toronto. On reaching the manager's office, his trial for neglect of duty was fortunately interrupted by the call of two Englishmen, and while their conversation proceeded, Edison slipped quietly out of the room, hurried to the Grand Trunk Freight Depot, 
found a conductor he knew taking out a freight train for Sarnia, and then was not happy until the ferry boat from Sarnia had landed him once more on the Michigan shore. The Grand Trunk still owes Mr. Edison the wages due him at the time he thus withdrew from its service, but the claim has never been pressed. The same winter of 1863-64, while at Port Huron, Edison had a further opportunity of displaying his ingenuity. An ice jam had broken the light telegraph cable laid in the bed of the river across to Sarnia, and thus communication was interrupted. The river is three-quarters of a mile wide and could not be crossed on foot, nor could the cable be repaired. Edison at once suggested using the steam whistle of the locomotive, and by manipulating the valve, converse the long and short outbursts of shrill sound into the Morse code. An operator on the Sarnia shore was quick enough to catch the significance of the strange whistling, and messages were thus sent in wireless fashion across the ice flows in the river. It is said that such signals were also interchanged by military telegraphers during the war, and possibly Edison may have heard of the practice. But be that as it may, he certainly showed ingenuity and resource in applying such a method to meet the necessity. It is interesting to note that at this point the Grand Trunk now has its St. Clair Tunnel, through which the trains are hauled under the riverbed by electric locomotives. Edison had now begun unconsciously the roaming and drifting that took him during the next five years all over the Middle States, and that might well have wrecked the career of anyone less persistent and industrious. It was a period of his life corresponding to the Wanderhare of the German artisan, and it was an easy way of gratifying a taste for travel without the risk of privation. Today there is little temptation to the telegrapher to go to distant parts of the country on the chance that he may secure a livelihood at the quay. The ranks are well filled everywhere, and of late years the telegraph as an art or industry has shown relatively slight expansion, owing chiefly to the development of telephony. Hence, if vacancies occur, there are plenty of operators available, and salaries have remained so low as to lead to one or two formidable and costly strikes that unfortunately took no account of the economic conditions of demand and supply. But in the days of the Civil War, there was a great dearth of skillful manipulators of the key. About 1,500 of the best operators in the country were at the front on the federal side alone, and several hundred more had enlisted. This created a serious scarcity, and a nomadic operator going to any telegraphic center would be sure to find a place open waiting for him. At the close of the war, a majority of those who had been with the two opposed armies remained at the key under more peaceful surroundings. But the rapid development of the commercial and railroad systems fostered a new demand, and then for a time it seemed almost impossible to train new operators fast enough. In a few years, however, the telephone sprang into vigorous existence, dating from 1876, drawing off some of the most adventurous spirits from the telegraph field. And the deterrent influence of the telephone on the telegraph had made itself felt by 1890. The expiration of the leading Bell telephone patents five years later accentuated even more sharply the check that had been put on telegraphy, as hundreds and thousands of independent telephone companies were then organized, growing a vast network of toll lines over Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Iowa, and other states, and affording cheap, instantaneous means of communication without any necessity for the intervention of an operator. It will be seen that the times have changed radically since Edison became a telegrapher and that in this respect a chapter of electrical history had been definitely closed. There was a day when the art offered a distinct career to all of its practitioners, and young men of ambition and good family were eager to begin even as messenger boys, and were ready to undergo a severe ordeal of apprenticeship with the belief that they could ultimately attain positions of responsibility and profit. At the same time, Operators have always been shrewd enough to regard the telegraph as a stepping stone to other careers in life. 
A bright fellow entering the telegraph service today finds the experience he may gain therein valuable, but he soon realizes that there are not enough good-paying official positions to go around, so as to give each worthy man a chance after he has mastered the essentials of the art. He feels, therefore, that to remain at the key involves either stagnation or deterioration, and that after, say, twenty-five years of practice, he will have lost ground as compared with friends who started out in other occupations. The craft of an operator, learned without much difficulty, is very attractive to a youth, but a position at the key is no place for a man of mature years. His services, with rare exceptions, grow less valuable as he advances in age and nervous strain breaks him down. On the contrary, men engaged in other professions find, as a rule, that they improve and advance with experience, and that age brings larger rewards and opportunities. The list of well-known Americans who have been graduates of the key is indeed an extraordinary one, and there is no department of our national life in which they have not distinguished themselves. The contrast in this respect between them and their European colleagues is highly significant. In Europe, the telegraph systems are all under government management. The operators have strictly limited spheres of promotion, and at the best, the transition from one kind of employment to another is not made so easily as in the New World. But in the United States we have seen Rufus Bullock become Governor of Georgia, and Ezra Cornell Governor of New York. Marshall Jewell was Postmaster General of President Grant's Cabinet and Daniel Lamont was Secretary of State in President Cleveland's. General T. T. Eckert, past President of the Western Union Telegraph Company, was Assistant Secretary of War under President Lincoln. And Robert J. Wynne, afterward a Consul General, served as Assistant Postmaster General. A very large proportion of the Presidents and leading officials of the great railroad systems are old telegraphers, including Messrs. W. C. Brown, President of the New York Central Railroad, and Marvin Hewitt, President of the Chicago and Northwestern Railroad. In industrial and financial life, there have been Theodore N. Vail, President of the Bell Telephone System, L. C. Wire, late President of the Adams Express, A. B. Chandler, President of the Postal Telegraph and Cable Company, Sir W. Van Home, identified with Canadian development. Robert C. Clowry, President of the Western Union Telegraph Company. D. H. Bates, Manager of the Baltimore and Ohio Telegraph for Robert Garrett. And Andrew Carnegie, the greatest iron master the world has ever known, as well as its greatest philanthropist. In journalism, there have been leaders like Edward Rosewater, founder of the Omaha Bee, W.J. Elverson of the Philadelphia Press, and Frank A. Munsey, publisher of a half-dozen big magazines. George Kennan has achieved fame in literature, and Guy Carleton and Henry D. Suchet have been successful as dramatists. These are but typical of hundreds of men who could be named who have risen from work at the key to become recognized leaders in differing spheres of activity. But roving has never been favorable to the formation of steady habits. The young men who thus floated about the country from one telegraph office to another were often brilliant operators, noted for speed in sending and receiving, but they were undisciplined, were without the restraining influences of home life, and were so highly paid for their work that they could indulge freely in dissipation if inclined that way. Subjected to nervous tension for hours together at the key, many of them unfortunately took to drink, and having ended one engagement in a city by a debauch that closed the doors of the office to them, would drift away to the nearest town, and there securing work, would repeat the performance. At one time, indeed, these men were so numerous and so much in evidence as to constitute a type that the public was disposed to accept as representative of the telegraphic fraternity. But as the conditions creating him ceased to exist, the tramp operator also passed into history. 
It was, however, among such characters that Edison was very largely thrown in these early days of aimless drifting. To learn something, perhaps, of their nonchalant philosophy of life, sharing bed and board with them under all kinds of adverse conditions, but always maintaining a stoic abstemiousness, and never feeling other than a keen regret at the waste of so much genuine ability and kindliness on the part of those knights errant of the key, whose inevitable fate might so easily have been his own. Such a class or group of men can always be presented by an individual type, and this is assuredly best embodied in Melton F. Adams, one of Edison's earliest and closest friends, to whom reference will be made in later chapters, and whose life has been so full of adventurous episodes that he might well be regarded as the modern Gil Blass. That career is certainly well worth telling as another story, to use the Kipling phrase. Of him, Edison says, Adams was one of a class of operators never satisfied to work at any place for any great length of time. He had wanderlust. After enjoying hospitality in Boston in 1868-69 on the floor of my hall bedroom, which was a paradise for the entomologist, while the boarding house itself was run on the banting system of flesh reduction, he came to me one day and said, Goodbye, Edison. I have got sixty cents, and I am going to San Francisco. And he did go. How? I never knew, personally. I learned afterward that he got a job there, and then, within a week, they had a telegrapher's strike. He got a big torch and sold patent medicine on the streets at night to support the strikers. Then he went to Peru as partner of a man who had a grizzly bear which they proposed entering against a bull in the bull ring in that city. The grizzly was killed in five minutes, and so the scheme died. Then Adams crossed the Andes, and started a market report bureau in Buenos Aires. This didn't pay, so he started a restaurant in Pernambuco, Brazil. There he did very well, but something went wrong, as it always does to a nomad. So he went to the Transvaal, and ran a panorama called Paradise Lost in the Kaffir Kralls. This didn't pay, and he became the editor of a newspaper then went to England to raise money for a railroad in Cape Colony. Next I heard of him in New York, having just arrived from Bogota, United States of Columbia, with a power of attorney and $2,000 from a native of that republic, who had applied for a patent for tightening a belt to prevent it from slipping on a pulley, a device which he thought a new and great invention, but which was in use ever since machinery was invented. I gave Adams then a position as salesman for electrical apparatus. This he soon got tired of, and I lost sight of him. Adams, in speaking of this episode, says that when he asked for transportation expenses to St. Louis, Edison pulled out of his pocket a ferry ticket to Hoboken and said to his associates, I'll give him that, and he'll get there all right. This was in the early days of electric lighting but down to the present moment the peregrinations of this versatile genius of the key have never ceased in one hemisphere or the other, so that as Mr. Adams himself remarked to the authors in April 1908, the life has been somewhat variegated, but never dull. The fact remains also that throughout this period, Edison, while himself a very Ishmael, never ceased to study explorer, experiment. Referring to this beginning of his career, he mentions a curious fact that throws light on his ceaseless application. After I became a telegraph operator, he says, I practiced for a long time to become a rapid reader of print, and got so expert I could sense the meaning of a whole line at once. This faculty, I believe, should be taught in schools, as it appears to be easily acquired. Then one can read two or three books in a day, whereas if each word at a time only is sensed, reading is laborious.
Chapter 5 of Edison, His Life and Inventions This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Edison, His Life and Inventions by Frank Lewis Dyer and Thomas Comerford Martin Chapter 5 Arduous Years in the Central West in 1903, when accepting the position of honorary electrician to the International Exposition held in St. Louis in 1904, to commemorate the centenary of the Louisiana Purchase, Mr. Edison spoke in his letter of the Central West as a region where, as a young telegraph operator, I spent many arduous years before moving east. The term of probation thus referred to did not end until 1868, and while it lasted, Edison's wanderings carried him from Detroit to New Orleans, and took him, among other cities, to Indianapolis, Cincinnati, Louisville, and Memphis, some of which he visited twice in his peregrinations to secure work. From Canada, after the episodes noted in the last chapter, he went to Adrian, Michigan, and of what happened there Edison tells a story typical of his wanderings for several years to come. After leaving my first job at Stratford Junction, I got a position as operator on the Lake Shore and Michigan Southern at Adrian, Michigan, in the division superintendent's office. As usual, I took the night trick, which most operators disliked, but which I preferred, as it gave me more leisure to experiment. I had obtained from the station agent a small room, and had established a little shop of my own. One day, the day operator wanted to get off, and I was on duty. About nine o'clock, the superintendent handed me a dispatch, which he said was very important, and I must get off at once. The wire at the time was very busy, and I asked if I should break in. I got orders to do so, and acting under those orders of the superintendent, I broke in and tried to send the dispatch. But the other operator would not permit it, and the struggle continued for ten minutes. Finally, I got possession of the wire and sent the message. The superintendent of the telegraph, who then lived in Adrian, and went to his office in Toledo every day, happened that day to be in the Western Union office uptown, and it was the superintendent I was really struggling with. In about twenty minutes he arrived livid with rage, and I was discharged on the spot. I informed him that the general superintendent had told me to break in and send the dispatch, but the general superintendent then and there repudiated the whole thing. Their families were socially close, so I was sacrificed. My faith in human nature got a slight jar. Edison then went to Toledo and secured a position at Fort Wayne on the Pittsburgh, Fort Wayne, and Chicago Railroad, now leased to the Pennsylvania system. This was a day job, and he did not like it. He drifted two months later to Indianapolis, arriving there in the fall of 1864, when he was at first assigned to duty at the Union Station, at a salary of $75 a month for the Western Union Telegraph Company, whose service he now entered, and with which he has been destined to maintain highly important and close relationships throughout a large part of his life. Superintendent Wallach appears to have treated him generously, and to have loaned him instruments, a kindness that was greatly appreciated. For twenty years later, the inventor called on his old employer, and together they visited the scene where the borrowed apparatus had been mounted on a rough board in the depot. Edison did not stay long in Indianapolis, however, resigning in February 1865 and proceeding to Cincinnati. The transfer was probably due to trouble caused by one of his early inventions, embodying what has been characterized by an expert as probably the most simple and ingenious arrangement of connections for a repeater. His ambition was to take press report, but finding, even after considerable practice, that he broke frequently, he adjusted two embossing Morse registers, one to receive the press matter, and the other to repeat the dots and dashes at a lower speed, so that the message could be copied leisurely. Hence he could not be rushed or broken in receiving, while he turned out copy that was a marvel of neatness and clearness. All was well so long as ordinary conditions prevailed, but when an unusual pressure occurred the little system fell behind, 
and the newspapers complained of the slowness with which reports were delivered to them. It is easy to understand that with matter received at a rate of forty words per minute, and worked off at twenty-five words per minute, a serious congestion or delay would result, and the newspapers were more anxious for news than they were for fine penmanship. Of this device Mr. Edison remarks, Together we took press for several nights, my companion keeping the apparatus in adjustment, and I copying. The regular press operator would go to the theater, or take a nap, only finishing the report after 1 a.m. One of the newspapers complained of bad copy toward the end of the report, that is, from 1 to 3 a.m., and requested that the operator taking the report up to 1 a.m., which was ourselves, take it all, as the copy then was perfectly unobjectionable. This led to an investigation by the manager, and the scheme was forbidden. This instrument, many years afterwards, was applied by me for transferring messages from one wire to any other wire simultaneously, or after any interval of time. It consisted of a disk of paper, the indentations being formed in a volute spiral, exactly as in the disk phonographs today. It was this instrument which gave me the idea of the phonograph while working on the telephone. Arrived in Cincinnati, where he got employment in the Western Union Commercial Telegraph Department at a wage of $60 per month, Edison made the acquaintance of Milton F. Adams, already referred to as Facile Princeps, the typical telegrapher in all his more sociable and brilliant aspects. Speaking of that time, Mr. Adams says, I can well recall when Edison drifted in to take a job. He was a youth of about 18 years decidedly unprepossessing in dress, and rather uncouth in manner. I was twenty-one, and very duddish. He was quite thin in those days, and his nose was very prominent, giving a Napoleonic look to his face, although the curious resemblance did not strike me at the time. The boys did not take to him cheerfully, and he was lonesome. I sympathized with him, and we became close companions. As an operator he had no superiors, and very few equals. Most of the time he was monkeying with the batteries and circuits, and devising things to make the work of telegraphy less irksome. He also relieved the monotony of office work by fitting up the battery circuits to play jokes on his fellow operators, and to deal with the vermin that infested the premises. He arranged in the cellar what he called his rat paralyzer, a very simple contrivance consisting of two plates, insulated from each other and connected from the main battery. They were so placed that when a rat passed over them, the fore feet on one plate and the hind feet on the other completed the circuit, and the rat departed this life electrocuted. Shortly after Edison's arrival at Cincinnati came the close of the Civil War and the assassination of President Lincoln. It was natural that telegraphers should take an intense interest in the general struggle, for not only did they handle all the news relating to it, but many of them were one time or another personal participants. For example, one of the operators in the Cincinnati office was George Ellsworth, who was telegrapher for Morgan, the famous Southern guerrilla, and was with him when he made his raid into Ohio and was captured near the Pennsylvania line. Ellsworth himself made a narrow escape by swimming the Ohio River with the aid of an army mule. Yet we can well appreciate the unimpressionable way in which some of the men did their work, from an antidote that Mr. Edison tells of that awful night of Friday, April 14th, 1865. I noticed, he says, an immense crowd gathering in the street, outside a newspaper office. I called the attention of the other operators to the crowd, and we sent a messenger boy to find out the cause of the excitement. He returned in a few minutes and shouted, Lincoln's shot! Instinctively, the operators looked from one face to another, to see which man had received the news. All the faces were blank, and every man said he had not taken a word about the shooting. Look over your files, said the boss, to the man handling the press stuff. For a few moments we waited in suspense, and then the man held up a sheet of paper containing a short account of the shooting of the president. The operator had worked so mechanically that he had handled the news without the slightest knowledge of its significance. Mr. Adams says that at the time the city was unfet on account of the close of the war. The name of the assassin was received by telegraph, 
and it was noted with a thrill of horror that it was the brother of Edwin Booth and that of Junius Brutus Booth, the latter of whom was then playing at the old National Theatre. Booth was hurried away into seclusion, and the next morning the city that had been so gay overnight with bunting was draped with mourning. Edison's diversions in Cincinnati were chiefly those already observed. He read a great deal, but spent most of his leisure in experiment. Mr. Adams remarks, Edison and I were very fond of tragedy. Forrest and John McCullough were playing at the National Theater, and when our capital was sufficient, we would go to see these eminent tragedians alternate in Othello and Iago. Edison always enjoyed Othello greatly. Aside from an occasional visit to the Llewellyn Garden over the Rhine, with a glass of beer and a few pretzels consumed while listening to the excellent music of a German band, the theater was the sum and substance of our innocent dissipation. The Cincinnati office, as a central point, appears to have been attractive to many of the clever young operators who graduated from it to positions of larger responsibility. Some of them were conspicuous for their skill and versatility. Mr. Adams tells this interesting story as an illustration. L. C. Weir, or Charlie as he was known, at that time agent for the Adams Express Company, had the remarkable ability of taking messages and copying them twenty-five words behind the sender. One day he came into the operating room, and passing a table he heard Louisville calling Cincinnati. He reached over to the key and answered the call. My attention was arrested by the fact that he walked off after responding, and the sender happened to be a good one. We are coolly asked for a pen, and when he sat down, the sender was just one message ahead of him with date, address, and signature. Charlie started in, and, in a beautiful, large, round hand, copied that message. The sender went right along, and when he finished with six messages, closed his key. When Weir had done with the last one, the sender began to think that after all there had been no receiver, as Weir did not break, but simply gave his okay. He afterward became president of the Adams Express, and was certainly a wonderful operator. The operating room referred to was on the fifth floor of the building with no elevators. Those were the early days of trade unionism and telegraphy, and the movement will probably never quite die out in the craft, which has always shown so much solidarity. While Edison was in Cincinnati, a delegation of five union operators went over from Cleveland to form a local branch, and the occasion was one of great conviviality. Night came, but the Unionists were conspicuous by their absence, although more circuits than one were intolerant of delay and clamorous for attention, eight local Unionists being away. The Cleveland report wire was in special need, and Edison, almost alone in the office, de devoted himself to it through the night and until three o'clock the next morning when he was relieved. He had previously been getting eighty dollars a month, and had eked this out by copying plays for the theater. His rating was that of a plug, or inferior operator, but he was determined to lift himself into the class of first-class operators, and kept up the practice of going into the office at night to copy press, acting willingly as a substitute for any operator who wanted to get off a few hours, which often meant all night. Speaking of this special ordeal, for which he had thus been unconsciously preparing, Edison says, my copy looked fine if viewed as a whole, as I could write a perfectly straight line across the wide sheet, which was not ruled. There were no flourishes, but the individual letters would not bear close inspection. When I missed understanding a word, there was no time to think what it was, so I made an illegible one to fill in, trusting to the printers to sense it. I knew they could read anything, although Mr. Bloss, an editor of the Inquirer, made such bad copy that one of his editorials was pasted up on the notice board in the telegraph office with an offer of one dollar to any man who could read twenty consecutive words. Nobody ever did it. When I got through, I was too nervous to go home, so waited the rest of the night for the day manager, Mr. Stevens, to see what was to be the outcome of this union formation and of my efforts. He was an austere man, and I was afraid of him. I got the morning papers, which came out at 4 a.m., and the press report read perfectly, which surprised me greatly. I went to work on my regular day wire to Portsmouth, Ohio, and there was considerable excitement, but
but nothing was said to me. Neither did Mr. Stevens examine the copy on the office hook, which I was watching with great interest. However, about 3 p.m. he went to the hook, grabbed the bunch, and looked at it as a whole without examining it in detail, for which I was thankful. Then he jabbed it back on the hook, and I knew I was all right. He walked over to me and said, Young man, I want you to work the Louisville wire nights. Your salary will be $125. Thus I got from the plug classification to that of a first-class man. But no sooner was this promotion secured than he started again on his wandering southward, while his friend Adams went north, neither having any difficulty in making the trip. The boys in those days had extraordinary facilities for travel. As a usual thing, it was only necessary for them to board a train and tell the conductor they were operators. Then they would go as far as they liked. The number of operators was small, and they were in demand everywhere. It was in this way Edison made his way south as far as Memphis, Tennessee, where the telegraph service at that time was under military law, although the operators received $125 a month. Here again, Edison began to invent and to improve on existing apparatus, with the result of having once more to move on. The story may be told in his terse language. I was not the inventor of the auto-repeater, but while in Memphis I worked on one. Learning that the chief operator, who was a protege of the superintendent, was trying in some way to put New York and New Orleans together for the first time since the close of the war, I redoubled my efforts and at two o'clock one morning I had them speaking to each other. The office of the Memphis Avalanche was in the same building. The paper got wind of it and sent messages. A column came out in the morning about it, but when I went to the office in the afternoon to report for duty, I was discharged without explanation. The superintendent would not even give me a pass to Nashville, so I had to pay my fare. I had so little money left that I nearly starved to Cater, Alabama and had to stay there three days before going north to Nashville. Arrived in that city, I went to the telegraph office, got money enough to buy a little solid food, and secured a pass to Louisville. I had a companion with me who was also out of a job. I arrived at Louisville on a bitterly cold day, with ice in the gutters. I was wearing a linen duster, and was not much to look at, but I got a position at once, working on a press wire. My traveling companion was less successful on account of his record. They had a limit even in those days when the telegraph office was so demoralized. Some reminiscences of Mr. Edison are of interest as bearing not only upon the demoralized telegraph service, but the conditions from which the New South had to emerge while working out its salvation. The telegraph was still under military control, not having been turned over to its original owners the Southern Telegraph Company. In addition to the regular force, there was an extra force of two or three operators, and some stranded ones, who were a burden for us, for the board was high. One of these derelicts was a great source of worry to me, personally. He would come in at all hours and either throw ink around or make a lot of noise. One day he built a fire in the grate and started to throw pistol cartridges into the flames. These would explode, and I was twice hit by the bullets which left a black and blue mark. Another night he came in from some part of the building with a lot of stationery with Confederate states printed at the head. He was a fine operator and wrote a beautiful hand. He would take a sheet of paper, write capital A, and then take another sheet and make the A differently, and so on through the alphabet, each time crumpling the paper up in his hands and throwing it on the floor. He would keep this up until the room was nearly flush with the table. Then he would quit. Everything at that time was wide open. Disorganization reigned supreme. There was no head to anything. One night, myself and a companion would go over to a gorgeously furnished faro bank and get our midnight lunch. Everything was free. There was over twenty kino rooms running. One of them I visited was in a Baptist church the man with the wheel being in the pulpit, and the gamblers in the pews. While there, a manager of the telegraph office was arrested for something I never understood, and incarcerated in a military prison about a half mile from the office. The building was in plain sight from the office, and four stories high. He was kept strictly incommunicado. One day, thinking he might be confined in a room facing the office, 
I put my arm out of the window and kept signaling, dots and dashes by the movement of the arm. I tried this several times for two days. Finally he noticed it, and putting his arm through the bars of the window, he established communication with me. He thus sent several messages to his friends, and was afterwards set free. Another curious story told by Edison concerns a fellow operator on night duty at Chattanooga Junction, at the time he was at Memphis. When it was reported that Hood was marching on Nashville, one night a Jew came into the office about eleven o'clock in great excitement, having heard the Hood rumor. He, being a large sutler, wanted to send a message to save his goods. The operator said it was impossible, that orders had been given to send no private messages. Then the Jew wanted to bribe my friend, who steadfastly refused for the reason, as he told the Jew, that he might be court-martialed and shot. Finally, the Jew got up to eight hundred dollars. The operator swore him to secrecy and sent the message. Now, there was no such order about private messages, and the Jew, finding it out, complained to Captain Van Duzer, chief of telegraphs, who investigated the matter, and while he would not discharge the operator, laid him off indefinitely. Van Duzer was so lenient that if an operator were discharged, all the operator had to do was wait three days, and then go back and sit on the stoop of Van Duzer's office all day, and he would be taken back. But Van Duzer swore he would never give in in this case. He said that if the operator had taken eight hundred dollars and sent the message at the regular rate, which was twenty-five cents, it would have been all right, as the Jew would be punished for trying to bribe a military officer. But when the operator took the eight hundred and then set the message deadhead, he couldn't stand it, and he would never relent. A third typical story of this period deals with a cipher message from Thomas. Mr. Edison narrates it as follows. When I was an operator in Cincinnati, working out the Louisville wire lines for a time, one night a man over the on the Pittsburgh wire yelled out, D.I. Cipher, which meant that there was a cipher message from the War Department at Washington, and that it was coming, and he yelled out, Louisville. I immediately started to call up that place. It was just at the change of shift in the office. I could not get Louisville, and the cipher message began to come. It was taken by the operator at the other table, direct from the War Department. It was for General Thomas at Nashville. I called for about twenty minutes and notified them that I could not get Louisville. I kept at it for about fifteen minutes longer and notified them that there was still no answer from Louisville. They then notified the War Department that they could not get Louisville. Then we tried to get by all kinds of roundabout ways, but in no case could anybody get them at the office. Soon a message came from the War Department to send immediately for the manager of the Cincinnati office. He was brought to the office, and several messages were exchanged, the contents of which, of course, I do not know. But the matter appeared to be very serious, and as they were afraid of General Hood, of the Confederate Army, who was then attempting to march on Nashville, and it was very important that this cipher of about 1,200 words or so should be got through immediately to General Thomas. I kept on calling up to 12 or 1 o'clock, but no Louisville. About one o'clock, the operator at the Indianapolis office got a hold of an operator on a wire which ran from Indianapolis to Louisville along the railroad, who happened to come into his office. He arranged with this operator to get a relay of horses, and the message was sent through Indianapolis to this operator, who then engaged horses to send the dispatches to Louisville and find out the trouble, and to get the dispatches through without delay to General Thomas. In those days, the telegraph fraternity was rather demoralized, and the discipline was very lax. It was found out a couple of days afterward that there were three night operators at Louisville. One of them had gone over to Jeffersonville, and had fallen off a horse and broken his leg, and was in a hospital. By a remarkable coincidence, another of the men had been stabbed in the Keno room, and was also in hospital, while the third operator had gone to Cynthiana to see a man hanged, and it got left by the train. Young Edison remained in Louisville for about two years, quite a long stay for one with such nomadic instincts. It was there that he perfected the peculiar vertical style of writing, which, beginning with him in telegraphy, later became so much of a fad with teachers of penmanship and in the schools. He says of this form of writing, 
a current example of which is given above. I developed this style in Louisville while taking press reports. My wire was connected to the blind side of a repeater at Cincinnati, so that if I missed a word or sentence, or if the wire worked badly, I could not break in and get the last words, because the Cincinnati man had no instrument by which he could hear me. I had to take what came. When I got the job, the cable across the Ohio River at Covington, connecting with the line at Louisville, had a variable leak in it, which caused the strength of the signaling current to make violent fluctuations. I obviated this by using several relays, each with a different adjustment, working several sounders, all connected with one sounding plate. The clatter was bad, but I could read it with fair ease. When, in addition to this infernal leak, the wires north to Cleveland worked badly, it required a large amount of imagination to get the sense of what was being sent. An imagination requires an appreciable time for this exercise, and as the stuff was coming at a rate of thirty-five to forty words a minute, it was very difficult to write down what was coming and to imagine what wasn't coming. Hence it was necessary to become a very rapid writer, so I started to find the fastest style. I found that the vertical style, with each letter separate and without any flourishes, was the most rapid, and that the smaller the letter, the greater the rapidity. As I took on an average from eight to fifteen columns of news report every day, it did not take long to perfect this method. Mr. Edison has adhered to this characteristic style of penmanship down to the present time. As a matter of fact, the conditions at Louisville at that time were not much better than they had been at Memphis. The telegraph operating room was in a deplorable condition. It was on the second story of a dilapidated building on the principal street of the city, with the battery room in the rear, behind which was the office of the agent of the Associated Press. The plastering was about one-third gone from the ceiling. A small stove, used occasionally in the winter, was connected to the chimney by a tortuous pipe. The office was never cleaned. The switchboard for manipulating the wires was about thirty-four inches square. The brass connections on it were black with age and with the arcing effects of lightning, which to young Edison seemed particularly partial to Louisville. It would strike on the wires, he says, with an explosion like a cannon shot, making that office no place for an operator with heart disease. Around the dingy walls were a dozen tables, the ends next to the wall. They were about the size of those seen in old-fashioned country hotels for holding the wash bowl and pitcher. The copper wires connecting the instruments to the switchboard were small, crystallized, and rotten. The battery room was arranged with old record books and message bundles, and one hundred cells of nitric acid battery, arranged on a stand in the center of the room. This stand, as well as the floor, was almost eaten through by the destructive action of the powerful acid. Grim and uncompromising as the description reads, it was typical of the equipment in those remote days of the telegraph at the close of the war. Illustrative of the length to which telegraphers would, could go at a time when there was so much in demand, Edison tells the following story. When I took the position there, there was a great shortage of operators. One night at 2 a.m., another operator and I were on duty. I was taking press report, and the other man was working the New York wire. We heard a heavy tramp, tramp, tramp on the rickety stairs. Suddenly the door was thrown open with great violence, dislodging it from one of the hinges. There appeared in the doorway one of the best operators we had, who worked daytime and was of a very quiet disposition, except when intoxicated. He was a great friend of the manager of the office. His eyes were bloodshot and wild. One sleeve had been torn away from his coat. Without noticing either of us, he went up to the stove and kicked it over. The stove pipe fell, dislocated at every joint. It was half full of exceedingly fine soot, which floated out and filled the room completely. This produced a momentary respite to his labors. When the atmosphere was cleared sufficiently to see, he went around and pulled every table away from the wall, piling them on top of the stove in the middle of the room. Then he proceeded to pull the switchboard away from the wall. It was held tightly by screws. He succeeded, finally, and when it gave way, he fell with the board, and, striking on the table, cut himself, so he soon became covered with blood. He then went to the battery room, and knocked all the batteries off on the floor. 
the nitric acid soon began to combine with the plaster in the room below, which was the public receiving room for messengers and bookkeepers. The excess acid poured through and ate up the accounting books. After having finished everything to his satisfaction, he left. I told the other operator to do nothing. We would leave things just as they were and wait until the manager came. In the meantime, as I knew all the wires coming through to the switchboard, I rigged up a temporary set of instruments so that the New York business could be cleared up, and we also got the remainder of the press matter. At about seven o'clock, the day men began to appear. They were told to go downstairs and wait the coming of the manager. At eight o'clock, he appeared, walking around, went into the battery room, and then came to me, saying, Edison, who did this? I told him that Billy L. had come in full of soda water and invented the ruin before him. He walked backward and forward about a minute, then coming up to my table, put his fist down and said, If Billy L. ever does that again, I will discharge him. It was needless to say that there were other operators who took advantage of that kind of discipline, and I had many calls at night after that, but none with such destructive effects. This was one aspect of life as it presented itself to the sensitive and observant young operator in Louisville. But there was another, more intellectual side, in the contact afforded with journalism and its leaders, and the information taken in almost unconsciously as to the political and social movements of the time. Mr. Edison looks back on this with great satisfaction. I remember, he says, the discussions between the celebrated poet and journalist, George D. Prentice, then editor of the Courier Journal, and Mr. Tyler of the Associated Press. I believe Prentice was the father of the humorous paragraph of the American newspaper. He was poetic, highly educated, and a brilliant talker. He was very thin and small. I don't think he weighed over 125 pounds. Tyler was a graduate of Harvard, and had a very clear enunciation. In a sharp contrast to Prentice, he was a large man. After the paper had gone to press, Prentice would generally come over to Tyler's office and start talking. Having while in Tyler's office heard them arguing on the immortality of the soul, etc., I asked permission of Mr. Tyler if, after finishing the press matter, I might come in and listen to the conversation, which I did many times after. One thing I could never comprehend was that Tyler had a sideboard with liquors and generally crackers. Prentice would pour out half a glass of what they call corn whiskey and would dip the crackers in it and eat them. Tyler's took it sans food. One teaspoon of that stuff would have put me to sleep. Mr. Edison throws out a curious sidelight on the origin of the comic column in the modern American newspaper. The telegraph giving to a new joke or a good story the ubiquity and instantaneity of an important historical event. It was the practice of the press operators all over the country at that time, when a lull occurred, to start in and send jokes or stories the day men had collected, and these were copied and pasted up on the bulletin board. Cleveland was the originating office for press, which it received from New York and sent it out simultaneously to Milwaukee, Chicago, Toledo, Detroit, Pittsburgh, Columbus, Dayton, Cincinnati, Indianapolis, Vincennes, Terre Haute, St. Louis, and Louisville. Cleveland would call first on Milwaukee, if he had anything. If so, he would send it, and Cleveland would repeat it to all of us. Thus, any joke or story originating anywhere in that area was known the next day all over. The press men would come in and copy anything that could be published, which was about 3%. I collected, too, quite a large scrapbook of it, but unfortunately have lost it. Edison tells an amusing story of his own pursuits at the time. Always an omnivorous reader, he had some difficulty in getting a sufficient quantity of literature for home consumption, and was in the habit of buying books at auctions and at second-hand stores. One day, at an auction room, he secured a stack of twenty unbound volumes of the North American Review for two dollars. These he had bound and delivered at the telegraph office. One morning, when he was free as usual at three o'clock, he started off at a rapid pace with ten volumes on his shoulder. He found himself very soon the subject of a fusillade. When he stopped, a breathless policeman grabbed him by the throat 
and ordered him to drop his parcel and explain matters as a suspicious character. He opened the package, showing the books somewhat to the disgust of the officer, who imagined he had caught a burglar sneaking away in the dark alley with his booty. Edison explained that being deaf he had heard no challenge, and therefore had kept moving, and the policeman remarked apologetically that it was fortunate for Edison that he was not a better shot. The incident is curiously relevatory of the character of the man, for it must be admitted that, while literary telegraphers are by no means scarce, there are very few who would spend scant savings on back numbers of a ponderous review at an age when tragedy, beer, and pretzels are far more enticing. Through all his travels, Edison has preserved those books, and has them now in his library at Llewellyn Park on Orange Mountain, New Jersey. Drifting after a time from Louisville, Edison made his way as far north as Detroit, but, like the famous Duke of York, soon made his way back again. Possibly the severer discipline after the happy-go-lucky regime in the southern city had something to do with this restlessness, which again manifested itself, however, on his return thither. The end of the war had left the South a scene of destruction and desolation, and many men who had fought bravely and well, found it hard to reconcile themselves to the grim task of reconstruction. To them it seemed better to let ill alone and to seek other clime where conditions would be less onerous. At this moment a great deal of exaggerated talk was current as to the sunny life and easy wealth of Latin America, and under its influences many unreconstructed Southerners made their way to Mexico, Brazil, Peru, or the Argentine. Telegraph operators were naturally in touch with this movement, and Edison's fertile imagination was readily inflamed by the glowing idea of all these vague possibilities. Again he threw up his steady work, and with a couple of sanguine young friends made his way to New Orleans. They had the notion of taking positions in the Brazilian government telegraphs, as an advertisement had been inserted in some paper stating that operators were wanted. They had timed their departure from Louisville, so as to catch a specially charted steamer, which was to leave New Orleans for Brazil on a certain day, and to convey a large number of Confederates and their families, who were disgusted with the United States, and were going to settle in Brazil, where slavery still prevailed. Edison and his friends arrived in New Orleans just at the time of the Great Riot, when several hundred Negroes were killed, and the city was in the hands of a mob. The government had seized the steamer chartered for Brazil, in order to bring in troops from the Yazoo River to New Orleans to stop the rioting. The young operators therefore visited another shipping office to make inquiries as to vessels for Brazil, and encountered an old Spaniard who sat in a chair near the steamer's agent's desk, and to whom they explained their intentions. He had lived and worked in South America, and was very emphatic in his assertion, as he shook his yellow bonied finger at them, that the worst mistake that they could possibly make would be to leave the United States. He would not leave on any account, and they, as young Americans, would always regret it if they forsook their native land, whose freedom, climate, and opportunities could not be equaled anywhere on the face of the globe. Such sincere advice as this could not be disdained, and Edison made his way north again. One cannot resist speculation as to what might have happened to Edison himself, and to the development of electricity had he made this proposed plunge into the enervating tropics. It will be remembered that at a somewhat similar crisis in life, young Robert Burns entertained seriously the idea of forsaking Scotland for the West Indies. That he did not go was certainly better for Scottish verse, to which he contributed later so many immortal lines, and it was probably better for himself, even if he died a gauger. It was simply impossible to imagine Edison working out the phonograph, telephone, and incandescent lamp under the tropical climes he sought. Some years later, he was informed that both his companions had gone to Veracruz, Mexico, and had died there of yellow fever. Work was soon resumed at Louisville, where the dilapidated old office occupied at the close of the war had been exchanged for one much more comfortable and luxurious in its equipment. As before, Edison was allotted to press work, and remembers very distinctly taking the presidential message and veto of the District of Columbia Bill by President Johnson. 
As the matter was received over the wire, he paragraphed it so that each printer had exactly three lines, thus enabling the matter to be set up very expeditiously in the newspaper offices. This earned him the gratitude of the editors, a dinner, and all the newspaper exchanges he wanted. Edison's accounts of the sprees and debauches of the other night operators in the loosely managed offices enable one to understand how even a little steady application to the work in hand would be appreciated. On one occasion, Edison acted as treasurer for his bibulous companions, holding the stake, so to speak, in order that the supply of liquor might last longer. One of the mildest mannered of the party took umbrage at the parsimony of the treasurer and knocked him down, whereupon the others in the party set upon the assailant and mauled him so badly that he had to spend three weeks in the hospital. At another time, two of his companions, sharing the temporary hospitality of his room, smashed most of the furniture and went to bed with their boots on. Then his kindly good nature rebelled. I felt that this was running hospitality into the ground, so I pulled them out and left them on the floor to cool off from their alcoholic trance. Edison seems on the whole to have been fairly comfortable and happy in Louisville, surrounding himself with books and experimental apparatus, and even indicting a treatise on electricity. But his very thirst for knowledge and new facts again proved his undoing. The instruments in the handsome new offices were fastened in their proper places, and the operators were strictly forbidden to remove them, or to use the batteries except on regular work. This prohibition meant little to Edison, who had access to no other instruments except those of the company. I went one night, he says, into the battery room to obtain some sulfuric acid for experimenting. The car boy tipped over. The acid ran out, went through to the manager's room below, and ate up his desk and all the carpet. The next morning I was summoned before him, and told what the company wanted was operators, not experimenters. I was at liberty to take my pay and get out. The fact that Edison is a very studious man, an insatiate lover and reader of books, is well known to his associates, but the surprise is often expressed at his fund of miscellaneous information. This, it will be seen, is partly explained by his work for years as a press reporter. He says of this, The second time I was in Louisville, they had moved into a new office, and the discipline was now good. I took the press job. In fact, I was a very poor sender, and therefore made the taking of press report a specialty. The newspaper men allowed me to come over, after going to press at 3 a.m., and get all the exchanges I wanted. These I would take home and lay at the foot of my bed. I never slept more than four or five hours, so that I would awake at nine or ten and read these papers until dinner time. I thus kept posted, and knew from their activity every member of Congress, and what committees they were on, and about all the topical doings, as well as the prices of breadstuffs, and all the primary markets. I was in a much better position than most operators to call on my imagination to supply missing words or sentences, which were frequent in those days of old, rotten wires, badly insulated, especially on stormy nights. Upon such occasions I had to supply, in some cases, one-fifth of the whole matter, pure guessing. But I got caught only once. There had been some kind of convention in Virginia, in which John Minor Botts was the leading figure. There was a great excitement about it, and two votes had been taken at the convention on the two days. There was no doubt that the vote the next day would go a certain way. A very bad storm came up about ten o'clock, and my wire worked very badly. Then there was a cessation of all signals. Then I made out the words, Minor Bots. The next was a New York item. I filled in a paragraph about the convention, and how the vote had gone, as I was sure it would. But the next day I learned that instead of there having been a vote, the convention had enjoined without action until the day after. In like manner, it was at Louisville that Mr. Edison got an insight into the manner in which great political speeches are more frequently reported than the public suspects. The Associated Press had a shorthand man traveling with President Johnson when he made a celebrated swing around the circle in a private train, delivering hot speeches in deference of his conduct. The man engaged me to write out the notes from his reading. He came in loaded and on the verge of incoherence. We started in, but about every two minutes I would have to scratch out whole paragraphs, 
and insert the same thing said in another and better way. He would frequently change words, always to the betterment of the speech. I couldn't understand this, and when he got through I had copied about three columns. I asked him why these changes, if he read from notes. Sonny, he said, if these politicians had their speeches published as they deliver them, a great many shorthand writers would be out of a job. The best shorthanders and the holders of good positions are those who could take a lot of rambling, incoherent stuff and make a rattling good speech out of it. Going back to Cincinnati, and beginning his second term there as an operator, Edison found the office in new quarters, and with greatly improved management. He was again put on night duty, much to his satisfaction. He rented a room in the top floor of an office building, bought a cot and an oil stove, a foot lathe, and some tools. He cultivated the acquaintance of Mr. Summers, superintendent of telegraph of the Cincinnati and Indianapolis Railroad, who gave him permission to take such scrap apparatus as he might desire, which was of no use to the company. With Mr. Summers, on one occasion, he had an opportunity to indulge his always strong sense of humor. Summers was a very witty man, he says, and fond of experimenting. We worked on a self-adjusting telegraph relay, which would have been very valuable if we could have got it. I soon became the possessor of a second-hand room corf induction coil, which, although would only give a small spark, would twist the arms and clutch the hands of a man so he could not let go of the apparatus. One day we went down to the roundhouse of the Cincinnati and Indianapolis Railroad and connected up the long wash tank in the room with the coil, one electrode being connected to the earth. Above this wash room was a flat roof. We bored a hole through the roof and could see the men as they came in. The first man, as he entered, dipped his hands in the water. The floor being wet, he formed a circuit, and up went his hands. He tried it the second time with the same result. He then stood against the wall with a puzzled expression. We surmised that he was waiting for someone else to come in, which occurred shortly after, with the same result. Then they went out, and the place was soon crowded, and there was considerable excitement. Various theories were broached to explain the curious phenomena. We enjoyed the sport immensely. It must be remembered that this was over forty years ago, when there was no popular instruction in electricity, and when its possibilities for practical joking were known to very few. Today, such a crowd of working men would be sure to include at least one student of a night school, or a correspondence course, who could explain the mystery offhand. Note has been made of the presence of Ellsworth in the Cincinnati office, and his service with the Confederate guerrilla Morgan, for whom he had tapped federal wires, read military messages, sent false ones, and done serious mischief generally. It is well known that one operator can recognize another by the way in which he makes his signals. It is his style of handwriting. Ellsworth possessed, in a remarkable degree, the skill of imitating these peculiarities, and thus he deceived the Union operators easily. Edison says that while apparently a quiet man in bearing, Ellsworth, after the excitement of fighting, found the tameness of a telegraph office obnoxious, and that he became a bad gunman in the panhandle of Texas where he was killed. We soon became acquainted, says Edison, of this period in Cincinnati, and he wanted me to invent a secret method of sending dispatches so that an intermediate operator could not tap the wire and understand it. He said that if it could be accomplished, he could sell it to the government for a large sum of money. This suited me, and I started in and succeeded in making such an instrument, which had in it the germ of my quadruplex, now used throughout the world, permitting the dispatch of four messages over one wire simultaneously. By the time I had succeeded in getting the apparatus to work, Ellsworth suddenly disappeared. Many years afterwards, I used this little device again for the same purpose. At Menlo Park, New Jersey, I had my laboratory. There were several Western Union wires cut into the laboratory and used by me in experimenting at night. One day I sat near an instrument, which I had left connected during the night. I soon found it was a private wire between New York and Philadelphia, and I heard among a lot of stuff a message that surprised me. A week after that I had occasion to go to New York, and, visiting the office of the lessee of the wire, I asked him if he hadn't sent such and such a message. The expression that came over his face was a sight. 
He asked me how I knew of any message. I told him the circumstances, and suggested that he had better cipher such communications, or put on a secret sounder. The result of the interview was that I installed from him my old Cincinnati apparatus, which was used thereafter for many years. Edison did not make a very long stay in Cincinnati this time, but went home after a while to Port Huron. Soon, tiring of idleness and isolation, he sent a cry from Macedonia to his old friend Milt Adams, who was in Boston, and whom he wished to rejoin if he could get work promptly in the East. Edison himself gives the details of this eventful move, when he went East to grow up with the new art of electricity. I had left Louisville the second time, and went home to see my parents. After stopping home for some time, I got restless, and thought I would like to work in the East. Knowing that a former operator named Adams, who had worked with me in the Cincinnati office, was in Boston, I wrote him that I wanted a job there. He wrote back that if I came on immediately, he would get me a job in the Western Union office. I had helped out the Grand Trunk Railroad telegraph people, by a new device when they lost one of the two submarine cables they had across the river, making the remaining cable act just as well for their purpose, as if they had had two. I thought that I was entitled to a pass, which they conceded, and I started for Boston. After leaving Toronto, a terrific blizzard came up, and the train got snowed under in a cut. After staying there twenty-four hours, the train men made snowshoes of fence-rail splits, and started out to find food, which they did about a half mile away. They found a roadside inn, and by means of snowshoes all the passengers were taken to the inn. The train reached Montreal four days late. A number of the passengers and myself went to the military headquarters, to testify in favor of a soldier who was on furlough and was two days late, which was a serious matter with military people, I learned. We willingly did this, for this soldier was a great storyteller and made the time pass quickly. I met here a telegraph operator named Stanton, who took me to his boarding house, the most cheerless I have ever been in. Nobody got enough to eat, the bedclothes were too short and too thin, it was twenty-eight degrees below zero, the wash water was frozen solid. The board was cheap, being only a dollar fifty per week. Stanton said that the usual livestock accompaniment of operators' boarding houses was absent. He thought the intense cold had caused them to hibernate. Stanton, when I was working at Cincinnati, left his position and went out on the Union Pacific to work at Julesburg, which was a cattle town at that time and very rough. I remember seeing him off on a train, never expecting to see him again. Six months later, while working press wire in Cincinnati, about 2 a.m., there was flung in the middle of the operating room a large tin box. It made a report just like a pistol and we all jumped up startled. In walked Stanton. Gentlemen, he said, I have just returned from a pleasure trip to the land beyond the Mississippi. All my wealth is contained in my metallic traveling device, and you are welcome to it. The case contained one paper collar. He sat down, and I noticed that he had a woolen comforter around his neck, with his coat buttoned closely. The night was intensely warm. He then opened his coat, and revealed the fact that he had nothing on but the bare skin. Gentlemen, said he, you see before you an operator who has reached the limit of impecuniosity. Not far from the limit of impecuniosity was Edison himself, as he landed in Boston in 1868 after this wintry ordeal. This chapter is run to undue length but it must not close without one citation from high authority as to the service of the military telegraph corps so often referred to in it. General Grant, in his memoirs, describing the movements of the Army of the Potomac, lays stress on the service of his telegraph operators and says, Nothing could be more complete than the organization and discipline of this body of brave and intelligent men. Insulated wires were wound upon reels, two men and a mule detailed to each wheel. The pack saddle was provided with a rack, like a sawbuck, placed crossways, so that the wheel would revolve freely. There was a wagon provided with a telegraph operator, battery, and instruments for each division, corps, and army, and for my headquarters. Wagons were also loaded with light poles supplied with an iron spike at each end to hold the wires up. 
the moment troops were in a position to go into camp, the men would put up these wires. Thus, in a few minutes longer time than it took a mule to walk the length of its coil, telegraphic communication would be effected between all the headquarters of the army. No orders ever had to be given to establish the Chapter 6 of Edison, His Life and Inventions. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Edison, His Life and Inventions by Frank Lewis Dyer and Thomas Comerford Martin. Chapter 6. Milton Adams was working in the office of the Franklin Telegraph Company in Boston when he received Edison's appeal from Port Huron, and with characteristic impetuosity at once made it his business to secure a position for his friend. There was no opening in the Franklin office, so Adams went over to the Western Union office and asked the manager, Mr. George F. Milliken, if he did not want an operator who, like young Lokenvar, came out of the West. What kind of copy does he make? was the cautious response. I passed Edison's letter through the window for his inspection. Milliken read it, and a look of surprise came over his countenance, as he asked me if he could take it off the line like that. I said he certainly could, and that there was nobody who could stick him. Milliken said that if he was that kind of an operator, I could send for him, and I wrote to Edison to come on, as I had a job for him in the main office of the Western Union. Meantime, Edison had secured his pass over the Grand Trunk Railroad, and spent four days and nights on the journey, suffering extremes of cold and hunger. Franklin's arrival in Philadelphia finds its parallel in the very modest debut of Adam's friend in Boston. It took only five minutes for Edison to get the job, for Superintendent Milliken, a fine type of telegraph official, saw quickly through the superficialities, and realized that it was no ordinary young operator he was engaging. Edison himself tells the story of what happened. The manager asked me when I was ready to work. Now, I replied, I was then told to return at 5.30 p.m., and punctually at that hour I entered the main operating room and was introduced to the night manager. The weather being cold and being clothed poorly, my peculiar appearance caused much mirth. As I afterward learned, the night operators had consulted together how they might put up a job on the J from the Woolly West. I was given a pen and assigned to the New York number one wire. After waiting an hour, I was told to come over to a special table and take a special report for the Boston Herald. The conspirators having arranged to have one of the fastest senders in New York send the dispatch and salt the new man. I sat down unsuspiciously at the table, and the New York man started slowly. Soon he increased his speed to which I easily adapted my pace. This put my rival on his metal, and he put on his best powers, which, however, were soon reached. At this point I happened to look up, and saw the operators all looking over my shoulder, with their faces shining with fun and excitement. I knew then that they were trying to put a job on me, but I kept my own counsel. The New York man then commenced to slur over his words, running them together and sticking the signals. But I had been used to this style of telegraphy and taking report and was not in the least discomfited. Finally, when I thought the fun had gone far enough, and having about completed the special, I quietly opened the key and remarked telegraphically to my New York friend, Say, young man, change off and send with your other foot. This broke the New York man all up, and he turned the job over to another man to finish. Edison had a distaste for taking press report. Due to the fact that it was steady, continuous work, and interfered with the studies and investigations that could be carried on in the intervals of ordinary commercial telegraphy. He was not lazy in any sense. While he had no very lively interest in the mere routine work of a telegraph office, he had the profoundest curiosity as to the underlying principles of electricity that made telegraphy possible, and he had an unflagging desire and belief in his own ability to improve the apparatus he handled daily. 
the whole intellectual atmosphere of Boston was favorable to the development of the brooding genius in this shy, awkward, studious youth, utterly indifferent to clothes and personal appearance, but ready to spend his last dollar on books and scientific paraphernalia. It is a matter of record that he did once buy a new suit for thirty dollars in Boston, but the following Sunday, while experimenting with acids in his little workshop, the suit was spoiled. This is what I get for putting so much money in a new suit, was the laconic remark of the youth, who was more than delighted to pick up a complete set of Faraday's works about the same time. Adams says that when Edison brought home these books at 4 a.m., he read steadily until breakfast time. Then he remarked enthusiastically, Adams, I got so much to do and life is so short, I'm going to hustle. Thereupon he started on a run for breakfast. Edison himself says, It was in Boston I bought Faraday's works. I think I must have tried about everything in those books. His explanations were simple. He used no mathematics. He was the master experimenter. I don't think there were many copies of Faraday's works sold in those days. The only people who did anything in electricity were the telegraphers and the opticians making simple school apparatus to demonstrate the principles. One of these firms was Palmer and Hall, whose catalog of 1850 showed a miniature electric locomotive made by Mr. Thomas Hall and exhibited in operation the following year at the Charitable Mechanics Fair in Boston. In 1852, Mr. Hall made for a Dr. A. L. Henderson of Buffalo, New York, a model line of railroad with electric motor engine, telegraph line, and electric railroad signals, together with a figure operating the signals at each end of the line automatically. This was in reality the first example of railroad trains moving by telegraph signals, a practice now so common and universal as to attract no comment. To show how little some fundamental methods can change in 50 years, it may be noted that Hall conveyed the current to his tiny car through 40 feet of rail, using the rail as a conductor, just as Edison did more than 30 years later in his historic experiments for Villard at Menlo Park and just as a large proportion of American trolley systems do this at the present moment. It was among such practical, investigating folk as these that Edison was very much at home. Another notable man of this stamp, with whom Edison was thrown in contact, was the late Mr. Charles Williams, who, beginning his career in the electrical field in the 40s, was at the height of activity as a maker of apparatus when Edison arrived in the city, and who afterward as an associate of Alexander Graham Bell, enjoyed the distinction of being the first manufacturer in the world of telephones. At his Court Street workshop, Edison was a frequent visitor. Telegraph repairs and experiments were going on constantly, especially on the early fire alarm telegraphs of Farmer and Gamewell, and with the aid of one of the men there, probably George Anders, Edison worked out into an operative model his first invention, a vote recorder the first Edison patent, for which papers were executed on October 11, 1868, and which was taken out June 1, 1869, number 90,646. The purpose of this particular device was to permit a vote in the National House of Representatives to be taken in a minute or so, complete lists being furnished of all members voting on the two sides of any question. Mr. Edison, in recalling the circumstances, says, Roberts was the telegraph operator who was the financial backer to the extent of $100. The invention, when completed, was taken to Washington. I think it was exhibited before a committee that had something to do with the Capitol. The chairman of the committee, after seeing how quickly and perfectly it worked, said, Young man, if there is any invention on earth we don't want down here, it is this. One of the greatest weapons in the hands of a minority to prevent bad legislation is filibustering on votes and this instrument would prevent it. I saw the truth of this, because as press operator I had taken miles of congressional proceedings, and to this day an enormous amount of time is wasted during each session of the House in foolishly calling the members' names and recording and then adding their votes, when the whole operation can be done in almost a moment by merely pressing a particular button at each desk. For filibustering purposes, however, the present methods are most admirable. Edison determined from that time forth to devote his inventive faculties only to things for which there was a real, genuine demand. 
something that subserved the actual necessities of humanity. The first patent was taken out for him by the late Honorable Carol D. White, afterward U.S. Commission of Labor, and a well-known publicist, then practicing patent law in Boston. He describes Edison as an uncouth in manner, a chewer rather than a smoker of tobacco, but full of intelligence and ideas. Footnote. The general scheme of a fire alarm telegraph system embodies a central office to which notice can be sent from any number of signal boxes of the outbreak of a fire in the district covered by the box, the central office in turn calling out the nearest fire engines and warning the fire department in general of the occurrence. Such fire alarms can be exchanged automatically or by operators and are sometimes associated with a large fire alarm bell or whistle. Some boxes can be operated by the passing public. Others need special keys. The box mechanism is usually of the ratchet, step-by-step -step movement, familiar in district messenger call boxes. End footnote. Edison's curiously practical, though imaginative mind, demanded realities to work upon, things that belong to human nature's daily food, and he soon harked back to telegraphy, a domain in which he was destined to succeed and over which he was to reign supreme as an inventor. He did not, however, neglect chemistry, but indulged his taste in that direction freely, although we have no record that this work was anything more, at that time, than the carrying out of experiments outlined in the books. The foundations were being laid for the remarkable chemical knowledge that later on grappled successfully with so many knotty problems in the realm of chemistry, notably with the incandescent lamp and the storage battery. Of one incident in his chemical experiments, he tells the following story. I had read in a scientific paper the method of making nitroglycerin, and was so fired by the wonderful properties it was said to possess that I determined to make some of the compound. We tested what we considered a very small quantity, but this produced such terrible and unexpected results that we became alarmed, the fact dawning on us that we had a very large white elephant in our possession. At 6 a.m., I put the explosive into a sarsaparilla bottle, tied a string to it, wrapped it up in a paper, and gently let it down in the sewer, corner of State and Washington Streets. The associate in this was a man whom he had found endeavoring to make electrical apparatus for sleight-of-hand performances. In the Boston Telegraph office at that time, as perhaps at others, there were operators studying to enter college. Possibly some were already in attendance at Harvard University. This condition was not unusual at one time. The first electrical engineer graduated from Columbia University, New York, followed up his studies while a night operator, came out brilliantly at the head of his class. Edison says of these scholars that they paraded their knowledge rather freely, and it was his delight to go to the second-hand bookstores on Cornhill and study up questions that he could spring upon them when he got an occasion. With those engaged on night duty, he got midnight lunch from an old Irishman called the Cake Man, who appeared regularly with his wares at twelve midnight. The office was on the ground floor, and had been a restaurant previous to its occupation by the Western Union Telegraph Company. It was literally loaded with cockroaches, which lived between the wall and the board running around the room at the floor, and which came out after the lunch. These were such a bother on my table that I pasted two strips of tin foil on the wall at my desk, connecting one piece to the positive side of a, the big battery supplying current to the wires, and the negative pole to the other strip. The cockroaches moving up on the wall would pass over the strips. The moment they got their legs across both strips, there was a flash of light, and the cockroaches went up into gas. This automatic electrocuting device attracted so much attention, and got half a column in an evening paper, that the manager made me stop it. The reader will remember that a similar plan of campaign against rats was carried out by Edison while in the West. About this time, Edison had a narrow escape from injury, which might easily have shortened his career, and he seems to have provoked the trouble more or less innocently by using a little elementary chemistry. After being in Boston several months, he says, working New York Wire 1, I was requested to work the press wire, called the Milk Route, as there were so many towns on it taking press simultaneously. New York office had reported great delays on the wire, due to operators constantly interrupting, or breaking, as it was called, to have words repeated which they failed to get. And New York claimed that Boston was one of the worst offenders. It was a rather hard position for me, 
for I took the report without breaking, and it would prove the previous Boston operator incompetent. The results made the operators have some hard feelings against me. He was put back on the wire and did much better after that. It seems that the office boy was down on this man. One night he asked me if I could tell him how to fix a key so it would not break, even if the circuit breaker was open, and also so it could not be easily detected. I told him to jab a penful of ink on the platinum points, so that there was sugar enough to make it sufficiently thick to hold up while the operator tried to break. The current was still going through the ink, so he could not break. The next night about 1 a.m., this operator, on the press wire, while I was standing near a house printer studying it, pulled out a glass insulator, then used upside down as a substitute for an ink bottle, and threw it with great violence at me, just missing my head. It would certainly have killed me if it had not missed. The cause of the trouble was that this operator was doing his best he could not to break, but being compelled to, opened the key, and found he couldn't. The press matter came right along, and he couldn't stop it. The office boy had put the ink in a few minutes before, when the operator had turned his head during a law. He blamed me instinctively as the cause of the trouble. Later on, we became good friends. He took his meals at the same emaciator that I did. His main object in life seemed to be acquiring the art of throwing up wash pitchers and catching them without breaking them. About one-third of his salary was used in paying for pitchers. One day, a request reached the Western Union Telegraph Office in Boston from the principal of a select school for young ladies, to the effect that she would like someone to be sent up to the school to exhibit and describe the Morse telegraph to her children. There had always been a warm interest in Boston for, in the life and work of Morse, who had been born there at Charlestown, barely a mile from the birthplace of Franklin, and this request for a little lecture on Morse's telegraph was quite natural. Edison, who was always ready to earn some extra money for his experiments, and was already known as the best informed operator in the office, accepted the invitation. What happened is described by Adams as follows. We gathered up a couple of sounders, a battery, and a sonic wire, and at the appointed time called on her to do the stunt. Her schoolroom was about 20 feet by 20 feet, not including a small platform. We rigged up the line between the two ends of the room, Edison taking the stage while I was at the other end of the room. All being in readiness, the principal was told to bring in her children. The door opened, and in came about twenty young ladies, elegantly gowned, not one of whom was under seventeen. When Edison saw them, I thought he would faint. He called me on the line and asked me to come to the stage and explain the mysteries of the Morse system. I replied that I thought that he was in the right place, and told him to get busy with his talks on dots and dashes. Always modest, Edison was so overcome he could hardly speak, but he managed to say, finally, that his friend, Mr. Adams, was better equipped with cheek than he was. We would change places, and he would do the demonstrating while I explained the whole thing. This caused the bevy to turn to see who, where the lecturer was. I went to the stage, saying something, and we did some telegraphing over the line. I guess it was satisfactory. We got the money, which was the main point to us. Edison tells the story in a similar manner, but insists that it was he who saved the situation. I managed to say that I would work the apparatus, and Mr. Adams would do, make the explanations. Adams was so embarrassed that he fell over an ottoman. The girls tittered, and this increased his embarrassment until he couldn't say a word. The situation was so desperate that for a reason I could never explain, I started in myself, and talked and explained better than I had ever did before or since. I can talk to two or three persons, but when there are more, they radiate some unknown form of influence which paralyzes my vocal cords. However, I got out of this scrape, and many times afterwards, when I chanced with other operators to meet some of the young ladies on their way home from school, they would smile and nod, much to the mystification of the operators, who were ignorant of this episode. Another amusing story of this period of impecuniosity and financial strain is thus told by Edison. My friend Adams was working in the Franklin Telegraph Company, which competed with the Western Union. Adams was laid off, and as his financial resources had reached absolute zero centigrade, I undertook to let him sleep in my hall bedroom. I generally had hall bedrooms because they were cheap and I needed money to buy apparatus. 
I also had the pleasure of his genial company at the boarding house about a mile distant, but at the sacrifice of some apparatus. One morning, as we were hastening to breakfast, we came in to Tremont Row, and saw a large crowd in front of two small gents furnishing goods stores. We stopped to ascertain the cause of the excitement. One store put up a paper sign in the display window which said, Three hundred pairs of stockings received this day. Five cents a pair. No connection with the store next door. Presently, the other store put up a sign stating that they had received three hundred pairs, price three cents per pair, and stated that they had no connection with the store next door. Nobody went in. The crowd kept increasing. Finally, when the price had reached three pairs for one cent, Adam says to me, I can't stand this any longer. Give me a cent. I gave him a nickel, and he elbowed his way in, and throwing the money on the counter, the store being filled with women clerks, he said, Give me three pairs. The crowd was breathless, and a girl took down a box and drew out three pairs of baby socks. Oh, said Adams, I want men's size. Well, sir, we do not permit one to pick sizes for that amount of money. And the crowd roared, and this broke up the sales. It was generally supposed that Edison did not take up work on the stock ticker until after his arrival a little later in New York. But he says, After the vote recorder, I invented a stock ticker and started a ticker service in Boston and had 30 or 40 subscribers and it operated from a room over the gold exchange. This was about a year after Callahan started in New York. To say the least, this evidenced great ability and enterprise on part of the youth. The dealings in gold during the Civil War and after its close had brought gold indicators into use, and these had soon been followed by stock tickers, the first of which was introduced in New York in 1867. The success of this new but primitively crude class of apparatus was immediate. Four manufacturers were soon busy trying to keep pace with the demands for it from brokers, and the Gold and Stock Telegraph Company formed to exploit the system which soon increased its capital from 200000 to 300000 paying 12 cent dividends on the latter amount. Within its first year, the capital was again increased to $1 million, and the dividends of 10% were easily paid on that sum also. It is needless to say that such facts became quickly known among the operators, from whose ranks, of course, the new employees were enlisted, and it was a common ambition among the more ingenious to produce a new stock ticker. From the beginning, each phase of electrical development, indeed each step in mechanics, has been accompanied by the well-known phenomenon of invention, namely the attempt of the many to perfect and refine and even reinvent where one or two daring spirits have led the way. The figures of capitalization and profit just mentioned were relatively much larger in the 60s than they are today, and to enterprising young operators they spelled illimitable wealth. Edison was, however, about the only one in Boston of whom history makes record as achieving any tangible result in this new art, and he soon longed for the larger telegraphic opportunity of New York. His friend, Milt Adams, went west with quenchless zest for that kind of roving life and aimless adventure of which the serious-minded Edison had already had more than enough of. Realizing that to New York he must look for further support in his efforts, Edison, deep in debt for his embryonic inventions, but with high hope and courage, now made the next monumentous step in his career. He was far riper in experience and practice of his art than any other telegrapher of his age, and had acquired, moreover, no little knowledge of the practical business of life. Note has been made above of his invention of a stock ticker in Boston, and of his establishing a stock quotation circuit. This was by no means all, and as a fitting close to this chapter, he may be quoted as to some other work and its perils in experimentation. I was also engaged in putting up private lines, upon which I used an alphabetical dial instrument for telegraphing between business establishments, a forerunner of modern telephony. This instrument was very simple and practical, and anyone could work it after a few minutes' explanation. I had these instruments made at Mr. Hamplet's, who had a little shop where he was engaged in experimenting with electric clocks. Mr. Hamlet was the father and introducer in, after years of the Western Union telegraph system, of time distribution. 
My laboratory was the headquarters for the men, and also of tools and supplies for these private lines. They were put up cheaply, as I used the roofs of houses, just as the Western Union did. It never occurred to me to ask permission from the owners. All we did was to go to the store, etc., say we were telegraph men and wanted to go up on the wires on the roof. Permission was always granted. In this laboratory, I had a large induction coil, which I borrowed to make some experiments with. One day I got a hold of both electrodes of the coil, and it clinched my hand on them so I couldn't let go. The battery was on the shelf. The only way I could get free was to back off and pull the coil, so that the battery wires would pull the cells off the shelf and thus break the circuit. I shut my eyes and pulled, but the nitric acid splashed all over my face and ran down my back. I rushed to a sink, which was only half big enough, and got in as well as I could, and wiggled around for several minutes to permit the water to dilute the acid and stop the pain. My face and back were streaked with yellow. The skin was thoroughly oxidized. I did not go on the street by daylight for two weeks, as the appearance of my face was dreadful. Start a recording intro. Chapter 7 of Edison, His Life and Inventions. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ray Christensen. Edison, His Life and Inventions by Frank Lewis Dreyer and Thomas Comerford Martin. Chapter 7 The Stock Ticker. The letters and figures used in the language of the tape, said a well-known Boston stock speculator, are very few, but they spell ruin in 99 million ways. It is not to be inferred, however, that the modern stock ticker has anything to do with the making or losing of fortunes. There were regular daily stock market reports in London newspapers in 1825, and New York soon followed the example. As far back as 1692, Houghton issued in London a weekly review of financial and commercial transactions, upon which Macaulay based the lively narrative of stock speculation in the 17th century, given in his famous history. That which the ubiquitous stock ticker has done is to give instantaneously to the news of what the stock market is doing so that at every minute, thousands of miles apart, brokers, investors, and gamblers may learn the exact conditions. The existence of such facilities is to be admired rather than deplored. News is vital to Wall Street, and there is no living man on whom the things in Wall Street are without effect. Financial history of the United States and of the world, as shown by the prices of government bonds and general securities has been told daily for 40 years on these narrow strips of paper tape, of which thousands of miles are yearly run through the tickers of the New York alone. It is true that the record of the chattering little machine made in cannibalistic abbreviations on the tape can drive a man suddenly to the very verge of insanity with joy or despair but if there be blame for that, it attaches to the American spirit of speculation and not to the ingenious mechanism which reads and registers the beating of the financial pulse. Edison came first to New York in 1868 with his early stock printer, which he tried unsuccessfully to sell. He went back to Boston and quite undismayed got up a duplex telegraph Toward the end of my stay in Boston, he says, I obtained a loan of money amounting to $800 to build a particular kind of duplex telegraph for sending two messages over a single wire simultaneously. The apparatus was built, and I left the Western Union employ and went to Rochester, New York, to test the apparatus on the lines of the Atlantic and Pacific Telegraph between that city and New York. 
but the assistant at the other end could not be made to understand anything. Notwithstanding, I had written out a very minute description of just what to do. After trying for a week, I gave it up and returned to New York with but a few cents in my pocket. Thus, he who has never speculated in a stock in his life was destined to make the beginnings of his own fortune by providing for others the apparatus that should bring to the eye all over a great city the momentary fluctuations of stocks and bonds. No one could have been in dire poverty than he when the steamboat landed him in New York in 1869. He was in debt and his few belongings in books and instruments had to be left behind. He was not far from starving. Mr. W. S. Mallory, an associate of many years, quotes directly from him on this point. Some years ago, we had a business negotiation in New York, which made it necessary for Mr. Edison and me to visit the city five or six times within a comparatively short period. It was our custom to leave Orange about 11 a.m. on arrival in New York to get our lunch before keeping the appointments, which were usually made for two o'clock. Several of these lunches were at Domenico's, Sherry's, and other places of similar character. But one day, while en route, Mr. Edison said, I have been to lunch with you several times now today. I am going to take you to lunch with me and give you the finest lunch you have ever had. When we arrived at Hoboken, we took the downtown ferry across the Hudson, and when we arrived on the Manhattan side, Mr. Edison led the way to Smith and McNeil's, opposite Washington Market and well known to old New Yorkers. We went inside, and as soon as the waiter appeared, Mr. Edison ordered apple dumplings and a cup of coffee for himself. He consumed his share of the lunch with the greatest possible pleasure. Then, as soon as he'd finished, he went to the cigar counter and purchased cigars. As we walked to keep the appointment, he gave me the following reminiscence. When he left Boston and decided to come to New York, he had only money enough for the trip. After leaving the boat, his first thought was of breakfast, but he was without money to obtain it. However, in passing a wholesale tea house, he saw a man tasting tea. So he went in and asked the taster if he might have some of the tea. This the man gave him, and thus he obtained his first breakfast in New York. He knew a telegraph operator here, and on him he depended a loan to tide him over until such time as he should secure a position. During the day, he had succeeded in locating this operator, but found that he also was out of the job, and that the best he could do was loan him one dollar, which he did. This small sum of money represented both food and lodging until time as work could be obtained. Edison said that as a result of the time consumed and the exercise in walking while he found his friend, he was extremely hungry and that he gave most serious consideration as to what he should buy in the way of food, and what particular kind of food would be most satisfying and filling. The result was that at Smith and McNeil's he decided on apple dumplings and a cup of coffee, that which he never ate anything more appetizing. It was not long before he was at work and was able to live in a normal manner. During the Civil War, with its enormous increase in the national debt and the volume of paper money, gold had gone to a high premium, and, as ever, by its fluctuations in the price of the value of other commodities it was determined. This led to the creation of a gold room in Wall Street, where the precious metal could be dealt in, while for dealings in stock there also extended the regular board and the open board and the long room. Devoted to one but the leading object of speculation, the gold room was the very focus of all the financial and gambling activity of the time, and its quotations governed trade and commerce. At first, notations in chalk and on blackboards sufficed, but seeing their inadequacy, Dr. S. S. Laws, vice president and actual presiding officer of the gold exchange, devised and introduced what was popularly known as the gold indicator. 
At first, notations in chalk on the blackboard sufficed, but seeing their inadequacy, Dr. S. S. Laws, vice president and actual presiding officer of the Gold Exchange, devised and introduced what was popularly known as the Gold Indicator. This exhibited merely the prevailing price of gold, but as its quotations changed from instant to instant, it was in a most literal sense the sonores of the neighboring eyes. One indicator looked upon the gold room, the other opened toward the street. Within the exchange, the face could easily be seen high up on the west wall of the room, and the machine was operated by Mr. Mersoso, the official registrar of the gold board. Dr. Laws, who afterward became president of the State University of Missouri, was an inventor of unusual ability and attainments. In his early youth, he had earned his livelihood in a tool factory, and apparently with his savings, he went to Princeton, where he studied electricity under no less a teacher than the famous Joseph Henry. At the outbreak of the war in 1861, he was president of one of the Presbyterian Synodical Colleges of the South, whose buildings passed into the hands of the government. Going to Europe, he returned to New York in 1863 and became interested with a relative in financial matters. His connection with the gold exchange soon followed when it was organized. The indicating mechanism he devised was electrical, controlled at central by two circuit closed keys, and was a prototype of all the later and modern step-by-step -step printing telegraphs upon which the distribution of financial news depended. The fraction drum of the indicator could be driven in either direction, known as the advantage and retrograde movements, and was divided and marked into eighths. It geared into a unit drum, which as do speed indicators and cyclometers. Four electrical pulsations were required to move the drum the distance between the fractions. The general operation was simple, and in normally active times, the mechanism and the registrar were equal to all emergencies. But it is obvious that the recorder had to be carried away to the broker's office and other places by messengers, and the delay, confusion, and mistakes soon suggested that Dr. Laws, the desirability of having a number of indicators at such scattered points operated by a master transmitter and dispersing with the regiments of noisy boys. He secured this privilege of distribution and resigning from the exchange, devoted his exclusive attention to the gold reporting telegraph, which he patented, and for which, at the end of 1866, he had scarcely 50 subscribers. His indicators were small oblong boxes, in the front of which was a long slot allowing the dial as they traveled past inside to show the numerals consisting the quotation, the dials or wheels being arranged in a row horizontally overlapping each other as in modern fare registers which are now seen on most trolley cars. It was not long before there were 300 subscribers, but the very success of this device brought competition and improvements. Mr. E. A. Callahan an ingenious printing telegraph operator, saw that there were unexhaustible possibilities in the idea, and his foresight and inventiveness made him the father of the ticker, in connection with which he was thus, like laws, one of the first to grasp and exploit the underlying principle of the central station as a universal source of supply. The genius of this invention, Mr. Callahan was told in an interesting way, in 1867, on the site of the present Mills building on Broadway Street, opposite the stock exchange of today, was an old building which had been cut up to subverse the necessities of its occupants, all engaged in the dealing of gold and stocks. It had one main entrance from the street to a hallway from which entrance to the offices of two prominent broker firms was obtained. Each firm had its own army of boys, numbering from 12 to 15, whose duties were to ascertain the latest quotations from the different exchanges. Each boy devoted his attention to some particularly active stock, pushing each other to get into those narrow quarters, yelling out the prices at the door, 
and pushing back for later ones. The hustle made this doorway to me a most undesirable refuge from an April shower. I was simply whirled into the street. I naturally thought that much of this noise and confusion might be dispersed and that the prices might be furnished through some system of telegraphy which would not require the employment of skilled operators. The conception of the stock ticker dates from this incident. Mr. Callahan's first idea was to distribute gold quotations and to this end he devised an indicator. It consisted of two dials mounted separately. Each revolved by an electromagnet so that the desired figures were brought to an aperture in the case enclosing the apparatus as in the laws system. Each shaft with its dial was provided with two ratcheted wheels, one the reverse of the other. One was used in connection with the propelling lever, which was provided to a pawl to fit into the teeth of the reversed ratcheted wheel in the, on its forward movement. It was thus made impossible for either dial to go by a momentum beyond its limit. Learning that Dr. Laws, with the skillful aid of F.L. Pope, was already active in the same direction, Mr. Callahan, with ready wit, transformed his indicator into a ticker that would make a printed record. The name of the ticker came through the casual remark of a, an observer to whom the noise was the most striking feature of the mechanism. Mr. Callahan removed the two dials and substituting type wheels turned the movements face to face so that each type wheel could imprint its characters upon a paper tape in two lines. Three wires stranded together from the central office to each instrument. Of these, one furnished the current for the alphabet wheel, one for the figure wheel, and one for the mechanism that took care of inking and printing on the tape. Callahan made the further innovation of insulating his circuit wires. Although the cost was then 40 times as great as that of bare wires, it will be understood that electromagnets were the ticker's actuating agency. The ticker apparatus was placed under a neat glass shade and mounted on a shelf. 25 instruments were energized from one circuit and the quotations were supplied from a central at 18 New Street. The Gold and Stott Telegraph Company was promptly organized to supply to brokers the system, which was very rapidly adopted throughout the financial district of New York at the southern tip of Manhattan Island. Quotations were transmitted by Morse Telegraph from the floor of the stock exchange to the central and thence distributed to the subscribers. Success with the stock news system was instantaneous. It was at this juncture that Edison reached New York and, according to his own statement, found shelter at night in the battery room of the Gold Indicator Company, having meantime applied for a position as an operator with the Western Union. He had to wait a few days, and during this time he seized the opportunity to study the indicators and the complicated general transmitter in the office controlled from the keyboard of the operator on the floor of the gold exchange. What happened next has been the basis of many inaccurate stories, but is dramatic enough as told in Mr. Edison's own version. On the third day of my arrival and while sitting in the office, the complicated general instrument for sending on all the lines and which made a very great noise suddenly came to a stop with a crash. Within two minutes, over 300 boys, a boy from every broker in the street, rushed upstairs and crowded the long aisle and office that hardly had room for 100, all yelling that such and such a broker's wire was out of order and to fix it at once. It was pandemonium, and the man in charge became so excited that he lost control of all knowledge he ever had. I went to the indicator and, having studied it thoroughly, knew where the trouble ought to be and found it. One of the innumerable contact springs had broken off and fallen down between two gear wheels and stopped the instrument, but it was not very noticeable. As I went out to tell the man in charge what the matter was, Dr. Laws appeared in the scene, the most excited person I had seen. He demanded of the man the cause of the trouble, but the man was speechless. 
I ventured to say that I knew what the problem was, and he said, fix it, fix it, be quick. I removed the spring and set the contact wheels at zero, and the line, battery, and inspecting men all scattered through the financial district to set the instruments. In about two hours, things were working again. Dr. Laws came in to ask my name and what I was doing. I told him, and he asked me to come to his private office the following day. His office was filled with stacks of books, all relating to metaphysics and kindred matters. He asked me a great many questions about the instruments and his system, and I showed him how he could simplify things generally. He then requested that I should call next day. On arrival, he stated at once that he had decided to put me in charge of the whole plant and that my salary would be $300 per month. This was such a violent jump from anything I had ever seen before that it rather paralyzed me for a while. I thought it was too much to be lasting, but I determined to try and live up to the salary. If 20 hours a day of hard work would do it, I kept this position, made many improvements, devised several stock tickers until the Gold and Stock Telegraph Company consolidated with the Gold Indicator Company. Certainly few changes in fortune have ever been more sudden and dramatic in any notable career than this which thus placed an ill-clad, unkempt, half-starved, eager lad in a position of such responsibility in days when the fluctuations in the price of gold at every instant meant fortune or ruin to thousands. Edison, barely 21 years old, was a keen observer of the stirring events around him. Wall Street is at any time an interesting study, but it was never at a more agitated and sensational period of its history than at this time. Edison's arrival in New York coincided with an act of speculation in gold which may, indeed, be said to have provided him with an occupation, and was soon followed by the attempt of Mr. J. Gould and his associates to corner the gold market, precipitating the panic of Black Friday, September 24, 1869. Securing its important duties and the precious metals, and thus assisting to create an artificial stringency in the gold market. The government had made it a practice to revive the situation by selling a million of gold each month. The metal was thus restored into circulation. In some manner, President Grant was persuaded that general conditions and the movement of the crops would be helped if the sale of gold were suspended for a time, and this put into effect he went to visit an old friend in the Pennsylvania remote from railroads and telegraphs. The gold pool had acquired control of $10 million in gold and drove the price upward rapidly from 144 toward their goal of 200 On Black Friday, they purchased another $28 million at 160 and still the price went up. The financial and commercial interests of the country were in panic but the pool persevered in its effort to corner gold, with a profit of many millions contingent on success, yielding a frantic request. President Grant, who returned to Washington, caused Secretary Baldwell of the Treasury to throw $4 million of gold into the market. Relief was instantaneous. The corner was broken, but the harm had been done. Edison's remarks shed a vivid sidelight on this extraordinary episode. On Black Friday, he says, we had a very exciting time with the indicators. The Gould and Fisk crowd had cornered gold and had run the quotations up faster than the indicator could follow. The indicator was composed of several wheels. On the circumference of each wheel were the numerals, and one wheel had fractions. It worked in the same way as an ordinary counter. One wheel made ten revolutions, and at the tenth it advanced the adjacent wheel and this, in its turn, having gone ten revolutions, advanced the next wheel, and so on. On the morning of Black Friday, the indicator was quoting 150 premium, whereas the bids by Gould's agents in the gold room were 165 for five millions or any part. We had a paperweight at the transmitter to speed it up, and by one o'clock reached the right quotation. The excitement was prodigious. New York, as well as Broad Street, was jammed with excited people. 
I sat on top of the Western Union Telegraph booth to watch the surging crazy crowd. One man came to the booth, grabbed a pencil, and attempted to write a message to Boston. The first stroke went clear off the blank. He was so excited that he had the operator write the message for him. Amid great excitement, Spire, the banker, went crazy and it took five men to hold him, and everybody lost their head. The Western Union operator came to me and said, Shake, Edison, we are okay. We've got a cent. I felt very happy because we were poor. These occasions are very enjoyable to a poor man, but they rarely occur. There is a calm sense of detachment about this description that has been possessed by the narrator even in the most anxious moments of his career. He was determined to see all that could be seen and, quitting his perch on the telegraph booth, sought the more secluded headquarters of the pool forces. A friend of mine was an operator who worked in the office of Belden and Company, 60 Broadway, which were headquarters for Fisk. Mr. Gould was uptown in the Erie office in the Grand Opera House. The firm on Broad Street, Smith and Gould and Martin, was the other branch. All were connected with wires. Gould seemed to be in charge, Fisk being the executive downtown. Fisk wore a velvet corduroy coat and a very peculiar vest. He was very chipper and seemed to be light-hearted and happy. Sitting around the room were about a dozen fine-looking men. All had the complexion of cadavers. There was a basket of champagne. Hundreds of boys were rushing and paying checks, all checks being payable to Belden and Company. When James Brown of Brown Brothers and Company broke the corner by selling five million gold, all payments were repudiated by Smith, Gould, and Martin, but they continued to receive checks at Belden and Company's for some time until the street got wind of the game. There was some kind of conspiracy with the government people, which I could not make out, but I heard messages that opened my eyes as to the ramifications of Wall Street. Gold fell to 132, and it took us all night to get the indicator back to that quotation. All night long, the streets were full of people. Every broker's office was brilliantly lighted all night, and all hands were at work. The clearinghouse for gold had been swamped, and all was mixed up. No one knew if he was bankrupt or not. Edison in those days rather liked the modest coffee shops and mentions visiting one. When on the New York number one wire that I worked in Boston, there was an operator named Jerry Brost at the other end. He was a first-class receiver and rapid sender. We made up a scheme to hold this wire, so he changed one letter of the alphabet, and as soon as I got used to it, and finally we changed three letters. If any operator tried to receive from Brost, he couldn't do it, so Brost and I always worked together. Brost did less talking than any operator I ever knew. Never having seen him, I went while in New York to call upon him. I did all the talking. He would listen, stroke his beard, and say nothing. In the evening, I went over to an all-night lunch house in the printing house square in a basement, Oliver's. Night editors included Horace Greeley and Henry Raymond of the New York Times took their midnight lunch there. When I went with Brost and the other operator, they pointed out two or three men who were then celebrated in the newspaper world. The night was intensely hot and close. After getting our lunch and upon reaching the sidewalk, Brost opened his mouth and said, That's a great place. A plate of cakes, a cup of coffee, and a Russian bath for 10 cents. This was about 50% of his conversation for two days. The work of Edison on the gold indicator had thrown him into close relationships with Mr. Franklin L. Pope, the young telegraph engineer then associated with Dr. Laws, and afterward a distinguished expert and technical writer who became president of the American Institute of Electrical Engineers in 1886. Each recognized the special ability of the other, and barely a week after the famous events of Black Friday, the announcement of their partnership appeared in the Telegrapher of October 1, 1869. This was the first professional card, if it may be so described, ever issued in America by a form of electrical engineers, and is here reproduced. 
It is probable that the advertisement, one of the largest in the _Telegrapher_, and appearing frequently, was not paid for at full rates, as the publisher, Mr. J. N. Ashley, became a partner in the firm, and not altogether a "sleeping one" when it came to the division of profits, which at times were considerable. In order to be near his new friend, Edison boarded the Pope at Elizabeth, New Jersey, for some time, living the strenuous life in the performance of his duties. Associated with Pope and Ashley, he followed up his work on telegraph printers with marked success. While with them, I devised a printer to print gold quotations instead of indicating them. The lines were started, and the whole was sold out to the Gould and Stock Telegraph Company. My experimenting was all done in that small shop of Dr. Bradley, located near the station of the Pennsylvania Railroad in New Jersey City. Every night I left for Elizabeth on the 1 a.m. train, then walked half a mile to Mr. Pope's house and up at 6 a.m. for breakfast to catch the 7 a.m. train. This continued for all winter, and many were the occasions when I was nearly frozen in the Elizabeth Walk. This Dr. Bradley appears to have been the first in this country to make electrical measurements of precision with a galvanometer but was an old-school experimenter who had worked for years on an experiment without commercial value. He was also extremely irascible, and when on one occasion the connecting wire would not come out of one of the binding posts of a new and costly galvanometer, he jerked the instrument to the floor and then jumped on it. He must have been, however, a man of originality, as evidenced by his attempt to age whiskey by electricity, an attempt that has often been made. The hobby he had at the time I was there, says Edison, was the aging of raw whiskey by passing strong electric currents through it. He had arranged 20 jars with platinum electrodes held in place by hard rubber. When all was ready, he filled the cells with whiskey, connected the battery, locked the door of the small room to which he had placed, and gave positive orders that no one should enter. He then disappeared for three days. On the second day, we noticed a terrible smell in the shop, as if from some dead animal. The next day, the doctor arrived, and noticing the smell, asked what was dead. We all thought something had gotten into his whiskey room and died. He opened it and was nearly overcome. The hard rubber he used was, of course, full of sulfur, and this being attacked by a nauseous hydrogen had produced sulfide hydrogen gas in torrents, displacing all the air in the room. Sulfuride hydrogen is, as is well known, the gas given off by rotten eggs. Another glimpse of this period of development is afforded by an interesting article on the Stock Reporting Telegraph in the Electrical World of March 4, 1899, by Mr. Ralph W. Pope, the well-known secretary of the American Institute of Electrical Engineers, who had, as a youth, an active and intimate connection with that branch of the electrical industry. In the course of his article, he mentions the curious fact that Dr. Laws, at first, in receiving quotations from the exchanges, was so distrustful of the Morse system that he installed long lines of speaking tubes as a more satisfactory and safe device than the telegraph wires. As to the relations of that time, Mr. Pope remarks, The rivalry between the two concerns resulted in consolidation. Dr. Law's enterprise being absorbed by the Gold and Stock Telegraph Company, while the Law stock printer was relegated to the scrap heap and the museum competition in the field did not, however, cease. Messrs. Pope and Edison invented a one-wire printer and started a system of gold printers devoted to the recording of gold quotations and sterling exchange only. It was intended more specifically for importers and exchange brokers and was furnished at a lower price than the indicator service. The building and equipment of private telegraph lines was also entered upon. This business was subsequently absorbed by the Gold and Stock Telegraph Company, which was probably at this time at the height of its prosperity. The financial organization of the company was peculiar and worthy of attention. Each subscriber for a machine paid in $100 for the privilege of securing an instrument, 
For the service, he paid $25 weekly. In case he retired or failed, he could transfer his right and employees were constantly on the alert for purchasable rights, which could be disposed of at a profit. It was occasionally worth the profit to convince a man that he did not actually own the machine which had been placed in his office. The Western Union Telegraph Company secured a majority of its stock and General Marshall Lefferts was elected president. A private line department was established and the business taken over from Pope, Edison, and Ashley was rapidly enlarged. At this juncture, General Lefferts, as president of the Gold and Stock Telegraph Company, requested Edison to go to work on improving the stock ticker. Furnishing the money and the well-known universal ticker in widespread use in this day was one result. Mr. Edison gives a graphic picture of the startling efforts of his fortunes. I made a great many inventions. One was the special ticker used for many years outside of New York in other large cities. This was made exceedingly simple as they did not have the experts we had in New York to handle anything complicated. The same ticker was used on the London Stock Exchange. After I had made a great number of inventions and obtained patents, the general seemed anxious that the matter should be closed up. One day I exhibited and worked on a successful device whereby if a ticker should get out of unison in a broker's office and commence to print wild figures, it could be brought in unison from the central station, which saved the labor of many men and much trouble to the broker. He called me into his office and said, Now, young man, I want to close up the matter of your inventions. How much do you think you should receive? I had made up my mind that, taking into consideration the time and the killing pace I was working at, I should be entitled to $5,000, but could get along with 3000 when the psychological moment arrived, I hadn't the nerve to name such a large sum, so I said, Well, General, suppose you make me offer. Then he said, How would $40,000 strike you? This caused me to come as near fainting as I had ever got. I was afraid he would hear my heart beat. I managed to say that I thought it was fair. All right, I will have a contract drawn. Come around in three days and signed it and I will give you the money. I arrived on time but had been doing some considerable thinking on the subject. The sum seemed to be very large for the amount of work for at that time I determined the value by the time and trouble and not by what the invention was worth to others. I thought there was something unreal about it. However, the contract was handed to me. I signed without reading it. Edison was then handed the first check he'd ever received, one for $40,000 drawn on the Bank of New York at the corner of William and Wall Street. On going to the bank and passing in the check of the paying teller, some brief remarks were made to him, which in his deafness he did not understand. The check was handed back to him, and Edison, fancying for a moment that in some way he had been cheated, went outside to the large steps to let the cold sweat evaporate. He then went back to the general, who with his secretary had a good laugh over the matter, told him the check must be endorsed, and sent him with a young man to identify him. The ceremony of identification performed with the paying teller, who was quite merry over the incident. Edison was given the amount in bundles of small bills until there certainly seemed to be a one cubit foot. Unaware, that he was the victim of a practical joke. Edison proceeded gravely to stow away the money in his overcoat pockets and all his other pockets. He then went to Newark and sat up all night with the money for fear it might be stolen. Once more he sought help next morning when the general laughed heartily and telling the clerk that the joke must be not carried any further and enabled him to deposit the currency in the bank and open an account. Thus, in an inconceivably brief time, had Edison passed from poverty to independence, made a deep impression as to his originality and ability on important people, and brought out valuable inventions, lifting himself at one bound out of the ruck of mediocrity and away from the deadening drudgery of a key. Best of all, he was enterprising, one of the leaders and pioneers for whom the world is always looking, 
and to use his own criticism of himself, he had too sanguine a temperament to keep money in solitary confinement. Quiet self-possession, he seized his opportunity, began to buy machinery, rented a shop, and got to work. Moving quickly into a larger shop, numbers 10 and 12 Ward Street, Newark, New Jersey, he secured large orders from General Lefferitz to build stock tickers and employed 50 men. As business increased, he put on a night force and was his own foreman on both shifts. Half an hour of sleep three or four times in the 24 hours was all he needed in those days. When one invention succeeded, another with dazzling rapidity, and when he worked with the new fierce eruptive energy of a great volcano, throwing out new ideas incessantly with spectacular effect on the arts to which they related. It has always been a theory with Edison that we need sleep altogether too much, but on the other hand, he never, until long past 50, knew or practiced the slightest moderation in his work or in the use of strong coffee and black cigars. He has, moreover, while of tender and kindly disposition, never hesitated to use men up as freely as a Napoleon or Grant, seeing only the goal of a complete invention or perfect device to attain which all else must become subsidiary. He gives a graphic picture of his first methods as a manufacturer. Nearly all of my men were on piecework, and I allowed them to make good wages and never cut until the pay became absurdly high as they got more expert. I kept no books. I had two hooks. All the bills and accounts I owned I jabbed on one hook, and the memorandum of all who owed me I put on the other. When some of the bills fell due and I couldn't deliver tickets to get a supply of money, I gave a note. When the notes were due, a messenger came around from the bank with the note and a protest pinned to it for $1.25. Then I would go to New York and get an advance or pay the note if I had the money. This method of giving notes for my accounts and having all notes protested I kept up for over two years, Yet my credit was fine. Every store I traded with was always glad to furnish goods, perhaps in amazed admiration of my system of doing business, which was certainly new. After a while, Edison got a bookkeeper whose vagrancies made him look back with regret on the earlier primitive method. The first three months I had him go over all the books to find out how much we made. He reported $3,000. I gave a supper to some of my men to celebrate this, only to be told two days afterward that he made a mistake, and we had lost $500. And then a few days after that, he came to me again and said he was all mixed up, and now he found we'd made over $7,000. Edison changed bookkeepers, but never thereafter counted anything real profit until he had paid all his debts and had the profits in the bank. The factory work at this time related chiefly to stock tickers, principally the Universal, of which at one time 1,200 were in use. Edison's connections with this particular device was very close while it lasted. In a review of the ticker art, Mr. Callahan stated, with rather grudging praise, that a ticker at the present time, 1901, would be considered as impractical and unsaleable if it were not provided with a unison device. And he goes on to remark, the first unison on stock tickers was one used on the law's printer, footnote two. It was a crude and unsatisfactory piece of mechanism and necessitated doubling of the battery in order to bring it into action. It was short-lived. The Edison unison compromised a lever with a free and traveling on a spiral or worm on the type wheel shaft until it met a pin at the end of the worm, thus obstructing the shaft and leaving the type wheels at the zero point until released by the printing lever. This device is too well known to require a further description. It is not applicable to any instrument using two independently moving type wheels, but on nearly, if not all, other instruments will be found in use. The stock ticker has enjoyed the devotion of many brilliant inventors, G.M. Phelps, H. Van Hovenberg, A.A. A. Knudsen, G.B. Scott, 
SD Field, John Burry, and remains in extensive use as an application for which no substitute or competitor has been found. In New York, the two great stock exchanges have deemed it necessary to own and operate a stock ticker service for the sole benefit of their members. And down to the present moment, the process of improvement has gone on, impelled by the increasing volume of business to be reported. It is significant of Edison's work, now dimmed and overlaid by later advances, that at the very outset he recognized the vital importance of the interchangeability in the construction of this delicate and sensitive apparatus. But the difficulties of these early days were almost insurmountable. Mr. R. W. Pope says of the universal machines that they were simple and substantial and generally satisfactory, but adds, these instruments were supposed to have been made with interchangeable parts, but as a matter of fact, the instances in which these parts would fit were very few. The instruction book prepared for the use of the inspector states that the parts should not be tinkered or bent as they are accurately made and interchangeable. The difficulties encountered in fitting them properly doubtless gave rise to a story that Mr. Edison had stated there were three degrees of interchangeability. This was interpreted to mean, first, the parts will fit, second, they will almost fit, third, they do not fit and can't be made to fit. Footnote 2. This I invented as well. T-A-E. This early shop affords an illustration of the manner in which Edison has made a deep impression on the personnel of the electrical arts. At a single bench, there work three men since rich or prominent. One was Sigmund Bergman, for a time partner with Edison in his lighting developments in the United States, and now head and principal owner of the electrical works in Berlin, employing 10,000 men. The next man adjacent was John Crusey, afterward engineer of the great General Electric Works at Schenectady. A third was Schuckert, who left the bench to settle up with his father's little estate in Nuremberg, stayed there and founded electrical factories, which became the third largest in Germany, their proprietor dying very wealthy. I gave them good training as to working hours and hustling, says their quadrum master, and this is equally true as applies to many scores of others working in companies bearing Edison's name or organized under Edison patents. It is curiously sufficient in this connection that of the 21 presidents of the National Society, the American Institute of the Electrical Engineers, founded in 1884, eight have been intimately associated with Edison, namely Norvin Green and F.L. Polk, as business colleagues of the days of which we now write, while Messrs. Frank J. Sprague, T.C. Martin, A.E. Kenley, S.S. Wheeler, John W. Lieb, Jr., and Lewis Ferguson have all been at one time or another in Edison employ. The remark was once made that if a famous American teacher sat at one end of a log and a student at the other end, the elements of a successful university were present. It is equally true that in Edison and the many men who have graduated from his stern school of endeavor, America has had its foremost seat of electrical engineering. End of chapter 7. End of Edison, His Life and Inventions by Frank This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Edison, His Life and Inventions by Frank Lewis Dyer and Thomas Comerford Martin Chapter 8 Automatic, Duplex, and Quadruplex Telegraphy Work of various kinds poured in upon the young manufacturer, busy also with his own schemes and inventions, which soon began to follow so many distinct lines of inquiry 
that it ceases to be easy or necessary for the historian to treat them all in chronological sequence. Some notions of his ceaseless activity may be formed from the fact that he started no fewer than three shops in Newark during 1870 and 1871, and while directing these was also engaged by the men who controlled the Automatic Telegraph Company of New York, which had a circuit to Washington, to help it out of its difficulties. Quote, Soon after starting the large shop, 10 and 12 Ward Street, Newark, I rented shop room to the inventor of a new rifle. I think it was the Burden. In any event, it was a rifle which was subsequently adopted by the British Army. The inventor employed a toolmaker who was the finest and best toolmaker I had ever seen. I noticed that he worked pretty near the whole of the twenty-four hours. This kind of application I was looking for. He was getting $21.50 per week, and was also paid for overtime. I asked him if he could run the shop. I don't know. Try me, he said. All right. I will give you $60 per week to run both shifts. He went at it. His executive ability was greater than that of any other man I have yet seen. His memory was prodigious, conversation laconic, and movements rapid. He doubled the production inside three months, without materially increasing the payroll, by increasing the cutting speeds of tools, and by the use of various devices. When in need of rest, he would lie down on a workbench, sleep twenty or thirty minutes, and wake up fresh. As this was just what I could do, I naturally conceived great pride in having such a man in charge of my work. But almost everything has trouble connected with it. He disappeared one day, and although I sent men everywhere that it was likely he could be found, he was not discovered. After two weeks, he came into the factory in a terrible condition as to clothes and face. He sat down and turning to me, said, Edison, it's no use. This is the third time. I can't stand prosperity. Put my salary back and give me a job. I was very sorry to learn that it was whiskey that spoiled such a career. I gave him an inferior job and kept him for a long time. Unquote. Edison had now entered definitely upon that career as an inventor which has left so deep an imprint on the records of the United States Patent Office, where from his first patent in 1869 up to the summer of 1910, no fewer than 1,328 separate patents have been applied for in his name, averaging 32 every year and one about every 11 days, with a substantially corresponding number issued. The height of this inventive activity was attained about 1882, in which year no fewer than 141 patents were applied for, and 75 granted to him, or nearly nine times as many as in 1876, when invention as a profession may be said to have been adopted by this prolific genius. It will be understood, of course, that even these figures do not represent the full measure of active invention, as in every process and at every step there were many discoveries that were not brought to patent registration, but remained trade secrets, and furthermore that in practically every case the actual patented invention followed from one to a dozen or more gradually developing forms of the same idea. An Englishman named George Little had brought over a system of automatic telegraphy, which worked well on a short line, but was a failure when put upon the longer circuits for which automatic methods are best adapted. The general principle involved in automatic or rapid telegraphs, except the photographic ones, is that of preparing the message in advance for dispatch by perforating narrow strips of paper with holes, work which can be done either by hand punches or by typewriter apparatus. A certain group of perforations corresponds to a Morse group of dots and dashes for a letter of the alphabet, 
when the tape thus made ready is run rapidly through a transmitting machine, electrical contact occurs wherever there is a perforation, permitting the current from the battery to flow into the line and thus transmit signals correspondingly. At the distant end, these signals are received sometimes on ink-writing recorder as dots and dashes, or even as typewriting letters. But in many of the earlier systems, like that of Bain, the record at the higher rates of speed was affected by chemical means, a tell-tale stain being made on the traveling strip of paper by every spurt of incoming current. Solutions of potassium iodide were frequently used for this purpose, giving a sharp blue record, but fading away too rapidly. The little system had perforating apparatus operated by electromagnets. Its transmitting machine was driven by a small electromagnetic motor, and the record was made by electrochemical decomposition. The writing member being a minute platinum roller instead of the more familiar iron stylus. Moreover, a special type of wire had been put up for the single circuit of 280 miles between New York and Washington. This is believed to have been the first compound wire made for telegraphic or other signaling purposes, the object being to secure greater lightness with textile strength and high conductivity. It had a steel core with a copper ribbon wound spirally around it and tinned to the core wire. But the results obtained were poor, and in their necessity the parties in interest turned to Edison. Mr. E. H. Johnson tells of the conditions. Quote, General W. J. Palmer and some New York associates had taken up the little automatic system and had expended quite a sum in its development, when, thinking that they had reduced it to practice, they got Tom Scott of the Pennsylvania Railroad to send his superintendent of telegraph over to look into and report upon it. Of course he turned it down. The syndicate was appalled at this report, and in this extremity, General Palmer thought of the man who had impressed him as knowing it all by the telling of telegraphic tales as a means of whiling away lonesome hours on the plains of Colorado, where they were associated in railroad building. So this man, it was I, was sent for to come to New York and assuage their grief if possible. My report was that the system was sound fundamentally, that it contained the germ of a good thing, but needed working out. Associated with General Palmer was one Colonel Josiah C. Reef, then Eastern Bond Agent for the Kansas Pacific Railroad. The Colonel was always resourceful, and didn't fail in this case. He knew of a young fellow who was doing some good work for Marshall Lefferts, and who it was said was a genius at invention, and a very fiend for work. His name was Edison and he had a shop out of Newark, New Jersey. He came and was put in my care for the purpose of a mutual exchange of ideas and for a report by me as to his competency in the matter. This was my introduction to Edison. He confirmed my views of the automatic system. He saw its possibilities as well as the chief obstacles to be overcome, viz., the sluggishness of the wire, together with the need of mechanical betterment of the apparatus, and he agreed to take the job on one condition, namely, that Johnson would stay and help, as he was the man with ideas. Mr. Johnson was accordingly given three months' leave from Colorado Railroad Building, and has never seen Colorado since." Unquote. Applying himself to the difficulties with wanted energy, Edison devised new apparatus, and solved the problem to such an extent that he and his assistants succeeded in transmitting and recording 1,000 words per minute between New York and Washington, and 3,500 words per minute to Philadelphia. Ordinary manual transmission by key is not in excess of 40 to 50 words a minute. Stated very briefly, Edison's principal contribution to the commercial development of the automatic was based on the observation that in a line of considerable length 
electrical impulses become enormously extended or sluggish due to a phenomenon known as self-induction which with ordinary morse work is in a measure corrected by condensers but in the automatic the aim was to deal with impulses following each other from twenty-five to one hundred times as rapidly as in morse lines and to attempt to receive and record intelligibly such a lightning-like succession of signals would have seemed impossible. But Edison discovered that by utilizing a shunt around the receiving instrument with a soft iron core, the self-induction would produce a momentary and instantaneous reversal of the current at the end of each impulse, and thereby give an absolutely sharp definition to each signal. This discovery did away entirely with sluggishness, and made it possible to secure high speeds over lines of comparatively great lengths. But Edison's work on the automatic did not stop with this basic suggestion, for he took up and perfected the mechanical construction of the instruments, as well as the perforators, and also suggested numerous electrosensitive chemicals for the receivers, so that the automatic telegraph almost entirely by reason of his individual work, was placed on a plane of commercial practicability. The long line of patents secured by him in this art is an interesting exhibit of the development of a germ to a completed system, not, as is usually the case, by numerous inventors working over considerable periods of time, but by one man evolving the successive steps at a white heat of activity. The system was put in commercial operation, but the company, now encouraged, was quite willing to allow Edison to work out his idea of an automatic that would print the message in bold Roman letters instead of in dots and dashes, with consequent gain in speed in delivery of the message after its receipt in the operating room, it being obviously necessary in the case of any message received in Morse characters to copy it in script before delivery to the recipient. A large shop was rented in Newark, equipped with $25,000 worth of machinery, and Edison was given full charge. Here he built their original type of apparatus, as improved, and also pushed his experiments on the letter system so far that at a test between New York and Philadelphia, 3,000 words were sent in one minute and recorded in Roman type. Mr. D. N. Craig, one of the early organizers of the Associated Press, became interested in this company, whose president was Mr. George Harrington, formerly Assistant Secretary of the United States Treasury. Mr. Craig brought with him at this time, the early seventies, from Milwaukee a Mr. Shoals, who had a wooden model of a machine to which had been given the then new and unfamiliar name of typewriter. Craig was interested in the machine and put the model in Edison's hands to perfect. Quote, this typewriter proved a difficult thing, says Edison, to make commercial. The alignment of the letters was awful. One letter would be one-sixteenth of an inch above the others, and all the letters wanted to wander out of line. I worked on it till the machine gave fair results. Some were made and used in the office of the automatic company. Craig was very sanguine that some day all business letters would be written on a typewriter. He died before that took place, but it gradually made its way. The typewriter I got into commercial shape is now known as the Remington. About this time I got an idea I could devise an apparatus by which four messages could simultaneously be sent over a single wire without interfering with each other. I now had five shops, and with experimenting on this new scheme I was pretty busy. At least I did not have ennui." Unquote. A very interesting picture of Mr. Edison at this time is furnished by Mr. Patrick B. Delaney, a well-known inventor in the field of automatic and multiplex telegraphy, who at that time was a chief operator of the Franklin Telegraph Company in Philadelphia. His remark about Edison is that, quote, 
His ingenuity inspired confidence, and wavering financiers stiffened up when it became known that he was to develop the automatic, unquote, is a noteworthy evidence of the manner in which the young inventor had already gained a firm footing. He continues, quote, Edward H. Johnson was brought on from the Denver and Rio Grande Railway to assist in the practical introduction of automatic telegraphy on a commercial basis, and about this time, in 1872, I joined the enterprise. Fairly good results were obtained between New York and Washington, and Edison, indifferent to theoretical difficulties, set out to prove high speeds between New York and Charleston, South Carolina, the compound wires being hitched up to one of the southern and Atlantic wires from Washington to Charleston for the purpose of experimentation. Johnson and I went to the Charleston end to carry out Edison's plans, which were rapidly unfolded by telegraph every night from a loft on Lower Broadway, New York. We could only get the wire after all business was cleared, usually about midnight, and for months in the quiet hours that wire was subjected to more electrical acrobatics than any other wire ever experienced. When the experiments ended, Edison's system was put into regular commercial operation between New York and Washington, and did fine work. If the single wire had not broken about every other day, the venture would have been a financial success, but moisture got in between the copper ribbon and the steel core, setting up galvanic action which made short work of the steel. The demonstration was, however, sufficiently successful to impel J. Gould to contract to pay about four million dollars in stock for the patents. The contract was never completed so far as the four million dollars were concerned, but Gould made good use of it in getting control of the Western Union. Unquote. One of the most important persons connected with the automatic enterprise was Mr. George Harrington, to whom we have above referred, and with whom Mr. Edison entered into close confidential relations, so that the inventions made were held jointly under a partnership deed covering, quote, any inventions or improvements that may be useful or desired in automatic telegraphy, unquote. Mr. Harrington was assured at the outset by Edison that while the little perforator would give on the average only seven or eight words per minute, which was not enough for commercial purposes, he could devise one giving fifty or sixty words, and that while the little solution for the receiving tape cost fifteen dollars to seventeen dollars per gallon, he could furnish a ferric solution costing only five or six cents per gallon. In every respect, Edison made good, and in a short time the system was a success. Quote, Mr. Little having withdrawn his obsolete perforator, his ineffective resistance, his costly chemical solution, to give place to Edison's perforator, Edison's resistance and devices, and Edison's solution costing a few cents per gallon. But, continues Mr. Harrington in a memorable affidavit, the inventive efforts of Mr. Edison were not confined to automatic telegraphy, nor did they cease with the opening of that line to Washington, unquote. They all led up to the quadruplex. Flattered by their success, Messrs. Harrington and Reef, who owned with Edison the foreign patents for the new automatic system, entered into an arrangement with the British Postal Telegraph Authorities for a trial of the system in England, involving its probable adoption, if successful. Edison was sent to England to make the demonstration, in 1873, reporting there to Colonel George E. Gouraud, who had been an associate in the United States Treasury with Mr. Harrington, and was now connected with the new enterprise. With one small satchel of clothes, three large boxes of instruments, and a bright fellow telegrapher named Jack Wright, he took voyage on the Jumping Java, as she was humorously known, of the Cunard Line. The voyage was rough, and the little Java justified her reputation by jumping all over the ocean. Quote, At the table, says Edison, there were never more than ten or twelve people. 
I wondered at the time how it could pay to run an ocean steamer with so few people. But when we got into calm water and could see the green fields, I was astounded to see the number of people who appeared. There were certainly two or three hundred. I learned afterward that they were mostly going to the Vienna Exposition. Only two days could I get on deck, and on one of these a gentleman had a bad scalp wound from being thrown against the iron wall of a small smoking-room erected over a freight hatch." Unquote. Arrived in London, Edison set up his apparatus at the Telegraph Street headquarters, and sent his companion to Liverpool with the instruments for that end. The condition of the test was that he was to send from Liverpool and receive in London, and to record at the rate of one thousand words per minute, five hundred words to be sent every half hour for six hours. Edison was given a wire and batteries to operate with, but a preliminary test soon showed that he was going to fail. Both wire and batteries were poor, and one of the men detailed by the authorities to watch the test remarked quietly, in a friendly way, quote, You are not going to have much show. They are going to give you an old Bridgewater Canal wire that is so poor we don't work it, and a lot of sand batteries at Liverpool." Unquote. Footnote. The sand battery is now obsolete. In this type, the cell containing the elements was filled with sand, which was kept moist with an electrolyte. The situation was rather depressing to the young American, thus encountering, for the first time, the stolid conservatism and opposition to change that characterizes so much of official life and methods in Europe. Quote, I thanked him, says Edison, and hoped to reciprocate somehow. I knew I was in a hole. I had been staying at a little hotel in Covent Garden called the Hummums, and got nothing but roast beef and flounders, and my imagination was getting into a coma. What I needed was pastry. That night I found a French pastry shop in High Holborn Street and filled up. My imagination got all right. Early in the morning I saw Gorod, stated my case, and asked if he would stand for the purchase of a powerful battery to send to Liverpool. He said yes. I went immediately to Apps on the Strand and asked if he had a powerful battery. He said he hadn't that all he had was Tyndall's Royal Institution battery, which he supposed would not serve. I saw it, one hundred cells, and, getting the price, one hundred guineas, hurried to Garode. He said, Go ahead. I telegraphed to the man in Liverpool. He came on, got the battery to Liverpool set up and ready, just two hours before the test commenced. One of the principal things that made the system a success was that the line was put to earth at the sending end through a magnet, and the extra current from this, passed to the line, served to sharpen the recording waves. This new battery was strong enough to pass a powerful current through the magnet without materially diminishing the strength of the line current. Unquote. The test under these more favorable circumstances was a success. Quote, the record was as perfect as copper plate, and not a single remark was made in the time lost column. Unquote. Edison was now asked if he thought he could get a greater speed through submarine cables with this system than with the regular methods, and replied that he would like a chance to try it. For this purpose, 2,200 miles of Brazilian cable then stored under water in tanks at the Greenwich Works of the Telegraph Construction and Maintenance Company near London, was placed at his disposal from 8 p.m. until 6 a.m. Quote, This just suited me, as I preferred night work. I got my apparatus down and set up, and then to get a preliminary idea of what the distortion of the signal would be, I sent a single dot which should have been recorded upon my automatic paper by a mark about one-thirty-second of an inch long. Instead of that, it was twenty-seven feet long. If I ever had any conceit, it vanished from my boots up. I worked on this cable more than two weeks, and the best I could do was two words per minute. 
which was only one-seventh of what the guaranteed speed of the cable should be when laid. What I did not know at the time was that a coiled cable, owing to induction, was infinitely worse than when laid out straight, and that my speed was as good as, if not better than, with the regular system, but no one told me this." Unquote. While he was engaged on these tests, Colonel Garode came down one night to visit him at the lonely works, spent a vigil with him, and toward morning wanted coffee. There was only one little inn nearby, frequented by longshoremen and employees from the soap works and cement factories, a rough lot, and there at daybreak they went as soon as the other customers had left for work. Quote, the place had a bar and six bare tables, and was simply infested with roaches. The only things that I ever could get were coffee made from burnt bread with brown molasses cake. I ordered these for Garode. The taste of the coffee, the insects, etc., were too much. He fainted. I gave him a big dose of gin, and this revived him. He went back to the works and waited until six when the day men came, and telegraphed for a carriage. He lost all interest in the experiments after that, and I was ordered back to America." Unquote. Edison states, however, that the automatic was finally adopted in England and used for many years, indeed is still in use there. But they took whatever was needed from his system, and he, quote, has never heard a cent from them, unquote. Arduous work was at once resumed at home on duplex and quadruplex telegraphy, just as though there had been no intermission or discouragement over dots twenty-seven feet long. A clue to his activity is furnished in the fact that in 1872 he had applied for 38 patents in the class of telegraphy, and 25 in 1873, several of these being for duplex methods, on which he had experimented. The earlier apparatus had been built several years prior to this, as shown by a curious little item of news that appeared in the telegrapher of January 30, 1869. Quote, T. A. Edison has resigned his situation in the Western Union office, Boston, and will devote his time to bringing out his inventions. Unquote. Oh, the supreme, splendid confidence of youth! Six months later, as we have seen, he had already made his mark, and the same journal in October 1869 could say, quote, Mr. Edison is a young man of the highest order of mechanical talent, combined with good scientific electrical knowledge and experience. He has already invented and patented a number of valuable and useful inventions, among which may be mentioned the best instrument for double transmission yet brought out. Unquote. Not bad for a novice of twenty-two. It is natural, therefore, after his intervening work on indicators, stock tickers, automatic telegraphs, and typewriters, to find him harking back to duplex telegraphy, if, indeed, he can be said to have dropped it in the interval. It has always been one of the characteristic features of Edison's method of inventing that work in several lines has gone forward at the same time. No one line of investigation has ever been enough to occupy his thoughts fully, or to express it otherwise, he has found rest in turning from one field of work to another, having absolutely no recreations or hobbies, and not needing them. It may also be said that, once entering it, Mr. Edison has never abandoned any field of work. He may change the line of attack, he may drop the subject for a time, but sooner or later the notebooks or the patent office will bear testimony to the reminiscent outcroppings of latent thought on the matter. His attention has shifted chronologically and by process of evolution from one problem to another, and some results are found to be final, but the interests of the man in the thing never dies out. No one sees more vividly than he the fact that, in the interplay of the arts, one industry shapes and helps another, and that no invention lives to itself alone. 
the path to the quadruplex lay through work on the duplex, which, suggested first by Moses G. Farmer in 1852, had been elaborated by many ingenious inventors, notably in this country by Stearns, before Edison once again applied his mind to it. The different methods of such multiple transmission, namely the simultaneous dispatch of the two communications in opposite directions over the same wire, or the dispatch of both at once in the same direction, gave plenty of play to ingenuity. Prescott's Elements of the Electric Telegraph, a standard work in its day, described, quote, a method of simultaneous transmission invented by T. A. Edison of New Jersey in 1873, unquote, and says of it, quote, its peculiarity consists in the fact that the signals are transmitted in one direction by reversing the polarity of a constant current, and in the opposite direction by increasing or decreasing the strength of the same current, unquote. Herein lay the germ of the Edison quadruplex. It is also noted that, quote, in 1874, Edison invented a method of simultaneous transmission by induced currents, which has given very satisfactory results in experimental trials, unquote. Interest in the duplex as a field of invention dwindled, however, as the quadruplex loomed up for while the one doubled the capacity of a circuit, the latter created three phantom wires, and thus quadruplexed the working capacity of any line to which it was applied. As will have been gathered from the above, the principle embodied in the quadruplex is that of working over the line with two currents from each end that differ from each other in strength or nature, so that they will affect only instruments adapted to respond to just such currents and no others, and, by so arranging the receiving apparatus as not to be affected by the currents transmitted from its own end of the line. Thus, by combining instruments that respond only to variation in the strength of current from the distant station, with instruments that respond only to the change in the direction of current from the distant station, and by grouping a pair of these at each end of the line, the quadruplex is the result. Four sending and four receiving operators are kept busy at each end, or eight in all. Aside from other material advantages, it is estimated that at least from $15 million to $20 million has been saved by the Edison quadruplex merely in the cost of line construction in America. The quadruplex has not as a rule the same working efficiency that four separate wires have. This is due to the fact that when one of the receiving operators is compelled to break the sending operator for any reason, the break causes the interruption of the work of eight operators instead of two, as would be the case in a single wire. The working efficiency of the quadruplex, therefore, with the apparatus in good working condition, depends entirely upon the skill of the operators employed to operate it. But this does not reflect upon or diminish the ingenuity required for its invention. Speaking of the problem involved, Edison said some years later to Mr. Upton, his mathematical assistant, that, quote, he always considered he was only working from one room to another. Thus, he was not confused by the amount of wire or the thought of distance, unquote. The immense difficulties of reducing such a system to practice made it readily conceived especially when it is remembered that the line itself, running across hundreds of miles of country, is subject to all manner of atmospheric conditions, and varies from moment to moment in its ability to carry current. And also, when it is borne in mind that the quadruplex requires at each end of the line a so-called artificial line, which must have the exact resistance of the working line, and must be varied with the variations in resistance 
of the working line. At this juncture other schemes were fermenting in his brain, but the quadruplex engrossed him. Quote, this problem was of most difficult and complicated kind, and I bent all my energies toward its solution. It required a peculiar effort of the mind, such as the imagining of eight different things moving simultaneously on a mental plane, without anything to demonstrate their efficiency. Unquote. It is perhaps hardly to be wondered at that when notified he would have to pay twelve and a half per cent extra if his taxes in Newark were not at once paid, he actually forgot his own name when asked for it suddenly at the city hall, lost his place in the line, and, the fatal hour striking, had to pay the surcharge after all. So important an invention as the quadruplex could not long go begging, but there were many difficulties connected with its introduction, some of which are best described in Mr. Edison's own words. Quote, Around 1873, the owners of the Automatic Telegraph Company commenced negotiations with Jay Gould for the purchase of the wires between New York and Washington, and the patents for the system, then in successful operation. Jay Gould at that time controlled the Atlantic and Pacific Telegraph Company, and was competing with the Western Union and endeavoring to depress Western Union stock on the exchange. About this time, I invented the quadruplex. I wanted to interest the Western Union Telegraph Company in it, with a view of selling it, but was unsuccessful until I made an arrangement with the chief electrician of the company, so that he could be known as a joint inventor, and receive a portion of the money. At that time, I was very short of money, and needed it more than glory. This electrician appeared to want glory more than money, so it was an easy trade. I brought my apparatus over and was given a separate room with a marble-tiled floor, which, by the way, was a very hard kind of floor to sleep on, and started in putting on the finishing touches. After two months of very hard work, I got a detail at regular times of eight operators and we got it working nicely from one room to another over a wire which ran to Albany and back. Under certain conditions of weather, one side of the quadruplex would work very shakily, and I had not succeeded in ascertaining the cause of the trouble. On a certain day, when there was a board meeting at the company, I was to make an exhibition test. The day arrived. I had picked the best operators in New York, and they were familiar with the apparatus. I arranged that if a storm occurred, and the bad side got shaky, they should do the best they could and draw freely on their imaginations. They were sending old messages. About one o'clock everything went wrong, as there was a storm somewhere near Albany, and the bad side got shaky. Mr. Orton, the president, and William H. Vanderbilt, and the other directors came in. I had my heart trying to climb up around my esophagus. I was paying a sheriff five dollars a day to withhold judgment, which had been entered against me in a case which I had paid no attention to, and if the quadruplex had not worked before the president, I knew I was to have trouble and might lose my machinery. The New York Times came out next day with a full account. I was given five thousand dollars as part payment for the invention, which made me easy, and I expected the whole thing would be closed up. But Mr. Orton went on an extended tour just about that time. I had paid for all the experiments on the quadruplex and exhausted the money, and I was again in straits. In the meantime, I had introduced the apparatus on the lines of the company, where it was very successful. At that time, the general superintendent of the Western Union was General T. T. Eckert, who had been assistant secretary of war with Stanton. Eckert was secretly negotiating with Gould to leave the Western Union and take charge of the Atlantic and Pacific, Gould's company. One day Eckert called me into his office and made inquiries about money matters. I told him Mr. Orton had gone off and left me without means and I was in straits. 
he told me I would never get another cent, but that he knew a man who would buy it. I told him of my arrangement with the electrician, and said I could not sell it as a whole to anybody, but if I got enough for it, I would sell all my interest in any share I might have. He seemed to think his party would agree to this. I had a set of quadruplex over in my shop, 10 and 12 Ward Street, Newark, and he arranged to bring him over next evening to see the apparatus. So the next morning Eckert came over with Jay Gould and introduced him to me. This was the first time I had ever seen him. I exhibited and explained the apparatus, and they departed. The next day Eckert sent for me, and I was taken up to Gould's house, which was near the Windsor Hotel, Fifth Avenue. In the basement he had an office. It was in the evening, and we went in by the servants' entrance, as Eckert probably feared that he was watched. Gould started in at once, and asked me how much I wanted. I said, Make me an offer. Then he said, I will give you thirty thousand dollars. I said, I will sell any interest I may have for that money, which was something more than I thought I could get. The next morning I went with Gould to the office of his lawyers, Sherman and Sterling, and received a check for thirty thousand dollars, with a remark by Gould that I had got the steamboat Plymouth Rock, as he had sold her for thirty thousand dollars, and had just received the check. There was a big fight on between Gould's company and the Western Union, and this caused more litigation. The electrician, on account of the testimony involved, lost his glory. The judge never decided the case, but went crazy a few months afterwards. Unquote. It was obviously a characteristically shrewd move on the part of Mr. Gould to secure an interest in the quadruplex as a factor in his campaign against the Western Union, and as a decisive step toward his control of that system by the subsequent merger that included not only the Atlantic and Pacific Telegraph Company, but the American Union Telegraph Company. Nor was Mr. Gould less appreciative of the value of Edison's automatic system. Referring to matters that will be taken up later in the narrative, Edison says, quote, After this, Gould wanted me to help install the automatic system in the Atlantic and Pacific Company, of which General Eckert had been elected president, the company having bought the automatic telegraph company. I did a lot of work for this company, making automatic apparatus in my shop at Newark. About this time, I invented a district messenger call box system, and organized a company called the Domestic Telegraph Company, and started in to install the system in New York. I had great difficulty in getting subscribers, having tried several canvassers, who, one after another, failed to get subscribers. When I was about to give up, a test operator named Brown, who was on the automatic telegraph wire between New York and Washington, which passed through my Newark shop, asked permission to let him try and see if he couldn't get subscribers. I had very little faith in his ability to get any, but I thought I would give him a chance, as he felt certain of his ability to succeed. He started in, and the results were surprising. Within a month he had procured two hundred subscribers, and the company was a success. I have never quite understood why six men should fail absolutely while the seventh man should succeed. Perhaps hypnotism would account for it. This company was sold out to the Atlantic and Pacific Company. Unquote. As far back as 1872, Edison had applied for a patent on district messenger signal boxes, but it was not issued until January 1874, another patent being granted in September of the same year. In this field of telegraph application, as in others, Edison was a very early comer, his only predecessor being the fertile and ingenious Callahan of stock ticker fame. The first president of the Gold and Stock Telegraph Company, Elisha W. Andrews, had resigned in 1870 in order to go to England to introduce the stock ticker in London. He lived in Englewood, New Jersey, and the very night he had packed his trunk, the house was burglarized. Calling on his nearest friend the next morning for even a pair of suspenders, 
Mr. Andrews was met with regrets of inability, because the burglars had also been there. A third and fourth friend in the vicinity was appealed to with the same disheartening reply of a story of wholesale spoilation. Mr. Callahan began immediately to devise a system of protection for Englewood, but at that juncture a servant girl, who had been for many years with a family on the heights in Brooklyn, went mad suddenly and held an aged widow and her daughter as helpless prisoners for twenty-four hours without food or water. This incident led to an extension of the protective idea, and very soon a system was installed in Brooklyn with one hundred subscribers. Out of this grew in turn the district messenger system, for it was just as easy to call a messenger as to sound a fire alarm or summon the police. Today no large city in America is without a service of this character, but its function was sharply limited by the introduction of the telephone. Returning to the automatic telegraph, it is interesting to note that so long as Edison was associated with it, as a supervising providence, it did splendid work, which renders the later neglect of automatic or rapid telegraphy the more remarkable. Reed's standard telegraph in America bears astonishing testimony to this point in 1880 as follows, quote, The Atlantic and Pacific Telegraph Company had 22 automatic stations. These included the chief cities on the seaboard, Buffalo, Chicago, and Omaha. The through business during nearly two years was largely transmitted in this way. Between New York and Boston, 2,000 words a minute have been sent. The perforated paper was prepared at the rate of 20 words per minute. Whatever its demerits, this system enabled the Atlantic and Pacific Company to handle a much larger business during 1875 and 1876 than it could otherwise have done with its limited number of wires in their then condition. Unquote. Mr. Reed also notes as a very thorough test of the perfect practicability of the system that it handled the President's message, December 3, 1876, of 12,600 words with complete success. This long message was filed at Washington at 1.05 and delivered in New York at 2.07. The first 9,000 words were transmitted in 45 minutes. The perforated strips were prepared in 30 minutes by 10 persons and duplicated by 9 copyists. But today, nearly 35 years later, telegraphy in America is still practically on a basis of hand transmission. Of this period, and his association with Jay Gould, some very interesting glimpses are given by Edison. Quote, while engaged in putting in the automatic system, I saw a great deal of Gould, and frequently went uptown to his office to give information. Gould had no sense of humor. I tried several times to get off what seemed to me a funny story, but he failed to see any humor in them. I was very fond of stories, and had a choice lot, always kept fresh, with which I could usually throw a man into convulsions. One afternoon, Gould started in to explain the great future of the Union Pacific Railroad, which he then controlled. He got a map, and had an immense amount of statistics. He kept at it for over four hours, and got very enthusiastic. Why he should explain to me, a mere inventor with no capital or standing, I couldn't make out. He had a peculiar eye, and I made up my mind that there was a strain of insanity somewhere. This idea was strengthened shortly afterward, when the Western Union raised the monthly rental of the stock tickers. Gould had one in his house office, which he watched constantly. This he had removed, to his great inconvenience, because the price had been advanced a few dollars. He railed over it. This struck me as abnormal. I think Gould's success was due to abnormal development. He certainly had one trait that all men must have who want to succeed. He collected every kind of information and statistics about his schemes and had all the data. His connection with men prominent in official life, of which I was aware, was surprising to me. His conscience seemed to be atrophied. 
but that may be due to the fact that he was contending with men who never had any to be atrophied. He worked incessantly until twelve or one o'clock at night. He took no pride in building up an enterprise. He was after money, and money only. Whether the company was a success or a failure mattered not to him. After he had hammered the Western Union through his opposition company and had tired out Mr. Vanderbilt, the latter retired from control, and Gould went in and consolidated his company and controlled the Western Union. He then repudiated the contract with the automatic telegraph people, and they never received a cent for their wires or patents, and I lost three years of very hard labor. But I never had any grudge against him, because he was so able in his line, and as long as my part was successful, the money with me was a secondary consideration. When Gould got the Western Union, I knew no further progress in telegraphy was possible, and went into other lines." Unquote. The truth is that General Eckert was a conservative, even a reactionary, and being prejudiced, like many other American telegraph managers, against machine telegraphy, threw out all such improvements. The course of electrical history has been variegated by some very remarkable litigation, but none was ever more extraordinary than that referred to here as arising from the transfer of the Automatic Telegraph Company to Mr. J. Gould and the Atlantic and Pacific Telegraph Company. The terms accepted by Colonel Reef from Mr. Gould on December 30, 1874, provided that the purchasing telegraph company should increase its capital to $15 million, of which the automatic interests were to receive $4 million for their patents, contracts, etc. The stock was then selling at about 25, and in the later consolidation with the Western Union, went in at about 60 so that the real purchase price was not less than one million dollars in cash. There was a private arrangement in writing with Mr. Gould that he was to receive one-tenth of the result to the automatic group and a tenth of the further results secured at home and abroad. Mr. Gould personally bought up and gave money and bonds for one or two individual interests on the above basis, including that of Harrington, who, in his representative capacity, executed assignments to Mr. Gould. But payments were then stopped, and the other owners were left without any compensation, although all that belonged to them in the shape of property and patents was taken over bodily into Atlantic and Pacific hands, and never again left them. Attempts at settlement were made in their behalf, and dragged wearily, due apparently to the fact that the plans were blocked by General Eckert, who had in some manner taken offense at a transaction effected without his active participation in all the details. Edison, who became under the agreement the electrician of the Atlantic and Pacific Telegraph Company, has testified to the unfriendly attitude assumed toward him by General Eckert as president. In a graphic letter from Menlo Park to Mr. Gould, dated February 2, 1877, Edison makes a most vigorous and impassioned complaint of his treatment, quote, which, acting cumulatively, was a long, unbroken disappointment to me, unquote. And he reminds Mr. Gould of promises made to him the day the transfer had been effected of Edison's interest in the quadruplex. The situation was galling to the busy, high-spirited young inventor, who, moreover, had to live, and it led to his resumption of work for the Western Union Telegraph Company, which was only too glad to get him back. Meantime, the saddened and perplexed automatic group was left unpaid, and it was not until 1906, on a bill filed nearly thirty years before, that Judge Hazel in the United States Circuit Court for the Southern District of New York found strongly in favor of the claimants, and ordered an accounting. The court held that there had been a most wrongful appropriation of the patents, including alike those relating to the automatic, the duplex, and the quadruplex, all being included in the general arrangement under which Mr. Gould had put his tempting bait of four million dollars. In the end, however, the complainant had nothing to show for all his struggle, 
as the master who made the accounting set the damages at one dollar. Aside from the great value of the quadruplex, saving millions of dollars, for a share in which Edison received thirty thousand dollars, the automatic itself is described as of considerable utility by Sir William Thompson in his juror report at the Centennial Exposition of 1876, recommending it for award. This leading physicist of his age, afterward Lord Kelvin, was an adept in telegraphy, having made the ocean cable talk, and he saw in Edison's American Automatic, as exhibited by the Atlantic and Pacific Company, a most meritorious and useful system. With the aid of Mr. E. H. Johnson, he made exhaustive tests, carrying away with him to Glasgow University the surprising records that he obtained. His official report closes thus, quote, The electromagnetic shunt with soft iron core invented by Mr. Edison, utilizing Professor Henry's discovery of electromagnetic induction in a single circuit to produce a momentary reversal of the line current, at the instant when the battery is thrown off and so cut off the chemical marks sharply at the proper instant, is the electrical secret of the great speed he has achieved. The main peculiarities of Mr. Edison's automatic telegraph, shortly stated in conclusion, are 1. The perforator, 2. The contact maker, 3. The electromagnetic shunt, and 4 the ferric cyanide of iron solution. It deserves award as a very important step in land telegraphy." Unquote. The attitude thus disclosed toward Mr. Edison's work was never changed, except that admiration grew as fresh inventions were brought forward. To the day of his death, Lord Kelvin remained on terms of warmest friendship with his American co-laborer, with whose genius he thus first became acquainted at Philadelphia in the environment of Franklin. It is difficult to give any complete idea of the activity maintained at the Newark shops during these anxious, harassed years, but the statement that at one time no fewer than forty-five different inventions were being worked upon will furnish some notion of the incandescent activity of the inventor and his assistants. The hours were literally endless, and upon one occasion, when the order was in hand for a large quantity of stock tickers, Edison locked his men in until the job had been finished of making the machine perfect, and all the bugs taken out, which meant sixty hours of unintermitted struggle with the difficulties. Nor were the problems and inventions all connected with telegraphy. On the contrary, Edison's mind welcomed almost any new suggestion as a relief from the regular work in hand. Thus, quote, Toward the latter part of 1875, in the Newark shop, I invented a device for multiplying copies of letters, which I sold to Mr. A. B. Dick of Chicago. And in the years since, it has been universally introduced throughout the world. It is called the mimeograph. I also invented devices for and introduced paraffin paper, now used universally for wrapping up candy, etc. Unquote. The mimeograph employs a pointed stylus, used as in writing with a lead pencil, which is moved over a kind of tough, prepared paper placed on a finely grooved steel plate. The writing is thus traced by means of a series of minute perforations in the sheet from which, as a stencil, hundreds of copies can be made. Such stencils can be prepared on typewriters. Edison elaborated this principle in two other forms, one pneumatic and one electric, the latter being in essence a reciprocating motor. Inside the barrel of the electric pen, a little plunger carrying the stylus travels to and fro at a very high rate of speed due to the attraction and repulsion of the solenoid coils of wire surrounding it. And, as the hand of the writer guides it, the pen thus makes its record in a series of very minute perforations in the paper. The current from a small battery suffices to energize the pen, and with the stencil thus made, hundreds of copies of the document can be furnished. As a matter of fact, 
as many as three thousand copies have been made from a single mimeographic stencil of this character. End of chapter 8 Recording by Tisto Chapter 9 of Edison, His Life and Inventions. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Heidi Preuss. Edison, His Life and Inventions by Frank Lewis Dyer and Thomas Comerford Martin. The Telephone motograph and microphone a very great invention has its own dramatic history episodes full of human interest attend its development the periods of weary struggle the daring adventure along unknown paths the clash of rival claimants are closely similar to those which mark the revelation and subjugation of a new continent at the close of the epoch of discovery, it is seen that mankind as a whole has made more than one great advance. But in the earlier stages, one watched chiefly the confused vicissitudes of fortune of the individual pioneers. The great modern art of telephony has had thus in its beginnings, its evolution, and its present status as a universal medium of intercourse all the elements of surprise, mystery, swift creation of wealth, tragic interludes, and colossal battles that can appeal to the imagination and hold public attention. And in this new electrical industry, in laying its essential foundations, Edison has again been one of the dominant figures. As far back as 1837, the American... Page discovered the curious fact that an iron bar, when magnetized and demagnetized at short intervals of time, emitted sounds due to the molecular disturbances in the mass. Philip Rees, a simple professor in Germany, utilized this principle in the construction of apparatus for the transmission of sound, but in the grasp of the idea he was preceded by Charles Bourseul, a young French soldier in Algeria, who in 1854, under the title of Electrical Telephony, in a Parisian illustrated paper, gave a brief and lucid description as follows. We know that sounds are made by vibrations, and are made sensible to the ear by the same vibrations, which are reproduced by the intervening medium. But the intensity of the vibrations diminishes very rapidly with distance, so that even with the aid of speaking tubes and trumpets, it is impossible to exceed somewhat narrow limits. Suppose a man speaks near a movable disc sufficiently flexible to lose none of the vibrations of the voice, that this disc alternately makes and breaks the connection with a battery. You may have, at a distance, another disc, which will simultaneously execute the same vibrations. Any one who is not deaf and dumb may use this mode of transmission, which would require no apparatus except an electric battery, two vibrating discs, and a wire. This would serve admirably for a portrayal of the Bell telephone, except that it mentions distinctly the use of the make-and-break method, i.e., where the circuit is necessarily opened and closed, as in telegraphy, although, of course, at an enormously higher rate, which is never proved practical. As far as is known, Borsell was not practical enough to try his own suggestion, and never made a telephone. About 1860, Rees built several forms of electrical telephonic apparatus, all imitating, in some degree, the human ear, 
with its auditory tube, tympanum, etc. The examples of the apparatus were exhibited in public not only in Germany, but in England. There is a variety of testimony to the effect that not only musical sounds, but stray words and phrases were actually transmitted with mediocre, casual success. It is impossible, however, to maintain the devices in adjustment for more than a few seconds, since the invention depended upon the make-and-break principle, the circuit being made and broken every time an impulse-creating sound went through it, causing the movement of the diaphragm on which the sound waves impinged. Rees himself does not appear to have been sufficiently interested in the marvelous possibilities of the idea to follow it up, remarking to the man who bought his telephonic instruments and tools that he had shown the world the way. In reality, it was not the way, although a monument erected in his memory at Frankfurt styles him the inventor of the telephone. As one of the American judges said in deciding in early litigation over the invention of the telephone, a hundred years of Reese would not have given the world the telephonic art for public use. Many others after Reese tried to devise practical make-and-break telephones, and all failed, although their success would have rendered them very valuable as means of fighting the Bell patent. But the method was a good starting point, even if it did not indicate the real path. If Reese had been willing to experiment with his apparatus so that it did not make and break, he probably would have been the true father of the telephone, besides giving it the name by which it is now known. It was not necessary to slam the gate open and shut. All that was required was to keep the gate closed and rattle the latch softly. Incidentally, it may be noted that Edison, in experimenting with the Reese transmitter, recognized at once the defect caused by the make-and-break action, and sought to keep the gap closed by the use, first, of one drop of water, and later, of several drops. But the water decomposed, and the incurable defect was still there. The Reese telephone was brought to America by Dr. P. H. Vanderweed, a well-known physicist in his day, and was exhibited by him before a technical audience at Cooper Union, New York, in 1868, and described shortly after in the technical press. The apparatus attracted attention, and a set was secured by Professor Joseph Henry for the Smithsonian Institution. There, the famous philosopher showed and explained it to Alexander Graham Bell, when that young and persevering Scotch genius went to get help and data as to the harmonic telegraphy upon which he was working, and as to transmitting vocal sounds. Bell took up immediately and energetically the idea that his two predecessors had dropped, and reached the goal. In 1875, Bell, who as a student and teacher of vocal physiology had unusual qualifications for determining feasible methods of speech transmission, constructed his first pair of magnetotelephones for such a purpose. In February of 1876, his first telephone patent was applied for, and in March it was issued. The first published account of the modern speaking telephone was a paper read by Bell before the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in Boston in May of that year. While at the Centennial Exposition at Philadelphia, the public first gained any familiarity with it. It was greeted at once with scientific acclaim and enthusiasm as a distinctly new and great invention although at first it was regarded more as a scientific toy than as a commercially valuable device. By an extraordinary coincidence, 
the very day that Bell's application for a patent went into the United States Patent Office, a caveat was filed there by Alicia Gray of Chicago, covering the specific idea of transmitting speech and reproducing it in a telegraphic circuit through an instrument capable of vibrating responsively to all the tones of the human voice and by which they are rendered audible. Out of this incident rose a struggle and a controversy whose echoes are yet heard as to the legal and moral rights of the two inventors, the assertion even being made that one of the most important claims of Gray, that on a liquid battery transmitter, was surreptitiously lifted into the Bell application, then covering only the magneto telephone. It was also asserted that the filing of the Gray caveat antedated by a few hours the filing of the Bell application. All such issues, when brought to the American courts, were brushed aside, the Bell patent being broadly maintained in all its remarkable breadth and fullness, embracing an entire art. But Gray was embittered and chagrined, and to the last expressed his belief that the honor and glory should have been his. The path of Gray to the telephone was a natural one. A Quaker carpenter who studied five years at Oberlin College, he took up electrical invention and brought about many ingenious devices in rapid succession in the telegraphic field, including the now universal needle annunciator for hotels, etc., the useful telautograph, automatic self-adjusting relays, private line printers, leading up to his famous harmonic system. This was based upon a principle that a sound produced in the presence of a reed or tuning fork responded to the sound, and acting as the armature of a magnet in a closed circuit, would by induction set up electrical impulses in the circuit and cause a distant magnet having a similarly tuned armature to produce the same tone or note. He also found that over the same wire at the same time another series of impulses corresponding to another note could be sent through the agency of a second set of magnets without in any way interfering with the first series of impulses. Building the principle into apparatus with a keyboard and vibrating reeds before his magnets, Dr. Gray was able not only to transmit music by his harmonic telegraph, but went so far as to send nine different telegraph messages at the same instant, each set of instruments depending on its selective note while any intermediate office could pick up the message for itself by simply tuning its relays to the keynote required. Theoretically, the system could be split up into any number of notes and semitones. Practically, it served as the basis of some real telegraphic work, but is not now in use. Anyone can realize, however, that it did not take so acute and ingenious a mind very long to push forward to the telephone, as a dangerous competitor with Bell, who had also, like Edison, been working assiduously in the field of acoustic and multiple telegraphs. Seen in retrospect, the struggle for the goal at this moment was one of the memorable incidents in electrical history. Among the interesting papers filed at the Orange Laboratory is a lithograph, the size of an ordinary patent drawing, headed, First Telephone on Record. The claim thus made goes back to the period when all was war, and when dispute was hot and rife as to the actual invention of the telephone. The device shown, made by Edison in 1875, was actually included in the caveat filed January 14, 1876, a month before Bell or Gray. It shows a little solenoid arrangement, with one end of the plunger attached to the diaphragm of a speaking or resonating chamber. 
Edison states that while the device is crudely capable of use as a magnetotelephone, he did not invent it for transmitting speech, but as an apparatus for analyzing the complex waves arising from various sounds. It was made in pursuance of his investigations into the subject of harmonic telegraphs. He did not try the effect of sound waves produced by the human voice until Bell came forward a few months later. But he found then that this device, made in 1875, was capable of use as a telephone. In his testimony and public utterances, Edison has always given Bell credit for the discovery of the transmission of articulate speech by talking against a diaphragm placed in front of an electromagnet. But it is only proper here to note, in passing, the curious fact that he had actually produced a device that could talk prior to 1876, and it was therefore very close to Bell, who took the one great step further. A strong characterization of the value and importance of the work done by Edison in the development of the carbon transmitter will be found in the decision of Judge Brown in the United States Circuit Court of Appeals, sitting in Boston on February 27, 1901, declaring void the famous Berliner patent of the Bell Telephone System. Footnote 5 See Federal Reporter, Volume 109, page 976, and following pages. Bell's patent of 1876 was of an all-embracing character, which only the make-and-break principle, if practical, could have escaped. It was pointed out in the patent that Bell discovered the great principle that electrical undulations induced by the vibrations of a current produced by sound waves can be represented graphically by the same sinusoidal curve that expresses the original sound vibrations themselves, or, in other words, that a curve representing sound vibrations will correspond precisely to a curve representing electrical impulses produced or generated by those identical sound vibrations, as, for example, when the latter impinge upon a diaphragm acting as an armature of an electromagnet, and which by movement to and fro sets up the electric impulses by induction. To speak plainly, the electric impulses correspond in form and character to the sound vibrations which they represent. This reduced to a patent claim governed the art as firmly as a papal bull for centuries enabled Spain to hold the Western world. The language of the claim is the method of an apparatus for transmitting vocal or other sounds telegraphically as herein described by causing electrical undulations similar in form to the vibrations of the air accompanying said vocals or other sounds substantially as set forth. It was a long time, however, before the inclusive nature of this grant over every possible telephone was understood and recognized, and litigation for and against the patent lasted during its entire life. At the outset, the commercial value of the telephone was little appreciated by the public, and Bell had great difficulty in securing capital. But among far-sighted inventors there was an immediate rush to the gold fields. Bell's first apparatus was poor, the results being described by himself as unsatisfactory and discouraging, which was almost as true of the devices he exhibited at the Philadelphia Centennial. The newcomers, like Edison, Berliner, Blake, Hughes, Grant, Gray, Dolbeer, and others brought a wealth of ideas, a fund of mechanical ingenuity, and an inventive ability which soon made the telephone one of the most notable gains of the century, 
and one of the most valuable additions to human resources. The work that Edison did was, as usual, marked by infinite variety of method, as well as by the power to seize on the one needed element of practical success. Every one of the six million telephones in use in the United States, and of the other millions in use throughout the world, bears the imprint of his genius, as at one time the instruments bore his stamped name. For years his name was branded on every Bell telephone set, and his patents were a mainstay of what has been popularly called the Bell Monopoly. Speaking of his own efforts in this field, Mr. Edison says, In 1876 I started again to experiment for the Western Union and Mr. Orton. This time it was the telephone. Bell invented the first telephone, which consisted of the present receiver, used both as a transmitter and a receiver, the magnetotype. It was attempted to introduce it commercially, but it failed on account of its faintness and extraneous sounds which came in on its wires from various causes. Mr. Orton wanted me to take hold of it and make it commercial. As I had also been working on a telegraph system employing tuning forks simultaneously with both Bell and Gray, I was pretty familiar with the subject. I started in and soon produced the carbon transmitter, which is now universally used. Tests were made between New York and Philadelphia, also between New York and Washington, using regular Western Union wires. The noises were so great that not a word could be heard with the bell receiver when used as a transmitter between New York and Newark, New Jersey. Mr. Orton and W. K. Vanderbilt and the Board of Directors witnessed and took part in the tests. The Western Union then put them on private lines. Mr. Theodor Pushkas of Budapest, Hungary, was the first man to suggest a telephone exchange, and soon after exchanges were established. The telephone department was put in the hands of Hamilton McKay Twombly, Vanderbilt's ablest son-in-law, who made a success of it. The Bell Company of Boston also started an exchange, and the fight was on, the Western Union pirating the Bell receiver and the Boston Company pirating the Western Union transmitter. About this time, I wanted to be taken care of. I threw out hints of this desire, but when Mr. Orton sent for me, he had learned that inventors didn't do business by the regular process, and concluded he would close it right up. He asked me how much I wanted. I had made up my mind it was certainly worth $25,000, if it ever mounted to anything for central station work. So that was the sum I had in mind to stick to and get, ostensibly. Still, it had been an easy job, and only required a few months, and I felt a bit shaky and uncertain. So I asked him to make me an offer. He promptly said he would give me a hundred thousand dollars. All right, I said. It is yours on one condition, and that is that you do not pay it all at once, but pay me at the rate of six thousand dollars per year for seventeen years, the life of the patent. He seemed only too pleased to do this, and it was closed. My ambition was soon four times too large for my business capacity, and I knew that I would soon spend this money experimenting if I got it all at once. So I fixed it that I couldn't. I saved seventeen years of worry by this stroke. Thus modestly is told the debut of Edison in the telephone art, to which with his carbon transmitter he gave the valuable principle of varying the resistance of the transmitting circuit with changes in the pressure, as well as the vital practice of using the induction coil as a means of increasing the effective length of the talking circuit. Without these, modern telephony would not and could not exist. See footnote 6. But Edison, in telephonic work, 
as in other directions, was remarkably fertile and prolific. His first inventions in the art, made in 1875-76, continue through many later years, including all kinds of carbon instruments, the water telephone, electrostatic telephone, condenser telephone, chemical telephone, various magneto telephones, inertia telephone, mercury telephone, voltaic pile telephone, musical transmitter, and the electromotograph, all were actually made and tested. Footnote 6. Briefly stated, the essential difference between Bell's telephone and Edison's is this. With the former, the sound vibrations impinge on a steel diaphragm arranged adjacent to the pole of a bar electromagnet, whereby the diaphragm acts as an armature and, by its vibrations, induces very weak electric impulses in the magnetic coil. These impulses, according to Bell's theory, correspond in form to the sound wave, and passing over the line, energize the magnet coil at the receiving end, and by varying that magnetism, cause the receiving diaphragm to be similarly vibrated to reproduce the sounds. A single apparatus is therefore used at each end, performing the double function of transmitter and receiver. With Edison's telephone, a closed circuit is used, on which is constantly flowing a battery current, and included in that circuit is a pair of electrodes, one or both of which is carbon. These electrodes are always in contact with a certain initial pressure, so that current will always be flowing over the circuit. One of the electrodes is connected with the diaphragm on which the sound waves impinge, and the vibrations of this diaphragm causes the pressure between the electrodes to be correspondingly varied, and thereby affects a variation in the current, resulting in the production of impulses which actuate the receiving magnet. In other words, with Bell's telephone, the sound waves themselves generate the electric impulses, which are hence extremely faint. With the Edison telephone, the sound waves actuate an electric value, so to speak, and permit variations in a current of any desired strength. A second distinction between the two telephones is this. With the Bell apparatus, the very weak electric impulses generated by the vibration of the transmitting diaphragm pass over the entire line to the receiving end, and in consequence the permissible length of line is limited to a few miles under ideal conditions. With Edison's telephone, the battery current does not flow on the main line, but passes through the primary circuit of an induction coil, by which corresponding impulses of enormously higher potential are set out on the main line to the receiving end. In consequence, the line may be hundreds of miles in length. No modern telephone system in use today lacks these characteristic features, the varying resistance and the induction coil. The principle of the electromotograph was utilized by Edison in more ways than one, first of all in telegraphy at this juncture. The well-known page patent, which had lingered in the patent office for years, had just been issued, and was considered a formidable weapon. It related to the use of a retractile spring to withdraw the armature lever from the magnet of a telegraph or other relay or sounder, and thus controlled the art of telegraphy except in simple circuits. There was no known way, remarks Edison, whereby this patent could be evaded, and its possessor would eventually control the use of what is known as the relay and sounder. And this was vital to telegraphy. Gould was pounding the Western Union on the stock exchange, disturbing its railroad contracts, and, 
being advised by his lawyers that this patent was of great value, bought it. The moment Mr. Orton heard this, he sent for me, and explained the situation, and wanted me to go to work immediately, and see if I couldn't evade it, or discover some other means that could be used in case Gould sustained the patent. It seemed a pretty hard job, because there was no known means of moving a lever at the other end of a telegraph wire except by the use of a magnet. I said I would go at it that night. In experimenting some years previously, I had discovered a very peculiar phenomenon, and that was that if a piece of metal connected to a battery was rubbed over a moistened piece of chalk, resting on metal connected to the other pole. When the current was passed, the friction was greatly diminished. When the current was reversed, the friction was greatly increased over what it was when no current was passing. Remembering this, I substituted a small piece of chalk rotated by a small electric motor for the magnet, and connecting a sounder to a metallic finger resting on the chalk. The combination claim of Page was made worthless. A hitherto unknown means was introduced in the electric art. Two or three of the devices were made and tested by the company's expert. Mr. Orton, after he had made me sign the patent application and got it in the patent office, wanted to settle for it at once. He asked my price. Again, I said, make me an offer. Again, he named a hundred thousand dollars. I accepted, providing he would pay it at the rate of six thousand dollars a year for seventeen years. This was done, and thus, with the telephone money, I received twelve thousand dollars yearly for that period from the Western Union Telegraph Company. A year or two later, the motograph cropped up again in Edison's work in a curious manner. The telephone was being developed in England, and Edison made arrangements with Colonel Garraud, his old associate in the automatic telegraph, to represent his interests. A company was formed, a large number of instruments were made and sent to Garraud in London, and prospects were bright. When there came a threat of litigation from the owners of the Bell patent, and Garad found he could not push the enterprise unless he could avoid using what was asserted to be an infringement of the bell receiver. He cabled for help to Edison, who sent back word telling him to hold the fort. I had recourse again, says Edison, to the phenomenon discovered by me years previous, that the friction of rubbing an electrode passing over a moist chalk surface was varied by electricity. I devised the telephone receiver, which was afterwards known as the loudspeaking telephone, or chalk receiver. There was no magnet, simply a diaphragm and a cylinder of compressed chalk about the size of a thimble. A thin spring connected to the center of the diaphragm extended outwardly and rested on the chalk cylinder and was pressed against it with a pressure equal to that which would be due to a weight of about six pounds. The chalk was rotated by hand. The volume of the sound was very great. A person talking into the carbon transmitter in New York had his voice so amplified that he could be heard one thousand feet away in an open field at Menlo Park. This great excess of power was due to the fact that the latter came from the person turning the handle. The voice, instead of furnishing all the power as with the present receiver, merely controlled the power, just as an engineer working of value would control a powerful engine. I made six of these receivers and sent them in charge of an expert on the first steamer. They were welcomed and tested, and shortly afterwards I shipped a hundred more. At the same time I was ordered to send twenty young men, after teaching them to become expert. I set up an exchange around the laboratory of ten instruments. I would then go out and get each one out of order in every conceivable way, cutting the wires of one, 
short-circuiting another, destroying the adjustments of a third, putting dirt between the electrodes of a fourth, and so on. A man would be sent to each to find out the trouble. When he could find the trouble ten consecutive times, using five minutes each, he was sent to London. About sixty men were sifted to get twenty. Before all had arrived, the bell company there, seeing we could not be stopped, entered into negotiations for consolidation. One day I received a cable from Gourad, offering thirty thousand for my interest. I cabled back I would accept. When the draft came, I was astonished to find it was for thirty thousand pounds. I had thought it was dollars. In regard to this singular and happy conclusion, Edison makes some interesting comments as to the attitude of the courts towards inventors, and the differences between American and English courts. The men I sent over were used to establish telephone exchanges all over the continent, and some of them became wealthy. It was among this crowd in London that Bernard Shaw was employed before he became famous. The chalk telephone was finally discarded in favor of the bell receiver, the latter being more simple and cheaper. Extensive litigation with newcomers followed. My carbon transmitter patent was sustained and preserved the monopoly of the telephone in England for many years. Bell's patent was not sustained by the courts. Sir Richard Webster, now Chief Justice of England, was my counsel and sustained all of my patents in England for many years. Webster has a marvelous capacity for understanding things scientific, and his address before the courts was lucidity itself. His brain is highly organized. My experience with the legal fraternity is that scientific subjects are distasteful to them, and that it is rare in this country, on account of the system of trying patent suits, for a judge to really reach the meat of the controversy. And inventors scarcely ever get a decision squarely and entirely in their favor. The fault rests, in my judgment, almost wholly with a system under which testimony to the extent of thousands of pages bearing on all conceivable subjects, many of them having no possible connection with the invention in dispute, is presented to an overworked judge in an hour or two of argument supported by several hundred pages of briefs, and the judge is supposed to extract some essence of the justice from this mass of conflicting, blind, and misleading statements. It is a human impossibility, no matter how able and fair-minded the judge may be. In England the case is different. There the judges are face to face with the experts and other witnesses. They get the testimony first hand, and only so much as they need, and there are no long winded briefs and arguments, and the case is decided then and there, a few months perhaps after the suit is brought, instead of many years afterwards, as in this country. And in England, when a case is once finally decided, it is settled for the whole country while here it is not so. Here a patent, having once been sustained, say in Boston, may have to be litigated all over again in New York, and again in Philadelphia, and so on for all the federal circuits. Furthermore, it seems to me that scientific disputes should be decided by some court containing at least one or two scientific men, men capable of comprehending the significance of an invention and the difficulties of its accomplishment, if justice is ever to be given to an inventor. And I think also that this court should have the power to summon before it and examine by recognized experts in the special art who might be able to testify to the facts for or against the patent instead of trying to gather the truth from the tedious essays of hired experts whose dispositions are really nothing but sworn arguments. The real gist of patent suits is generally very simple, and I have no doubt that any judge of fair intelligence, 
assisted by one or more scientific advisers, could in a couple of days, at the most, examine all the necessary witnesses, hear all the necessary arguments, and actually decide an ordinary patent suit, in a way that would more nearly be just, than can now be done by an expenditure of a hundred times as much money, and months and years of preparation. And I have no doubt that the time taken by the courts would be enormously less, because if a judge attempts to read the bulky records and briefs, that work alone would require several days. Acting as judges, Inventors would not be apt to correctly decide a complicated law point, and on the other hand, it is hard to see how a lawyer can decide a complicated scientific point rightly. Some inventors complain of our patent office, but my own experience with the patent office is that the examiners are fair-minded and intelligent, and when they refuse a patent, they are generally right but I think the whole problem lies with the system in vogue in the federal courts for trying patent suits, and in the fact, which cannot be disputed, that the federal judges, which but few exceptions, do not comprehend complicated scientific questions. To secure uniformity in the several federal circuits and correct errors it has been proposed to establish a central court of patent appeals in Washington. This I believe in, but this court should also contain at least two scientific men who would not be blind to the sophistry of paid experts. Refer to footnote 7. Men whose inventions would have created wealth of millions have been ruined and prevented from making any money whereby they could continue their careers as creators of wealth for the general good, just because the experts befuddled the judge by their misleading statements. As an illustration of the perplexing nature of expert advice in patent cases, the reader will probably be interested in pursuing the following extracts from the opinion of Judge Dayton in the suit of Bryce Brothers Co. v. Seneca Glass Co., tried in the United States Circuit Court, Northern District of West Virginia, reported in the Federal Reporter, 140, page 161. On this subject of the validity of this patent, a vast amount of conflicting, technical, perplexing, and almost hypercritical discussion and opinion has been indulged, both in the testimony and in the able and exhaustive arguments and briefs of counsel. Expert Osborne for the defendant, after setting forth minutely his superior qualifications, mechanical education, and great experience, takes up in detail the patent claims, and shows to his own entire satisfaction that none of them are new, that all of them have been applied under one form or another in some twenty-two previous patents, and in two other machines, not patented, to wit, the central glass and Kenny Cobble ones, that the whole machine is only an aggregation of well-known mechanical elements that any skilled designer would bring to his use in the construction of such a machine. This, certainly, under ordinary conditions, would settle the matter beyond peradventure, for this witness is a very wise and learned man in these things, and very positive. But expert Clark appears for the plaintiff, and after setting forth just as minutely his superior qualifications, mechanical education, and great experience, which appear fully equal in all respects to those of expert Osborne, proceeds to take up in detail the patent claims, and shows to his entire satisfaction that all, with possibly one exception, are new, show inventive genius, and distinct advances upon the prior art. In the most lucid and even fascinating way, he discusses all the parts of this machine, compares it with the others, draws distinctions, points out the merits of the one in controversy, and the defects of all the others, 
considers the twenty-odd patents referred to by Osborne, and, in the politest but neatest manner imaginable, shows that expert Osborne did not know what he was talking about, and sums the whole matter up by declaring this invention of Mr. Schrader's, as embodied in the patent in suit, a radical and wide departure from the cabal machine, omitted on all sides to be the nearest prior approach to it. A distinct and important advance in the art of engraving glassware, and generally a machine for this purpose, which has involved the exercise of the inventive faculty in the highest degree. Thus, a more radical and irreconcilable disagreement between experts touching the same thing could hardly be found. So it is with the testimony. If we take that for the defendant the central glass company machine, and especially the Cunny Cabal machine, built and operated years before this patent issued, and not patented, are just as good, just as effective and practical as this one, and capable of turning out just as perfect work, and as great a variety of it. On the other hand, if we take that produced by the plaintiff, we are driven to the conclusion that these prior machines, the product of the same mind, are only progressive steps forward from utter darkness, so to speak, into full inventive sunlight, which made clear to him the solution of the problem in this patented machine. The shortcomings of the earlier machines are minutely set forth, and the witnesses for the plaintiff are clear that they are neither practical nor profitable. But this is not all of the trouble that confronts us in this case. Counsel of both sides, with the indomitable courage that must command admiration, a courage that has led them to a vast amount of study, investigation, and thought, that in fact has made them all experts, have dissected this record of 356 closely printed pages, applied all mechanical principles and laws to the facts as they see them, and, besides, have ransacked the law books and cited an enormous number of cases, more or less in point, as illustration of their respective contentions the courts find nothing more difficult than to apply an abstract principle to all cases of classes that may arise. The facts in each case so frequently create an exception to the general rule that such rule must be honored rather in its breadth than in its observance. Therefore, after a careful examination of these cases, it is no criticism of the courts to say that both sides have found abundant and about equal amount of authority to sustain their respective contentions, and, as a result, counsel have submitted, in briefs, a sum total of 225 closely printed pages, in which they have clearly, yet almost to a mathematical certainty, demonstrated on the one side that this Schrader machine is new and patentable, and on the other that it is old and not so. Under these circumstances, it would be unnecessary labor and a fruitless task for me to enter into any further technical discussion of the mechanical problems involved, for the purpose of seeking to convince either side of its error. In cases of such perplexity as this, generally some incidents appear that speak more unerringly than do the tongues of the witnesses, and to some of these I propose to now refer. Mr. Bernard Shaw, the distinguished English author, has given a most vivid and amusing picture of this introduction of Edison's telephone to England, describing the apparatus as a much too ingenious invention, being nothing less than a telephone of such stentorian efficiency that it bellowed your most private communications all over the house, instead of whispering them with some sort of discretion. Shaw, as a young man, was employed by the Edison Telephone Company, and was very much alive to his surroundings, often assisting in public demonstrations of the apparatus. 
in a manner which I am persuaded laid the foundation of Mr. Edison's reputation. The sketch of the men sent over from America is graphic. Whilst the Edison Telephone Company lasted, it crowded the basement of a high pile of offices in Queen Victoria Street with American artificers. These deluded and romantic men gave me a glimpse of the skilled proletariat of the United States. They sang obsolete sentimental songs with genuine emotion, and their language was frightful even to an Irishman. They worked with a ferocious energy, which was out of all proportion to the actual result achieved. Indomitably resolved to assert their republican manhood by taking no orders from a tall-hatted Englishman, whose stiff politeness covered his conviction that they were relatively to himself inferior and common persons. They insisted on being slave-driven with genuine American oaths by genuine free and equal American foremen. They utterly despised the artful, slow British workman, who did as little for his wages as he possibly could, never hurried himself, and had a deep reverence for one whose pocket could be tapped by respectful behavior. Need I add that they were contemptuously wondered at by this same British workman as a parcel of outlandish adult boys who sweated themselves for their employer's benefit instead of looking out after their own interests? They adored Mr. Edison as the greatest man of all time in every possible department of science, art, and philosophy, and execrated Mr. Graham Bell, the inventor of the rival telephone, as his satanic adversary. But each of them had, or intended to have, on the brink of completion an improvement on the telephone, usually a new transmitter. They were free-souled creatures, excellent company, sensitive, cheerful, and profane, liars, braggarts, and hustlers, with an air of making slow old English hum, which never left them even when, as often happened, they were wrestling with the difficulties of their own making or struggling in non-thoroughfares from which they had to be retrieved like stray sheep by Englishmen without imagination enough to go wrong. Mr. Samuel Insull, who afterwards became private secretary to Mr. Edison, and a leader in the development of American electrical manufacturing and the central station art, was also in close touch with the London situation thus depicted, being at the time the private secretary to Colonel Gerard and acting for the first half hour as the amateur telephone operator in the first experimental exchange erected in Europe. He took notes of an early meeting where the affairs of the company were discussed by leading men, like Sir John Lubbock, Lord Avebury, and the Right Honourable E. P. Bulvery, then a cabinet minister none of whom could see in the telephone much more than an auxiliary for getting out promptly in the morning's papers the midnight debates in Parliament. I remember another incident, says Mr. Insull. It was at some celebration of one of the Royal Societies at the Burlington House, Piccadilly. We had a telephone line running across the roofs to the basement of the building. I think it was to Dinedale's laboratory in Burlington Street. As the ladies and gentlemen came through, they naturally wanted to look at the great curiosity, the loud-speaking telephone. In fact, any telephone was a curiosity then. Mr. and Mrs. Gladstone came through. I was handling the telephone at the Burlington House end. Mrs. Gladstone asked the man over the telephone whether he knew if a man or woman was speaking, and the reply came in quite loud tones that it was a man. With Mr. E. H. Johnson, who represented Edison, there went to England for the furtherance of this telephone enterprise Mr. Charles Edison, a nephew of the inventor. 
He died in Paris, October 1879, not twenty years of age. Stimulated by the example of his uncle, this brilliant youth had already made a mark for himself as a student and inventor, and when only eighteen he secured in open competition the contract to install a complete fire alarm telegraph system for Port Huron. A few months later he was eagerly welcomed by his uncle at Menlo Park, and after working on the telephone was sent to London to aid in its introduction. There he made the acquaintance of Professor Tyndall, exhibited the telephone to the late King of England, and also won the friendship of the late King of the Belgians, with whom he took up the project of establishing telephonic communication between Belgium and England. At the time of his premature death, he was engaged in installing the Edison quadruplex between Brussels and Paris, and being one of the very few persons then in Europe familiar with the workings of that invention. Meantime, the telephonic art in America was undergoing very rapid development. In March 1878, addressing the capitalists of the Electric Telephone Company on the future of his invention, Bell outlined prophetic foresights and remarkable clearness the coming of the modern telephone exchange. Comparing with gas and water distribution, he said, in a similar manner, it is conceivable that cables of telephone wires could be laid underground or suspended overhead, communicating by branch wires with private dwellings, country houses, shops, manufactories, etc., uniting them through the main cable with a central office where the wire could be connected as desired, establishing direct communication between any two places in the city. Not only so, but I believe in the future wires will unite the head offices of telephone companies in different cities, and a man in one part of the country may communicate by word of mouth with another in a distant place all of which has come to pass. Professor Bell also suggested how this could be done by the employ of a man in each central office for the purpose of connecting the wires as directed. He also indicated the two methods of telephonic tariff, a fixed rental and a toll, and mentioned the practice, now in use on long-distance lines, of a time charge. As a matter of fact, the centralizing was attempted in May 1877 in Boston with the circuits of the Holmes burglar alarm system, four banking houses being thus interconnected. While in January of 1878 the Bell Telephone Central Office System at New Haven, Connecticut was opened for business, the first fully equipped commercial telephone exchange ever established for public or general service. All through this formative period, Bell had adhered to and introduced the magneto form of telephone, now used only as a receiver, and very poorly adapted for the vital function of a speech transmitter. From August 1877, the Western Union Telegraph Company worked along the other line, and in 1878, with its allied gold and stock telegraph company, it brought into existence the American Speaking Telephone Company to introduce the Edison apparatus and to create telephone exchanges all over the country. In this warfare, the possession of a good battery transmitter counted very heavily in favor of the Western Union, for upon that the real expansion of the whole industry depended. But in a few months the Bell system had its battery transmitter too, tending to equalize matters. Late in the same year, patent litigation was begun, which brought out clearly the merits of Bell through his patent as the original and first inventor of the electric speaking telephone, and the Western Union Telegraph Company made terms with its rival. A famous contract 
bearing the date of November 10, 1879, showed that under the Edison and other controlling patents, the Western Union Company had already set going some 85 exchanges and was making large quantities of telephonic apparatus. In return for its voluntary retirement from the telephonic field, the Western Union Telegraph Company, under this contract, received a royalty of 20% of all the telephone earnings of the Bell system while the Bell patents ran, and thus came to enjoy an annual income of several hundred thousand dollars for some years, based chiefly on its modest investment in Edison's work. It was also paid several thousand dollars in cash for the Edison, Phelps, Gray, and other apparatus on hand. It secured further 40% of the stock of the local telephone systems of New York and Chicago, and last, but by no means least, it exacted from the Bell interests an agreement to stay out of the telegraph field. By March 1881, there were in the United States only nine cities of more than 10,000 inhabitants, and only one of more than 15,000 without a telephone exchange. The industry thrived under competition, and the absence of it now had a decided effect in checking growth. For when the Bell patent expired in 1893, the total of telephone sets in operation in the United States was only 291,253. To quote from an official Bell statement, the brief but vigorous Western Union competition was a kind of blessing in disguise. The very fact that two distinct interests were actively engaged in the work of organizing and establishing competing telephone exchanges all over the country greatly facilitated the spread of the idea and the growth of the business, and familiarized people with the use of the telephone as a business agency. While the keenness of the competition extending to the agents and employees of both companies, brought about a swift but quite unforeseen and unlooked-for expansion in the individual exchanges of the larger cities, and a corresponding advance in their importance, value, and usefulness. The truth of this was immediately shown in 1894. After the Bell patents had expired, the tremendous outburst of new competitive activity in independent country systems and toll lines through sparsely settled districts, work for which the Edison apparatus and methods were particularly adapted, yet against which the influence of the Edison patent was invoked. The data secured by the United States Census Office in 1902 showed that the whole industry had made gigantic leaps in eight years, and had 2,371,044 telephone stations in service, of which 1,053,866 were wholly or nominally independent of the bell. By 1907, an even more notable increase was shown, and the census figures for that year included no fewer than 6,118,578 stations, of which 1,986,575 were independent. These six million instruments, every single set employing the principle of the carbon transmitter, were grouped into 15,527 public exchanges, in the very manner predicted by Bell thirty years before, and they gave service in the shape of over 11 billion of talks. The outstanding capitalized value of the plant was $814,616,004. The income for the year was nearly $185 million, and the people employed were 140,000. If Edison had done nothing else, his share in the creation of such an industry would have entitled him to a high place among inventors. This chapter is of necessity brief in its references to many extremely interesting points and details, 
and to some readers it may seem incomplete in its references to the work of other men than Edison, whose influence on telephony as an art has also been considerable. In reply to this pertinent criticism, it may be pointed out that this is a life of Edison, and not of anyone else, and that even the discussion of his achievements alone in these various fields requires more space than the authors have at their disposal. The attempt has been made, however, to indicate the course of events and deal fairly with the facts. The controversy that once waged with great excitement over the invention of the microphone, but has long since died away, is suggestive of the difficulties involved in trying to do justice to everybody. A standard history describes the microphone thus. A form of apparatus produced during the early days of the telephone by Professor Hughes of England for the purpose of rendering faint, indistinct sounds distinctly audible, depended for its operation on the changes that result in the resistance of loose contacts. This apparatus was called the microphone, and was in reality but one of the many forms that it is possible to give to the telephone transmitter. For example, the Edison granular transmitter was a variety of microphone, it was also Edison's transmitter, in which the solid button of carbon was employed. Indeed, even the platinum point, which in the early form of the Reese transmitter pressed against the platinum contact, cemented to the center of the diaphragm, was a microphone. At that time, when most people were amazed at the idea of hearing, with the aid of a microphone, a fly walk at a distance of many miles, the priority of invention of such a device was hotly disputed. Yet without desiring to take anything from the credit of the brilliant American Hughes, whose telegraphic apparatus is still in use all over Europe, it may be pointed out that this passage gives Edison the attribution of at least two original forms, of which those suggested by Hughes were mere variations and modifications. With regard to this matter, Mr. Edison himself remarks, After I sent one of my men over to London, especially to show Priest the carbon transmitter, and where Hughes first saw it and heard it, then within a month he came out with the microphone, without any acknowledgment whatsoever. Published dates will show that Hughes came along after me. There have been other ways, also, in which Edison has utilized the particular property that carbon possesses of altering its resistance to the passage of current according to the pressure to which it is subjected, whether at the surface or through the closer union of the mass. A loose road with a few inches of dust or pebbles on it offers much appreciable resistance to the wheels of vehicles traveling over it, but if the surface is kept hard and smooth, the effect is quite different. In the same way, carbon, whether solid or in the shape of finely divided powder, offers a high resistance to the passage of electricity. But if the carbon is squeezed together, the conditions change, with less resistance to electricity in the circuit. For his quadruplex system, Mr. Edison utilized this fact in the construction of a rheostat, or resistance box. It consists of a series of silk discs saturated with a sizing of plumbago and well-dried. The discs are compressed by means of an adjustable screw, and in this manner the resistance of a circuit can be varied over a wide range. In like manner, Edison developed a pressure or carbon relay adapted to the transference of signals of various strengths from one circuit to another. An ordinary relay consists of an electromagnet inserted in the main line for telegraphing, which brings a local battery and sounder circuit into play, reproducing in the local circuit the signals sent over the main line. The signal relay is adjusted to the weaker currents likely to be received, but the signals reproduced on the sounder 
by the agency of the relay are, of course, all of equal strength, as they depend upon the local battery, which is only this steady work to perform. In cases where it is desirable to reproduce the signals in the local circuit with the same variations in strength as they are received by the relay, the Edison carbon pressure relay does the work. The poles of the electromagnet in the local circuit are hollowed out and filled up with carbon discs or powdered plumbago. The armature and the carbon-tipped poles of the electromagnet form part of the local circuit, and if the relay is actuated by a weak current, the armature will be attracted, but feebly. The carbon, being only slightly compressed, will offer considerable resistance to the flow of the current from the local battery, and therefore the signal on the local sounder will be weak. If, on the contrary, the incoming current on the main line be strong, the armature will be strongly attracted, the carbon will be sharply compressed, the resistance in the local circuit will be proportionately lowered, and the signal heard on the local sounder will be a loud one. Thus it will be seen, by another clever juggle with the willing agent, carbon, for which he has found so many duties, Edison is able to transfer or transmit exactly to the local circuit the mainline current in all its minutest variations. In his researches to determine the nature of the motograph phenomena and to open up other sources of electrical current generation, Edison has worked out a very ingenious and somewhat perplexing piece of apparatus known as the chalk battery. It consists of a series of chalk cylinders mounted on a shaft revolved by hand. Resting against each of these cylinders is a palladium face spring, and similar springs make contact with the shaft between each cylinder. By connecting all these springs in circuit with a galvanometer and revolving the shaft rapidly, a notable deflection is obtained of the galvanometer needle indicating the production of electrical energy. The reason for this does not appear to have been determined. Last but not least, in this beautiful and ingenious series, comes the tazimeter, an instrument of most delicate sensibility in the presence of heat. The name is derived from the Greek, the use of the apparatus being primarily to measure extreme minute differences of pressure. A strip of hard rubber with pointed ends rests perpendicularly on a platinum plate, beneath which is a carbon button, under which, again, lies another platinum plate. The two plates and the carbon button form part of an electrical circuit containing a battery and a galvanometer. The hard rubber strip is exceedingly sensitive to heat. The slightest degree of heat imparted to it causes it to expand invisibly, thus increasing the pressure contact on the carbon button and producing a variation in the resistance of the circuit, registered immediately by the little swinging needle of the galvanometer. The instrument is so sensitive that with a delicate galvanometer it will show the impingement of the heat from a person's hand thirty feet away. The suggestion to employ such an apparatus in astronomical observations occurs at once, and it may be noted that in Chapter 10 of Edison, His Life and Inventions this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Edison, His Life and Inventions by Frank Lewis Dyer and Thomas Comerford Martin Chapter 10 The Phonograph At the opening of the Electrical Show in New York City in October 1908, to celebrate the jubilee of the Atlantic Cable, and the first quarter century of lighting with the Edison service on Manhattan Island, the exercises were all conducted by means of the Edison phonograph. 
This included the dedicatory speech of Governor Hughes of New York, the modest remarks of Mr. Edison as president, the congratulations of the presidents of several national electric bodies, and a number of vocal and instrumental selections of operatic nature. All this was heard clearly by a very large audience and was repeated on other evenings. The same speeches were used again phonographically at the electrical show in Chicago in 1909, and now the records are preserved for reproduction a hundred or a thousand years hence. This tour de force, never attempted before, was merely an exemplification of the value of the phonograph, not only in establishing at first hand the facts of history, but in preserving the human voice. What would we not give to listen to the very accents and tones of the Sermon on the Mount, the orations of Demosthenes, the first Pitt's appeal for American liberty, the farewell of Washington, or the address at Gettysburg? Until Edison made his wonderful invention in 1877, the human race was entirely without means for preserving or passing on to posterity its own linguistic utterances or any other vocal sound. We have some idea how the ancients looked and felt and wrote. The abundant evidence takes us back to the cave dwellers. But all the old languages are dead, and the literary form is their embalmment. We do not even know definitely how Shakespeare's and Goldsmith's plays were pronounced on the stage in the theaters of the time, while it is only a guess that perhaps Chaucer would sound much more modern than he scans. The analysis of sound, which owes so much to Helmholtz, was one step toward recording, and the various means of illustrating the phenomena of sound to the eye and ear, prior to the phonograph, were all ingenious. One can watch the dancing little flames of Koenig, and see a voice expressed in tongues of fire. But the record can only be photographic. In like manner, the simple phonograph of Leon Scott, invented about 1858, records on a revolving cylinder of blackened paper the sound vibrations transmitted through a membrane to which a tiny stylus is attached, so that a human mouth uses a pen and inscribes its sign vocal. Yet, after all, we are just as far away as ever from enabling the young actors at Harvard to give Aristophanes with all the true, subtle intonation and inflection of the Athens of 400 B.C. The instrument is dumb. Ingenuity has been shown also in the invention of talking machines like Faber's, based on the reed organ pipe. These automata can be made by dexterous manipulation to jabber a little like a doll with its monotonous ma-ma or a cuckoo clock, but they lack even the sterile utility of the imitative art of ventriloquism. The real great invention lies in creating devices that shall be able to evoke from tin foil, wax, or composition at any time today, or in the future, the sound that once was as evanescent as the vibrations it made on the air. Contrary to the general notion, very few of the great modern inventions have been the result of a sudden inspiration by which, Minerva-like, they have sprung full-fledged from their creator's brain, but, on the contrary, they have been evolved by slow and gradual steps, so that frequently the final advance has been often almost imperceptible. The Edison phonograph is an important exception to the general rule, not, of course, the phonograph of the present day, with all of its mechanical perfection, but as an instrument capable of recording and reproducing sound. Its invention has been frequently attributed to the discovery that a point attached to a telephone diaphragm would, under the effect of sound waves, vibrate with sufficient force to prick the finger. The story, though interesting, is not founded on fact, but if true, it is difficult to see how the discovery in question could not have contributed materially to the ultimate accomplishment. To a man of Edison's perception, it is absurd to suppose that the effect of the so-called discovery would not have been made as a matter of deduction, long before the physical sensation was experienced. As a matter of fact, the invention of the phonograph was the result of pure reason. Some time prior to 1877, Edison had been experimenting on an automatic telegraph in which the letters were formed by embossing strips of paper with the proper arrangement of dots and dashes. By drawing this strip underneath a contact lever, the latter was actuated so as to control the circuits and send the desired signals over the line. It was observed that when the strip was moved very rapidly, 
the vibration of the lever resulted in the production of an audible note. With these facts before him, Edison reasoned that if the paper strip could be imprinted with elevations and depressions representative of sound waves, they might be caused to actuate a diaphragm so as to reproduce the corresponding sounds. The next step in the line of development was to form the necessary undulations on the strip, and it was then reasoned that original sounds themselves might be utilized to form a graphic record by actuating a diaphragm and causing a cutting or indenting point carried thereby to vibrate in contact with a moving surface, so as to cut or indent the record therein. Strange as it may seem, therefore, and contrary to the general belief, the phonograph was developed backward, the production of the sounds being of prior development to the idea of actually recording them. Mr. Edison's own account of the invention of the phonograph is intensely interesting. I was experimenting, he says, on an automatic method of recording telegraph messages on a disc of paper laid on a revolving platen, exactly the same as the disc-talking machine of today. The platen had a spiral groove on its surface, like the disc. Over this was placed a circular disc of paper. An electromagnet with the embossing point connected to an arm traveled over the disc, and any signals given through the magnets were embossed on the disc of paper. If this disc was removed from the machine and put on a similar machine provided with a contact point, the embossed record would cause the signals to be repeated into another wire. The ordinary speed of telegraphic signals is 35 to 40 words a minute, but with this machine several hundred words were possible. From my experiments on the telephone, I knew of the power of a diaphragm to take up sound vibrations, and as I had made a little toy which, when you recited loudly into the funnel, would work a pawl connected to the diaphragm, and this engaging a ratchet wheel served to give continuous rotation to a pulley. This pulley was connected by a cord to a little paper toy representing a man sawing wood. Hence, if one shouted, Mary had a little lamb, etc., the paper man would start sawing wood. I reached the conclusion that if I could record the movements of the diaphragm properly, I could cause such record to reproduce the original movements imparted to the diaphragm by the voice, and thus succeed in recording and reproducing the human voice. Instead of using a disc, I designed a little machine using a cylinder provided with grooves around the surface. Over this was to be placed tinfoil, which easily received and recorded the movements of the diaphragm. A sketch was made and the piecework price, $18, was marked on the sketch. I was in the habit of marking the price I would pay on each sketch. If the workman lost, I would pay his regular wages. If he made more than the wages, he kept it. The workman who got the sketch was John Cruzy. I didn't have much faith that it would work, expecting that I might possibly hear a word or so that would give hope for a future for the idea. Cruzy, when he had nearly finished it, asked what it was for. I told him I was going to record talking, and then have the machine talk back. He thought it absurd. However, it was finished. The foil was put on. I then shouted, Mary had a little lamb, etc. I adjusted the reproducer, and the machine reproduced it perfectly. I was never so taken aback in my life. Everybody was astonished. I was always afraid of things that worked the first time. Long experience proved that there were great drawbacks found generally, before they could be got commercial, but here was something there was no doubt of. No wonder that honest John Cruci, as he stood and listened to the marvelous performance of the simple little machine he had himself just finished, ejaculated in an awe-stricken tone, Mein Gott in Himmel! And yet he had already seen Edison do a few clever things. No wonder they sat up all night fixing and adjusting it so as to get better and better results, reciting and singing, trying each other's voices, and then listening with involuntary awe as the words came back again and again, just as long as they were willing to revolve the little cylinder with its dotted spiral indentations in the tinfoil under the vibrating stylus of the reproducing diaphragm. It took a little time to acquire the knack of turning the crank steadily while leaning over the recorder to talk into the machine, and there was some deftness required also in fastening down the tinfoil on the cylinder where it was held by a pin running in a longitudinal slot. Paraffined paper appears to have been experimented with as an impressionable material. It is said that Carman, the foreman of the machine shop, had gone the length of wagering Edison a box of cigars that the device would not work. 
all the world knows that he lost. The original Edison phonograph thus built by Crucy is preserved in the South Kensington Museum, London. That repository can certainly have no greater treasure of its kind. But as to its immediate use, the inventor says, that morning I took it over to New York and walked into the office of the Scientific American, went up to Mr. Beach's desk and said I had something to show him. He asked what it was. I told him I had a machine that would record and reproduce the human voice. I opened the package, set up the machine, and recited, Mary had a little lamb, etc. Then I reproduced it so that it could be heard all over the room. They kept me at it until the crowd got so great Mr. Beach was afraid the floor would collapse, and we were compelled to stop. The papers next morning contained columns. None of the writers seemed to understand how it was done. I tried to explain. It was so very simple, but the results were so surprising, they made up their minds probably that they would never understand it, and they didn't. I started immediately making several larger and better machines, which I exhibited at Menlo Park to crowds. The Pennsylvania Railroad ran special trains. Washington people telegraphed me to come on. I took a phonograph to Washington and exhibited in the room of James G. Blaine's niece, Gail Hamilton, and members of Congress and notable people of that city came all day long until late in the evening. I made one break. I recited Mary, etc., and another ditty. There was a little girl who had a little curl right in the middle of her forehead, and when she was good, she was very, very good, but when she was bad, she was horrid. It will be remembered that Senator Roscoe Conkling, then very prominent, had a curl of hair on his forehead, and all the caricaturists developed it abnormally. He was very sensitive about the subject. When he came in, he was introduced. But being rather deaf, I didn't catch his name, but sat down and started the curl ditty. Everybody tittered, and I was told that Mr. Conkling was displeased. About eleven o'clock at night, word was received from President Hayes that he would be very much pleased if I would come up to the White House. I was taken there, and found Mr. Hayes and several others waiting. Among them I remember Carl Schurz, who was playing the piano when I entered the room. The exhibition continued till about 12.30 a.m., when Mrs. Hayes and several other ladies, who had been induced to get up and dress, appeared. I left at 3.30 a.m. For a long time some people thought there was trickery. One morning at Menlo Park a gentleman came to the laboratory and asked to see the phonograph. It was Bishop Vincent, who helped Lewis Miller found the Chautauqua. I exhibited it, and then he asked if he could speak a few words. I put on a fresh foil and told him to go ahead. He commenced to recite biblical names with immense rapidity. On reproducing it, he said, I am satisfied now. There isn't a man in the United States who could recite those names with the same rapidity. The phonograph was now fairly launched as a world sensation, and a reference to the newspapers of 1878 will show the extent to which it and Edison were themes of universal discussion. Some of the press notices of the period were most amazing and amusing, as though the real achievements of this young man, barely thirty, were not tangible and solid enough to justify admiration of his genius, the yellow journalists of the period began busily to create an Edison myth, with gross absurdities of assertion and attribution from which the modest subject of it all has not yet ceased to suffer with unthinking people. A brilliantly vicious example of this method of treatment is to be found in the Paris Figaro of that year, under which the appropriate title of This Astounding Edison lay bare before the French public the most startling revelations as to the inventor's life and character. It should be understood, said this journal, that Mr. Edison does not belong to himself. He is the property of the telegraph company, which lodges him in New York at a superb hotel, keeps him on a luxurious footing, and pays him a formidable salary, so as to be the one to know of and profit by his discoveries. The company has, in the dwelling of Edison, men in its employ who do not quit him for a moment, at the table, on the street, in the laboratory, so that this wretched man, watched more closely than ever was any malefactor, cannot even give a moment's thought to his own private affairs without one of his guards asking him what he is thinking about. This foolish blague was accompanied by a description of Edison's new aerophone, a steam machine which carried the voice a distance of one and a half miles. You speak into a jet of vapor. A friend previously advised can answer you by the same method. 
nor were American journals backward in this wild exaggeration. The Führer had its effect in stimulating a desire everywhere on the part of everybody to see and hear the phonograph. A small commercial organization was formed to build and exploit the apparatus, and the shops at Menlo Park Laboratory were assisted by the little Bergman shop in New York. Offices were taken for the new enterprise at 203 Broadway, where the Mail and Express building now stands, and where, in a general way, under the auspices of a talented dwarf, C. A. Cheever, the embryonic phonograph and the crude telephone shared rooms and expenses. Gardner G. Hubbard, father-in-law of Alex Graham Bell, was one of the stockholders in the phonograph company, which paid Edison $10,000 cash and a 20% royalty. This curious partnership was maintained for some time, even when the Bell Telephone offices were removed to Reed Street, New York, whither the phonograph went also, and was perhaps explained by the fact that just then the ability of the phonograph as a money-maker was much more easily demonstrated than was that of the telephone, still in its short-range magneto stage and awaiting development with the aid of the carbon transmitter. The earning capacity of the phonograph then, as largely now, lay in its exhibition qualities. The royalties from Boston, ever intellectually awake and ready for something new, ran as high as $1,800 a week. In New York, there was a ceaseless demand for it, and with the aid of Hilburn L. Roosevelt, a famous organ builder and uncle of ex-President Roosevelt, concerts were given at which the phonograph was featured. To maintain this novel show business, the services of James Redpath were called into requisition with great success. Redpath, famous as a friend and biographer of John Brown as a Civil War correspondent, and as founder of the celebrated Redpath Lyceum Bureau in Boston, divided the country into territories, each section being leased for exhibition purposes on a basis of a percentage of the gate money. To 203 Broadway from all over the Union flocked a swarm of showmen, cranks, and particularly of old operators, who, the seedier they were in appearance, the more insistent they were that Tom should give them, for the sake of old Lang Syne, this chance to make a fortune for him and for themselves. At the top of the building was a floor on which these novices were graduated in the use and care of the machine, and then, with an equipment of tin foil and other supplies, they were sent out on the road. It was a diverting experience while it lasted. The excitement over the phonograph was maintained for many months, until a large proportion of the inhabitants of the country had seen it, and then the show receipts declined and dwindled away. Many of the old operators, taken on out of good nature, were poor exhibitors and worse accountants, and at last they and the machines with which they had been entrusted faded from sight. But in the meantime, Edison had learned many lessons as to this practical side of development that were not forgotten when the renaissance of the phonograph began a few years later, leading up to the present enormous and steady demand for both machines and records. It deserves to be pointed out that the phonograph has changed little in the intervening years from the first crude instruments of 1877 and 78. It has simply been refined and made more perfect in a mechanical sense. Edison was immensely impressed with its possibilities, and greatly inclined to work upon it, but the coming of the electric light compelled him to throw all his energies for a time into the vast new field awaiting conquest. The original phonograph, as briefly noted above, was rotated by hand, and the cylinder was fed slowly longitudinally by means of a nut engaging a screw thread on the cylinder shaft. Wrapped around the cylinder was a sheet of tin foil, with which engaged a small chisel-like recording needle connected adhesively with the center of an iron diaphragm. Obviously, as the cylinder was turned, the needle followed a spiral path whose pitch depended upon that of the feed screw. Along this path a thread was cut in the cylinder, so as to permit the needle to indent the foil readily as the diaphragm vibrated. By rotating the cylinder and causing the diaphragm to vibrate under the effect of vocal or musical sounds, the needle-like point would form a series of indentations in the foil, corresponding to and characteristic of the sound waves. By now engaging the point with the beginning of the grooved record so formed, and by again rotating the cylinder, the undulations of the record would cause the needle and its attached diaphragm to vibrate so as to affect the reproduction. Such an apparatus was necessarily undeveloped, 
and was interesting only from a scientific point of view. It had many mechanical defects which prevented its use as a practical apparatus. Since the cylinder was rotated by hand, the speed at which the record was formed would vary considerably, even with the same manipulator, so that it would have been impossible to record and reproduce music satisfactorily, in doing which exact uniformity of speed is essential. The formation of the record in tinfoil was also objectionable from a practical standpoint, since such a record was faint and would be substantially obliterated after two or three reproductions. Furthermore, the foil could not be easily removed from and replaced upon the instrument, and consequently the reproduction had to follow the recording immediately, and the successive tin foils were thrown away. The instrument was also heavy and bulky. Notwithstanding these objections, the original phonograph created, as already remarked, an enormous popular excitement, and the exhibitions were considered by many skeptical persons as nothing more than clever ventriloquism. The possibilities of the instrument as a commercial apparatus were recognized from the first, and some of the fields in which it was predicted that the phonograph would be used are now fully occupied. Some have not yet been realized. Writing in 1878 in the North American Review, Mr. Edison summed up his own ideas as to the future applications of the new invention. Among the many uses to which the phonograph will be applied are the following. 1. Letter writing in all kinds of dictation without the aid of a stenographer. 2. Phonographic books which speak to blind people without effort on their part. 3. The teaching of elocution. 4. Reproduction of music. 5. The family record, a registry of sayings, reminiscences, etc., by members of a family in their own voices, and of the last words of dying persons. 6. Music boxes and toys. 7. Clocks that should announce in articulate speech the time for going home, going to meals, etc. 8. The preservation of languages by exact reproduction of the manner of pronouncing. 9. Educational purposes, such as preserving the explanations made by a teacher, so that the pupil can refer to them at any moment, and spelling or other lessons placed upon the phonograph for convenience in committing to memory. 10. Connection with the telephone, so as to make that instrument an auxiliary in the transmission of permanent and invaluable records, instead of being the recipient of momentary and fleeting communication. Of the above fields of usefulness in which it was expected that the phonograph might be applied, only three have been commercially realized, namely, the reproduction of musical, including vaudeville or talking selections, for which purpose a very large proportion of the phonographs now made is used. The employment of the machine as a mechanical stenographer, which field has been taken up actively only within the past few years, and the utilization of the device for the teaching of languages, for which purpose it has been successfully employed, for example, by the International Correspondence Schools of Scranton, Pennsylvania, for several years. The other uses, however, which were early predicted for the phonograph, have not as yet been worked out practically, although the time seems not far distant when its general utility will be widely enlarged. Both dolls and clocks have been made, but thus far the world has not taken them seriously. The original phonograph, as invented by Edison, remained in its crude and immature state for almost ten years, still the object of philosophical interest and as a convenient textbook illustration of the effect of sound vibration. It continued to be a theme of curious interest to the imaginative, and the subject of much fiction, while its neglected commercial possibilities were still more or less vaguely referred to. During this period of arrested development, Edison was continuously working on the invention and commercial exploitation of the incandescent lamp. In 1887, his time was comparatively free, and the phonograph was then taken up with renewed energy, and the effort made to overcome its mechanical defects and to furnish a commercial instrument so that its early promise might be realized. The important changes made from that time up to 1890 converted the phonograph from a scientific toy into a successful industrial apparatus. The idea of forming the record on tinfoil had been early abandoned, and in its stead was substituted a cylinder of wax-like material in which the record was cut by a minute chisel-like gouging tool. Such a record, or phonogram as it was then called, 
could be removed from the machine or replaced at any time. Many reproductions could be obtained without wearing out the record, and whenever desired the record could be shaved off by a turning tool so as to present a fresh surface on which a new record could be formed, something like an ancient palimpsest. A wax cylinder having walls less than one quarter of an inch in thickness could be used for receiving a large number of records, since the maximum depth of the record groove is hardly ever greater than one one-thousandth of an inch. Later on, as the crowning achievement in the phonographic field, from a commercial point of view, came the duplication of records to the extent of many thousands from a single master. This work was actively developed between the years 1890 and 1898, and its difficulties may be appreciated when the problem is stated, the copying from a single master of many millions of excessively minute sound waves having a maximum width of one-hundredth of an inch, and a maximum depth of one-thousandth of an inch, or less than the thickness of a sheet of tissue paper. Among the interesting developments of this process was the coating of the original or master record with a homogeneous film of gold, so thin that 300,000 of these piled one on top of the other would present a thickness of only one inch. Another important change was in the nature of a reversal of the original arrangement, the cylinder or mandrel carrying the record being mounted in fixed bearings and the recording or reproducing device being fed lengthwise, like the cutting tool of a lath, as the blank or record was rotated. It was early recognized that a single needle for forming the record and the reproduction therefrom was an undesirable arrangement, since the formation of the record required a very sharp cutting tool, while satisfactory and repeated reproduction suggested the use of a stylus, which would result in minimum wear. After many experiments and the production of a number of types of machines, the present recorders and reproducers were evolved the former consisting of a very small cylindrical gouging tool having a diameter of about forty thousandths of an inch, and the latter a ball or button-shaped stylus with a diameter of about thirty-five thousandths of an inch. By using an incisor of this sort, the record is formed of a series of connected gouges with rounded sides, varying in depth and width, and with which the reproducer automatically engages and maintains its engagement. Another difficulty encountered in the commercial development of the phonograph was the adjustment of the recording stylus so as to enter the wax-like surface to a very slight depth, and of the reproducer so as to engage exactly the record when formed. The earlier types of machines were provided with separate screws for effecting these adjustments, but considerable skill was required to obtain good results, and great difficulty was experienced in meeting the variations in the wax-like cylinders due to the warping under atmospheric changes. Consequently, with the early types of commercial phonographs, it was first necessary to shave off the blank accurately before a record was formed thereon, in order that an absolutely true surface might be presented. To overcome these troubles, the very ingenious suggestion was then made and adopted of connecting the recording and reproducing styluses to their respective diaphragms through the instrumentality of a compensating weight, which acted practically as a fixed support under the very rapid sound vibrations, but which yielded readily to distortions or variations in the wax-like cylinders. By reason of this improvement, it became possible to do away with all adjustments, the mass of the compensating weight causing the recorder to engage the blank automatically to the required depth, and to maintain the reproducing stylus always within the desired pressure on the record when formed. These automatic adjustments were maintained even though the blank or record might be so much out of true as an eighth of an inch, equal to or more than 200 times the maximum depth of the record groove. Another improvement that followed along the lines adopted by Edison for the commercial development of the phonograph was making the recording and reproducing styluses of sapphire an extremely hard, non-oxidizable jewel, so that these tiny instruments would always retain their true form and effectively resist wear. Of course, in this work, many other things were done that may still be found on the perfected phonograph as it stands today, and many other suggestions were made which were contemporaneously adopted, but which were later abandoned. For the curious-minded, reference is made to the records in the patent office, which will show that up to 1893, 
Edison had obtained upward of sixty-five patents in this art, from which his line of thought can be very closely traced. The phonograph of today, except for the perfection of its mechanical features, in its beauty of manufacture and design, and in small details, may be considered identical with the machine of 1889, with the exception that with the latter the rotation of the record cylinder was affected by an electric motor. Its essential use, as then contemplated, was as a substitute for sonographers, and the most extravagant fancies were indulged in as to utility in that field. To exploit the device commercially, the patents were sold to Philadelphia capitalists, who organized the North American Phonograph Company, through which leases for limited periods were granted to local companies doing business in special territories, generally within the confines of a single state. Under that plan, resembling the methods of 1878, the machines and blank cylinders were manufactured by the Edison Phonograph Works, which still retains its factories at Orange, New Jersey. The marketing enterprise was early doomed to failure, principally because the instruments were not well understood and did not possess the necessary refinements that would fit them for the special field in which they were to be used. At first the instruments were leased, but it was found that the leases were seldom renewed. Efforts were then made to sell them, but the prices were high, from 100 to $150. In the midst of these difficulties, the chief promoter of the enterprise, Mr. Lippincott, died, and it was soon found that the roseate dreams of success entertained by the sanguine promoters were not to be realized. The North American Phonograph Company failed, its principal creditor being Mr. Edison, who, having acquired the assets of the defunct concern, organized the National Phonograph Company, to which he turned over the patents, and with characteristic energy, he attempted again to build up a business with which his favorite and to him most interesting invention might be successfully identified. The National Phonograph Company, from the very start, determined to retire at least temporarily from the field of stenographic use, and to exploit the phonograph for musical purposes as a competitor of the music box. Hence it was necessary that for such work the relatively heavy and expensive electric motor should be discarded, and a simple spring motor constructed with a sufficiently sensitive governor to permit accurate musical reproduction. Such a motor was designed, and is now used on all phonographs except on such special instruments as may be made with electric motors, as well as on the successful apparatus that has more recently been designed and introduced for stenographic use. Improved factory facilities were introduced, new tools were made, and various types of machines were designed so that the phonographs can now be bought at prices ranging from 10 to $200. Even with the changes which were thus made in the two machines, the work of developing the business was slow, as a demand had to be created, and the early prejudice of the public against the phonograph, due to its failure as a stenographic apparatus, had to be overcome. The story of the phonograph as an industrial enterprise, from this point of departure, is itself full of interest but embraces so many details that it is necessarily given in a separate later chapter. We must return to the days of 1878, when Edison, with at least three first-class inventions to his credit, the quadruplex, the carbon telephone, and the phonograph, had become a man of mark and a world character. The invention of the phonograph was immediately followed, as usual, by the appearance of several other incidental and auxiliary devices, some patented, and others remaining simply the application of the principles of apparatus that had been worked out. One of these was the telephonograph, a combination of a telephone at a distant station with a phonograph. The diaphragm of the phonograph mouthpiece is actuated by an electromagnet in the same way as that of an ordinary telephone receiver, and in this manner a record of the message spoken from a distance can be obtained and turned into sound at will. Evidently, such a process is reversible, and the phonograph can send a message to a distant receiver. This idea was brilliantly demonstrated in practice in February 1889 by Mr. W. J. Hammer, one of Edison's earliest and most capable associates, who carried on telephonographic communication between New York and an audience in Philadelphia. The record made in New York on the Edison phonograph was repeated into an Edison carbon transmitter, sent over 103 miles of circuit 
including six miles of underground cable, received by an Edison motograph, repeated by that onto a phonograph, transferred from the phonograph to an Edison carbon transmitter, and by that delivered to the Edison motograph receiver in the enthusiastic lecture hall, where everyone could hear each sound and syllable distinctly. In real practice, this spectacular playing with sound vibrations, as if they were lacrosse balls to toss around between the gulls, could be materially simplified. The modern megaphone, now used universally in making announcements to large crowds, particularly at sporting events, is also due to this period as a perfection by Edison of many antecedent devices going back, perhaps, much further than the legendary funnels through which Alexander the Great is said to have sent commands to his outlying forces. The improved Edison megaphone for long-distance work comprised two horns of wood or metal about six feet long, tapering from a diameter of two feet six inches at the mouth to a small aperture provided with ear tubes. These converging horns or funnels, with a large speaking trumpet in between them, are mounted on a tripod and the megaphone is complete. Conversation can be carried on with this megaphone at a distance of over two miles, as with a ship or the balloon. The modern megaphone now employs the receiver form thus introduced as its very effective transmitter, with which the old-fashioned speaking trumpet cannot possibly compete, and the word megaphone is universally applied to a single side-flaring horn. A further step in this line brought Edison to the aerophone, around which the Figaro weaved its fanciful description. In the construction of the aerophone, the same kind of tympanum is used as in the phonograph, but the imitation of the human voice, or the transmission of sound, is effected by the quick opening and closing of valves placed within a steam whistle or an organ pipe. The vibrations of the diaphragm communicated to the valves cause them to operate in synchronism, so that the vibrations are thrown upon the escaping air or steam, and the result is an instrument with a capacity of magnifying the sounds two hundred times and of hurling them to great distances intelligibly, like a huge fog siren, but with immense clearness and penetration. All this study of sound transmission over long distances without wires led up to the consideration and invention of pioneer apparatus for wireless telegraphy, but that also is another chapter. Yet one more ingenious device of this period must be noted, Edison's vocal engine, the patent application for which was executed in August 1878, the patent being granted the following December. Reference to this by Edison himself has already been quoted. The voice engine, or phonomotor, converts the vibrations of the voice or of music acting on the diaphragm into motion which is utilized to drive some secondary appliance, whether as a toy or for some useful purpose. Thus a man can actually talk a hole through a board. Somewhat weary of all this work and excitement, and not having enjoyed any cessation from toil or period of rest for ten years, Edison jumped eagerly at the opportunity afforded him in the summer of 1878 of making a westward trip. Just thirty years later, on a similar trip over the same ground, he jotted down for this volume some of his reminiscences. The lure of 1878 was the opportunity to try the ability of his delicate tazimeter during the total eclipse of the sun, July 29th. His admiring friend, Professor George F. Barker of the University of Pennsylvania, with whom he had now been on terms of intimacy for some years, suggested the holiday, and was himself a member of the excursion party that made its rendezvous at Rollins, Wyoming Territory. Edison had tested his tazimeter and was satisfied that it would measure down to the millionth part of a degree Fahrenheit. It was just ten years since he had left the West in poverty and obscurity, a penniless operator in search of a job, but now he was a great inventor and famous, a welcome addition to the band of astronomers and physicists assembled to observe the eclipse and the corona. There were astronomers from nearly every nation, says Mr. Edison. We had a special car. The country at that time was rather new. Game was in great abundance, and could be seen all day long from the car window, especially antelope. We arrived in Rollins about 4 p.m. It had a small machine shop and was the point where locomotives were changed for the next section. The hotel was a very small one, and by doubling up we were barely accommodated. My roommate was Fox, the correspondent of the New York Herald. 
After we retired and were asleep, a thundering knock on the door awakened us. Upon opening the door, a tall, handsome man with flowing hair, dressed in Western style, entered the room. His eyes were bloodshot, and he was somewhat inebriated. He introduced himself as Texas Jack, Joe Cremondo, and said he wanted to see Edison, as he had read about me in the newspapers. Both Fox and I were rather scared, and didn't know what was to be the result of the interview. The landlord requested him not to make so much noise, and was thrown out into the hall. Jack explained that he had just come in with a party which had been hunting, and that he felt fine. He explained also that he was the boss pistol shot of the West, and that it was he who taught the celebrated Dr. Carver how to shoot. Then, suddenly pointing to a weather vane on the freight depot, he pulled out a Colt revolver and fired through the window, hitting the vane. The shot awakened all the people, and they rushed in to see who was killed. It was only after I told him I was tired and would see him in the morning that he left. Both Fox and I were so nervous we didn't sleep any that night. We were told in the morning that Jack was a pretty good fellow, and was not one of the bad men of whom they had a good supply. They had one in the jail, and Fox and I went over to see him. A few days before he had held up a Union Pacific train and robbed all the passengers. In the jail also was a half-breed horse thief. We interviewed the bad man through bars as big as railroad rails. He looked like a bad man. The rim of his ear all around came to a sharp edge and was serrated. His eyes were nearly white, and appeared as if made of glass and set in wrong, like the life-size figures of Indians in the Smithsonian Institution. His face was also extremely irregular. He wouldn't answer a single question. I learned afterward that he got seven years in prison, while the horse thief was hanged. As horses ran wild and there was no protection, it meant death to steal one. This was one interlude among others. The first thing the astronomers did was to determine with precision their exact locality upon the earth. A number of observations were made, and Watson of Michigan University, with two others, worked all night computing until they agreed. They said they were not in error more than 100 feet, and that the station was 12 miles out of the position given on the maps. It seemed to take an immense amount of mathematics. I preserved one of the sheets, which looked like the timetable of a Chinese railroad. The instruments of the various parties were then set up in different parts of the little town, and got ready for the eclipse, which was to occur in three or four days. Two days before the event we all got together, and obtaining an engine and car, went twelve miles farther west to visit the United States government astronomers at a place called Separation, the apex of the Great Divide, where the waters run east of the Mississippi and west of the Pacific. Fox and I took our Winchester rifles with an idea of doing a little shooting. After calling on the government people, we started to interview the telegraph operator at this most lonely and desolate spot. After talking over old acquaintances, I asked him if there was any game about. He said, plenty of jackrabbits. These jackrabbits are a very peculiar species. They have ears about six inches long and very slender legs, about three times as long as those of an ordinary rabbit and travel at a great speed by a series of jumps, each about thirty feet long, as near as I could judge. The local people called them narrow-gauge mules. Asking the operator the best direction, he pointed west, and noticing a rabbit in a clear space in the sage bushes, I said, There's one now. I advanced cautiously to within one hundred feet and shot. The rabbit paid no attention. I then advanced to within ten feet and shot again. The rabbit was still immovable. On looking around, the whole crowd at the station were watching, and then I knew the rabbit was stuffed. However, we did shoot a number of live ones until Fox ran out of cartridges. On returning to the station, I passed away the time shooting at cans set on a pile of tins. Finally, the operator said to Fox, I have a fine Springfield musket. Suppose you try it. So Fox took the musket and fired. It knocked him nearly over. It seems that the musket had been run over by a handcar, which slightly bent the long barrel, but not sufficiently for an amateur like Fox to notice. After Fox had his shoulder treated with Arnica at the government hospital tent, we returned to Rollins. The eclipse was, however, the prime consideration, and Edison followed the example of his colleagues in making ready. The place which he secured for setting up his tazimeter 
was an enclosure hardly suitable for the purpose, and he describes the results as follows. I had my apparatus in a small yard enclosed by a board fence six feet high. At one end there was a house for hens. I noticed that they all went to roost just before totality. At the same time a slight wind arose, and at the moment of totality the atmosphere was filled with thistle-down and other light articles. I noticed one feather, whose weight was at least 150 milligrams, rise perpendicularly to the top of the fence, where it floated away on the wind. My apparatus was entirely too sensitive, and I got no results. It was found that the heat from the corona of the sun was ten times the index capacity of the instrument, but this result did not leave the value of the device in doubt. The scientific American remarked, Seeing that the tasimeter is affected by a wider range of etheric undulations than the eye can take cognizance of, and is withal far more acutely sensitive, the probabilities are that it will open up hitherto inaccessible regions of space, and possibly extend the range of aerial knowledge as far beyond the limit obtained by the telescope as that is beyond the narrow reach of aided vision. The eclipse over, Edison, with Professor Barker, Major Thornburg, several soldiers, and a number of railroad officials, went hunting about 100 miles south of the railroad in the Ute country. A few months later, the Major and 30 soldiers were ambushed near the spot at which the hunting party had camped, and all were killed. Through an introduction from Mr. J. Gould, who then controlled the Union Pacific, Edison was allowed to ride on the cow catchers of the locomotives. The different engineers gave me a small cushion, and every day I rode in this manner, from Omaha to the Sacramento Valley, except through the snow shed on the summit of the Sierras, without dust or anything else to obstruct the view. Only once was I in danger, when the locomotive struck an animal about the size of a small bear cub, which I think was a badger. This animal struck the front of the locomotive just under the headlight with great violence, and was then thrown off by the rebound. I was sitting to one side, grasping the angle brace, so no harm was done. This welcome vacation lasted nearly two months, but Edison was back in his laboratory and hard at work before the end of August, gathering up many loose ends and trying out many thoughts and ideas that had accumulated on the trip. One hot afternoon, August 30th, as shown by the document in the case, Mr. Edison was found by one of the authors of this biography, employed most busily in making a mysterious series of tests on paper, using for ink acids which corrugated and blistered the paper were written upon. When interrogated as to his object, he stated that the plan was to afford blind people the means of writing directly to each other, especially if they were also deaf and could not hear a message on the phonograph. The characters which he was thus forming on the paper were high enough in relief to be legible to the delicate touch of a blind man's fingers, and with simple apparatus, letters could thus be written, sent, and read. There was certainly no question as to the result obtained at the moment, which was all that was asked, but the Edison autograph thus, and then written now, shows the paper eaten out by the acid use, although covered with glass for many years. Mr. Edison does not remember that he ever recurred to this very interesting test. He was, however, ready for anything new or novel, and no record can ever be made or presented that would do justice to a tithe of the thoughts and fancies daily and hourly put upon the rack. The famous notebooks, to which reference will be made later, were not begun as a regular series, as it was only the profusion of these ideas that suggested the vital value of such systematic registration. Then, as now, the propositions brought to Edison ranged over every conceivable subject, but the years have taught him caution in grappling with them. He tells an amusing story of one dilemma into which his good nature led him at this period. At Menlo Park one day, a farmer came in and asked if I knew any way to kill potato bugs. He had twenty acres of potatoes, and the vines were being destroyed. I sent men out and culled two quarts of bugs, and tried every chemical I had to destroy them. Bisulfide of carbon was found to do it instantly. I got a drum and went over to the potato farm and sprinkled it on the vines with a pot. Every bug dropped dead. The next morning the farmer came in very excited and reported that the stuff had killed the vines as well. I had to pay three hundred dollars for not experimenting properly. During this year, 1878, the phonograph made its way also to Europe, 
and various sums of money were paid there to secure the rights to its manufacture and exploitation. In England, for example, the microscopic company paid $7,500 down and agreed to a royalty, while arrangements were effected also in France, Russia, and other countries. In every instance, as in this country, the commercial development had to wait several years, for in the meantime another great art had been brought into existence, demanding Chapter 11 of Edison, His Life and Inventions. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Edison, His Life and Inventions by Frank Lewis Dyer and Thomas Comerford Martin. Chapter 11 The Invention of the Incandescent Lamp. It is possible to imagine a time to come when the hours of work and rest will once more be regulated by the sun. But the course of civilization has been marked by an artificial lengthening of the day, and by a constant striving after more perfect means of illumination. Why mankind should sleep through several hours of sunlight in the morning, and stay awake through a needless time in the evening, can probably only be attributed to total depravity. It is certainly a most stupid, expensive, and harmful habit. In no one thing has man shown greater fertility of invention than in lighting. To nothing does he cling more tenaciously than to his devices for furnishing light. Electricity today reigns supreme in the field of illumination, but every other kind of artificial light that has ever been known is still in use somewhere. Toward its light-bringers the race has assumed an attitude of veneration, though it has forgotten, if it ever heard, the names of those who first brightened its gloom and dissipated its darkness. If the tallow candle, hitherto unknown, were now invented, its creator would be hailed as one of the greatest benefactors of the present age. Up to the close of the eighteenth century, the means of house and street illumination were of two generic kinds, grease and oil. But then came a swift and revolutionary change in the adoption of gas. The ideas and methods of Murdoch and Le Bon soon took definite shape, and coal smoke was piped from its place of origin to distant points of consumption. As early as 1804, the first company ever organized for gas lighting was formed in London, one side of Pall Mall being lit up by the enthusiastic pioneer Windsor in 1807. Equal activity was shown in America, and Baltimore began the practice of gas lighting in 1816. It is true that there were explosions, and distinguished men like Davy and Watt opined that the illuminate was too dangerous, but the spirit of coal has demonstrated its usefulness convincingly, and a commercial development began, which, for extent and rapidity, was not inferior to that marking the concurrent adoption of steam in industry and transportation. Meanwhile, the wax candle and the argand oil lamp held their own bravely. The whaling fleets, long after gas came into use, were one of the greatest sources of our national wealth, to New Benford, Massachusetts alone, some three or four hundred ships brought their whale and sperm oil, spermaceti and whalebone, and at one time that port was accounted the richest city in the United States in proportion to its population. The ship owners and refiners of that whaling metropolis were slow to believe that their monopoly could ever be threatened by newer sources of illumination, but gas had become available in the cities and coal oil and petroleum were now added to the list of illuminating materials. The American whaling fleet, which at the time of Edison's birth mustered over 700 sail, had dwindled probably to a bare tenth when he took up the problem of illumination, and the competition of oil from the ground with oil from the sea and with coal gas had made the artificial production of light cheaper than ever before, when up to the middle of the century it had remained one of the heaviest items of domestic expense. Moreover, just about the time that Edison took up incandescent lighting, water gas was being introduced on a large scale as a commercial illuminant that could be produced at much lower cost than coal gas. Throughout the first half of the 19th century, the search for a practical electric light was almost wholly in the direction of employing methods analogous to those already familiar. In other words, obtaining the illumination from the actual consumption of the light-giving material. 
In the third quarter of the century, these methods were brought to practicality, but all may be referred back to the brilliant demonstrations of Sir Humphrey Davy at the Royal Institution circa 1809 and 10, when, with the current from a battery of 2,000 cells, he produced an intense voltaic arc between the points of consuming sticks of charcoal. For more than 30 years, the arc light remained an expensive laboratory experiment, but the coming of the dynamo placed that illuminate on a commercial basis. The mere fact that electrical energy from the least expensive chemical battery using up zinc and acids costs 20 times as much as that from a dynamo driven by steam engine is in itself enough to explain why so many of the electric arts lingered in embryo after their fundamental principles had been discovered. Here is seen also further proof of the great truth that one invention often waits for another. From 1850 onward, the improvements in both the arc lamp and the dynamo were rapid, and under the superintendence of the great Faraday, in 1858, protecting beams of intense electric light from the voltaic arc were shed over the waters of the Straits of Dover from the beacons of South Foreland and Dungeness. By 1878, the arc lighting industry had sprung into existence in so promising a manner as to engender an extraordinary fever and furor of speculation. At the Philadelphia Centennial Exposition of 1876, Wallace Farmer dynamos built at Ansonia, Connecticut, were shown, with the current from which arc lamps were there put in actual service. A year or two later, the work of Charles F. Brush and Edward Weston laid the deep foundation of modern arc lighting in America, securing as well substantial recognition abroad. Thus the new era had been ushered in but it was based altogether on the consumption of some material, carbon, in a lamp open to the air. Every lamp the world had ever known did this, in one way or another. Edison himself began at that point, and his notebooks show that he made various experiments with this type of lamp at a very early stage. Indeed, his experiments had led him so far as to anticipate in 1875 what are now known as flaming arcs, the exceedingly bright and generally orange or rose-colored lights which have been introduced within the last few years, and are now so frequently seen in streets and public places. While the arcs with plain carbons are bluish-white, those with carbons containing calcium fluoride have a notable golden glow. He was convinced, however, that the greatest field of lighting lay in the illumination of houses and other comparatively enclosed areas, to replace the ordinary gas light, rather than in the illumination of streets and other outdoor places by lights of great volume and brilliancy. Dismissing from his mind quickly the commercial impossibility of using arc lights for general indoor illumination, he arrived at the conclusion that an electric lamp giving light by incandescence was the solution of the problem. Edison was familiar with the numerous but impracticable and commercially unsuccessful efforts that had been previously made by other inventors and investigators to produce electric light by incandescence, and at the time that he began his experiments in 1877, Almost the whole scientific world had pronounced such an idea as impossible of fulfillment. The leading electricians, physicists, and experts of the period had been studying the subject for more than a quarter of a century, and with but one known exception, had proven mathematically and by close reasoning that the subdivision of the electric light, as it was then termed, was practically beyond attainment. Opinions of this nature have ever been but a stimulus to Edison when he has given deep thought to a subject and has become impressed with strong convictions of possibility. And in this particular case he was satisfied that the subdivision of the electric light, or, more correctly, the subdivision of the electric current, was not only possible, but entirely practicable. It will have to be perceived from the foregoing chapters that from the time of boyhood, when he first began to rub against the world, his commercial instincts were alert and predominated in almost all of the enterprises that he set in motion. This characteristic trait had grown stronger as he matured, having received, as it did, fresh impetus and strength from his one lapse in the case of his first patented invention, the vote recorder. The lesson he then learned was to devote his inventive faculties only to things for which there was a real, genuine demand, and that would subserve the actual necessities of humanity, and it was probably a fortunate circumstance that this lesson was learned at the outset of his career as an inventor. He has never assumed to be a philosopher or pure scientist. In order that the reader may grasp an adequate idea of the magnitude and importance of Edison's invention of the incandescent lamp, it will be necessary to review briefly the state of the art 
at the time he began his experiments on that line. After the invention of the voltaic battery, early in the last century, experiments were made which determined that heat could be produced by the passage of the electric current through wires of platinum and other metals, and through pieces of carbon as noted already, and it was, of course, also observed that if sufficient current were passed through these conductors, they could be brought from the lower stage of redness up to the brilliant white heat of incandescence. As early as 1845, the results of these experiments were taken advantage of when Starr, a talented American who died at the early age of 25, suggested in his English patent of that year two forms of small incandescent electric lamps, one having a burner made from platinum foil placed under a glass cover without excluding the air, and the other composed of a thin plate or pencil of carbon enclosed in a terracellian vacuum. These suggestions of young star were followed by many other experimenters, whose improvements consisted principally in devices to increase the compactness and portability of the lamp, in the sealing of the lamp chamber to prevent the emission of air, and in the means for renewing the carbon burner when it had been consumed. Thus Roberts, in 1852, proposed to cement the neck of the glass globe into a metallic cup, and to provide it with a tube or stopcock for exhaustion by means of a hand pump. Lodeguine, Kahn, Kosloff, and Kotinsky, between 1872 and 1877, proposed various ingenious devices for perfecting the joint between the metal base and the glass globe, and also provided their lamps with several short carbon pencils, which were automatically brought into circuit successively as the pencils were consumed. In 1876 or 1877, Blingwine proposed the employment of a long carbon pencil, a short section only of which was in circuit at any one time, and formed the burner, the lamp being provided with a mechanism for automatically pushing other sections of the pencil into position between the contacts to renew the burner. Sawyer and Mann proposed in 1878 to make the bottom plate of glass instead of metal, and provided ingenious arrangements for charging the lamp chamber with an atmosphere of pure nitrogen gas which does not support combustion. These lamps and many others of similar character, ingenious as they were, failed to become of any commercial value, due, among other things, to the brief life of the carbon burner. Even under the best conditions, it was found that the carbon members were subject to a rapid disintegration or evaporation, which experimenters assumed was due to the disrupting action of the electric current, and hence the conclusion that carbon contained in itself the elements of its own destruction, and was not a suitable material for the burner of an incandescent lamp. On the other hand, platinum, although found to be the best of all materials for the purpose, aside from its great expense, and not combining with oxygen at high temperatures, as does carbon, require to be brought so near the melting point in order to give light that a very slight increase in the temperature resulted in its destruction. It was assumed that the difficulty lay in the material of the burner itself, and not in its environment. It was not realized up to such a comparatively recent date as 1879 that the solution of the great problem of subdivision of the electric current would not, however, be found merely in the production of a durable incandescent electric lamp, even if any of the lamps above referred to had fulfilled that requirement. The other principal features necessary to subdivide the electric current successfully were the burning of an indefinite number of lights on the same circuit, each light to give a useful and economical degree of illumination, and each light to be independent of all the others in regard to its operation and extinguishment. The opinions of scientific men of the period on the subject are well represented by the two following extracts. The first from a lecture at the Royal United Service Institution about February 1879 by Mr. Sir W. Priest, one of the most eminent electricians in England, who, after discussing the question mathematically, said, Hence the subdivision of the light is an absolute ignis fatuus. The other extract is from a book written by Paget Higgs, LLD, Doctor of Science, published in London in 1879, in which he says, Much nonsense has been talked in relation to this subject. Some inventors have claimed the power to indefinitely divide the electric current, not knowing or forgetting that such a statement is incompatible with the well-proven law of conservation of energy. Some inventors, in the last sentence just quoted, probably, indeed we think undoubtedly, refers to Edison, whose earlier work in electric lighting, 1878, had been announced in this country and abroad, 
and who had then stated boldly his conviction of the practicability of the subdivision of the electric current. The above extracts are good illustrations, however, of scientific opinions up to the end of 1879, when Mr. Edison's epoch-making invention rendered them entirely untenable. The eminent scientist John Tyndall, while not sharing these precise views, at least as late as January 17, 1879, delivered a lecture before the Royal Institution on the electric light, when after pointing out the development of the art up to Edison's work and showing the apparent hopelessness of the problem, he said, Knowing something of the intricacy of the practical problem, I should certainly prefer seeing it in Edison's hands to having it in mine. The reader may have deemed this sketch of the state of the art to be a considerable digression, but it is certainly due to the subject to present the facts in such a manner as to show that this great invention was neither the result of improving some process or device that was known or existing at the time, nor due to any unforeseen lucky chance, nor the accidental result of other experiments. On the contrary, it was the legitimate outcome of a series of exhaustive experiments founded upon logical and original reasoning in a mind that had the courage and hardihood to set at naught the confirmed opinions of the world, voiced by those generally acknowledged to be the best exponents of the art, experiments carried on amid a storm of jeers and derision, almost as contemptuous as if the search were for the discovery of perpetual motion. In this we see the man foreshadowed by the boy who, when he obtained his books on chemistry or physics, did not accept any statement of fact or experiment therein, but worked out every one of them himself to ascertain whether or not they were true. Although this brings the reader up to the year 1879, one must turn back two years and accompany Edison in his first attack on the electric light problem. In 1877 he sold his telephone invention, the carbon transmitter, to the Western Union Telegraph Company, which had previously come into possession also of his quadruplex inventions, as already related. He was still busily engaged on the telephone, on acoustic electrical transmission, sextuplex telegraphs, duplex telegraphs, miscellaneous carbon articles, and other inventions of a minor nature. During the whole of the previous year, and until late in the summer of 1877, he had been working with characteristic energy and enthusiasm on the telephone, and in developing this invention to a successful issue, had preferred the use of carbon and had employed it in numerous forms, especially in the form of carbonized paper. 1877 in Edison's laboratory was a veritable carbon year, for it was carbon in some shape or form for interpolation in electric circuits of various kinds that occupied the thoughts of the whole force from morning to night. It is not surprising, therefore, that in September of that year, when Edison turned his thoughts actively toward electric lighting by incandescence, his early experiment should be in the line of carbon as an illuminant. His originality of method was displayed at the very outset, for one of the first experiments was the bringing of incandescence of a strip of carbon in the open air to ascertain merely how much current was required. This conductor was a strip of carbonized paper about an inch long, one-sixteenth of an inch broad, and six or seven one-thousandths of an inch thick, the ends of which were secured to clamps that formed the poles of a battery. The carbon was lighted up to incandescence, and of course oxidized and disintegrated immediately. Within a few days this was followed by experiments with the same kind of carbon, but in vacuo, by means of a hand-worked air pump. This time the carbon strip burned at incandescence for about eight minutes. Various experiments to prevent oxidation were tried, such, for instance, as coating the carbon with powdered glass, which in melting would protect the carbon from the atmosphere, but without successful results. Edison was inclined to concur in the prevailing opinion as to the easy destructibility of carbon, but without actually settling the point in his mind, he laid aside temporarily this line of experiment and entered a new field. He had made previously some trials of platinum wire as an incandescent burner for a lamp, but left it for a time in favor of carbon. He now turned to the use of almost infusible metals, such as boron, ruthenium, chromium, etc., as separators or tiny bridges between two carbon points, the current acting so as to bring these separators to a high degree of incandescence, at which point they would emit a brilliant light. He also placed some of these refractory metals directly in the circuit, bringing them to incandescence, and used silicon in powdered form in glass tubes placed in the electric circuit. His notes include the use of powdered silicon, 
mixed with lime or other very infusible non-conductors or semiconductors. Edison's conclusions on these substances were that, while in some respects they were within the boundaries of possibility for the subdivision of the electric current, they did not reach the ideal that he had in mind for commercial results. Edison's systematized attacks on the problem were two in number, the first of which we have just related, which began in September 1877 and continued until about January 1878. Contemporaneously, he and his force of men were very busily engaged day and night on other important enterprises and inventions. Among the latter, the phonograph may be specially mentioned, as it was invented in the late fall of 1877. From that time until July 1878, his time and attention day and night were almost completely absorbed by the excitement caused by the invention and exhibition of the machine. In July, feeling entitled to a brief vacation after several years of continuous labor, Edison went with the expedition to Wyoming to observe an eclipse of the sun, and incidentally to test his tazimeter, a delicate instrument devised by him for measuring heat transmitted through immense distances of space. His trip has been already described. He was absent about two months. Coming home, rested and refreshed, Mr. Edison says, After my return from the trip to observe the eclipse of the sun, I went with Professor Barker, Professor of Physics in the University of Pennsylvania, and Dr. Chandler, Professor of Chemistry in Columbia College, to see Mr. Wallace, a large manufacturer of brass in Ansonia, Connecticut. Wallace at this time was experimenting on series arc lighting. Just at that time I wanted to take up something new, and Professor Barker suggested that I go to work and see if I could subdivide the electric light so it could be got in small units like gas. This was not a new suggestion, because I had made a number of experiments on electric lighting a year before this. They had been laid aside for the phonograph. I determined to take up the search again and continue it. On my return home, I started my usual course of collecting every kind of data about gas, bought all the transactions of the gas engineering societies, etc., all the back volumes of gas journals, etc. Having obtained all the data and investigated gas jet distribution in New York by actual observations, I made up my mind that the problem of the subdivision of the electric current could be solved and made commercial. About the end of August 1878, he began his second organized attack on the subdivision of the current, which was steadily maintained until he achieved signal victory a year and two months later. The date of this interesting visit to Ansonia is fixed by an inscription made by Edison on a glass goblet which he used. The legend in diamond scratches runs, Thomas A. Edison, September 8, 1878, made under the electric light. Other members of the party left similar memorials, which under the circumstances have come to be greatly prized. A number of experiments were witnessed in arc lighting, and Edison secured a small Wallace Farmer dynamo for his own work, as well as a set of Wallace arc lamps for lighting the Menlo Park Laboratory. Before leaving Ansonia, Edison remarked significantly, Wallace, I believe I can beat you making electric lights. I don't think you are working in the right direction. Another date which shows how promptly the work was resumed is October 14, 1878, when Edison filed an application for his first lighting patent, Improvement in Electric Lights. In after years, discussing the work of Wallace, who was not only a great pioneer electrical manufacturer, but one of the founders of the wire drawing and brass working industry, Edison said, Wallace was one of the earliest pioneers in electrical matters in this country. He has done a great deal of good work, for which others have received the credit, and the work which he did in the early days of electric lighting others have benefited by largely, and he has been crowded to one side and forgotten." Associated in all this work with Wallace at Ansonia was Professor Moses G. Farmer, famous for the introduction of the fire alarm system, as the discoverer of the self-exciting principle of the modern dynamo, as a pioneer experimenter in the electric railway field, as a telegraph engineer, and as a lecturer on mines and explosives to naval classes at Newport. During 1858, Farmer, who, like Edison, was a ceaseless investigator, had made a series of studies upon the production of light by electricity, and had even invented an automatic regulator by which a number of platinum lamps in multiple arc could be kept at uniform voltage for any length of time. In July 1859, he lit up one of the rooms of his house at Salem, Massachusetts, every evening with such lamps, using in them small pieces of platinum and iridium wire, which were made to incandesce by means of current from primary batteries. 
Farmer was not one of the party that memorable day in September, but his work was known through his intimate connection with Wallace, and there is no doubt that reference was made to it. Such work had not led very far. The lamps were hopelessly short-lived, and everything was obviously experimental, but it was all helpful and suggestive to one whose open mind refused no hint from any quarter. At the commencement of his new attempts, Edison returned to his experiments with carbon as an incandescent burner for a lamp, and made a very large number of trials, all in vacuo. Not only were the ordinary strip paper carbons tried again, but tissue paper coated with tar and lamp black was rolled into thin sticks like knitting needles, carbonized and raised to incandescence in vacuo. Edison also tried hard carbon, wood carbons, and almost every conceivable variety of paper carbon in like manner. With the best vacuum that he could then get by means of the ordinary air pump, the carbons would last, at the most, only from ten to fifteen minutes in a state of incandescence. Such results were evidently not of commercial value. Edison then turned his attention in other directions. In his earliest consideration of the problem of subdividing the electric current, he had decided that the only possible solution lay in the employment of a lamp whose incandescing body should have a high resistance combined with a small radiating surface, and be capable of being used in what is called multiple arc, so that each unit or lamp could be turned on or off without interfering with any other unit or lamp. No other arrangement could possibly be considered as commercially practicable. The full significance of the last three preceding sentences will not be obvious to laymen, as undoubtedly many of the readers of this book may be and now being on the threshold of the series of Edison's experiments that led up to the basic invention, we interpolate a brief explanation in order that the reader may comprehend the logical reasoning and work that in this case produce such far-reaching results. If we consider a simple circuit in which a current is flowing, and include in the circuit a carbon horseshoe-like conductor, which it is desired to bring to incandescence by the heat generated by the current passing through it, it is first evident that the resistance offered to the current by the wires themselves must be less than that offered by the burner, because otherwise current would be wasted as heat in the conducting wires. At the very foundation of the electric lighting art is the essentially commercial consideration that one cannot spend very much for conductors, and Edison determined that, in order to use wires of a practicable size, the voltage of the current, that is, its pressure or the characteristic that overcomes resistance to its flow, should be 110 volts, which since its adoption has been the standard. To use a lower voltage or pressure, while making the solution of the lighting problem a simple one, as we shall see, would make it necessary to increase the size of the conducting wires to a prohibitive extent. To increase the voltage or pressure materially, while permitting some saving in the cost of conductors, would enormously increase the difficulties of making a sufficiently high resistance conductor to secure light by incandescence. This apparently remote consideration, weight of copper used, was really the commercial key to the problem, just as the incandescent burner was the scientific key to that problem. Before Edison's invention, incandescent lamps had been suggested as a possibility, but they were provided with carbon rods or strips of relatively low resistance, and to bring these to incandescence required a current of low pressure, because a current of high voltage would pass through them so readily as not to generate heat, and to carry a current of low pressure through wires without loss would require wires of enormous size. Having a current of relatively high pressure to contend with, it was necessary to provide a carbon burner which, as compared with what had previously been suggested, should have a very great resistance. Carbon as a material, determined after patient search, apparently offered the greatest hope, but even with this substance, the necessary high resistance would be obtained only by making the burner of extremely small cross-section, thereby also reducing its radiating surface. Therefore, the crucial point was the production of a hair-like carbon filament, with a relatively great resistance and small radiating surface, capable of withstanding mechanical shock, and susceptible of being maintained at a temperature of over 2,000 degrees, for a thousand hours or more before breaking. And this filamentary conductor required to be supported in a vacuum chamber so perfectly formed and constructed that during all those hours, and subjected as it is to varying temperatures, not a particle of air should enter to disintegrate the filament. And not only so, 
but the lamp after its design must not be a mere laboratory possibility, but a practical commercial article capable of being manufactured at low cost and in large quantities. A statement of what had to be done in those days of actual as well as scientific electrical darkness is quite sufficient to explain Tyndall's attitude of mind in preferring that the problem should be in Edison's hands rather than in his own. To say that the solution of the problem lay merely in reducing the size of the carbon burner to a mere hair is to state a half-truth only. But who, we ask, would have had the temerity even to suggest that such an attenuated body could be maintained at a white heat without disintegration for a thousand hours? The solution consisted not only in that, but in the enormous mass of patiently worked out details, the manufacture of the filaments, their uniform carbonization, making the globes, producing a perfect vacuum, and countless other factors, the omission of any of which would probably have resulted eventually in failure. Footnote 8. As a practical illustration of these facts, it was calculated by Professor Barker at the University of Pennsylvania, after Edison had invented the incandescent lamp, that if it should cost $100,000 for copper conductors to supply current to Edison lamps in a given area, it would cost about $200 million for copper conductors for lighting the same area by lamps of the earlier experimenters, such, for instance, as the lamp invented by Kahn in 1875. This enormous difference would be accounted for by the fact that Edison's lamp was one having a high resistance and relatively small radiating surface, while Kahn's lamp was one having a very low resistance and large radiating surface. Continuing the digression one step farther in order to explain the term multiple arc, it may be stated that there are two principal systems of distributing electric current, one termed series and the other multiple arc. The two are illustrated diagrammatically side by side, the arrows indicating flow of current. The series system, it will be seen, presents one continuous path for the current. The current for the last lamp must pass through the first and all the intermediate lamps. Hence, if any one light goes out, the continuity of the path is broken, current cannot flow, and all the lamps are extinguished unless a loop or bypath is provided. It is quite obvious that such a system would be commercially impracticable where small units, similar to gas jets, were employed. On the other hand, in the multiple arc system, current may be considered as flowing in two parallel conductors, like the vertical sides of a ladder, the ends of which never come together. Each lamp is placed in a separate circuit across these two conductors, like a rung in the ladder, thus making a separate and independent path for the current in each case. Hence, if a lamp goes out, only that individual subdivision or ladder step is affected. Just that one particular path for the current is interrupted, but none of the other lamps is interfered with. They remain lighted, each one independent of the other. The reader will quite readily understand, therefore, that a multiple arc system is the only one practically commercial where electric light is to be used in small units like those of gas or oil. Such was the nature of the problem that confronted Edison at the outset. There was nothing in the whole world that in any way approximated a solution, although the most brilliant minds in the electrical art had been assiduously working on the subject for a quarter of a century preceding. As already seen, he came early to the conclusion that the only solution lay in the use of a lamp of high resistance and small radiating surface, and, with characteristic fervor and energy, he attacked the problem from this standpoint, having absolute faith in a successful outcome. The mere fact that even with the successful production of the electric lamp, the assault on the complete problem of commercial lighting would hardly be begun did not deter him in the slightest. To one of Edison's enthusiastic self-confidence, the long vista of difficulties ahead— we say it in all sincerity, must have been alluring. After having devoted several months to experimental trials of carbon, at the end of 1878, as already detailed, he turned his attention to the platinum group of metals, and began a series of experiments in which he used chiefly platinum wire and iridium wire, and alloys of refractory metals in the form of wire burners for incandescent lamps. These metals have very high fusing points, and were found to last longer than the carbon strips previously used when heated up to incandescence by the electric current, although under such conditions as were then possible, they were melted by excess of current after they had been lighted a comparatively short time, either in the open air or in such a vacuum as could be obtained 
by means of the ordinary air pump. Nevertheless, Edison continued along this line of experiment with unremitting vigor, making improvement after improvement, until about April 1879 he devised a means whereby platinum wire of a given length, which would melt in the open air when giving a light equal to four candles, would emit a light of twenty-five candle power without fusion. This was accomplished by introducing the platinum wire into an all-glass globe, completely sealed and highly exhausted of air, and passing a current through the platinum wire while the vacuum was being made. In this, which was a new and radical invention, we see the first step toward the modern incandescent lamp. The knowledge thus obtained, that current passing through the platinum during exhaustion would drive out occluded gases, that is, gases mechanically held in or upon the metal, and increase the infusibility of the platinum, led him to aim at securing greater perfection in the vacuum, on the theory that the higher the vacuum obtained, the higher would be the infusibility of the platinum burner. And this fact also was of the greatest importance in making successful the final use of carbon, because without the subjection of the carbon to the heating effect of current during the formation of the vacuum, the presence of occluded gases would have been a fatal obstacle. Continuing these experiments with most fervent zeal, taking no account of the passage of time, with an utter disregard for meals, and but scanty hours of sleep snatched reluctantly at odd periods of the day or night, Edison kept his laboratory going without cessation. A great variety of lamps was made of the platinum-iridium type, mostly with thermal devices to regulate the temperature of the burner and prevent its being melted by an excess of current. The study of apparatus for obtaining more perfect vacua was unceasingly carried on, for Edison realized that in this there lay a potent factor of ultimate success. About August he had obtained a pump that would produce a vacuum up to about one hundred thousandths part of an atmosphere, and some time during the next month, or beginning of October, had obtained one that would produce a vacuum up to one millionth part of an atmosphere. It must be remembered that the conditions necessary for maintaining this high vacuum, were only made possible by his invention of the one-piece all-glass globe, in which all the joints were hermetically sealed during its manufacture into a lamp, whereby a high vacuum could be retained continuously for any length of time. In obtaining this perfection of vacuum apparatus, Edison realized that he was approaching much nearer to a solution of the problem. In his experiments with the platinum iridium lamps, he had been working all the time toward the proposition of high resistance and small radiating surface, until he had made a lamp having thirty feet of fine platinum wire wound upon a small bobbin of infusible material. But the desired economy, simplicity, and durability were not obtained in this manner, although at all times the burner was maintained at a critically high temperature. After attaining a high degree of perfection with these lamps, he recognized their impracticable character, and his mind reverted to the opinion he had formed in his early experiments two years before, namely, that carbon had the requisite resistance to permit a very simple conductor to accomplish the object if it could be used in the form of a hair-like filament, provided the filament itself could be made sufficiently homogeneous. As we have already seen, he could not use carbon successfully in his earlier experiments, for the strips of carbon he then employed, though they were much larger than filaments, would not stand, but were consumed in a few minutes under the imperfect conditions then at his command. Now, however, that he had found means for obtaining and maintaining high vacua, Edison immediately went back to carbon, which from the first he had conceived of as the ideal substance for a burner. His next step proved conclusively the correctness of his old deductions. On October 21st, 1879, after many patient trials, he carbonized a piece of cotton sewing thread bent into a loop or horseshoe form and had it sealed into a glass globe from which he exhausted the air until a vacuum up to one millionth of an atmosphere was produced. This lamp, when put on the circuit, lighted up brightly to incandescence and maintained its integrity for over forty hours, and lo, the practical incandescent lamp was born. The impossible, so-called, had been attained. Subdivision of the electric light current was made practicable. The goal had been reached, and one of the greatest inventions of the century was completed. Up to this time, Edison had spent over $40,000 in his electric light experiments, but the results far more than justified the expenditure, for with this lamp he made the discovery that the filament of carbon, 
under the conditions of high vacuum, was commercially stable, and would stand high temperatures without the disintegration and oxidation that took place in all previous attempts that he knew of for making an incandescent burner out of carbon. Besides, this lamp possessed the characteristics of high resistance and small radiating surface, permitting economy in the outlay for conductors and requiring only a small current for each unit of light, conditions that were absolutely necessary of fulfillment in order to accomplish commercially the subdivision of the electric light current. This slender, fragile, tenuous thread of brittle carbon, glowing steadily and continuously with a soft light agreeable to the eyes, was the tiny key that opened the door to a world revolutionized in its interior illumination. It was a triumphant vindication of Edison's reasoning powers, his clear perceptions, his insight into possibilities, and his inventive faculty, all of which had already been productive of so many startling, practical, and epic-making inventions. And now he had stepped over the threshold of a new art, which has since become so worldwide in its application as to be an integral part of the modern human experience. Footnote 9. The following extract from Walker on patents will probably be of interest to the reader. Section 31A. A meritorious exception to the rule of the last section is involved in the adjudicated validity of the Edison incandescent light patent. The carbon filament, which constitutes the only new part of the combination of the second claim of that patent, differs from the earlier carbon burners of Sawyer and Mann, only in having a diameter of one sixty-fourth of an inch or less, whereas the burners of Sawyer and Mann had a diameter of one thirty-second of an inch or more. But that reduction of one-half in diameter increased the resistance of the burner fourfold and reduced its radiating surface twofold, and thus increased eightfold its ratio of resistance to radiating surface. That eightfold increase in proportion enabled the resistance of the conductor of electricity from the generator to the burner to be increased eightfold, without any increase of percentage of loss of energy in that conductor, or decrease of percentage of development of heat in the burner, and thus enabled the area of the cross-section of that conductor to be reduced eightfold, and thus to be made with one-eighth of the amount of copper or other metal, which would be required if the reduction of diameter of the burner from one thirty-second to one sixty-fourth of an inch had not been made. And that great reduction in the size and cost of conductors involved also a great difference in the composition of the electric energy employed in the system, that difference consisting in generating the necessary amount of electrical energy with comparatively high electromotive force, and comparatively low current, instead of contrariwise. For this reason, the use of carbon filaments, one sixty-fourth of an inch in diameter or less, instead of carbon burners, one thirty-second of an inch in diameter or more, not only worked an enormous economy in conductors, but also necessitated a great change in generators, and did both according to a philosophy which Edison was the first to know, and which is stated in this paragraph in its simplest form and aspect, and which lies at the foundation of the incandescent electric lighting of the world. No sooner had the truth of this new principle been established than the work to establish it firmly and commercially was carried out more assiduously than ever. The next immediate step was a further investigation of the possibilities of improving the quality of the carbon filament. Edison had previously made a vast number of experiments with carbonized paper for various electrical purposes, with such good results that he once more turned to it and now made fine filament-like loops of this material which were put into other lamps. These proved even more successful, commercially considered, than the carbonized thread, so much so that after a number of such lamps had been made and put through severe tests, the manufacture of lamps from these paper carbons was begun and carried on continuously. This necessitated first the devising and making of a large number of special tools for cutting the carbon filaments and for making and putting together the various parts of the lamps. Meantime, great excitement had been caused in this country and in Europe by the announcement of Edison's success. In the old world, scientists generally still declared the impossibility of subdividing the electric light current, and in the public press, Mr. Edison was denounced as a dreamer. Other names of a less complimentary nature were applied to him, even though his lamp were actually in use, and the principle of commercial incandescent lighting had been established. Between October 21, 1879 and December 21, 1879, 
Some hundreds of these paper carbon lamps had been made and put into actual use, not only in the laboratory, but in the streets and several residences at Menlo Park, New Jersey, causing great excitement and bringing many visitors from far and near. On the latter date, a full-page article appeared in the New York Herald, which so intensified the excited feeling that Mr. Edison deemed it advisable to make a public exhibition. On New Year's Eve, 1879, Special trains were run to Menlo Park by the Pennsylvania Railroad, and over 3,000 persons took advantage of the opportunity to go out there and witness this demonstration for themselves. In this great crowd were many public officials and men of prominence in all walks of life who were enthusiastic in their praises. In the meantime, the mind that conceived and made practical this invention could not rest content with anything less than perfection, so far as it could be realized. Edison was not satisfied with paper carbons. They were not fully up to the ideal that he had in mind. What he sought was a perfectly uniform and homogeneous carbon, one like the one hoss shea that had no weak spots to break down at inopportune times. He began to carbonize everything in nature that he could lay his hands on. In his laboratory notebooks are innumerable jottings of the things that were carbonized and tried, such as tissue paper, soft paper, all kinds of cardboards, drawing paper of all grades, paper saturated with tar, all kinds of threads, fish line, threads rubbed with tarred lamp black, fine threads plated together in strands, cotton soaked in boiling tar, lamp wick, twine, tar and lamp black mixed with a proportion of lime, vulcanized fiber, celluloid, boxwood, coconut hair and shell, spruce, hickory, baywood, cedar and maple shavings, rosewood, punk, cork, bagging, flax, and a host of other things. He also extended his searches far into the realms of nature in the line of grasses, plants, canes, and similar products, and in these experiments at that time and later he carbonized, made into lamps, and tested no fewer than 6,000 different species of vegetable growths. The reasons for such prodigious research are not apparent on the face of the subject, nor is this the occasion to enter into an explanation as that alone would be sufficient to fill a fair-sized book. Suffice it to say that Edison's omniferous reading, keen observation, power of assimilating facts and natural phenomena, and skill in applying the knowledge thus attained to whatever was at hand, now came into full play in determining that the results he desired could only be obtained in certain directions. At this time he was investigating everything with a microscope, and one day in the early part of 1880 he noticed upon a table in the laboratory an ordinary palm-leaf fan. He picked it up and, looking it over, observed that it had a binding rim made of bamboo, cut from the outer edge of the cane, a very long strip. He examined this, and then gave it to one of his assistants, telling him to cut it up and get out of it all the filaments he could, carbonize them, put them into lamps, and try them. The results of this trial were exceedingly successful— far better than with anything else thus far used, indeed so much so that after further experiments and microscopic examinations, Edison was convinced that he was now on the right track for making a thoroughly stable commercial lamp, and shortly afterward he sent a man to Japan to procure further supplies of bamboo. The fascinating story of the bamboo hunt will be told later, but even this bamboo lamp was only one item of a complete system to be devised, a system that has since completely revolutionized the art of interior illumination. Reference has been made in this chapter to the preliminary study that Edison brought to bear on the development of the gas art in industry. This study was so exhaustive that one can only compare it to the careful investigation made in advance by any competent war staff of the elements of strength and weakness on both sides in a possible campaign. A popular idea of Edison that dies hard pictures a breezy, slapdash, energetic inventor arriving at new results by luck and intuition, making boastful assertions and then winning out by mere chance. The native simplicity of the man, the absence of pose and ceremony, do much to strengthen this notion. But the real truth is that while gifted with unusual imagination, Edison's march to the goal of a new invention is positively humdrum and monotonous in its steady progress. No one ever saw Edison in a hurry. No one ever saw him lazy. And that which he did with slow, careful scrutiny six months ago, he will be doing with just as much calm deliberation of research six months hence, and six years hence, if necessary. 
If, for instance, he were asked to find the most perfect pebble on the Atlantic shore of New Jersey, instead of hunting here, there, and everywhere for the desired object, we would no doubt find him patiently screening the entire beach, sifting out the most perfect stones, and eventually, by gradual exclusion, reaching the long-sought-for pebble. And the mere fact that in this search years might be taken would not lessen his enthusiasm to the slightest extent. In the prospectus book, among the series of famous notebooks, all the references and data apply to gas. The book is numbered 184, falls into the period now dealt with, and runs along casually with items spread out over two or three years. All these notes refer specifically to electricity versus gas as general illuminance, and cover an astounding range of inquiry and comment. One of the very first notes tells the whole story. Object. Edison to effect exact imitation of all done by gas, so as to replace lighting by gas by lighting by electricity, to improve the illumination to such an extent as to meet all requirements of natural, artificial, and commercial conditions. A large program, but fully executed. The notes, it will be understood, are all in Edison's handwriting. They go on to observe that a general system of distribution is the only possible means of economic illumination and they dismiss isolated plant lighting as in mills and factories as of so little importance to the public, we shall leave the consideration of this out of this book. The shrewd prophecy is made that gas will be manufactured less for lighting as the result of electrical competition, and more and more for heating, etc., thus enlarging its market and increasing its income. Comment is made on kerosene and its cost, and all kinds of general statistics are jotted down as desirable. Data are to be obtained on lamp and dynamo efficiency, and another review of the whole thing as worked out upon pure science principles by Rowland Young Trowbridge, also Rowland on the possibilities and probabilities of cheaper production by better manufacture, higher incandescence without decrease of life in lamps. Notes are also made on meters and motors. It doesn't matter if electricity is used for light or for power. While small motors, it is observed, can be used night or day, and small steam engines are inconvenient. Again, the shrewd comment. Generally poorest district for light, best for power, thus evening up whole city, the effect of this on investment. It is pointed out that previous inventions failed, necessities for commercial success and accomplishment by Edison, Edison's great effort, not to make a large light or a blinding light, but a small light having the mildness of gas. Curves are then called for of iron and copper investment, also energy line, curves of candle power and electromotive force, curves on motors, graphic representation of the consumption of gas, January to December, tables and formulae, representations graphically of what one dollar will buy in different kinds of light, table weight of copper require different distance, 100 ohm lamp, 16 candles. Table with curves showing increased economy by larger engine, higher power, etc. There is not much that is dilettant about all this. Note is made of an article in April 1879, putting the total amount of gas investment in the whole world at that time at $1,500,000,000, which is now, 1910, about the amount of the electric lighting investment in the United States. Incidentally, a note remarks, so unpleasant is the effect of the products of gas that in the new Madison Square Theater, every gas jet is ventilated by special tubes to carry away the products of combustion. In short, there is no aspect of the new problem to which Edison failed to apply his acutest powers, and the speed with which the new system was worked out and introduced was simply due to his initial mastery of all the factors in the older art. Luther Steeringer, an expert gas engineer and inventor, whose services were early enlisted, once said that Edison knew more about gas than any other man he had ever met. Chapter 12 of Edison, His Life and Inventions. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, 
please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ralph Snelson, Springfield, Utah. Edison, His Life and Inventions by Frank Lewis Dyer and Thomas Comerford Martin. Chapter 12, Memories of Menlo Park. From the spring of 1876 to 1886, Edison lived and did his work at Menlo Park, and at this stage of the narrative, midway in that interesting and eventful period, it is appropriate to offer a few notes and jottings on the place itself, around which tradition is already weaving its fancies, just as at the time the outpouring of new inventions from it invested the name with sudden prominence and with the glamour of romance. In 1876 I moved, says Edison, to Menlo Park, New Jersey, on the Pennsylvania Railroad, several miles below Elizabeth. The move was due to trouble I had about rent. I had rented a small shop in Newark on the top floor of a padlock factory by the month. I gave notice that I would give it up at the end of the month, paid the rent, moved out, and delivered the keys. Shortly afterward I was served with a paper, probably a judgment, wherein I was to pay nine months' rent. There was some law, it seems, that made a monthly renter liable for a year. This seemed so unjust that I determined to get out of a place that permitted such injustice. For several Sundays he walked through different parts of New Jersey with two of his assistants before he decided on Menlo Park. The change was a fortunate one for the inventor had married Miss Mary E. Stilwell, and was now able to establish himself comfortably with his wife and family, while enjoying immediate access to the new laboratory. Every moment thus saved was valuable. Today the place and region have gone back to the insignificance from which Edison's genius lifted them so startlingly. A glance from the car windows reveals only a gently rolling landscape dotted with modest residences and unpretentious barns, and there is nothing in sight by way of memorial to suggest that for nearly a decade this spot was the scene of the most concentrated and fruitful inventive activity the world has ever known. Close to the Menlo Park Railway Station is a group of gaunt and deserted buildings, shelter of the casual tramp and slowly crumbling away when not destroyed by the carelessness of some ragged smoker this silent group of buildings comprises the famous old laboratory and workshops of mr edison historic as being the birthplace of the carbon transmitter the phonograph the incandescent lamp and the spot where edison also worked out his systems of electrical distribution his commercial dynamo his electric railway, his megaphone, his tossimeter, and many other inventions of greater or lesser degree. Here he continued, moreover, his earlier work on the quadruplex, sextuplex, multiplex, and automatic telegraphs, and did his notable pioneer work in wireless telegraphy. As the reader knows, it had been a master passion with Edison from boyhood up to possess a laboratory, in which, with free use of his own time and powers, and with command of abundant material resources, he could wrestle with nature and probe her closest secrets. Thus, from the little cellar at Port Huron, from the scant shelves in a baggage car, from the nooks and corners of dingy telegraph offices, and the grimy little shops in New York and Newark, he had now come to the proud ownership of an establishment to which his favorite word, laboratory, might justly be applied. Here he could experiment to his heart's content, and invent on a larger, bolder scale than ever, and he did. Menlo Park was the merest hamlet. Omitting the laboratory structures, it had only about seven houses, the best looking of which Edison lived in, a place that had a windmill pumping water into a reservoir. One of the stories of the day was that Edison had his front gate so connected with the pumping plant that every visitor, as he opened or closed the gate, added involuntarily to the supply in the reservoir. Two or three of the houses were occupied by the families of members of the staff. In the others, boarders were taken, the laboratory, of course, furnishing all the patrons. 
Near the railway station was a small saloon kept by an old Scotchman named Davis, where billiards were played in idle moments, and where, in the long winter evenings, the hot stove was a center of attraction to loungers and storytellers. The truth is that there was very little social life of any kind possible under the strenuous conditions prevailing at the laboratory, where, if anywhere, relaxation was enjoyed at odd intervals of fatigue and waiting. The main laboratory was a spacious wooden building of two floors. The office was in this building at first, until removed to the brick library when that was finished. There S. L. Griffin, an old telegraph friend of Edison, acted as his secretary, and had charge of a voluminous and amazing correspondence. The office employees were the Carmen brothers and the late John F. Randolph, afterward secretary. According to Mr. Francis Jell of Budapest, then one of the staff, to whom the writers were indebted for a great deal of valuable data on this period, Quote, it was on the upper story of this laboratory that the most important experiments were executed and where the incandescent lamp was born. This floor consisted of a large hall containing several long tables upon which could be found all the various instruments, scientific and chemical apparatus that the arts at that time could produce. Books lay promiscuously about while here and there long lines of bichromate of potash cells could be seen, together with experimental models of ideas that Edison or his assistants were engaged upon. The side walls of this hall were lined with shelves filled with bottles, files, and other receptacles containing every imaginable chemical and other material that could be obtained, while at the end of this hall, and near the organ, which stood in the rear, was a large glass case containing the world's most precious metals in sheet and wire form, together with very rare and costly chemicals. When evening came on, and the last rays of the setting sun penetrated through the side windows, this hall looked like a veritable Faust laboratory. On the ground floor we had our testing table, which stood on two large pillars of brick built deep into the earth, in order to get rid of all vibrations on account of the sensitive instruments that were upon it. There was the Thompson reflecting mirror, galvanometer, and electrometer, while nearby were the standard cells by which the galvanometers were adjusted and standardized. This testing table was connected by means of wires with all parts of the laboratory and machine shop, so that measurements could be conveniently made from a distance, as in those days we had no portable and direct reading instruments such as now exist. Opposite this table we installed, later on, our photometrical chamber, which was constructed on the Bunsen principle. A little way from this table, and separated by a partition, we had the chemical laboratory with its furnaces and stink chambers. Later on, another chemical laboratory was installed near the photometer room, and this Dr. A. Hade had charge of. Next to the laboratory in importance was the machine shop, a large and well-lighted building of brick, at one end of which there was the boiler and engine room. This shop contained light and heavy lathes, boring and drilling machines, all kinds of planing machines, in fact tools of all descriptions, so that any apparatus, however delicate or heavy, could be made and built as might be required by Edison in experimenting. Mr. John Crusey had charge of this shop, and was assisted by a number of skilled mechanics, notably John Ott, whose deft fingers and quick intuitive grasp of the master's ideas are still in demand under the more recent conditions at the Llewellyn Park Laboratory in Orange. Between the machine shop and the laboratory was a small building of wood used as a carpenter's shop, where Tom Logan plied his art. Nearby was the gasoline plant, before the incandescent lamp was perfected, the only illumination was from gasoline gas, and that was used later for incandescent lamp glass blowing, which was done in another small building on one side of the laboratory. 
Apparently little or no lighting service was obtained from the Wallace Farmer art lamps secured from Ansonia, Connecticut. The dynamo was probably needed for Edison's own experiments. On the outskirts of the property was a small building in which lamp black was crudely but carefully manufactured and pressed into very small cakes for use in the Edison carbon transmitters of that time. The night watchman, Alfred Swanson, took care of this curious plant, which consisted of a battery of petroleum lamps that were forced to burn to the sooting point. During his rounds in the night, Swanson would find time to collect from the chimneys the soot that the lamps gave. It was then weighed out into very small portions, which were pressed into cakes or buttons by means of a hand press. These little cakes were delicately packed away between layers of cotton in small, light boxes and shipped to Bergman in New York, by whom the telephone transmitters were being made. A little later the Edison Electric Railway was built on the confines of the property out through the woods, at first only a third of a mile in length, but reaching ultimately to Pump Town, almost three miles away. Mr. Edison's own words may be quoted as to the men with whom he surrounded himself here and upon whose services he depended primarily for help in the accomplishment of his aims. In an autobiographical article in the Electrical World of March 5, 1904, he says, quote, It is interesting to note that in addition to those mentioned above, Charles Batchelor and Frank Upton, I had around me other men who ever since have remained active in the field, such as Mr. Francis Jell, William J. Hammer, Martin Force, Ludwig K. Bohm, not forgetting that good friend and co-worker the late John Crusey. They found plenty to do in the various developments of the art, and as I now look back I sometimes wonder how we did so much in so short a time." Unquote. Mr. Jail, in his reminiscences, adds another name to the above, namely that of John W. Lawson, and then goes on to say, quote, These are the names of the pioneers of incandescent lighting, who were continuously at the side of Edison day and night for some years, and who, under his guidance, worked upon the carbon filament lamp from its birth to ripe maturity. These men all had complete faith in his ability and stood by him as on a rock, guarding their work with the secretiveness of a burglar-proof safe. Whenever it leaked out in the world that Edison was succeeding in his work on the electric light, spies and others came to the park, so it was of the utmost importance that the experiments and their results should be kept a secret until Edison had secured the protection of the patent office." Unquote. With this staff was associated from the first Mr. E. H. Johnson, whose work with Mr. Edison lay chiefly, however, outside the laboratory, taking him to all parts of the country and to Europe. There were also to be regarded as detached members of it the Bergman brothers, manufacturing for Mr. Edison in New York, and incessantly experimenting for him. In addition there must be included Mr. Samuel Insull, whose activities for many years as private secretary and financial manager were devoted solely to Mr. Edison's interest with Mineral Park as a center and main source of anxiety as to payrolls and other constantly recurring obligations. The names of yet other associates occur from time to time in this narrative. Edison Men, who have been very proud of their close relationship to the inventor and his work at Old Menlo. Quote, there was also Mr. Charles L. Clark, who devoted himself mainly to engineering matters and later on acted as chief engineer of the Edison Electric Light Company for some years. Then there were William Holzer and James Hipple, both of whom took an active part in the practical development of the glass-blowing department of the laboratory and subsequently at the first Edison lamp factory at Menlo Park. Later on, Mr. Jell, Hipple, and Force assisted Mr. Batchelor to install the lamp works of the French Edison Company at ivory sur seine Then there were Mr. Charles T. Hughes, Samuel D. Mott, and Charles T. Mott, who devoted their time chiefly to commercial affairs. 
Mr. Hughes conducted most of this work, and later on took a prominent part in Edison's electric railway experiments. His business ability was on a high level, while his personal character endeared him to us all." Unquote. Among other now well-known men who came to us and assisted in various kinds of work were Mr. Atchison, Worth, Crosby, Herrick, and Hill, while Dr. Hayde was placed by Mr. Edison in charge of a special chemical laboratory. Dr. E. L. Nichols was also with us for a short time, conducting a special series of experiments. There was also Mr. Isaacs, who did a great deal of photographic work, and to whom we must be thankful for the pictures of Menlo Park in connection with Edison's work. Quote, Among others who were added to Mr. Crusey's staff in the machine shop were Mr. J. H. Vale and W. S. Andrews. Mr. Vale had charge of the dynamo room. He had a good general knowledge of machinery, and very soon acquired such familiarity with the dynamos that he could skip about among them with astonishing agility to regulate their brushes or to throw rosin on the belts when they began to squeal. Later on he took an active part in the affairs and installations of the Edison Light Company. Mr. Andrews stayed on Mr. Crusey's staff as long as the laboratory machine shop was kept open, after which he went into the employ of the Edison Electric Light Company, and became actively engaged in the commercial and technical exploitation of the system. Another man who was with us at Menlo Park was Mr. Herman Claudius, an Austrian who at one time was employed in connection with the state telegraphs of his country. To him Mr. Edison assigned the task of making a complete model of the network of conductors for the contemplated first station in New York." Unquote. Mr. Francis R. Upton, who was early employed by Mr. Edison as his mathematician, furnishes a pleasant, vivid picture of his chief associates engaged on the memorable work at Menlo Park. He says, quote, Mr. Charles Batchelor was Mr. Edison's principal assistant at that time. He was an Englishman, and came to this country to set up the thread-weaving machinery for the Clark Thread Works. He was a most intelligent, patient, competent, and loyal assistant to Mr. Edison. I remember distinctly seeing him work many hours to mount a small filament, and his hand would be as steady and his patience as unyielding at the end of those many hours as it was at the beginning, in spite of repeated failures. He was a wonderful mechanic. The control that he had of his fingers was marvelous, and his eyesight was sharp. Mr. Batchelor's judgment and good sense were always in evidence. Mr. Crusey was the superintendent, a Swiss trained in the best Swiss ideas of accuracy. He was a splendid mechanic with a vigorous temper and wonderful ability to work continuously and to get work out of men. It was an ideal combination that of Edison, Batchelor, and Crusey Mr. Edison, with his wonderful flow of ideas which were sharply defined in his mind, as can be seen by any of the sketches that he made, as he evidently always thinks in three dimensions, Mr. Crusey, willing to take the ideas and capable of comprehending them, would distribute the work so as to get it done with marvelous quickness and great accuracy. Mr. Batchelor was always ready for any special fine experimenting or observation and could hold to whatever he was at as long as Mr. Edison wished, and always brought to bear on what he was at the greatest skill. While Edison depended upon Upton for his mathematical work, he was wont to check it up in a very practical manner, as evidenced by the following incident described by Mr. Jail. Quote, I was once with Mr. Upton calculating some tables which he had put me on when Mr. Edison appeared with a glass bulb having a pear-shaped appearance in his hand. It was the kind that we were going to use for our lamp experiments, and Mr. Edison asked Mr. Upton to please calculate for him its cubic contents in centimeters. Now Mr. Upton was a very able mathematician who, after he finished his studies at Princeton, went to Germany and got his final gloss under that great master Hemholtz. Whatever he did and worked on was executed in a pure mathematical manner, and any wrangler at Oxford would have been delighted to see him juggle with integral and differential equations with a dexterity that was surprising. 
He drew the shape of the bulb exactly on paper, and got the equation of its lines with which he was going to calculate its contents, when Mr. Edison again appeared and asked him what it was. He showed Edison the work he had already done on the subject, and told him that he would very soon finish calculating it. Why, said Edison, I would simply take that bulb and fill it with mercury and weigh it, and from the weight of the mercury and its specific gravity, I'll get it in five minutes, and use less mental energy than is necessary in such a fatiguing operation. Menlo Park became ultimately the center of Edison's business life as it was of his inventing. After the short, distasteful period during the introduction of his lighting system, when he spent a large part of his time at the offices at 65 Fifth Avenue, New York, or on the actual work connected with the New York Edison installation, he settled back again in Menlo Park altogether. Mr. Samuel Insull describes the business methods which prevailed throughout the earlier Menlo Park days of storm and stress and the curious conditions with which he had to deal as private secretary. I never attempted to systematize Edison's business life. Edison's whole method of work would upset the system of any office. He was just as likely to be at work in his laboratory at midnight as midday. He cared not for the hours of the day or the days of the week. If he was exhausted, he might more likely be asleep in the middle of the day than in the middle of the night as most of his work in the way of inventions was done at night. I used to run his office on as close business methods as my experience admitted, and I would get at him whenever it suited his convenience. Sometimes he would not go over his mail for days at a time, but other times he would go regularly to his office in the morning. At other times my engagements used to be with him to go over his business affairs at Menlo Park at night, if I was occupied in New York during the day. In fact, as a matter of convenience, I used more often to get at him at night, as it left my days free to transact his affairs, and enabled me, probably at a midnight luncheon, to get a few minutes of his time, to look over his correspondence, and get his directions as to what I should do in some particular negotiation or matter of finance. While it was a matter of suiting Edison's convenience as to when I should transact business with him, it also suited my own ideas, as it enabled me, after getting through my business with him, to enjoy the privilege of watching him at his work, and to learn something about the technical side of matters. Whatever knowledge I may have of the electric light and power industry, I feel I owe it to the tuition of Edison. He was about the most willing tutor, and I must confess that he had to be a patient one. Here again occurs the reference to the incessant night work at Menlo Park, a note that is struck in every reminiscence and in every record of the time. But it is not to be inferred that the atmosphere of grim determination and persistent pursuit of the new invention characteristic of this period made life a burden to the small family of laborers associated with Edison. Many a time, during the long, weary nights of experimenting, Edison would call a halt for refreshments, which he had ordered always to be sent in when night work was in progress. Everything would be dropped, all present would join in the meal, and the last good story or joke would pass around. In his notes, Mr. Jell says, our lunch always ended with a cigar, and I may mention here that although Edison was never fastidious in eating, he always relished a good cigar, and seemed to find in it consolation and solace. It often happened that while we were enjoying the cigars after our midnight repast, one of the boys would start up a tune on the organ, and we would all sing together, or one of the others would give a solo. Another of the boys had a voice that sounded like something between the ring of an old tomato can and a pewter jug. He had one song that he would sing while we roared with laughter. He was also great in imitating the tinfoil phonograph. When Boehm was in good humor, he would play his zither now and then, and amuse us by singing pretty German songs. On many of these occasions the laboratory was the rendezvous of jolly and convivial visitors, mostly old friends and acquaintances of Mr. Edison. 
Some of the office employees would also drop in once in a while, and as everybody present was always welcome to partake of the midnight meal, we all enjoyed these gatherings. After a while, when we were ready to resume work, our visitors would intimate that they were going home to bed, but we fellows could stay up and work, and they would depart, generally singing some song like, Good Night, Ladies. It often happened that when Edison had been working up to three or four o'clock in the morning, he would lie down on one of the laboratory tables, and with nothing but a couple of books for a pillow, he would fall into a sound sleep. He said it did him more good than being in a soft bed, which spoils a man. Some of the laboratory assistants could be seen now and then sleeping on a table in the early morning hours. If their snoring became objectionable to those still at work, the calmer was applied. This machine consisted of a Babbitt soap-box without a cover. Upon it was mounted a broad ratchet wheel with a crank, while into the teeth of the wheel there played a stout, elastic slab of wood. The box would be placed on the table where the snorer was sleeping, and the crank turned rapidly. The racket thus produced was something terrible, and the sleeper would jump up as though a typhoon had struck the laboratory. The irrepressible spirit of humor in the old days, although somewhat strenuous at times, caused many a moment of hilarity which seemed to refresh the boys and enable them to work with renewed vigor after its manifestation. Mr. Upton remarks that often during the period of the invention of the incandescent lamp, when under great strain and fatigue, Edison would go to the organ and play tunes in a primitive way and come back to crack jokes with the staff but I have often felt that Mr. Edison never could comprehend the limitations of the strength of other men, as his own physical and mental strength have always seemed to be without limit. He could work continuously as long as he wished, and had sleep at his command. His sleep was always instant, profound, and restful. He has told me that he never dreamed. I have known Mr. Edison now for thirty-one years, and feel that he has always kept his mind direct and simple, going straight to the root of troubles. One of the peculiarities I have noticed is that I have never known him to break into a conversation going on round him and ask what people were talking about. The nearest he would ever come to it was when there had evidently been some story told, and his face would express a desire to join in the laugh, which would immediately invite telling the story to him. Next to those who worked with Edison at the laboratory, and were with him constantly at Menlo Park, were the visitors, some of whom were his business associates, some of them scientific men, and some of them hero worshippers and curiosity hunters. Foremost in the first category was Mr. E. H. Johnson, who was in reality Edison's most intimate friend, and was required for constant consultation but whose intense activity, remarkable grasp of electrical principles, and unusual powers of exposition led to his frequent detachment for long trips, including those which resulted in the introduction of the telephone, phonograph, and electric light in England and on the continent. A less frequent visitor was Mr. S. Bergman, who had all he needed to occupy his time in experimenting and manufacturing, and whose contemporaneous Wooster Street letterheads advertised Edison's inventions as being made there. Among the scientists were Professor George F. Barker of Philadelphia, a big, good-natured philosopher whose valuable advice Edison esteemed highly. In sharp contrast to him was the earnest, serious Roland of Johns Hopkins University afterward the leading american physicist of his day professor c f brackett and c f young of princeton university were often received always interested in what edison was doing and proud that one of their own students mr upton was taking such a prominent part in the development of the work Soon after the success of the lighting experiments and the installation at Menlo Park became known, Edison was besieged by persons from all parts of the world anxious to secure rights and concessions for their respective countries. Among these was Mr. Louis Ra of Paris, 
who organized the French Edison Company, the Pioneer Edison Lighting Corporation in Europe, and who, with the aid of Mr. Batchelor, established lamp works and a machine shop at ivory sur seine near Paris, in 1882. It was there that Mr. Nikola Tesla made his entree into the field of light and power and began his own career as an inventor. And there also Mr. Etni Fodor, general manager of the Hungarian General Electric Company at Budapest, received his early training. It was he who erected at Athens the first European Edison station on the now universal three-wire system. Another visitor from Europe, a little later, was Mr. Emil Rathenau, the present director of the great Elektricitäts Gesellschaft of Germany. He secured the rights for the empire and organized the Berlin Edison system, now one of the largest in the world. Through his extraordinary energy and enterprise, the business made enormous strides, and Mr. Rathenau has become one of the most conspicuous industrial figures in his native country. From Italy came Professor Colombo, later a cabinet minister, with his friend Signor Buzzi of Milan. The rights were secured for the peninsula. Colombo and his friends organized the Italian Edison Company and erected at Milan the first central station in that country. Mr. John W. Lieb, Jr., now a vice president of the New York Edison Company, was sent over by Mr. Edison to steer the enterprise technically and spent ten years in building it up with such brilliant success that he was later decorated as commander of the Order of the Crown of Italy by King Victor. Another young American enlisted into European service was Mr. E. G. Acheson, the inventor of carborundum, who built a number of plants in Italy and France before he returned home. Mr. Lieb has since become president of the American Institute of Electrical Engineers and the Association of Edison Illuminating Companies, while Dr. Acheson has been president of the American Electrochemical Society. Switzerland sent Mr. Turretini, Biederman, and Thury, all distinguished engineers, to negotiate for rights in the Republic, and so it went with regard to all the other countries of Europe, as well as those of South America. It was a question of keeping such visitors away, rather than of inviting them to take up the exploitation of the Edison system for what time was not spent in personal interviews was required for the masses of letters from every country under the sun, all making inquiries, offering suggestions, proposing terms. Nor were the visitors merely those on business bent. There were the lion hunters and celebrities of whom Sarah Bernhardt may serve as a type. One visit of note was that paid by Lieutenant G. W. DeLong, who had an earnest and protracted conversation with Edison over the Arctic expedition he was undertaking with the aid of Mr. James Bennett of the New York Herald. The Jeannette was being fitted out, and Edison told DeLong that he would make and present him with a small dynamo machine, some incandescent lamps, and an arc lamp. While the little dynamo was being built, all the men in the laboratory wrote their names on the paper insulation that was wound upon the iron core of the armature. As the Jeannette had no steam engine on board that could be used for the purpose, Edison designed the dynamo so that it could be worked by manpower, and told Lieutenant DeLong it would keep the boys warm up in the Arctic. When they generated current with it, the ill-fated ship never returned from her voyage, but went down in the icy waters of the north, there to remain until some future cataclysm of nature, ten thousand years hence, shall reveal the ship and the first marine dynamo as curious relics of a remote civilization. Edison also furnished DeLong with a set of telephones provided with extensible circuits, so that parties on the ice floes could go long distances from the ship and still keep in communication with her. So far as the writers can ascertain, this is the first example of field telephony. Another nautical experiment that he made at this time, suggested probably by the requirements of the Arctic expedition, was a buoy that was floated in New York Harbor, and which contained a small Edison dynamo and two or three incandescent lamps. The dynamo was driven by the wave or tide motion through intermediate mechanism, and thus the lamps were lit up from time to time, serving as signals. 
These were the prototypes of the lighted buoys which have since become familiar as in the channel off Sandy Hook. One notable afternoon was that on which the New York Board of Aldermen took a special train out to Menlo Park to see the lighting system with its conductors underground in operation. The Edison Electric Illuminating Company was applying for a franchise, and the aldermen, for lack of scientific training and specific practical information, were very skeptical on the subject, as indeed they might well be. Mr. Edison demonstrated personally the details and merits of the system to them. The voltage was increased to a higher pressure than usual, and all the incandescent lamps at Menlo Park did their best to win the approbation of the New York City Fathers. After Edison had finished exhibiting all the good points of his system, he conducted his guests upstairs in the laboratory, where a long table was spread with the best things that one of the most prominent New York caterers could furnish. The laboratory witnessed high times that night, for all were in the best of humor, and many a bottle was drained in toasting the health of Edison and the aldermen. This was one of the extremely rare occasions on which Edison has addressed an audience, but the stake was worth the effort. The representatives of New York could with justice drink the health of the young inventor, whose system is one of the greatest boons the city has ever had conferred upon it. Among other frequent visitors was Mr. Edison's father, one of those amiable patriarchal characters with a Horace Greeley beard, typical Americans of the old school, who would sometimes come into the laboratory with his two grandchildren, a little boy and girl called Dash and Dot. He preferred to sit and watch his brilliant son at work, with an expression of satisfaction on his face that indicated a sense of happiness and content that his boy, born in that distant humble home in Ohio, had risen to fame and brought such honor upon the name. It was indeed a pathetic sight to see a father venerate his son as the elder Edison did. Not less at home was Mr. Mackenzie, the Mount Clemens station agent, the life of whose child Edison had saved when a trained newsboy. The old Scotchman was one of the innocent, chartered libertines of the place, with an unlimited stock of good jokes and stories, but seldom of any practical use. On one occasion, however, when everything possible and impossible under the sun was being carbonized for lamp filaments, he allowed a handful of his bushy red beard to be taken for the purpose, and his laugh was the loudest when the Edison Mackenzie hair lamps were brought up to incandescence, their richness in red rays being slyly attributed to the nature of the filamentary material. Oddly enough, a few years later, some inventor actually took out a patent for making incandescent lamps with carbonized hair for filaments. Yet other visitors again haunted the place, and with the following reminiscence of one of them from Mr. Edison himself, this part of the chapter must close. Quote, At Menlo Park, one cold winter night, there came into the laboratory a strange man in a most pitiful condition. He was nearly frozen, and he asked if he might sit by the stove. In a few moments he asked for the head man, and I was brought forward. He had a head of abnormal size, with highly intellectual features, and a very small and emaciated body. He said he was suffering very much, and asked if I had any morphine. As I had about everything in chemistry that could be bought, I told him I had. He requested that I give him some so I got the morphine sulfate. He poured out enough to kill two men, when I told him that we didn't keep a hotel for suicides, and he had better cut the quantity down. He then bared his legs and arms, and they were literally pitted with scars due to the use of hypodermic syringes. He said he had taken it for years, and it required a big dose to have any effect. I let him go ahead." In a short while he seemed like another man, and began to tell stories, and there were about fifty of us who sat around listening until morning. He was a man of great intelligence and education. He said he was a Jew, but there was no distinctive feature to verify this assertion. He continued to stay around until he finished every combination of morphine with an acid that I had, probably ten ounces all told. Then he asked if he could have strychnine. I had an ounce of the sulfate. He took enough to kill a horse, and asserted it had as good an effect as morphine. 
When this was gone, the only thing I had left was a chunk of crude opium, perhaps two or three pounds. He chewed this up and disappeared. I was greatly disappointed because I would have laid in another stock of morphine to keep him at the laboratory. About a week afterward, he was found dead in a barn at Perth Amboy. Unquote. Returning to the work itself, note of which has already been made in this and preceding chapters, we find an interesting and unique reminiscence in Mr. Gell's notes of the reversion to carbon as a filament in the lamps, following an exhibition of metallic filament lamps given in the spring of 1879 to the men in the syndicate advancing the funds for these experiments. They came to Menlo Park on a late afternoon train from New York, it was already dark when they were conducted into the machine shop, where we had several platinum lamps installed in series. When Edison had finished explaining the principles and details of the lamp, he asked Crusey to let the dynamo machine run. It was of the Grammy type, as our first dynamo of the Edison design was not yet finished. Edison then ordered the juice to be turned on slowly. Today I can see those lamps rising to a cherry red like glow bugs, and hear Mr. Edison saying, A little more juice, and the lamps began to glow. A little more is the command again, and then one of the lamps emits for an instant a light like a star in the distance, after which there is an eruption and a puff, and the machine shop is in total darkness. We knew instantly which lamp had failed, and Bachelor replaced that by a good one, having a few in reserve nearby. The operation was repeated two or three times, with about the same results, after which the party went into the library until it was time to catch the train for New York. Such an exhibition was decidedly discouraging, and it was not a jubilant party that returned to New York, but... That night Edison remained in the laboratory, meditating upon the results that the platinum lamp had given so far. I was engaged reading a book near a table in the front, while Edison was seated in a chair by a table near the organ, with his head turned downward, and that conspicuous lock of hair hanging loosely on one side, he looked like Napoleon in the celebrated picture, on the eve of a great battle. Those days were heroic ones, for he then battled against mighty odds, and the prospects were dim and not very encouraging. In cases of emergency, Edison always possessed a keen faculty of deciding immediately and correctly what to do, and the decision he then arrived at was predestined to be the turning point that led him on to ultimate success. After that exhibition we had a house cleaning at the laboratory, and the metallic filament lamps were stored away while preparations were made for our experiments on carbon lamps. Thus the work went on. Menlo Park has hitherto been associated in the public thought with the telephone, phonograph, and incandescent lamp, but it was there equally that the Edison dynamo and system of distribution were created and applied to their specific purposes. While all this study of a possible lamp was going on, Mr. Upton was busy calculating the economy of the multiple arc system and making a great many tables to determine what resistance a lamp should have for the best results and at what point the proposed general system would fall off in economy when the lamps were of the lower resistance that was then generally assumed to be necessary. The world at that time had not the shadow of an idea as to what the principles of a multiple arc system should be, enabling millions of lamps to be lighted off distributing circuits, each lamp independent of every other. But at Menlo Park, at that remote period in the seventies, Mr. Edison's mathematician was formulating the inventor's conception in clear, instructive figures, and the work then executed has held its own ever since. From the beginning of his experiments on electric light, Mr. Edison had a well-defined idea of producing not only a practicable lamp, but also a system of commercial electric lighting. Such a scheme involved the creation of an entirely new art, for there was nothing on the face of the earth from which to draw assistance or precedent unless we accept the elementary forms of dynamos then in existence. 
It is true there were several types of machines in use for the then very limited field of arc lighting, but they were regarded as valueless, as a part of a great comprehensive scheme which could supply everybody with light. Such machines were confessedly inefficient, although representing the farthest reach of a young art. A commission appointed at that time by the Franklin Institute, and including Professor Elihu Thompson, investigated the merits of existing dynamos and reported as to the best of them. The Gramma machine is the most economical as a means of converting motive force into electricity. It utilizes in the arc from 38 to 41 percent of the motive work produced after deduction is made for friction and the resistance of the air. They reported also that the brush arc lighting machine produces in the luminous arc useful work equivalent to 31 percent of the motive power employed, or to 38 and a half percent after the friction has been deducted. Commercial possibilities could not exist in the face of such low economy as this, and Mr. Edison realized that he would have to improve the dynamo himself if he wanted a better machine. The scientific world at that time was engaged in a controversy regarding the external and internal resistance of a circuit in which a generator was situated. Discussing the subject, Mr. Gell, in his biographical notes, says, While this controversy raged in the scientific papers and criticism and confusion seemed at its height, Edison and Upton discussed this question very thoroughly and Edison declared he did not intend to build up a system of distribution in which the external resistance would be equal to the internal resistance. He said he was just about going to do the opposite. He wanted a large external resistance and a low internal one. He said he wanted to sell the energy outside of the station and not waste it in the dynamo and conductors where it brought no profits. In these later days, when these ideas of Edison are used as common property and are applied in every modern system of distribution, it is astonishing to remember that when they were propounded they met with most vehement antagonism from the world at large. Edison, familiar with batteries in telegraphy, could not bring himself to believe that any substitute generator of electrical energy could be efficient that used up half its own possible output before doing an equal amount of outside work. Undaunted by the dicta of contemporaneous science, Mr. Edison attacked the dynamo problem with his accustomed vigor and thoroughness. He chose the drum form for his armature, and experimented with different kinds of iron— Cores were made of cast iron, others of forged iron, and still others of sheets of iron of various thicknesses separated from each other by paper or paint. These cores were then allowed to run in an excited field, and after a given time their temperature was measured and noted. By such practical methods Edison found that the thin laminated cores of sheet iron gave the least heat and had the least amount of wasteful eddy currents. His experiments and ideas on magnetism at that period were far in advance of the time. His work and tests regarding magnetism were repeated later on by Hopkinson and Cap, who then elucidated the whole theory mathematically by means of formula and constants. Before this, however, Edison had attained these results by pioneer work founded on his original reasoning and utilized them in the construction of his dynamo thus revolutionizing the art of building such machines. After thorough investigation of the magnetic qualities of different kinds of iron, Edison began to make a study of winding the cores, first determining the electromotive force generated per turn of wire at various speeds in fields of different intensities. He also considered various forms and shapes for the armature, and by methodical and systematic research obtained the data and best conditions upon which he could build his generator. In the field magnets of his dynamo he constructed the cores and yoke of forged iron, having a very large cross-section, which was a new thing in those days. Great attention was also paid to all the joints, which were smoothed down so as to make a perfect magnetic contact. The Edison dynamo, with its large masses of iron, was a vivid contrast to the then existing types with their meager quantities of the ferric element. Edison also made tests on his field magnets by slowly raising the strength of the exciting current, 
so that he obtained figures similar to those shown by a magnetic curve, and in this way found where saturation commenced and where it was useless to expend more current on the field. If he had asked Upton at the time to formulate the results of his work in this direction for publication, he would have anticipated the historic work on magnetism that was executed by the two other investigators, Hopkinson and Cap, later on. The laboratory notebooks of the period bear abundant evidence of the systematic and searching nature of these experiments and investigations in the hundreds of pages of notes, sketches, calculations, and tables made at the time by Edison, Upton, Bachelor, Jail, and by others who from time to time were entrusted with special experiments to elucidate some particular point. Mr. Jell says the experiments on armature winding were also very interesting. Edison had a number of small wooden cores made, at both ends of which we inserted little brass nails, and we wound the wooden cores with twine as if it were wire on an armature. In this way we studied armature winding, and had matches where each of us had a core, while bets were made as to who would be the first to finish properly and correctly a certain kind of winding. Care had to be taken that the wound core corresponded to the direction of the current, supposing it were placed in a field and revolved. After Edison had decided this question, Upton made drawings and tables from which the real armatures were wound and connected to the commutator. To a student of today all this seems simple, but in those days the art of constructing dynamos was about as dark as air navigation is at present. Edison also improved the armature by dividing it and the commutator into a far greater number of sections than up to that time had been the practice. He was also the first to use mica in insulating the commutator sections from each other. In the meantime, during the progress of the investigations on the dynamo, word had gone out to the world that Edison expected to invent a generator of greater efficiency than any that existed at the time. Again he was assailed and ridiculed by the technical press, for had not the foremost electricians and physicists of Europe and America worked for years on the production of dynamos and arc lamps as they then existed? Even though this young man at Menlo Park had done some wonderful things for telegraphy and telephony, even if he had recorded and reproduced human speech, he had his limitations, and could not upset the settled dictum of science that the internal resistance must equal the external resistance. Such was the trend of public opinion at the time. But after Mr. Crusey had finished the first practical dynamo, and after Mr. Upton had tested it thoroughly and verified his figures and results several times, for he also was surprised, Edison was able to tell the world that he had made a generator giving an efficiency of 90%. 90% as against 40% was a mighty hit, and the world would not believe it. Criticism and argument were again at their height while Upton, as Edison's duelist, was kept busy replying to private and public challenges of the fact. The tremendous progress of the world in the last quarter of a century, owing to the revolution caused by the all-conquering march of heavy current engineering, is the outcome of Edison's work at Menlo Park, that raised the efficiency of the dynamo from 40% to 90%. Mr. Upton sums it all up very precisely in his remarks upon this period. Quote, what has now been made clear by accurate nomenclature was then very foggy in the textbooks. Mr. Edison had completely grasped the effect of subdivision of circuits and the influence of wires leading to such subdivisions when it was most difficult to express what he knew in technical language. I remember distinctly when Mr. Edison gave me the problem of placing a motor in circuit in multiple arc with a fixed resistance, and I had to work out the problem entirely, as I could find no prior solution. There was nothing I could find bearing upon the counter-electromotive force of the armature and the effect of the resistance of the armature on the work given out by the armature. It was a wonderful experience to have problems given me out of the intuitions of a great mind, based on enormous experience in practical work and applying to new lines of progress. 
One of the main impressions left upon me after knowing Mr. Edison for many years is the marvelous accuracy of his guesses. He will see the general nature of a result long before it can be reached by mathematical calculation. His greatness was always to be clearly seen when difficulties arose. They always made him cheerful and started him thinking, and very soon would come a line of suggestions which would not end until the difficulty was met and overcome or found insurmountable. I have often felt that Mr. Edison got himself purposely into trouble by premature publications and otherwise, so that he would have a full incentive to get himself out of trouble. This chapter may well end with a statement from Mr. Jell, shrewd and observant, as a participator in all the early work of the development of the Edison lighting system. Quote, Those who were gathered around him in the old Menlo Park laboratory enjoyed his confidence, and he theirs, nor was this confidence ever abused. He was respected with a respect which only great men can obtain, and he never showed by any word or act that he was their employer in a sense that would hurt the feelings, as is often the case in the ordinary course of business life. He conversed, argued, and disputed with us all as if he were a colleague on the same footing. It was his winning ways and manners that attached us all so loyally to his side, and made us ever ready with a boundless devotion to execute any request or desire." Unquote. Thus does a great magnet run through a heap of sand and filings, exert its lines of force, and attract irresistibly to itself the iron and steel particles that are its affinity, and having sifted them out, leaving the useless dust behind. Chapter 13 of Edison, His Life and Inventions. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Melissa. Edison, His Life and Inventions by Frank Lewis Dyer and Thomas Comerford Martin. Chapter 13 a world hunt for filament material. In writing about the old experimenting days at Menlo Park, Mr. F. R. Upton says, Edison's day is twenty-four hours long, for he has always worked whenever there was anything to do, whether day or night, and carried a force of night workers, so that his experiments could go on continually. If he wanted material, he always made it a principle to have it at once and never hesitated to use special messengers to get it. I remember in the early days of the electric light, he wanted a mercury pump for exhausting the lamps. He sent me to Princeton to get it. I got back to Medicin late in the day, and had to carry the pump over to the laboratory on my back that evening, set it up, and work all night in the next day getting results. This characteristic principle of obtaining desired material in the quickest and most positive way manifested itself in the search that Edison instituted for the best kind of bamboo for lamp filaments, immediately after the discovery related in a preceding chapter. It is doubtful whether, in the annals of scientific research and experiment, there is anything quite analogous to the story of this search and the various expeditions that went out from the Edison Laboratory in 1880 and subsequent years to scour the earth for material so apparently simple as a homogeneous strip of bamboo or other similar fiber. Prolonged and exhaustive experiment, microscopic examination, and an intimate knowledge of the nature of wood and plant fibers, however, had led Edison to the conclusion that bamboo, or similar fibrous filaments, were more suitable than anything else then known for commercial incandescent lamps, and he wanted the most perfect for that purpose. Hence, the quickest way was to search the tropics until the proper material was found. The first emissary chosen for this purpose was the late William H. Moore of Rawway, New Jersey, who left New York in the summer of 1880, bound for China and Japan. 
these being the countries preeminently noted for the production of abundant species of bamboo. On arrival in the east, he quickly left the cities behind and proceeded into the interior, extending his search far into the more remote country districts, collecting specimens on his way, and devoting much time to the study of the bamboo, and in roughly testing the relative value of its fiber in canes of one, two, three, four, and five-year growths. Great bales of samples were sent to Edison, and after careful tests, a certain variety and growth of Japanese bamboo was determined to be the most satisfactory material for filaments that had been found. Mr. Moore, who was continuing his searches in that country, was instructed to arrange for the cultivation and shipment of regular supplies of this particular species. Arrangements to this end were accordingly made with a Japanese farmer, who began to make immediate shipments and who subsequently displayed so much ingenuity in fertilizing and cross-fertilizing that the homogeneity of the product was constantly improved. The use of this bamboo for Edison lamp filaments was continued for many years. Although Mr. Moore did not meet with the exciting adventures of some subsequent explorers, he encountered numerous difficulties and novel experiences in his many months of travel throughout the hinterland of Japan and China. The attitude toward foreigners thirty years ago was not as friendly as it has since become, but Edison, as usual, had made a happy choice of messengers, as Mr. Moore's good nature and diplomacy attested. These qualities, together with his persistence and perseverance, and faculty of intelligent discrimination in the matter of fibers, helped to make his mission successful, and gave to him the honor of being the one who found the bamboo which was adopted for use as filaments in commercial Edison lamps. Although Edison had satisfied himself that bamboo furnished the most desirable material thus far discovered for incandescent lamp filaments, he felt that in some part of the world there might be found a natural product of the same general character that would furnish a still more perfect and homogeneous material. In his study of this subject, and during the prosecution of vigorous and searching inquiries in various directions, he learned that Mr. John C. Brawner, then residing in Brooklyn, New York, had an expert knowledge of indigenous plants of the particular kind desired. During the course of a geological survey which he had made for the Brazilian government, Mr. Brawner had examined closely the various species of palms which grow plentifully in that country, and of them there was one whose fibers he thought would be just what Edison wanted. Accordingly, Mr. Bronner was sent for and dispatched to Brazil in December 1880 to search for and to send samples of this and such other palms, fibers, grasses, and canes as, in his judgment, would be suitable for the experiments then being carried on at Menlo Park. Landing at Para, he crossed over into the Amazonian province, and thence proceeded through the heart of the country, making his way by canoe on the rivers and their tributaries, and by foot into the forests and marshes of a vast and almost untrodden wilderness. In this manner, Mr. Bronner traversed about two thousand miles of the comparatively unknown interior of southern Brazil, and procured a large variety of fiber specimens, which he shipped to Edison a few months later. When these fibers arrived in the United States, they were carefully tested, and a few of them found suitable, but not superior to the Japanese bamboo, which was then being exclusively used in the manufacture of commercial Edison lamps. Later on, Edison sent out an expedition to explore the wilds of Cuba and Jamaica. A two months investigation of the latter island revealed a variety of bamboo growths, of which a great number of specimens were obtained and shipped to Menlo Park. But on careful test, they were found inferior to the Japanese bamboo, and hence rejected. The exploration of the glades and swamps of Florida by three men extended over a period of five months in a minute search for fibrous woods of the palmetto species. A great variety was found, and over five hundred boxes of specimens were shipped to the laboratory from time to time, but none of them tested out with entirely satisfactory results. The use of Japanese bamboo for carbon filaments was therefore continued in the manufacture of lamps, 
although an incessant search was maintained for a still more perfect material. The spirit of progress so pervasive in Edison's character led him, however, to renew his investigations further afield by sending out two other men to examine the bamboo and similar growths of those parts of South America not covered by Mr. Bronner. These two men were Frank McGowan and C. F. Hannington, both of whom had been for nearly seven years in the employ of the Edison Electric Light Company in New York. The former was a stocky, rugged Irishman, possessing the native shrewdness and buoyancy of his race, coupled with undaunted courage and determination, and the latter was a veteran of the Civil War, with some knowledge of forest and field, acquired as a sportsman. They left New York in September 1887, arriving in due time at Para, proceeding thence 2,300 miles up the Amazon River to Iquitos. Nothing of an eventual nature happened during this trip, but on arrival at Iquitos the two men separated, Mr. McGowan to explore on foot and by canoe in Peru, Ecuador, and Colombia, while Mr. Hannington returned by the Amazon River to Para. Thence Hannington went by steamer to Montevideo, and by similar conveyance up the river to La Plata, and through Uruguay, Argentine, and Paraguay, to the southernmost part of Brazil, collecting a large number of specimens of palms and grasses. The adventures of Mr. McGowan, after leaving Iquitos, would fill a book if related in detail. The object of the present narrative and the space at the author's disposal, however, do not permit of more than a brief mention of his experiences. His first objective point was Quito, about five hundred miles away, which he proposed to reach on foot and by means of canoeing on the Napo River through a wild and comparatively unknown country teeming with tribes of hostile natives. The dangers of the expedition were pictured to him in glowing terms, but spurning prophecies of dire disaster, he engaged some native Indians in a canoe and started on his explorations, reaching Quito in eighty-seven days after a thorough search of the country on both sides of the Napo River. From Quito he went to Guayaquil, from there by steamer to Buenaventura, and thence by rail twelve miles to Cordova. From this point he set out on foot to explore the Cauca Valley and the Cordilleras. Mr. McGowan found in these regions a great variety of bamboo, small and large, some species growing seventy-five to one hundred feet in height, and from six to nine inches in diameter. He collected a large number of specimens, which were subsequently sent to Orange for Edison's examination. After about fifteen months of exploration attended by much hardship and privation, deserted sometimes by treacherous guides, twice laid low by fevers, occasionally in peril from Indian attacks, wild animals and poisonous serpents, tormented by insect pests, endangered by floods, 119 days without meat, 98 days without taking off his clothes, Mr. McGowan returned to America, broken in health, but having faithfully fulfilled the commission entrusted to him. The Evening Sun, New York, obtained an interview with him at that time, and in its issue of May 2nd, 1889, gave more than a page to a brief story of his interesting adventures, and then commented editorially upon them as follows. A Romance of Science The narrative given elsewhere in the Evening Sun of the wanderings of Edison's missionary of science, Mr. Frank McGowan, furnishes a new proof that the romances of real life surpass any that the imagination can frame. In pursuit of a substance that should meet the requirements of the Edison incandescent lamp, Mr. McGowan penetrated the wilderness of the Amazon, and for a year defied its fevers, beasts, reptiles, and deadly insects, in his quest for a material so precious that jealous nature has hidden it in her most secret fastnesses. No hero of mythology or fable ever dared such dragons to rescue some captive goddess as did this dauntless champion of civilization. Theseus or Siegfried, or any knight of the fairy books, might envy the victories of Edison's irresistible lieutenant. As a sample story of adventure, Mr. McGowan's narrative is a marvel fit to be classed with the historic journeyings of the greatest travelers. 
but it gains immensely in interest when we consider that it succeeded in its scientific purpose. The mysterious bamboo was discovered, and large quantities of it were procured and brought to the wizard's laboratory, there to suffer another wondrous change, and then to light up our pleasure haunts in our homes with a gentle radiance. A further, though rather sad, interest attaches to the McGowan story. For only a short time it elapsed after his return to America, when he disappeared suddenly and mysteriously, and in spite of long-continued and strenuous efforts to obtain some light on the subject, no clue or trace of him was ever found. He was a favorite among the Edison old-timers, and his memory is still cherished, for when some of the boys happen to get together, as they occasionally do, some one is almost sure to wonder what became of poor Mac. He was last seen at Monquin's famous old French restaurant on Fulton Street, New York, where he lunched with one of the authors of this book and the late Luther Steringer. He sat with them for two or three hours discussing his wonderful trip and telling some fascinating stories of adventure. Then the party separated at the Ann Street door of the restaurant after making plans to secure the narrative in more detailed form for subsequent use and McGowan has not been seen from that hour to this. The trail of the explorer was more instantly lost in New York than in the vast recesses of the Amazon swamps. The next and last explorer who Medicine sent out in search of natural fibers was Mr. James Rickleton of Maplewood, New Jersey, a school principal, a well-known traveler, and an ardent student of natural science. Mr. Rickleton's own story of his memorable expedition is so interesting as to be worthy of repetition here. A village schoolmaster is not unaccustomed to door wrappings, for the steps of belligerent mothers are often thitherward bent seeking redress for conjured wrongs to their darling boobies. It was a bewildering moment, therefore, to the Maplewood teacher, when in answering a rap at the door one afternoon, he found, instead of an irate mother, a messenger from the laboratory of the world's greatest inventor, bearing a letter requesting an audience a few hours later. Being the teacher to whom reference is made, I am now quite willing to confess that for the remainder of that afternoon, less than a problem of Euclid would have been sufficient to disqualify me for the remaining scholastic duties of the hour. I felt it, of course, to be no small honor for a humble teacher to be called to the sanctum of Thomas A. Edison. The letter, however, gave no intimation of the nature of the object for which I had been invited to appear before Mr. Edison. When I was presented to Mr. Edison, his way of setting forth the mission he had designated for me was characteristic of how a great mind conceives vast undertakings and commands great things in few words. At this time, Mr. Edison had discovered that the fiber of a certain bamboo afforded a very desirable carbon for the electric lamp and the variety of bamboo used was a product of Japan. It was his belief that in other parts of the world other and superior varieties might be found, and to that end he had dispatched explorers to bamboo regions in the valleys of the great South American rivers, where specimens were found of extraordinary quality. But the locality in which these specimens were found was lost in the limitless reaches of those great river bottoms. The great necessity for more durable carbons became a desideratum so urgent that the tireless inventor decided to commission another explorer to search the tropical jungles of the Orient. This brings me, then, to the first meeting of Edison, when he set forth substantially as follows, as I remember it twenty years ago, the purpose for which he had called me from my scholastic duties. With a quizzical gleam in his eye, he said, I want a man to ransack all the tropical jungles of the East to find a better fiber for my lamp. I expect it to be found in the palm or bamboo family. How would you like that job? Suiting my reply to his love of brevity and dispatch, I said, That would suit me. Can you go tomorrow? was his next question. Well, Mr. Edison, I must first of all get a leave of absence from my board of education and assist the board to secure a substitute for the time of my absence. How long will it take, Mr. Edison? How can I tell? Maybe six months, and maybe five years. No matter how long, find it. He continued, 
I sent a man to South America to find what I want. He found it, but lost the place where he found it, so we might as well have never found it at all. Hereat I was enjoined to proceed forthwith to court the Board of Education for a leave of absence, which I did successfully, the Board considering that a call so important and honorary was entitled to their unqualified favor, which they generously granted. I reported to Mr. Edison on the following day, when he instructed me to come to the laboratory at once to learn all the details of drawing and carbonizing fibers, which it would be necessary to do in the Oriental jungles. This I did, and in the meantime a set of suitable tools for this purpose had been ordered to be made in the laboratory. As soon as I learned my new trade, which I accomplished in a few days, Mr. Edison directed me to the library of the laboratory to occupy a few days in studying the geography of the Orient, and particularly in drawing maps of the tributaries of the Ganges, the Irrawaddy, and the Brahmaputra rivers and other regions which I expected to explore. It was while thus engaged that Mr. Edison came to me one day and said, If you will go up to the house, his palatial home not far away, and look behind the sofa in the library, you will find a joint of bamboo, a specimen of that found in South America. Bring it down and make a study of it. If you find something equal to that, I will be satisfied. At the home, I was guided to the library by an Irish servant woman, to whom I communicated my knowledge of the definite locality of the sample joint. She plunged her arm, bare and herculean, behind the aforementioned sofa, and holding aloft a section of wood, called out in a mood of discovery, Is that it? Replying in the affirmative, she added, under an impulse of innocent divination that whatever her wizard master laid hands upon could result in nothing short of an invention. Sure, sir, and what's he going to invent out of that? My kit of tools made, my maps drawn, my oriental geography reviewed, I came to the point when matters of immediate departure are discussed, and when I took occasion to mention to my chief that, on the subject of life insurance, underwriters refused to take any risks on an enterprise so hazardous, Mr. Edison said that if I did not place too high a valuation on my person, he would take the risk himself. I replied that I was born and bred in New York State, but now that I had become a Jersey man, I did not value myself at above $1,500. Edison laughed and said that he would assume the risk, and another point was settled. The next matter was the financing of the trip, about which Mr. Edison asked in a tentative way about the rates to the East. I told him the expense of such a trip could not be determined beforehand in detail, but that I had established somewhat of a reputation for economic travel, and that I did not believe any traveler could surpass me in that respect. He desired no further assurance in that direction, and thereupon ordered a letter of credit made out with authorization to order a second when the first was exhausted. Herein, then, are set forth in briefest space the preliminaries of a circuit of the globe in quest of fiber. It so happened that the day on which I set out fell on Washington's birthday, and I suggested to my boys and girls at school that they make a line across the station platform near the school at Maplewood, and from this line I should start eastward around the world, and if good fortune should bring me back, I would meet them from the westward at the same line, as that I often made them tow the scratch, for once they were only too well pleased to have me tow the line for them. This was done, and I sailed via England and the Suez Canal to Ceylon, that fair isle to which Sinbad the sailor made his sixth voyage, picturesquely referred to in history as the brightest gem in the British colonial crown. I knew Ceylon to be eminently tropical. I knew it to be rich in many varieties of the bamboo family, which has been called the king of the grasses, and in this family had I most hope of finding the desired fiber. Weeks were spent in this paradisiacal island. Every part was visited. Native woodcraftsmen were offered a premium on every new species brought in, and in this way nearly a hundred species were tested, a greater number than was found in any other country. One of the best specimens tested during the entire trip around the world was found first in Ceylon, although later in Burma, it being indigenous to the latter country. 
is a gigantic tree grass or reed growing in clumps of from one to two hundred, often twelve inches in diameter and one hundred and fifty feet high, and known as the giant bamboo, Bambusa gigantia. This giant grass stood the highest test as a carbon, and on account of its extraordinary size and qualities, I extended this special mention. With others who have given much attention to this remarkable reed, I believe that in its manifold uses the bamboo is the world's greatest dendral benefactor. From Ceylon I proceeded to India, touching the great peninsula first at Cape Comorin, and proceeding northward by way of Pondicherry, Madura, and Madras, and thence to the tableland of Bangalore and the western Ghauts, testing many kinds of woods at every point, but particularly the palm and bamboo families. From the range of the western Ghauts, I went to Bombay, and then north by the way of Delhi to Simla, the summer capital of the Himalayas, thence again northward to the headwaters of the Sutlej River, testing everywhere on my way everything likely to afford the desired carbon. On returning from the mountains, I followed the valleys of the Jumna and the Ganges to Calcutta. Whence I again ascended the sub-Himalayas to Darjeeling, where the numerous river bottoms were sprinkled plentifully with many varieties of bamboo, from the larger sizes to dwarfed species covering the mountain slopes, and not longer than the grafts of meadows. Again descending to the plains, I passed eastward to the Brahmaputra River, which I ascended to the foothills in Assam, but finding nothing of superior quality in all this northern region, I returned to Calcutta, and sailed thence to Rangoon in Burma, and there, finding no samples giving more excellent tests in the lower regions of the Irrawaddy, I ascended that river in Mandalay, where, through Burmese bamboo wiseacres, I gathered in from round about and tested all that the unusually rich Burmese flora could furnish. In Burma, the giant bamboo, as already mentioned, is found indigenous, but beside it no superior varieties were found. Samples tested at several points on the Malay Peninsula showed no new species, except at a point north of Singapore, where I found a species large and heavy, which gave a test nearly equal to that of the giant bamboo in Ceylon. After completing the Malay Peninsula, I had planned to visit Java and Borneo, but having found in the Malay Peninsula and in Ceylon a bamboo fiber which averaged a test from 1 to 200 percent better than that in use at the lamp factory, I decided it was unnecessary to visit these countries, or New Guinea, as my Eureka had already been established, and that I would therefore set forth over the return hemisphere, searching China and Japan on the way. The rivers in southern China brought down to Canton bamboos of many species, where this wonderfully utilitarian reed enters very largely into the industrial life of that people, and not merely into the industrial life, but even into the culinary arts, for bamboo sprouts are a universal vegetable in China. But among all the bamboos of China, I found none of super-excellence in carbonizing qualities. Japan came next in the succession of countries to be explored, but there the work was much simplified, from the fact that the Tokyo Museum contains a complete classified collection of all the different species in the empire, and their samples could be obtained and tested. Now the last of the important bamboo-producing countries in the globe circuit had been done, and the home lap was in order. The broad Pacific was spanned in fourteen days, my natal continent in six, and on the 22nd of February, on the same day, at the same hour, at the same minute, one year to a second, little Maud, a sweet maid of the school, led me across the line which completed the circuit of the globe, and where I was greeted by the cheers of my boys and girls. I at once reported to Mr. Edison, whose manner of greeting my return was as characteristic of the man as his summary and matter-of-fact manner of my dispatch. His little catechism of curious inquiry was embraced in four small and intensely Anglo-Saxon words. With his usual pleasant smile, he extended his hand and said, Did you get it? This was surely a summing of a year's exploration not less laconic than Caesar's review of his Gaelic campaign. When I replied that he had, but that he must be the final judge of what I had found, 
He said that during my absence he had succeeded in making an artificial carbon, which was meeting the requirements satisfactorily. So well, indeed, that I believe no practical use was ever made of the bamboo fibers thereafter. I have herein given a very brief resume of my search for fiber through the Orient, and during my connection with that mission, I was at all times not less astonished at Mr. Edison's quick perceptions of conditions and his instant decision and his bigness of conceptions than I had always been with his prodigious industry and his inventive genius. Thinking persons know that blatant men never accomplish much, and Edison's marvelous brevity of speech, along with his miraculous achievements, should do much to put bores and garrulity out of fashion. Although Edison had instituted such a costly and exhaustive search throughout the world for the most perfect of natural fibers, he did not necessarily feel committed for all time to the exclusive use of that material for his lamp filaments. While these explorations were in progress, as indeed long before, he had given much thought to the production of some artificial compound that would embrace not only the required homogeneity, but also many other qualifications necessary for the manufacture of an improved type of lamp, which had become desirable by reason of the rapid adoption of his lighting system. At the very time Mr. McGowan was making his explorations deep in South America, and Mr. Rickleton his swift trip around the world, Edison, after much investigation and experiment, had produced a compound which promised better results than bamboo fibers. After some changes dictated by experience, this artificial filament was adopted in the manufacture of lamps. No radical change was immediately made, however, but the product of the lamp factory was gradually changed over, during the course of a few years, from the use of bamboo to the squirted filament, as the new material was called. An artificial compound of one kind or another has indeed been universally adopted for the purpose by all manufacturers. Hence, the incandescent conductors in all carbon filament lamps of the present day are made in that way. The fact remains, however, that for nearly nine years all Edison lamps, many millions in the aggregate, were made with bamboo filaments, and many of them for several years after that, until bamboo was finally abandoned in the early nineties, except for use in a few special types, which were so made until about the end of 1908. The last few years have witnessed a remarkable advance in the manufacture of incandescent lamps in the substitution of metallic filaments for those of carbon. It will be remembered that many of the earlier experiments were based on the use of strips of platinum, while other rare metals were the subject of casual trial. No real success was attained in that direction, and for many years the carbon filament lamp reigned supreme. During the last four or five years, lamps with filaments made from tantalum and tungsten have been produced and placed on the market with great success, and are now largely used. Their price is still very high, however, as compared with that of the carbon lamp, which has been vastly improved in methods of construction and whose average price of 15 cents is only one-tenth of what it was when Edison first brought it out. With the close of Mr. McGowan's and Mr. Reckleton's expeditions, there ended the historic world hunt for natural fibers. From start to finish, the investigations and searches made by Edison himself and carried on by others under his direction were remarkable not only from the fact that they entailed a total expenditure of about a hundred thousand dollars, dispersed under his supervision by Mr. Upton, but also because of their unique inception and thoroughness they illustrate one of the strongest traits of his character, an invincible determination to leave no stone unturned to acquire that which he believes to be in existence, and which, when found, will answer the purpose that he has in mind. Chapter 14 of Edison, His Life and Inventions. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Recording by Heidi Preuss. Edison, His Life and Inventions by Frank Lewis Dyer and Thomas Comerford Martin. Chapter 14 Inventing a Complete System of Lighting. In Berlin, on December 11, 1908, with notable eclat, the 70th birthday was celebrated of Emil Rottenau, the founder of the great Allgemeine Elektrikitätsgesellschaft. This distinguished German, creator of a splendid industry, then received the congratulations of his fellow countrymen, headed by Emperor William, who spoke enthusiastically of his services to electrotechniques and to Germany. In his interesting acknowledgment, Mr. Rottenau told how he went to Paris in 1881, and, at the electrical exhibition there, saw the display of Edison's inventions in electric lighting, which have met with as little proper appreciation as his countless innovations in the connection with telegraphy and telephony and the entire electrical industry. He saw the Edison dynamo, and he saw the incandescent lamp, of which millions have been manufactured since that day, without the great master being paid the tribute to his invention. But what impressed the observant, thoroughgoing German was the breadth with which the whole lighting art had been elaborated and perfected, even at that early day. The Edison system of lighting was as beautifully conceived, down to the very details, and as thoroughly worked out, as if it had been tested for decades in various towns. Neither sockets, switches, fuses, lamp-holders, nor any of the other accessories necessary to complete the installation were wanting, and the generating of current, the regulation, the wiring with distributing boxes, house connections, meters, etc., all showed signs of astonishing skill and incomparable genius. Such praise, on such an occasion, from the man who introduced incandescent electric lighting to Germany, is significant as to the continued appreciation abroad of Mr. Edison's work. If there is one thing modern Germany is proud and jealous of, it is her leadership in electrical engineering and investigation. But with characteristic insight, Mr. Rottenau, here placed his finger on the great merit that has often been forgotten. Edison was not simply the inventor of a new lamp and a new dynamo. They were invaluable elements, but far from all that was necessary. His was the mighty achievement of conceiving and executing in all its details an art and an industry absolutely new to the world. Within two years this man completed and made that art available in its essential, fundamental facts, which remain unchanged after thirty years of rapid improvement and widening application. Such a stupendous feat, whose equal is far to seek anywhere in history of invention, is worth studying especially as the task will take us over much new ground and over very little of the territory already covered. Notwithstanding the enormous amount of thought and labor expended on the incandescent lamp problem from the autumn of 1878 to the winter of 1879, it must not be supposed for one moment that Edison's whole endeavor and entire inventive skill had been given to the lamp alone or the dynamo alone. We have sat through the long watches of the night while Edison brooded on the real solution of the swarming problems. We have gazed anxiously at the steady fingers of the deft and cautious Bachelor, as one fragile filament after another refused to stay intact until it could be sealed into its crystal prison and there glow with light that never was before on land or sea. We have calculated armatures and field coils for the new dynamo with Upton, and held the stakes for Jail 
and his fellows at the winding bees. We have seen the mineral and vegetable kingdoms rifled and ransacked for substances that would yield the best filament. We have had the vague consciousness of assisting at the great development whose evidences today on every hand attest its magnitude. We have felt the fierce play of volcanic effort lifting new continents of opportunity from the infertile sea, without any devastation of pre-existing fields of human toil and harvest. But it still remains to elucidate the actual thing done, to reduce it to concrete data, and, in reducing, to unfold its colossal dimensions. The lighting system that Edison contemplated in this entirely new departure from antecedent methods included the generation of electrical energy, or current, on a very large scale, its distribution throughout extended areas, and its division and subdivision into small units converted into light at innumerable points in every direction from the source of supply, each unit to be independent of every other and susceptible to immediate control by the user. This was truly an altogether prodigious undertaking. We need not wonder that Professor Tyndall, in words implying grave doubt as to the possibility of any solution of the various problems, said publicly, that he would much rather have the matter in Edison's hands than in his own. There were no precedents, nothing upon which to build or improve. The problems could only be answered by the creation of new devices and methods expressly worked out for their solution. An electric lamp answering certain specific requirements would, indeed, be the key to the situation but its commercial adaptation required a multifarious variety of apparatus and devices. The word system is much abused in invention, and during the early days of electric lighting, its use applied to a mere freakish lamp or dynamo was often ludicrous. But after all, nothing short of a complete system could give real value to the lamp as an invention. Nothing short of a system could body forth the new art to the public. Let us, therefore, set down briefly a few of the leading items needed for perfect illumination by electricity, all of which were part of the Edison program. First, to conceive a broad and fundamentally correct method of distributing the current satisfactory in a scientific sense and practical commercially in its efficiency and economy. This meant ready-made a comprehensive plan analogous to illumination by gas with a network of conductors all connected together so that in any given city area the lights could be fed with electricity from several directions thus eliminating any interruption due to the disturbance of any particular section. Second, to devise an electric lamp that would give about the same amount of light as a gas jet, which custom had proven to be a suitable and useful unit. This lamp must possess the quality of requiring only a small investment in the copper conductors reaching it. Each lamp must be independent of every other lamp. Each and all the lights must be produced and operated with sufficient economy to compete on a commercial basis with gas. The lamp must be durable, capable of being easily and safely handled by the public, and one that would remain capable of burning at full incandescence and candle power a great length of time. Third, to devise means whereby the amount of electrical energy furnished to each and every customer could be determined, as in the case of gas, and so that this could be done cheaply and reliably by a meter at the customer's premises. Fourth, to elaborate a system or network of conductors capable of being placed underground or overhead, which would allow of being tapped at any intervals, 
so that service wires could be run from the main conductors in the street into each building. Where these mains went below the surface of the thoroughfare, as in large cities, there must be protective conduit or pipe for the copper conductors, and these pipes must allow of being tapped wherever necessary. With these conductors and pipes must also be furnished manholes, junction boxes, connections, and a host of varied paraphernalia ensuring perfect general distribution. Fifth, to devise means for maintaining at all points in an extended area of distribution a practically even pressure of current, so that all the lamps, wherever located, near or far away from the central station, should give an equal light at all times, independent of the number that might be turned on, and safeguarding the lamps against rupture by sudden and violent fluctuations of current. There must also be means for thus regulating at the point where the current was generated the quality or pressure of the current throughout the whole lighting area, with devices for indicating what such pressure might actually be at various points in the area. Sixth, to design efficient dynamos, such not being in existence at the time, that would convert economically the steam power of high-speed engines into electrical energy, together with means for connecting and disconnecting them with the exterior consumption circuits, means for regulating, equalizing their loads, and adjusting the number of dynamos to be used according to the fluctuating demands on the electrical station. Also, the arrangement of complete stations with steam and electric apparatus and auxiliary devices for ensuring their efficient and continuous operation. Seventh, to invent devices that would prevent the current from becoming excessive upon any conductors, causing fire or other injuries. Also, switches for turning the current on and off, lamp holders, fixtures, and the like. Also, means and methods for establishing the interior circuits that were to carry current to chandeliers and fixtures in buildings. Here was the outline of the program laid down in the autumn of 1878, and pursued through all its difficulties to definite accomplishment in about 18 months some of the steps being made immediately, others being taken as the art evolved. It is not to be imagined for one moment that Edison performed all the experiments with his own hands. The method of working at Menlo Park has already been described in these pages by those who participated. It would not only have been physically impossible for one man to have done all this work himself, in view of the time and labor required, and the endless detail, but most of the apparatus and devices invented, or suggested by him, as the art took shape, required the handiwork of skilled mechanics and artisans, of a high order and ability. Toward the end of 1879, the laboratory force thus numbered at least one hundred earnest men. In this respect of collaboration, Edison has always adopted a policy that must in part be taken to explain his many successes. Some inventors of the greatest abilities, dealing with ideas and conceptions of importance, have found it impossible to organize or even to tolerate a staff of co-workers, preferring solitary and secret toil, incapable of teamwork, or jealous of any intrusion that could possibly bar them from a full and complete claim to the results when obtained. Edison always stood shoulder to shoulder with his associates, but no one ever questioned the leadership, nor was it ever in doubt where the inspiration originated. The real truth is that Edison has always been so ceaselessly fertile of ideas himself he has had more than his whole staff could ever do to try them all out. He has thought cooperation, but no exterior suggestion. As a matter of fact, a great many of the Edison men have made notable inventions of their own, which their names are imperishably associated, 
but while they were with Edison, it was with his work that they were and must be busied. It was during this period of inventing a system that so much of systematic and continuous work with good results was done by Edison in the design and perfection of dynamos. The value of his contributions to the art of lighting comprised in this work has never been fully understood or appreciated, having been so greatly overshadowed by his invention of the incandescent lamp and of a complete system of distribution. It is a fact, however, that the principal improvements he made in dynamo electric generators were of a radical nature and remain in the art. Thirty years bring about great changes, especially in a field so notably progressive as that of the generation of electricity. But different as are the dynamos of today from those of the earlier period, they embody essential principles and elements that Edison then marked out and elaborated as the conditions of success. There was indeed prompt appreciation in some well-informed quarters of what Edison was doing, evidenced by the sensation caused in the summer of 1881, when he designed, built, and shipped to Paris for the first electrical exposition ever held, the largest dynamo that had been built up to that time. It was capable of lighting twelve hundred incandescent lamps, and weighed with its engine twenty-seven tons, the armature alone weighing six tons. It was then, and for a long time after, the eighth wonder of the scientific world, and its arrival and installation in Paris were eagerly watched by some of the most famous physicists and electricians of Europe. Edison's amusing description of his experience in shipping the dynamo to Paris when built may appropriately be given here. I built a very large dynamo with the engine directly connected, which I intended for the Paris Exposition of 1881. It was one or two sizes larger than those I had previously built. I had only a very short period in which to get it ready and put it on a steamer to reach the exposition in time. After the machine was completed, we found the voltage was too low. I had to devise a way of raising the voltage without changing the machine, which I did by adding extra magnets. After this was done, we tested the machine, and the crankshaft of the engine broke and flew clear across the shop. By working night and day, a new crankshaft was put in, and we only had three days left from that time to get it on board the steamer, and had also to run a test. So we made arrangements with the Timnani leader, and through him with the police, to clear the streets, one of the New York Crosstown streets, and line it with policemen, as we proposed to make a quick passage and didn't know how much time it would take. About four hours before the steamer had to get it, the machine was shut down after the test, and a schedule was made out in advance of what each man had to do. Sixty men were put on top of the dynamo to get it ready, and each man had written orders as to what he was to perform. We got it all taken apart and put on trucks and started off. They drove the horses with a fire bell in front of them to the French pier, the policemen lining the streets. Fifty men were ready to help the stevedores get it on the steamer, and we were one hour ahead of time. This exposition brings us, indeed, to a dramatic and rather pathetic parting of ways. The hour had come for the old laboratory force that had done such brilliant and memorable work to disband, never again to assemble under like conditions for like effort. Although its members all remained active in the field, and many have ever since become associated prominently with some department of electrical enterprise, 
The fact was they had done their work so well they must now disperse to show the world what it was, and assist in its industrial exploitation. In reality, they were too few for the demands that reached Edison from all parts of the world for the introduction of his system. And, in the emergency, the men nearest to him and most trusted were those upon whom he could best depend for such missionary work as was now required. The disciples, full of fire and enthusiasm, as well as of knowledge and experience, were soon scattered into the four winds, and the rapidity with which the Edison system was everywhere successfully introduced is testimony to the good judgment with which their leader had originally selected them as his colleagues. No one can say exactly just how this process of disintegration began, but Mr. E. H. Johnson had already been sent to England in the Edison interests, and now the question arose as to what should be done with the French demands and the Paris Electrical Exposition, whose importance as a point of new departure in electrical industry was speedily recognized on both sides of the Atlantic. It is very interesting to note that as the earlier staff broke up, Edison became the center of another large body, equally devoted, but more particularly concerned with the commercial development of his ideas. Mr. E. G. Atchison mentions in his personal notes on work at the laboratory that in December of 1880, while on some experimental work, he was called to the new lamp factory started recently at Menlo Park, and there found Edison, Johnson, and Bachelor, and Upton in conference. And Edison informed me that Mr. Bachelor, who was in charge of the construction, development, and operation of the lamp factory, was soon to sail to Europe to prepare for the exhibit to be made at the Electrical Exposition, to be held in Paris during the coming summer. These preparations overlap the reinforcement of the staff with some notable additions, chief among them being Mr. Samuel Insel, whose interesting narrative of events fits admirably into the story at this stage, and gives a vivid idea of the intense activity and excitement with which the whole atmosphere around Edison was then surcharged. I first met Edison on March 1, 1881. I arrived in New York on the city of Chester about five or six in the evening, and went direct to 65 Fifth Avenue. I had come over to act as Edison's private secretary, the position having been obtained for me through the good services of Mr. E. H. Johnson, whom I had known in London, and who wrote to Mr. U. H. Painter of Washington about me in the fall of 1880. Mr. Painter sent the letter on to Mr. Bachelor, who turned it over to Edison. Johnson returned to America late in the fall of 1880, and in January 1881 cabled me to come to this country. At the time he cabled for me, Edison was still at Menlo Park, but when I arrived in New York, the famous offices of the Edison Electric Light Company had been opened at 65 Fifth Avenue, and Edison had moved into New York with the idea of assisting in the exploitation of the light company business. I was taken by Johnson, direct from the Inman Steamship Pier, to 65 Fifth Avenue, and met Edison for the first time. There were three rooms on the ground floor at that time. The front one was used as a kind of reception room. The room immediately behind it was used as the offices of the president of the Edison Electric Light Company, Major S. B. Eaton. The rear room, which was directly back of the front entrance hall, was Edison's office, and there I first saw him. There was very little in the room except a couple of walnut roller-top desks, which were very generally used in American offices at that time. Edison received me with great cordiality. 
I think he was possibly disappointed at my being such a young man. I had only just turned twenty-one, and had a very boyish appearance. The picture of Edison is as vivid to me now as if the incident occurred yesterday, although it is now more than twenty-nine years since that first meeting. I had been connected with Edison's affairs in England as a private secretary to his London agent for about two years, and had been taught by Johnson to look on Edison as the greatest electrical inventor of the day. A view of him, by the way, which has been greatly strengthened as the years have rolled by. Owing to this, and to the fact that I felt highly flattered at the appointment as his private secretary, I was naturally prepared to accept him as a hero. With my strict English ideas as to the class of clothes to be worn by prominent men, there was nothing in Edison's dress to impress me. He wore a rather seedy black diagonal Prince Albert coat and waistcoat, with trousers of a dark material, and a white silk handkerchief around his neck, tied in a careless knot, falling over the stiff bosom of a white shirt, somewhat the worse for wear. He had a large, wide-awake hat of the sombrero pattern, then generally used in this country, and a rough brown overcoat, cut somewhat similarly to his Prince Albert coat. His hair was worn quite long, and hanging carelessly over his fine forehead. His face was at that time, as it is now, clean-shaven. He was full in face and figure, although by no means as stout as he has grown in recent years. What struck me above everything else was the wonderful intelligence and magnetism of his expression, and the extreme brightness of his eyes. He was far more modest than in my youthful picture of him. I had expected to find a man of distinction. His appearance, as a whole, was not what you would call slovenly. It is best expressed by the word careless. Mr. Insull supplements this pen picture by another, bearing upon the hustle and bustle of the moment. After a short conversation, Johnson hurried me off to meet his family and later in the evening, about eight o'clock, he and I returned to Edison's office, and I found myself launched, without further ceremony, into Edison's business affairs. Johnson had already explained to me that he was sailing the next morning, March 2nd, on the SS Arizona, and that Mr. Edison wanted to spend the evening discussing matters in connection with his European affairs. It was assumed inasmuch as I had just arrived from London, that I would be able to give more or less information on this subject. As Johnson was to sail the next morning at five o'clock, Edison explained that it would be necessary for him to have an understanding of European matters. Edison started out by drawing from his desk a checkbook and stating how much money he had in the bank, and he wanted to know what European telephone securities were most saleable, as he wished to raise the necessary funds to put on their feet the incandescent lamp factory, the electric tube works, and the necessary shops to build dynamos. All through the interview I was tremendously impressed with Edison's wonderful resourcefulness and grasp, and his immediate appreciation of any suggestion of consequence bearing on the subject under discussion. He spoke with very great enthusiasm of the work before him, namely the development of his electric lighting system, and his one idea seemed to be to raise all the money he could with the object of pouring it into the manufacturing side of the lighting business. I remember how extraordinarily I was impressed with him on this account, as I had just come from a circle of people in London who not only questioned the possibility of the success of Edison's invention, but often expressed doubt as to whether the work he had done could be called an invention at all. After discussing affairs with Johnson, who was receiving his final instructions from Edison, far into the night, and going down to the steamer to see Johnson aboard, 
I finished my first night's business with Edison, somewhere between four and five in the morning. Feeling thoroughly imbued with the idea that I had met one of the great masterminds of the world. You must allow for my youthful enthusiasm, but you must also bear in mind Edison's particular gift of magnetism, which has enabled him during his career to attach so many men to him. I fell a victim to the spell at the first interview. Events moved rapidly in those days. The next morning, Tuesday, Edison took his new fetus Achates with him to a conference with John Roach, the famous old shipbuilder, and added agreed to take the Etna Iron Works, where Roach had laid the foundations of his fame and fortune. These works were not in use at the time. They were situated on Gurick Street, New York, north of Grand Street, on the east side of the city, and there— very soon after was established the first Edison dynamo manufacturing establishment, known for many years as the Edison Machine Works. The same night, Insull made his first visit to Menlo Park. Up to that time he had seen very little incandescent lighting, for the simple reason that there was very little to see. Johnson had had a few Edison lamps in London lit up from primary batteries as a demonstration, and in the summer of 1880 Swan had had a few series of lamps burning in London. In New York, a small gas engine plant was being started at the Edison offices on Fifth Avenue, but out at Menlo Park there was the first actual electric lighting central station— supplying distributed incandescent lamps and some electric motors by means of underground conductors, embedded in asphalt and surrounded by a wooden box. Mr. Insull says, The system employed was naturally the two-wire, as at that time the three-wire had not been thought of. The lamps were partly of the horseshoe filament paper carbon type and partly bamboo filament lamps, and were of an efficiency of 95 to 100 watts per 16 cp. I can never forget the impression that this first view of the electric lighting industry produced on me. Menlo Park must always be looked upon as the birthplace of the electric light and power industry. At that time, it was the only place where could be seen an electric light and power multiple arc distribution system the operation of which seemed such successful to my youthful mind as the operation of one of the large metropolitan systems today. I well remember about ten o'clock that night going down to the Menlo Park Depot and getting the station agent, who was also the telegraph operator, to send some cable messages for me to my London friends announcing that I had seen Edison's incandescent lighting system in actual operation, and that, so far as I could tell, it was an accomplished fact. A few weeks afterwards I received a letter from one of my London friends, who was a doubting Thomas, upbraiding me for coming so soon under the spell of the Yankee inventor. It was to confront and deal with just this element of doubt in London and in Europe generally that the dispatch of Johnson to England and of Bachelor to France was intended. Throughout the Edison staff there was a mingled feeling of pride in the work, resentment at the doubts expressed about it, and keen desire to show how excellent it was. Bachelor left for Paris in July 1881, on his second trip to Europe that year, and the exhibit was made, which brought such an instantaneous recognition of the incalculable value of Edison's lighting inventions, as evidenced by the awards and rewards immediately bestowed upon him. He was made an officer of the Legion of Honor, and Professor George F. Barker cabled as follows from Paris, announcing the decision of the expert jury which passed upon the exhibits. Accept my congratulations. You have distanced all competitors, 
and obtained a diploma of honor, the highest award given in the exposition. No person in any class in which you were an exhibitor received a like award. Nor was this all. Eminent men in science, who had previously expressed their disbelief in the statements made as to the Edison system, were now foremost in generous praise of his notable achievements, and accorded him full credit for his completion. A typical instance was Mr. Du Monsal, a distinguished electrician who had written cynically about Edison's work and denied its practicability. He now recounted publicly in this language, which in itself shows the state of the art when Edison came to the front. All these experiments achieved but moderate success, and when, in 1879, the new Edison incandescent carbon lamp was announced, many of the scientists, and I particularly, doubted the accuracy of the reports which came from America. This horseshoe of carbonized paper seemed incapable to resist mechanical shocks and to maintain incandescence for any considerable length of time. Nevertheless, Mr. Edison was not discouraged, and despite the active opposition made to his lamp, despite the pulmic acerbity of which he was the object, he did not cease to perfect it and he succeeded in producing the lamps which we now behold exhibited at the exposition, and are admired by all for their perfect steadiness. The competitive lamps exhibited and tested at this time comprised those of Edison, Maxim, Swan, and Lane Fox. The demonstration of Edison's success stimulated the faith of his French supporters and rendered easier the completion of plans for the Société Edison Continental of Paris, formed to operate the Edison patents on the continent of Europe. Mr. Bachelor, with Messrs. Atchison and Hippel, and one or two other assistants, at the close of the exposition, transferred their energies to the construction and equipment of machine shops and lamp factories at ivory sur seine for the company, and in a very short time the installation of plants began in various countries, France, Italy, Holland, and Belgium, etc. All through 1881, Johnson was very busy for his part in England. The first jumbo Edison dynamo had gone to Paris. The second and third went to London, where they were installed in 1881 by Mr. Johnson and his assistant, Mr. W. J. Hammer, in the 3,000-light central station on Holborn Viaduct, the plant going into operation on January 12, 1882. Outside of Menlo Park, this was the first regular station for incandescent lighting in the world, as the Pearl Street Station in New York did not go into operation until September of the same year. This historic plant was hurriedly thrown together on Crown Land, and would doubtless have been the nucleus of a great system, but for the passage of the English Electric Lighting Act of 1882, which at once throttled the industry by its absurd restrictive provisions, and which, though greatly modified, has left England ever since in a condition of serious inferiority as to the development in electric light and power. The streets and bridges of Holborn Viaduct were lighted by lamps turned on and off from the station, as well as the famous city temple of Dr. Joseph Parker, the first church in the world to be lighted by incandescent lamps. Indeed, so far as can be ascertained, the first church to be illuminated by electricity in any form. Mr. W. J. Hammer, who supplies some very interesting notes on the insulation, says, I well remember the astonishment of Dr. Parker and his associates when they noted the difference of temperature as compared with gas. I was informed that the people would not go into the gallery in warm weather, 
owing to the great heat caused by the many gas-jets, whereas on the introduction of the incandescent lamp there was no complaint. The telegraph operating room of the general post office at St. Martin le Grand and Newgate Street nearby was supplied with four hundred lamps through the instrumentality of Mr. Sir W. H. Priest, who, having been seriously skeptical as to Mr. Edison's results, became one of his most ardent advocates and did much to facilitate the introduction of the light. This station supplied its customers by a network of feeders and mains of the standard underground two-wire Edison tubing conductors in sections of iron pipes, such as was used subsequently in New York, Milan, and other cities. It also had a measuring system for the current, employing the Edison electrolic meter. Arc lamps were operated from its circuits, and one of the first sets of practical storage batteries was used experimentally at this station. In connection with these batteries, Mr. Hammer tells a characteristic incident of Edison. A careless boy, passing through the station, whistling a tune and swinging carelessly a hammer in his hand, wrapped a carboy of sulfuric acid, which happened to be on the floor above the jumbo dynamo. The blow broke the glass carboy, and the acid ran down upon the field magnet of the dynamo, destroying the windings of one of the twelve magnets. This accident happened while I was taking a vacation in Germany, and a prominent scientific man connected with the company cabled Mr. Edison to know whether the machine would work if the coil was cut out. Mr. Edison sent the laconic reply, why doesn't he try it and see? Mr. E. H. Johnson was kept busy, not only with the cares and responsibilities of his pioneer English plant, but by negotiations as to company formations, hearings before parliamentary committees, and particularly by distinguished visitors, including all the foremost scientific men in England, and a great many well-known members of the peerage. Edison was fortunate in being represented by a man with so much address, intimate knowledge of the subject, and powers of explanation. As one of the leading English papers said at the time, with equal humor and truth, there is but one Edison, and Johnson is his prophet. As the plant continued in operation, various details and ideas of improvement emerged, and Mr. Hammer says, Up to the time of the construction of this plant, it had been customary to place a single pole switch on one wire and a safety fuse on the other, and the practice of putting fuses on both sides of a lighting circuit was first used here. Some of the first, if not the very first, of the insulated fixtures were used in this plant and many of the fixtures were equipped with ball-insulating joints, enabling chandeliers, or electroliers, to be turned around, as was common with the gas chandeliers. This particular device was invented by Mr. John B. Verity, whose firm built many of the fixtures for the Edison Company, and constructed the notable electroliers shown at the Crystal Palace Exposition of 1882. We have made a swift survey of developments from the time when the system of lighting was ready for use, and when the staff scattered to introduce it. It will be readily understood that Edison did not sit with folded hands, or drop into complacent satisfaction the moment he had reached the practical stage of commercial exploitation. He was not willing to say, Let us rest and be thankful, as was one of England's great liberal leaders after a long period of reform. On the contrary, he was never more active than immediately after the work we have summed up at the beginning of this chapter. 
While he had been pursuing his investigations of the generator in conjunction with the experiments on the incandescent lamp, he gave much thought to the question of distribution of the current over large areas, revolving in his mind various plans for the accomplishment of this purpose, and keeping his mathematicians very busy working on the various schemes that suggested themselves from time to time. The idea of a complete system had been in his mind in broad outline for a long time, but it did not crystallize into commercial form until the incandescent lamp was an accomplished fact. Thus, in January 1880, his first patent application for a system of electrical distribution was signed. It was filed in the patent office a few days later, but was not issued as a patent until August 30, 1887. It covered, fundamentally, multiple arc distribution. How broadly will be understood from the following extracts from the New York Electrical Review of September 10, 1887. It would appear as if the entire field of multiple distribution were now in the hands of the owners of this patent. The patent is about as broad as a patent can be, being regardless of specific devices and laying a powerful grasp on the fundamental idea of multiple distribution from a number of generators throughout a metallic circuit. Mr. Edison made a number of other applications for patents on electrical distribution during the year 1880. Among these was the one covering the celebrated feeder invention, which has been of very great commercial importance in the art, its object being to obviate the drop in pressure, rendering lights dim in those portions of an electric light system that were remote from the central station. Footnote 10. For further explanation of feeder patent, see Appendix. From these two patents alone, which were absolutely basic and fundamental in effect, and both of which were, and still are, put into actual use wherever central station lighting is practiced, the reader will see that Mr. Edison's patient and thorough study, aided by his keen foresight and unerring judgment, had enabled him to grasp in advance with a master hand the chief and underlying principles of a true system. That system, which has since been put into practical use all over the world, and whose elements do not need the touch or change of more modern scientific knowledge. These patents were not by any means all he applied for in the year 1880, which it will be remembered was the year in which he was perfecting the incandescent electric lamp and methods to put into market for competition with gas. It was an extraordinarily busy year for Mr. Edison and his whole force, which from time to time was increased in number. Improvement upon improvement was the order of the day. That which was considered good today was superseded by something better and more serviceable tomorrow. Device after device, relating to some part of the entire system, was designed, built, and tried only to be rejected ruthlessly as being unsuitable. But the pursuit was not abandoned. It was renewed over and over again, in innumerable ways, until success had been attained. During the year 1880, Edison had made application for sixty patents, of which thirty-two were in relation to incandescent lamps, seven covered inventions relating to distributing systems, including the two above particularized. Five had reference to inventions of parts, such as motors, sockets, etc. Six covered inventions relating to dynamo-electric machines. 
three related to electric railways, and seven to miscellaneous apparatus, such as telegraph relays, magnetic ore separators, magneto signaling apparatus, etc. The list of Mr. Edison's patents, see appendices, is not only a monument to his life's work, but serves to show what subjects he was working on from year to year since 1868. The reader will see from an examination of this list that the years 1880, 1881, 1882, and 1883 were the most prolific periods of invention. It is worth while to scrutinize this list closely to appreciate the wide range of his activities. Not that his patents cover his entire range of work by any means, for his notebooks reveal a great number of major and minor inventions for which he has not seen fit to take out patents. Moreover, at the period now described, Edison was the victim of a dishonest patent solicitor, who deprived him of a number of patents in the following manner. Around 1881-82 I had several solicitors attending to different classes of work, one of these did me most serious injury. It was during the time that I was developing my electric lighting system, and I was working and thinking very hard in order to cover all the numerous parts, in order that it would be complete in every detail. I filed a great many applications for patents at that time, but there were seventy-eight of the inventions I made in that period that were entirely lost to me and my company, by reason of the dishonesty of this patent solicitor. Specifications had been drawn, and I had signed and sworn to the application for the patents for these seventy-eight inventions, and naturally I supposed they had been filed in the regular way. As time passed, I was looking for some action of the patent office, as usual, but none came. I thought it very strange, but had no suspicions, until I began to see my inventions recorded in the Patent Office Gazette as being patented by others. Of course I ordered an investigation, and found that the patent solicitor had drawn from the company the fees for filing all these applications, but had never filed them. All the papers had disappeared. However, in what he had evidently done— was to sell them to others, who had signed new applications and proceeded to take out patents themselves on my inventions. I afterwards found that he had been previously mixed up with a somewhat similar crooked job in connection with telephone patents. I am free to confess that the loss of these seventy-eight inventions has left a sore spot in me that has never healed. They were important, useful, and valuable, and represented a whole lot of tremendous work and mental effort, and I had had a feeling of pride in having overcome through them a great many serious obstacles. One of these inventions covered the multipolar dynamo. It was an elaborated form of the type covered by my patent number 219393 which had a ring armature. I modified and improved on this form, and had a number of pole pieces placed all around the ring, with a modified form of armature winding. I built one of these machines and ran it successfully in our early days at the Gurick Street shop. It is of no practical use to mention the man's name. I believe he is dead, but he may have left a family. The occurrence is a matter of the old Edison Company records. It will be seen from an examination of the list of patents in the appendix that Mr. Edison has continued year after year adding to his contributions to the art of electric lighting, and in the last twenty-eight years, 1880 through 1908, has taken out no fewer than 375 patents in this branch of industry alone. These patents may be roughly tabulated as follows. 
Incandescent Lamps and Their Manufacturer, 149. Distributing Systems and Their Control and Regulation, 77. Dynamo Electric Machines and Accessories, 106. Minor parts such as sockets, switches, safety catches, meters, underground conductors and parts, etc. 43. Quite naturally, most of these patents cover inventions that are in the nature of improvements or based upon devices which he had already created. But there are a number that relate to inventions absolutely fundamental and original in their nature. Some of these have already been alluded to, but among the others there is one which is worthy of special mention in connection with the present consideration of a complete system. This is patent number 274290, applied for November 27, 1882. It is known as the three-wire patent. It is described more fully in the appendix. The great importance of the feeder and the three-wire inventions will be apparent when it is realized that without them it is a question whether electric light could be sold to compete with low-priced gas, on account of the large investment in conductors that would be necessary. If a large city area were to be lighted from a central lighting station by means of copper conductors running directly therefrom to all parts of the district, it would be necessary to install large conductors or suffer such a drop of pressure at the ends most remote from the station as to cause the lights there to burn with a noticeable diminution of candle power. The feeder invention overcame this trouble and made it possible to use conductors only one-eighth the size that would otherwise have been necessary to produce the same results. Still further economy in cost of conductors was affected by the three-wire invention, by the use of which the already diminished conductors could still further be reduced to one-third of this smaller size, and at the same time allow for the successful operation of the station with far better results than if it were operated exactly as at first conceived. The feeder and three-wire systems are at this day used in all parts of the world, not only in central station work, but in the installation and operation of isolated electric light plants in large buildings. No sensible or efficient station manager or electric contractor would ever think of an installation made upon any other plan. Thus, Mr. Edison's early conceptions of the necessities of a complete system, one of them made even in advance of practice, have stood firm, unimproved, and unchanged during the past twenty-eight years, a period of time which has witnessed more wonderful and rapid progress in electrical science and art than has been known during any similar art or period of time since the world began. It must be remembered that the complete system, in all its parts, is not comprised in the few of Mr. Edison's patents, of which specific mention is here made. In order to comprehend the magnitude and extent of his work, and the quality of his genius, it is necessary to examine minutely the list of patents issued for the various elements which go to make up such a system. To attempt any relation in detail of the conception and working out of each part or element, to enter into any description of the almost innumerable experiments and investigations that were made, would entail the writing of several volumes, for Mr. Edison's close-written notebooks covering these subjects number nearly two hundred. It is believed that enough evidence has been given in this chapter to lead to an appreciation of the assiduous work and practical skill involved in inventing a system of lighting that would surpass, and to great extent, 
in one single quarter of a century supersede all the other methods of illumination developed during long centuries. But it will be appropriate before passing on to note that on January 17, 1908, while this biography was being written, Mr. Edison became the fourth recipient of the John Fritz Gold Medal for Achievement in Industrial Progress. This medal was founded in 1902 by the professional friends and associates of the veteran American iron master and metallurgical inventor in honor of his 80th birthday. Awards are made by a board of 16 engineers appointed in equal number from the four great national engineering societies, the American Society of Civil Engineers, the American Institute of Mining Engineers, the American Society of Mechanical Engineers, and the American Institute of Electrical Engineers, whose membership embraces the very pick and flower of professional engineering talent in America. Up to the time of the Edison Award, three others had been made. The first was to Lord Kelvin, the Nestor of Physics in Europe, for his work in submarine cable telegraphy and other scientific achievement. The second was to George Westinghouse for the air brake. The third was to Alexander Graham Bell for the invention and introduction of the telephone. The award to Edison was not only for his inventions in duplex and quadruplex telegraphy and for the phonograph, but for the development of a commercially practical incandescent lamp and the developments of a complete system of electric lighting, including dynamos, regulating devices, underground system, protective devices, and meters. Great has been the genius brought to bear on electrical development. There is no other man to whom such a comprehensive tribute could be paid. End of chapter 14Chapter 15 of Edison, His Life and Inventions. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nelly. Edison, His Life and Inventions by Frank Lewis Dyer and Thomas Comerford Martin. Chapter 15. Introduction of the Edison Electric Light In the previous chapter on the invention of a system, the narrative has been carried along for several years of activity after the verge of successful and commercial application of Edison's ideas and devices for incandescent electric lighting. The story of any year, one year in this period, if treated chronologically, would branch off in a great many directions, some going back to early works, others forward to arts not yet within the general survey. And the effect of such treatment will be confusing. In like manner the development of the Edison lighting system follows several concurrent, simultaneous lines of lens, and an effort was therefore made in the last chapter to give a rapid glance over the whole movement embracing a term of near five years, and including in its growth both the old world and the new. What is necessary to the completeness of the story at this stage is not to recapitulate, but to take up some of the loose ends of the threads, woven in and follow them through, until the clear and comprehensive picture of the events can be seen. Some things it will be difficult to reproduce in any picture of the art and times. One of the greatest delusions of the public in regard to any notable invention is the belief that the world is waiting for it with open arms and an eager welcome. The exact contrary is the truth. There is not a single new art or device the world has ever enjoyed of which it can be said that 
He was given immediate enthusiastic reception. The way of the inventor is hard. He can sometimes raise capital to help him in working out his crude conceptions, but even then it is frequently done at a distressful cost of personal surrender. When the result is achieved, the invention makes its appeal on the score of economy, of material, of, of effort, and then labor often awaits with crushing and tyrannical spirit to smash the apparatus or forbid its very use. Where both capital and labor are agreed that. The object is worthy of encouragement. There is the superior indifference of the public to overcome, and the stubborn resistance of the pre-existing devices to combat. The years of hardship and struggle are thus prolonged. The chagrin of poverty and neglect too frequently embitters the inventor's scanty bread, and one great spirit after another has succumbed to the defeat, beyond which lay the procrastinated triumph. So dearly earned, even in America, where the adoption of improvements and innovations is regarded as so prompt and sure, and where the huge tours of the patent office and the court bear witness to the ceaseless efforts of the inventor, it is impossible to deny that the sad truth that unconsciously society discourages invention rather than invites it. Possibly, our national optimism, as revealed in the mention, is seeking a higher good, needs some check. Possibly, the leaders would travel too fast and too far on the road to perfection, if conservatism did not also play its salutary part in insisting that the procession move forward as a whole. Edison and his electrolyte were happily more fortunate than other man inventions. In the relative cordiality of the reception given them, the merit was too obvious to remain unrecognized. Nevertheless, it was through intense hostility and opposition that the young art made its way, pushed forward by Edison's strong personality, and by his unbounded, unwavering faith in the ultimate success of his system. It may seem strange that. Great effort was required to introduce a life so manifestly inconvenient, safe, agreeable, and advantageous. But the facts are a matter of record, and today the recollection of some of the episodes brings a fierce glitter into the eye, and keen indignation into the voice of the man who has come so victoriously through the door. It was not a fact at any time that. The public was opposed to the idea of the electric light. On the contrary, the conditions for its acceptance had been ripening fast. Yet the very vogue of the electric arc light made harder the arrival of the incandescent. As a new illuminant for the streets, the art became familiar, either as a direct substitute for the low gas lamp along the sidewalk curb, or as a novel form of moonlight. Raised in groups at the top of lofty towers, often a hundred and fifty feet high, some of these lights were already in use for large indoor spaces. Although the size of the unit, the daily pressure of the current, and the sputtering sparks from the carbons, made them highly objectionable for such purposes, a number of parent arc lighting companies were in existence, and a great many local companies. Had been caught into being under franchise for commercial business, and to execute regular city contracts for the street lining. In this manner, a good deal of capital and the energies of many prominent men in politics and business had been rallied distinctively to support of arc lining. Under the inventive leaderships of such brilliant men as Bruce Thompson. Weston and Van Depoeller, there were scores of others. The industry had made considerable progress, and the art has been firmly established. Here lurked, however, very rigorous elements of opposition. For Edison predicted from the start the superiority of the small electric unit of light, and devoted himself exclusively to its perfection and introduction. It can be readily seen that. This situation made it all the more difficult for Edison System to secure the large sums of money needed for its exploitation, 
and to obtain new franchises of city ordinance as a public utility. Thus, in a curious manner, the modern art of electric lighting was in a very true sense divided against itself, with intense rivalries and jealousies which were none the less real, because they were but temporary and occurred in fact where ultimate union of the force was inevitable. For a long period of time, the arc was dominant and superior in the lightning branch of the electric industries in all respects, whether as to investment, employees, income, and profits, or in the respect to the manufacturing side. When the great National Electric Light Association was formed in 1885, its organizers were the captains of arc lightning, and not a single Edison's company or licensee could be found in its ranks, or dare to solicit membership. The Edison Company, soon numbering about three hundred, formed their own association, still maintained as a separate and useful body, and the lines were tensely drawn in a way that made it none too easy for the Edison service to advance, or for an impartial man to remain friendly with both sides. But the growing popularity of incandescent lightning, the flexibility and safety of the system, the ease with which other electric devices for heat, power, etc., could be put indiscriminately on the same circuits with the lamps, in due course rendered the old attitude of opposition obviously foolish and unattainable. The United States Census Office statistics of 1902 show that the income from incandescent lightning by central stations had by that time become over 52% of the total while that from arc lining was less than 29, and electric power surfaced due to the ease with which models could be introduced on incandescent circuits, brought in 15% more. Hence, 20 years after the first Edison station were established, the methods they involved could be fairly credited with no less than 67% of all central station income in the country, and the proportion has grown ever since. Then, it will be readily understood that, under these conditions, the modern lighting company supplies to its customers both incandescent and arc lighting, frequently from the same dynamo electric machinery as a source of current, and that the old feud as between the rival systems has died out. In fact, for some years past, the residents of the National Electric Light Association have been chosen almost exclusively from among the managers of the great Edison lighting companies in the leading cities. The other strong opposition to the incandescent light came from the gas industry. There also the most bitter feeling was shown. The gas manager did not like arc light, but it interfered only with his street service, which was not his largest source of income by any means. What did arouse his ire and indignation was to find this new opponent, the little incandescent lamp, pushing boldly into the field of interior lining, claiming it on a great variety of grounds of superiority, and calmly ignoring the question of price because it was so much better. Newspaper records and the pages of the technical papers of the day show to what extent prejudice and passion were stirred up and the astounding degree to which the opposition to the new light was carried. Here again was given the most convincing demonstration of the truth that such an addition to the resources of mankind always carries with it unsuspected benefits, even for its enemies. In two distinct directions, the gas art was immediately helped by Edison's work. The competition was almost salutary in the stimulus it gave to improvements in processes for making, distributing, and using gas, so that while vast economies have been affected at the gas works, the customers has had infinitely better light for less money. In the second place, the coming of the incandescent light raised the standard of illumination in such a manner that more gas than ever was wanted in order to satisfy the popular demand for brightness and brilliancy, both indoors and on the street. The result of the operation of these two forces acting upon it wholly from without, and from a rival it was desired to crush, has been to increase 
enormously the production and use of the gas in the last 25 years. It is true that the income of the central station is now over $300 million a year, and that isolated plant alighting represents also a large amount of diverted business. But, just as shown, it would obviously be unfair to regard all this as a loss from the standpoint of gas. It is, in a great measure, due to new sources of income developed by electricity for itself. A retrospective survey shows that, had the man in control of the American gas lighting art in 1880 been sufficiently far-sighted, and had they not taken a broader view of the situation, they might easily have remained dominant in the whole field of artificial lighting by securing the ownership of the patents and devices of the new industry. Apparently, not a single step of that kind was undertaken. No problems there a gas manager who would have agreed with Edison in the opinion written down by him at the time in Little Notebook number 184 that gas problems were having conferred on them an enhanced earning capacity. It was doubtless fortunate and providential for the electric lining art that, in its state of immature and development, it did not fall into hands of men who were opposed to its growth, and would not have sought its technical perfection. It was allowed to carve out its own career, and thus escape the fate that is supposed to have attended other great inventions, of being bought up merely for its purposes of suppression. There is a vague or popular notion that these happens to the public lords, but the truth is that no discovery of any real value is ever entirely lost. It may be retarded, but that is all. In the case of the gas companies and the incandescent light, many of them to whom it was in the early days as great an irritant as a red flag to a bow, emulated the performance of that animal, and spent a great deal of money and energy in belowing and throwing up dirt in the effort to destroy the hated enemy. This was not long, nor universally the spirit shown, and today, in hundreds of cities, the electric and gas problems are united under the one management, which does not find it impossible to push in a friendly and progressive way the use of both illuminants. The most conspicuous example of this identity of interest is given in New York itself. So much for the early opposition of which there were plenty. But it may be questioned whether inertia is not equally to be dreaded with active ill will. Nothing is more difficult in the world than to get a good many hundreds of thousands or millions of people to do something they have never done before. A very real difficulty in the introduction of his lamp and lining system by Edison lay in the absolute ignorance of the public at large, not only as to its merits, but as to the very appearance of the light. Some few thousand people had gone out to Menlo Park, and had there seen the lamps in operation at the laboratory or on the hillsides, but they were an insignificant proportion of the inhabitants of the United States. Of course, a great many accounts were written and read, but while general interest was aroused, it was necessarily apathetic. A newspaper description of a magazine article may be admirably complete in itself, with illustrations, but until some personal experience is had of the thing described, it does not convey a perfect mental picture, nor can it always make the desire active and insistent. Generally, people wait to have the new thing brought to them, and hence, as in the case of the Edison light, an educational campaign of a practical nature is a fundamental condition of success. After a serious difficulty confronting Edison and his associates was that nowhere in the world were there to be purchased any of the appliances necessary for the use of lighting system. Edison has resolved from the very first that the initial central station, emboldening his various ideas, should be installed in New York City, where he could superintend the installation personally, and then watch the operation. Plans to that end were now rapidly maturing, but there will be needed, among many other things, every one of them new and novel, dynamos, switchboards, 
regulators, pressure and current indicators, fixture and grid variety, incandescent lamp, meters, sockets, small switches, underground conductors, junction boxes, service boxes, manhole boxes, connectors, and even specially made wire. Now, not one of these materials things were in existence. Not any outsider was sufficiently informed about such devices to make them in order, except perhaps the special wire. Edison therefore started the first of all a lamp factory in one of the buildings in Mellow Park, equipped it with novel machinery and apparatus, and began to instruct men, boys and girls, as they could be enlisted in the absolutely new art, putting Mr. Upton in charge. With regard to the condition attended upon the manufacture of the lens, Edison says, When we first started the electric light, we had had from factory for manufacturing lens. As the Edison Light Company did not seem disposed to go into manufacturing, we started a small lamp factory in Menlo Park, with what money I could raise from my other inventions or royalties, and some assistance. The lamps at that time were costing about one point two five dollars each to make. So I said to the company, If you will give me a contract during the life of the patents, I will make all the lamps required by the company and deliver them for forty cents. The company jumped at the chance of this offer, and a contract was drawn up. We then bought at a receiver cell at Harrison, New Jersey, a very large brick factory building which had been used as an oil cloth works. We got it at a great bargain, and only paid a small sum down, and the ballast and water gauge. We moved the lamp forks from Menlo Park to Harrison. The first year, lamps cost us about $1.10 each. We sold them for 40 cents, but there were only about 20 or 30 thousands of them. The next year, they cost us about 70 cents, and we sold them for 40 cents. There were a good many, and we lost more money the second year than in the first. A third year, I succeeded in getting our machinery and in changing processes until it got down so that it cost somewhere around 50 cents. I still sold them for 40 cents and lost more money that year than any other because the sales were increasingly rapidly. The fourth year, I got it down to 37 cents, and I made all the money up in one year that I had lost previously. I finally got it down to 22 cents, and sold them for 40 cents, and they were made by the million. Whereupon the Wall Street people thought it was a very lucrative business, so they concluded that they would like to have it, and bought us out. One of the incidents which caused a very great cheapening was that, when we started, one of the important processes had to be done by experts. This was the selling of the part carrying the filament into the globe, which was rather a delicate operation in those days, and required several months of training before anyone could sell a fair number of part parts in a day. When we got to the point where we employed eighty of these experts, they formed a union, and knowing it was impossible to manufacture lamps without them, they become very insolent. One instance with that, the son of one of these experts was employed in the office, and when he was told to do anything, would not do it, and or would give an insolent reply. He was discharged, whereupon the union notified us that unless the boy was taken back, the whole body would go out. It got so bad that the manager came to me and said he could not stand any longer, something had got to be done. They were not only more surly, they were diminishing the output, and it became impossible to manage the works. He got me enthused on the subject, so I started in to see if it were not possible to do that operation by machinery. After feeling around for some days, I got a clue how to do it. I then put the man on it I could trust, and made the preliminary machinery. It seemed to work pretty well. I then made another machine which did the work nicely, and then made a third machine, and would bring in yardmen, ordinary labor laborers, etc., and when I could get these men to put the parts together, as well as the trained experts, in an hour, 
I considered the machine complete, and then went secretly to work, and made thirty of the machines. Up in the top loft of the factory, we stored these machines, and at night we put up the benches and got everything all ready. Then we discharged the office boy. Then the union went out. He has been out ever since. When we formed the works at Harrison, we divided the interest into one hundred shares or parts at one hundred dollars par. One of the boys were hard up after a time and sold two shares to Bob Cotton. Up to that time, we had never paid anything, but we got around to the point where the board declared a dividend every Saturday night. We had never declared a dividend when Cotton bought his shares, and after getting his dividends, for three weeks in succession, he called up on the telephone and wanted to know what kind of concern this was that paid a weekly dividend. The work sold for one million and eighty-five thousand dollars. Incidentally, it may be noted, as illustrative of the problem brought to Edison, that while he had the factory at Harrison, an importer in the Chinese trader went to him and wanted a dynamo to be run by hand power. The importer explained that, in China, human labor was cheaper than steam power. Edison devised a machine to answer the purpose, and put long spokes on it, fitted it up, and shipped it to China. He has not, however, heard of it since. For making the dynamos, Edison secured, as noted in the preceding chapter, the Roach Iron Works on Go Work Street, New York, and this was also equipped. A building was rented on Washington Street, where machinery tours were put in specially designed for making the underground tube conductor and the various paraphernalia. And the faithful John Cruyasi was given charge of that branch of production. To Sigmund Bergman, who had worked previously with Edison on telephone apparatus and phonographs, and was already making Edison specialities in a small way, in a loft on Wooster Street, New York, was assigned the task of constructing sockets, fixtures, meters, safety fuses, and numerous other details. Thus, broadly, the manufacturing end of the problem of introduction was cared of. In the early part of 1881, the Edison Electric Light Company leased the old Bishaw Mansion at 65 Fifth Avenue, close to Fording Street for his headquarters and showrooms. This was one of the finest homes in the city of that period, and its acquisition was a premonitory sign of the surrender of the famous residential avenue to commerce. The company needed not only offices, but even more, such as an interior as would display to advantage the new light in everyday use, and this house with its liberal lines, spacious halls, lofty salons, white parlors, and graceful winding stairway, was ideal for the purpose. In fact, in undergoing this violent change, it did not cease to be a home in the real sense, but to this day, many an Edison veteran's house is quickened by some chance reference to 65, where through many years the work of development by a loyal and devoted band of workers was centered. Here, Addison and a few of his assistants from Menlo Park installed immediately in the basement a small generating plant, at first with a gas engine, which was not successful, and then with a Hampson high-speed engine and boiler, constituted a complete isolated plant. The building was wired from top to bottom and equipped with all the appliances of the yard. The experience with the little gas engine was rather startling. At an early period of 65, we decided, says Addison, to light it up with the Addison system and put a gas engine in the cellar using city gas. One day, it was not going very well, and I went down to the man in charge and got exploring around. Finally, I opened the pedestal, a storehouse for tourists, etc. We had an open lamp, and we, when we opened the pedestal, it blow the doors off and blow out the windows and knock me down and the other men. For the next four or five years, 65 was a veritable beehive, day and night. The routine was very much the same as that at the laboratory, 
in its other necklace of the clock. The evenings were not only devoted to the continuance of the regular business, but the house were thrown open to the public until late at night, never closing before ten o'clock, so as to give everybody who wished an opportunity to see that great novelty of the time, the incandescent light, whose fame had meanwhile been spreading all over the globe. The first year, 1881, was naturally that which witnessed the greatest rush of visitors, and the building hardly ever closed its doors till midnight. During the day business was carried on on the great stress, and Mr. Ingzow has described how Edison was to be found there trying to lead the life of men of affairs in the conventional garb of polite society, instead of pursuing inventions and researches in his laboratory. But the disagreeable ordeal could not be dodged. After the experience, Edison could never again be tempted to quit his laboratory and work for any length of time. But in this instance, there were some advantages attached to the sacrifice, for the crowds of lying hunters and people seeking business arrangements would not only have gone out to Menlo Park, while, on the other hand, the great plans of lightning New York demanded very close personal attention on the sport. As he was, not only Edison but all the company's directors, officers, and employees were kept busy exhibiting and explaining light to the public of that day, when the highest known form of the house illuminant were scarce, the incandescent lamp with its ability to burn in any position, its lack of heat so that you can put your hand on the brilliant glass globe, the absence of any vitiating effect of, on the atmosphere, the obvious safety from fire, the curious fact that you need in no match just to light it, and that it was under absolute control from a distance. These and many other features came as a distinct revelation and marvel, while promising so much addition comfort, convenience, and beauty in the house, that inspection was almost invariably followed by request for installation. The camaraderie that existed at this time was very democratic, for all were workers in a common cause, all were enthusiastic believers in the doctrine they proclaimed and hoped to profit by the opening up of the new art. Often at night, in the small hours, all would adjourn for refreshments to a famous resort nearby, and to discuss the events of the today and tomorrow, full of instant excitement. The easy relationship at the time is neatly sketched by Edison, in humorous complaint as to his inability to keep his own secrets. When at sixty-five, I used to have in my desk a box of secrets, I would go to the box four or five times a day to get a secret, but after it got circulated about the building, everybody would come to get my secrets, so the box would only last about a day and a half. I was telling a gentleman one day that I could not keep a secret. Even if I locked them up in my desk, they would break it open. He suggested to me that he had a friend over on 8th Avenue who made a superior grade of secrets, and who would show them a trick. He said that he would have some of them made up with hair and old paper, and I could put them in without a word and see the result. I thought no more about the matter. He came in two or three months after and said, How did that secret business work? I didn't remember anything about it, and coming to investigate, it appeared that the box of secrets had been delivered and had been put in my desk, and I had smoked them all. I was too busy on other things to denotice. It was not uncommon sight to see in the parlors in the evening of John Pierre Morgan, Novin Prane, Grosvenor P. Laurie, Henry Villa, Robert L. Cutting, Edward D. Adams, J. Hood Wright, E. G. Fabry, Armand Galloway, and other men prominent in the city life, many of them stockholders and directors, all interested in doing this educational work. Thousands of persons thus came, bankers, brokers, lawyers, editors and reporters, prominent businessmen, electricians, insurance experts, under whose researching and intelligent inquiries the fact was elicited, and general admiration was soon won for the system, which in advance had solved so many new problems. Addison himself was in universal request, and the subject of much adulation but altogether too busy and modest to be spoiled by it. 
Once in a while, he felt it in his duty to go over the ground with scientific visitors, many of whom were foreign abroad, and discuss questions which were not simply those of technique but related to newer phenomena, such as the action of carbon, the nature and effect of high vacuum, the principles of electrical subdivision, the value of insulation, and many others which, unfortunate to say, remain as esoteric now as they were then. Even fruitful themes of controversy. Speaking of those days of nights, Addison says, "Years ago, one of the great violinists was Ramoni. After his performances went, were over, he used to come down to sixty-five and talk economics, philosophy, moral science, and everything else. He was highly educated and had a great mental capacity. He would talk with me, but I never asked him to bring his violin." One night he came with his violin, about twelve o'clock. I had a library at the top of the house, and Ramley came up there. He was in a genial humor and played the violin for me for about two hours, two thousand dollars worth. The front door was closed, and he walked up and down the room as he played. After that, every time he came to New York, he used to call at sixty-five late at night with his violin. If we were not there. Who would come down to the slums on Gower Street, and would play for an hour or two and talk philosophy. I would talk for the benefit of his music. Henry Dixie, then at the height of his Adonis popularity, would come in in those days, after theater hours, and would entertain us with stories. 1882 to 1884. Another visitor who would used to give us a good deal of amusement and pleasure was Captain Shaw. The head of the London Fire Brigade. He was good company. He would go out among the fire ladies and have a great time. One time, Robert Lincoln, Anson Stager of the Western Union, interested in the electric light, came on to make some arrangement with Major Eaton, president of the Anson Electric Light Company. They came to sixty-five in the afternoon, and Lincoln commenced telling stories. Like his father, they told stories all the afternoon, and that night they left for Chicago. When they got to Cleveland, it dawned upon them that they had not done any business, so they had to come back on the next train to New York and transact it. They were interested in the Chicago Edison Company, now one of the largest of the systems in the world. Speaking of telling stories, I once got telling a man stories at the Harrison Land factory. In the yard, as he was leaving, it was winter, and he was all in furs. I had nothing on to protect me against the cold. I told him one story after the other, six of all. Then I got pleurisy and had to be shipped to Florida for cure. The organization of the Edison Electric Light Company went back to 1868, but up to the time of leasing 65 Fifth Avenue, he had not been engaged in actual business. He had merely enjoyed the delights of anxious anticipation, and the perilous pleasure of backing Edison's experiments. Now active exploitation was required. Dr. Norin Green, the well-known president of the Western Union Telegraph Company, was president also of the Edison Company, but the pressing nature of his regular duties left him no leisure for such close, responsible management as was now required. Early in 1881, Mr. Gross Vanner, P. Lorry, after consultation with Mr. Edison, prevailed upon Major S. B. Eaton, the leading member of a very prominent law firm in New York, to accept the position of vice president and general manager of the company, in which, as also in some of the subsidiary Edison companies, and as president, he continued actively and energetically for nearly four years. A critical formative period in which the solidity of the foundation laid is attested by the magnitude and splendor of the superstructure. The fact that Edison conferred at this point with Mr. Lowry should perhaps be explained in justice to the distinguished lawyer, who for so many years was the close friend of the inventor and the chief counsel in all the tremendous litigation that followed the effort to enforce and validate Edison patents. As in England, Mr. Edison was fortunate in securing the legal assistance of Sir Richard Webster, 
afterward Lord Chief Justice of England, so in America, it counted greatly in his favor to enjoy the advocacy of such men as Laurie. Prominent among the famous leaders of the New York Bar, born in Massachusetts, Mr. Laurie, in his earlier days of straitened circumstances, was accustomed to defray some portion of his educational expenses by teaching music in Berkshire villages, and by a curious coincidence, one of his pupils, F. L. Pope, later Addison partner for a time, Laurie went west to bleeding Kansas with the first governor reader, and both were active participants in the exciting scenes of the Free State War until driven away in 1856 by many other free soilers by the acts of the broader roughing legislature. Returning east, Mr. Laurie took up practice in New York, soon becoming eminent in his profession and upon the accession of William Alton to the presidency of the Western Union Telegraph Company in 1866, he was appointed its general counsel, the duties of which post he discharged for fifteen years. One of the great cases in which he thus took a leading and distinguished art was that of the quadruplex telegraph, and later he acted as a legal adviser to Henry Villard in his numerous grandiose enterprises. Laurie thus came to know Addison, to conceive an intense admiration for him, and to believe in his ability at the time when others could not detect the fire of genius smoldering beneath the modest interior of a gaunt young operator slowly finding himself. It will be seen that Mr. Laurie was in a peculiarly advantageous position to make his convictions about Addison felt, so that it was he and his friends who rallied quickly to the new baron of discovery, and lent to the inventor the aid that came as a critical period. In this connection, it may be well to quote an article with, that appeared at the time of Mr. Laurie's death, in 1893. One of the most important services which Mr. Laurie has ever performed was in furnishing and procuring the necessary financial backing for Thomson A. Addison, and bringing out and perfecting his system of incandescent lightning. With characteristic pertinacity, Mr. Laurie stood by the inventor through thick and thin, in spite of doubt, discouragement, and ridicule, until at last success crowned his efforts, and all the litigation which had resulted from the widespread infringements of Addison patents. Mr. Laurie has ever borne the burden and heat of the day, and perhaps in no other field has he so personally distinguished himself as in the successful advocacy of the claims of Addison to the invention of the incandescent lamp and everything here around pertaining. This was the man of whom Addison had necessarily to make confident an advisor, and who supplied other things beside the legal direction and financial alliance by his knowledge of the world and affairs. There were many vital things to be done in the exploitation of the system that Addison simply could not and would not do. But Laura's several fair gravity, wit and humor, chivalry and devotion, graceful eloquence, and admirable equipoise of judgment were all the qualities that the occasion demanded, and that met the exigences. We are indebted to Miss Ingsoll for a graphic sketch of Addison at this period, and of the conditions under which work was done and progress was made. I do not think I had any understanding with Addison when I first went with him, as to my duties. I did whatever he told me, and looked after all kinds of fears, from buying his clothes to financing his business. I used to open the correspondence and answer it all, sometimes signing Addison's name with my initial, and sometimes signing my own name. If the letter of course were pursued, I was addressing a stranger. I was signing as Addison's private secretary. I had his power of attorney, and signed his checks. It was seldom that Addison signed a letter or check at that time. If he wanted personally to send a communication to anybody, if it was one of his close associates, it would probably be a pencil memo signed Addison. It was a shorthand writer, but seldom took down from Addison dictation, unless it was one on some technical sub subject that I did not understand. I would go over the correspondence with Addison, sometimes making a marginal note in shorthand, sometimes Addison would make his own notes on letters, 
and I would be expected to clear up the correspondence with Addison of Coney Commons as a guide as to the character of answer to make. It was a very common thing for Addison to write the words yes or no, and this would be all I had on which to base my answer. Addison marginalized documents extensively. He had a wonderful ability in pointing out the weak points of agreement, a balance sheet, all the while protesting he was no lawyer or accountant, and his vows were expressed in a very few words, but in characteristic and emphatic manner. The first few months I was with Addison, he spent most of the time in the office at City Five Fifth Avenue. Then there was a great deal of trouble with the life of lamps there, and he disappeared from the office and spent his time largely at Menlo Park. At another time, there were a great deal of trouble with some of the details and construction of dynamos, and had to spend a lot of time at Gower Street, which had been rapidly equipped with the idea of turning out high polar dynamo electric machines, direct connected to the engine, the first of which went to Paris and London, while the next were installed in the old Paris Street station of Edison Electric Illuminating Company of New York, just south of Fulton Street. And the west side of the street, Addison devoted a great deal of his time to the engineering work in connection with the laying out of the first incandescent electric lighting system in New York. Apparently, at that time, between the end of 1881 and spring of 1882, the most serious work was the manufacture installation of underground conducts in this territory. These conductors were manufactured by Electric Tube Company, which Addison controlled in the shop at Sixty Five Washington Street, run by John Cruzzi. Half round copper conductors were used, kept in place relatively to each other, and in the tube. First of all, by a heavy piece of cardboard, and later on by a rope, and then put in a twenty-foot iron pipe. And a combination of asphaltum and linseed oil was forced into the pipe for insulation. I remember as a coincidence that the building was only twenty feet wide. These lengths of conductors were twenty feet six inches long. As the half-round coppers extended to three inches beyond the drag ends of the length of the pipe, and in one of the operations we used to take the length of tubing out of the window, in order to turn it around, I was elected secretary of the electric tube company, and was expected to look after its finances. And it was in this position that my long intimacy with John Curiassi started. At this juncture, a large part of the correspondence referred very naturally to electric lighting, emboldening requests for all kinds of information, catalogues, prices, terms, etc., and all these letters were turned over to the lighting company by Addison for attention. The company was soon swamped with proposition for sale of territorial rights and with other negotiations, and some of these were accompanied by the offer of very large sums of money. It was the beginning of the electric light forward, which soon rose to sensational heights. Had the company accepted this cash offer from various localities, it could have gathered several millions of dollars at once in strategy. But this was not at all in accord with Mr. Edison's idea, which was to prove by actual experience the commercial value of the system, and then to license a central station commerce in large cities and towns. The apparent company taking the percent. Stage of their capital for the license under the Edison patents, and contracting also for the supply of apparatus, lamps, etc. This left the remainder of the country open for the cash sale of plants wherever requested. His counsels prevailed, and the wisdom of the policy adopted was seen in the swift establishment of Edison companies in centers of population both great and small, whose business were has ever been a constant and growing source of income. The parent manufacturing interest, from first to last, Edison has been an exponent and advocate of the central station idea of distribution, now so familiar to the public mind, but still very far from being carried out to its logical conclusions. In this instance, demands for isolated plants for lighting factories, mills, mines, hotels, etc., began to pour in, and something had to be done with them. This was a class of plant which. The inquirers desired to purchase our right and operate themselves, usually because of remoteness for any possible source of general supply for a concord. 
it had not been Edison's intention to cater to this class of customer until his broad central station plan had been worked out, and he has also discouraged this isolated plant within the limits of urban circuits. But these demands were so insistent it could not be denied, and it was de deemed desirable to comply with it at once, especially as it was seen that the steady cure for supplies and renewers would come benefit the new Edison manufacturing plants. After a very short trial, it was found necessary to create a separate organization for this branch of the industry, leaving the Edison Electric Light Company to continue under the original plan of operation as a parent, patent holding and licensing company. Accordingly, a new and distinct corporation was formed called the Edison Company for Isolated Lightning, to which was issued a special license to sell and operate plants of a self-contained character. As a matter of fact, such work began in advance of almost every other kind. A small plant using the paper carbon filament lamps was furnished by Edison at the earnest solicitation of Mr. Henry Willard for the steamship Columbia in 1879, and it is amusing to know that Mr. Upton carried the lamps himself to the ship, very tenderly and jealously, like fresh eggs, a market garden basket. The installation was almost successful. Another pioneer plant was that equipped and started in January 1881 for Hinks and Ketchum, a new firm of lit photographers and color painters who had previously been able to work only by day owing to the difficulties in coloring printing by artificial light a year later they said it is best substitute for daylight we have ever known and almost as cheap mr edison himself described various instances in which demands for isolated plants had to be met one night at sixty five he says james gordon bennett came in we were very anxious to get into a printing establishment. I had caused a printer's composing case to be set up with the idea that if we could get editors and publishers in to see it, we should show them the advantages of the electric light. So ultimately, Mr. Banner came, and after seeing the whole operation of everything, he ordered Mr. Hole and general manager of the Herald to light the newspaper office at upper once with electricity. Another instance of the same kind deals the introduction of the light for purely social purposes. While at 65th Avenue, remarked Mr. Edison, I got to know Christian Heller, then the largest decorator of the United States. He was a highly lecturer man, and I loved to talk to him. He was always railing against the rich people for whom he did work, for their poor taste. One day Mr. W. H. Vanderbilt came to 65, saw the light, and decided that he would have his new house lighted with it. This was one of the big box houses on Upper Fifth Avenue. He put the whole matter in the hands of his son-in-law, Mr. H. Mike Tombley, who was then in charge of the telephone department of the Western Union. Tombley closed a contract with us for a plant. Mr. Herder was doing the decoration, and it was extraordinarily fine. After a while, we got the engines and boilers and wires all done, and the lights in position, before the house was quite finished, and thought we could have an exhibit for of the light. About eight o'clock in the evening, we lit it up, and it was very good. Mr. Vanderbilt and his wife and some of his daughters came in, and were there a few minutes when a fire occurred. The large picture gallery was in lined with silk cloth, interwoven with fine metallic thread. In some manner, two wires had got crossed with this tinsel, which became red hot, and then the whole mass was soon afire. I knew what was the matter, and ordered them to run down and shut off. It had not burst into flame, and died out immediately. Mr. Vanderbilt became hysterical and wanted to know where he came from. We told her we had a plant in the cellar, and then she learned we had a boiler there. She said she would not occupy the house. She would not leave over a boiler. We had to take the whole installation out. The houses afterward went on to the New York Edison system. The art was, however, very crude and raw, and as there were no artisans in existence, as mechanics or electricians who had had any knowledge of the practice, there was inconceivable difficulty in getting such isolated plants installed, as well as wiring the buildings in the district to be covered by the first central station, New York. 
and night stool was therefore confounded at Fifth Avenue, and was put in charge of Mr. E. H. Johnson, fresh from his success in England. The most available men for the purpose were, of course, those who had been accustomed to wiring for the simple electrical system, then the vulgar, telephones, district messengers' calls, bulger alarms, house annunciators, etc., and a number of these wired men were engaged and instructed patiently in the rudiments of the new arts by means of a blackboard in our lessons. Students from the technical schools and colleges were also eager recruits, for here was something that promised a career, and one that was especially luring to young youth because of its novelty. These beginners were also instructed in general engineering problems under the guidance of Mr. C. L. Clark, who was brought in from the Mellow Park Laboratory to assume charge of the engineering part of the commerce affairs. Many of these pioneer students and workmen became afterward large and successful contractors, or have held positions of distinction as managers and superintendents of central stations. Possibly the electrical industry may not now attract as much adventurous seniors as it did then, for automobiles, aeronautics, and other new arts had come to the front in a quarter of the century to enlist in the enthusiasm of a young generation of mercury spirits. But it is certain that at the period of which we write, Addison himself, still under thirty-five, was the center of an extraordinary group of men, full of ever resting and aspiring talent to which he gave glorious opportunity. A very novel literary feature of the work had, was the issuance of a bulletin devoted entirely to the Addison Lightning propaganda. Nowadays, the house organ, as it is called, has become a very hackneyed feature of industrial development, confusing in its variety and volume, and a somewhat doubtful adjunct to a highly perfected, widely circulating periodic panic press. But at that time, 1882, the bulletin of the Edison Electric Light Company, published in ordinary 12 ammo form, was distinctly new in advertising and possibly unique. As it is difficult to find anything that compared with it, the bulletin was carried on for some years until its necessary was removed by development of other opportunities for reaching the public and its pages serve now as a vivid and lively picture of the period to which its record applies. The first issue of January 12, 1882, was only four pages, but it dealt with the question of insurance, plants at San Diego, Chile, and Rio de Janeiro, and the European Company with 3,500,000 francs described. The works in Paris, London, Strasbourg, and Moscow the laying of over six miles of street mains in New York, a patent decision in favor of Edison, and the size of a safety catch wire. By April of 1882, the bulletin had attained the respectable size of 16 pages, and in December it was a partly magazine for 48. Every item it bears testimony to the rapid progress being made, and by the end of 1882, it is seen that no fewer than 153 isolated Edison plants have been stored in the United States alone, with a capacity of 29,192 lamps. Moreover, the New York Central Station had gone into operation starting at 3 p.m. on September 4th, and at the close of 1882, it was lighting 225 houses wide for about 5,000 lamps. This apple good story will be told in next chapter. The most interesting are the bulletin notes from the England, especially in regard to the brilliant exhibition given by Mr. E. H. Johnson at the Crystal Palace, Sydenham, visited by the Duke and Duchess of Edinburgh, twice by the Dukes of Westminster and Sutherland, by three hundred members of the Gas Institute, and by a number of delegation from cities, boroughs, etc., Describing this before the Royal Society of Arts, Sir W. H. Pierce, F.R.S., remarked, Many unkind things have been said of Mr. Edison and his promises. Perhaps no one has been severer in this direction than myself. It is some gratification for me to announce my belief that he has at last solved the problem 
he set himself to solve, and to be able to describe the, to the society the way in which he had solved it. Before the exhibition closed, it was visited by the prince and princess of Wales, now the deceased Edward Seven, and the dowager Queen Alexandra, and the princesses received from Mr. Johnson as a souvenir a tiny electric chandelier fashioned like a banquet of fern leaves and flowers, the buds being some of the first miniature incandescent lamps ever made. The first item in the first bulletin board deal with the fire question, and all through the successive issues runs a series of significant items on the same subject. Many of them are aimed at gas, and there are several green summaries of death and fires due to gas leakers or exploitation. A tendency existed at the time to assume that electricity was altogether safe, while its opponents, predicting their attacks on arc lighting casualties, insisted that it was most dangerous. Edison's problem educating the public was rather difficult, for while his low pressure, direct current system has always been absolutely without danger to life, there has also been the undeniable fact that escaping electricity might cause a fire just as a leaky water pipe can flood a house. The important question had arisen, therefore, of satisfying the fire underwriters as to the safety of their system. He had foreseen that there would be an absolute necessity for special devices to prevent fires from occurring by reason of any excessive current flowing in any circuits, and several of his earliest detailed lightning inventions deal with this subject. The insurance underwrites of New York and other parts of the country give a great deal of time and study to the question through their most expert representatives, with the aid of Edison and his associates. Other electric light companies are cooperating, and the knowledge of this gained was embodied in insurance rules to govern wiring for electric lighting, formulated during the later part of 1881, adopted by the New York Board of Fire Underwriters, January 12, 1882, and subsequently endorsed by the other boards in the various insurance districts. Under temporary rulings, however, a vast amount of work had already been done, but it was obviously that the industry grew there with the less and less possibility of supervision except though through such regulations, insisting upon the use of the best devices and methods. Indeed, the direct superintendence soon became unnecessary, owing to the increasing knowledge and greater skill acquired by the installing staff and this system of education and was notably improved by many written by Mr. Adams himself. Copies of this procure are as scarce today as first folio Shakespeare's, and common prices equal to those of the other American first editions. The little book is the only known incursion of its authors into literature. If we accept the brief articles he has written for technical papers and for the magazines, it contained what was at once a full, elaborate, and terse explanation of a complete isolated plant, with diagrams of various methods of connection and operation, and a carefully detailed description of every individual part, its function, its characteristics, the remarkable success of those early years, which indeed only achieved by following up with the Chinese exactness the minute and intimate methods insisted upon by Addison, as to the use of the power and devices employed. It was a curious example of establishing standard practice, while changing with kaleidoscopic rapidity all the elements involved. He was true to ideal as to the polar star, but was incessantly making improvements with in every direction. With an iron class and that has often seemed ruthless and brutal, he did not hesitate to sacrifice older devices the moment a new one came inside that embodied real advance in securing effective results. The process is heroic but costly. Nobody ever had a bigger trap heap than Addison. But who dare proclaim the process intrinsically wasteful if the losses occur in the initial stages and economies in all the later ones? With Addison in this introduction of his lighting system, the method was ruthless, but not reckless. At an early stage of commercial development, a standardizing committee was formed, 
consisting of the heads of all the departments, and this body was instructed in the task of testing and criticizing all existing and proposed devices, as well as of considering the suggestions and complaints of workmen offered from time to time. This procedure was fruitful in two principal results. The education of the whole executive force in the technical details of the system, and a constant improvement in the quality of the Edison installations, both contributing to the rapid growth of the industrial. For many years, Gower Street played an important part in Edison fairs, being the center of all its manufacture of heavy machinery. But it was not in a desirable neighborhood, and owing to the rapid growth of the business, soon became disadvantageous for other reasons. Addison tells of his frequent visits to the shops at night with the escort of Jim Russell, a well-known detective who knew all the denizens of the places. We used to go out at night a little low place, an old lighthouse, eight feet wide and twenty feet long, where we got a lunch at two or three o'clock in the morning. It was the toughest kind of restaurant ever seen. For the clam chowder, they used to same four claims during the whole season, and the van average number of flies per pie was seven. That was by actual count. As to the shops in the locality, the street was lined with rather old buildings and poor tenements. We had no much frontage. As our business increased enormously, our quarters became too small, so we saw the district tamulator and asked him if we could now store castings and other things on the sidewalk. He gave us permission, told us to go ahead, and he would see it, it was all right. The only thing he required for this was that, when the man was sent with a note from him, asking us for to give him a job, he has to be put on. Who had a hand labor foreman, Big Jim, a very powerful Irishman, who could lift above half a ton. When one of the Tammy aspirants appeared, he was told to go right to work at one point five dollars per day. The next day, he was told to off to lift a certain piece, and if the man could not lift, he was discharged. That made the Tammy men all safe. Jim could pick the piece up easily; the other men could not. And so we let him out. Finally, the tammy leader cut a hot, as we were running a big engine lets out on the sidewalk, and he was afraid that we were carrying it a little too far. The lace were worked right out in the street and belted through the windows for the shop. At last, it became necessary to move from Gower Street, and Mr. Edison gives a very interesting account of the incident in connection with the transfer of the plan to. Scanactory, New York. After our works at Gower Street go too small, we had labor troubles also. It seems I had rather a socialistic restraint in me, and I raised the pay of the workmen twenty-five cents an hour above the prevailing rates of wages. Whereupon Hoy and Company, our new neighbors, complained at our doing this. I said I thought it was all right, but the men, having got a little more wages, thought they would try coercion and get a little more. As we were considered soft marks, whereupon this struck at that time that was critical. However, we were short of money for payrolls, and we concluded it might not be so bad after all, and it would give us a couple of weeks to catch up. So when the workmen went out, they appointed a committee to meet us. But for two weeks they could not find us, so they became somewhat more anxious than we were. Finally, they said they would like to go back. We said all right, and back they went. It was quite a novelty to the men not to be able to find us when they wanted to, and they didn't relish it at all. What with these troubles and lack of room, we decided to find a factory elsewhere, and decided to try the locomotive works at Schenectady. It seems that the people there had had a falling out among themselves, and one of the directors had started opposition works, but. Before he had completed all the buildings and putting machinery, some compromise was made, and the works were for sale. We bought them very reasonably and moved everything there. These works were owned by me and my assistant until sold to Edison General Electric Company. At one time, we employed several thousand men, and since then, the work has been greatly expanded. 
at these new works our orders were fair far in excess of our capital to handle the business and both mr ingsoe and i were afraid we might get into trouble for lack of money mr ingsoe was then my business manager running the whole thing and therefore when mr henry villard and his syndicate offered to buy us out we concluded it was better to be sure than to be sorry so we sold out for a large sum villard was a very aggressive man with big ideas so i could never quite understand him he had no sense of humor i remember one time we were going up to the hansen river boat into inspect the works and with us was mr henderson our chief engineer who was certainly the best recontour of funny stories i ever knew we sat at the tail end of the boat and he started in to tell funny stories Villard could not see a single point and scarcely laugh at all and henderson became so disconcerted he had to give it up it was the same way with gold in the early telegraph days i remember going with him to see mackay and the in Pecuniers country editor. It was very funny, full of amusing and absurd situation, but go never smiled once. The formation of the Edison General Electric Company involved the consolidation of the immediate Edison manufacturing interest in electric light and power, with a capitalization of twelve million dollars. Now a relatively modest sum, but in those days the amount was large. The combination caused a great deal of new paper comment as to such a coinage of brain power. Next step came with the creation of the great General Electric Company of today, a combination of the Edison, Thomson Hanson, and Bruch Lightning interest in the manufacture, which to this day maintains the ever glowing plants at Harrison, Lane, Schenectady and there employs from twenty to twenty five thousand people. End of chapter fifteen.